All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 1230 p.m. public portion of the closed litigation session of the February 26, 2019 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the Council will, will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the Council members will move to the Courtyard Conference Room for our closed session. I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone. Here. Weber. Here. Meyer. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. At this time, I'd like to see if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to any of the items on closed session. Now would be the time to do so. Are you here to speak on closed session? Okay, yeah. Why don't you come on up and we'll give you two minutes and you could address the council before we go back into closed session. And if you could please uh, just bring the microphone towards you so we can hear you that way. It, this is about a, a infection that I had got while fishing in the, by the boardwalk, next to the boardwalk, in between the jetty and the boardwalk. I was just out for an hour with the fishing and uh, just standing in the walking in the in the breakers of the of the beach um, after about an hour after the fishing I went home took a shower and and started feeling nauseous and then I was on, on my way to San Jose to a friend's house and started noticing my legs swelled up and started getting real nauseous got ended up getting a fever I was getting a cold sweats and it, it turned out that I got a flesh eating uh, infection from a bacteria that's that's in the water at the Santa Cruz boardwalk, in front, or at least from there to the jetty. It could be all over, I don't know, but that's where I was standing in the water. And uh, it was a really, really bad infection. I mean, I spent 15 days in the hospital, had, had emergency surgery, and two big patches of skin removed from my leg, and that, that's where they found the bacteria. And uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what else to say about this other, other than the fact that they, if there were any signs because um, later, when I got out of the hospital, I uh, had some newspapers, and I read the back of the newspaper, and it gives you a, a quality of the water in Santa Cruz that I, I'd never seen, <coughs> I'd heard from a friend, and it clearly stated there's a red flag saying, do not come in contact with the water. And if, there's, if, the, if it's that bad there, why are there no signs before anyone enters the beach at, at any beach entrance, I've taken pictures at everyone, and there are no signs nowhere stating uh, you, anything about the quality of the water. People should not be, when people, when it's stated in the paper, there should be signs on the beaches. I mean, I would have never been there if I, if I would have known. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being here and for sharing your perspective, and I'm sorry to hear about your medical um, situation. And so we'll go now into closed session, but we'll take in your testimony. Okay. Did you have a comment? <clears throat> yes, I have a, a request to add an item as a subsequent need item, and it is a, a lawsuit that's pending in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals entitled Zabriskie versus Federal National Mortgage Association, or Fannie Mae, I believe. Um, uh, this is a request for amicus participation on behalf of a nonprofit called the Public Rights Project. Um, that is, that is uh, joining in a petition for rehearing in the Ninth Circuit uh, against a ruling that was made against um, Zabriskie in, in favor of Fannie Mae. So um, the reason why it's coming to your attention now is that it came to my attention uh, after the agenda was posted. And the reason why it's a subsequent need item is that there's a deadline of March 8th to um, to add our name to a, an amicus brief that's going to be filed in the Ninth Circuit. And so that's before your next council meeting. So I would request that the council add this as a subsequent need item. Did you need a motion for yeah. from a council member? Okay. I'm prepared to make that. Um, making the findings that this came to our attention late and we need to act uh, with urgency. I'll move that we add this to the agenda. I'll second that. So motion by council member Matthews, seconded by myself. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, so at this time, we'll go ahead and adjourn our meeting to the courtyard conference room where the council will go into our closed session. I'm not gonna do it. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna go.
Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 1 p.m. session of the February 26, 2019 meeting of the City Council. Before we begin our meeting today, I would like to take a moment to remember a day that we as a city <coughs> will never forget. On February 26, 2013, at about 3.23 p.m., Detective Sergeant Butch Baker and Detective Elizabeth Butler lost their lives in the line of duty while conducting a follow-up investigation. And we as a community are indebted to them for their service. And this incident has impacted the entire Santa Cruz community in a very profound way. Today is the first city council meeting since the tragedy took place that fell on a regularly scheduled city council meeting. So I ask that we take a moment of silence to remember their sacrifice and celebrate their service. Okay, at this time, I would like to ask our clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Crone? Present. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. If the clerk could please lead us through the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. <laughs> for the presentations or do we move on to our introduction of new employees introduction of new introduction employees. of new employees okay well we have a new employee and you'll kick us off on the introduction on this one uh, we have Bonnie Bonnie Bush introducing our new employee with the city clerk's office yeah, thank you mayor <coughs> council members as you know we've been without a deputy city clerk for a while now so I am extremely happy to announce Julia Wood who is stepping into the position um, Julia has been in Santa Cruz for about six years, spending the first several years working in the South Bay managing homeowners associations, which um, we, <laughs> we found um, really aligned with a lot of um, our rules, the Brown Act and all that stuff. Um, she has family that lives in Santa Cruz and she was drawn to make Santa Cruz home with its unique character, <coughs> diversity and strong sense of community, as well as our beautiful beaches, forests and hiking. In her free time, Julia enjoys walking along, walking with her dog along Westcliff, working on DIY projects, or cooking with her partner for her friends and family. So please join me in congratulating Julia and welcoming her. Welcome, Julia. I'd like to now introduce or have our Public Works um, Director, Mark Dettel, come up to introduce uh, his new employee. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works, and it's my pleasure to introduce Joe Murphy, our new assistant engineer uh, in, in the wastewater division. Um, basically, she'll be doing um, design and engineering work related to our wastewater treatment plant, wastewater collections, and sewer lateral ordinance implementation. It's an existing position and works for Scott Glucks. Uh, she was born in Mountain View and lived in Pasadena and in Oakland and Berkeley as a youth and then Arcata as an adult. Uh, she currently lives in Santa Cruz and for the, most, for the past 30 years, she's been a student. Um, she did a 10 year stint as a chef in Northern California and spent the last five years researching water reuse technologies in the lab, which is Great, because we're starting our um, tertiary project at the wastewater treatment plant, potentially, um, working with Soquel Creek Water, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, she went to school at Humboldt State University in undergrad, and then did graduate work at the University of Colorado. Um, and when she's not working, she loves to cook. So please join me in welcoming Joe. Welcome, Joe. Welcome, Joe. 
Okay, if uh, our Director of Water, Rosemary Menard, can come up to introduce her new employee. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, today, I'm pleased to introduce to you, Lewis Kay. Uh, Lewis has just joined us as an Associate Professional Engineer. And Lewis is a wonder man for, uh, from our point of view. He's a guy who brings us lots of experience. He doesn't have water experience, but he's got a lot of really great construction management experience in a variety of public and private settings over the last 13 years. He's uh, worked at Sandus in uh, Silicon Valley as a project manager, the Department of Navy as a civilian contractor in Pearl Harbor as a nuclear engineer over a period of three years, as well as some uh, land development uh, work he's did in um, Illinois for a number of years. He comes with a engineering and project management degree from Michigan Techno Technological University. And um, he grew up in Honolulu, and when he, he and his wife decided where to relocate, this was sort of as similar as you could get to uh, <laughs> Honolulu with, uh, you know, in the Continental 48. So anyway, he's married and has a dog, likes to surf, ski, and hike, and so it's a perfect fit. And we're really thrilled to have someone with his experience joining our team, working on all of our um, rehabilitation replacement efforts for our capital program. So please welcome Louis Kay. Welcome, Louis. Welcome. And then lastly, we'll invite up our Director of Finance, Marcus Pimentel, to introduce a new employee. Thank you, Mayor. I'm proud to introduce you to Alex Drudley. Uh, boy, just hacked that last name. Sorry, Alex. Alex, Alex, Alex. We go by first names. Uh, Alex will be assisting Laura Nolan in our purchasing department, and we're really honored to bring him back home. Alex came from Santa Cruz. Uh, worked in Santa in, in our area in purchasing, went off to manage <coughs> purchasing in El Dorado County, and we were fortunate enough to bring him back home. So we're really excited about this opportunity. Uh, Alex brings many years of experiences of purchasing with a really how can I help attitude, and we've really appreciated that about him already in his first couple weeks. He fits right in with our culture of how can we serve and support our city in a creative, collective way. And we're excited about where he's gonna go in the city, and we're excited about helping his development move through we have a small purchasing group of three very dedicated people, but just three people who do a lot, a lot of work for a city our size. So we're really honored to have him here and look forward to many, many years, maybe a few decades of commitment to the city of Santa Cruz. And again, we're glad to bring him home. Thank you. Great. Welcome out. It's hard not to comment on your tie, Marcus. <laughs> Very fitting for your position. Okay, at this time I'd like to invite up a short presentation uh, from uh, Prince LaShaw on International Jazz Day. Come on up. Hi to everyone, uh, Mayor, Council Members. I would like to present to you a small version of what we did with the support that you gave last year, okay? International Jazz Day in a week. Presented music seminars for a week in a classroom setting at our local schools. Assisted music students to excel in music. <laughs> International Jazz Day Concert at the Santa Cruz City Municipal Water. This is a free public event. Come and enjoy.
And uh, that was what we did with the support that we received from the council and the mayor last year, 2018. Basically, uh, what we do, uh, we do uh, International Jazz Day. We go through the high schools, elementary, and middle school. We try to get the kids to pick up an instrument instead of anything else. Uh, to, if you learn an instrument, it keeps you busy. It, you, it humbles you. It makes you become a servant to that instrument. Keeps you out of mischief. Plus, you learn how to count, and you do math and science much more easier. Uh, the last person was Andy Narell from Monte Carlo, and uh, this year we have someone uh, called, uh, who is it? Uh, you got me all nervous now. But anyway, <laughs> Pete, Pete Escovito from Los Angeles. He's coming this year with his nine-piece group and his family. And uh, I can only ask that uh, as we go through the schools this year, that we get more confidence from the kids to learn an instrument and support from the city council again. Thank you, mayor and city council, a pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Prince. I had a chance to go last year with my family. It was a beautiful day and very windy on the wharf, but it was incredible. So um, I appreciate the presentation. So at this time, we'll go on to our next presentation, which is the Parking for Hope check presentation. So today, I am so happy that the city of Santa Cruz, in partnership with the Santa Cruz Downtown Association, will be presenting Hope Services with the fifth annual check collected from our Parking for Hope holiday program. And for those who don't know, Hope Services is a nonprofit in Santa Cruz that provides training and support services to adults with developmental disabilities. In doing so, the crews have helped to keep our downtown streets clean and welcoming for over 20 years. The funds were collected from the downtown meters the week before Christmas with the usual rate supplied. However, all proceeds this eight-day period were designated for donation to Hope Services. Over 143000 in total has been collected for Hope Services in the last five years. This means that the total amount collected in 2018 that has been donated to Hope Services today is 30,862. So we'd like to welcome the Hope Services team to the podium to accept the, do the donation. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, I have a uh, mayor's proclamation, and that will be uh, declaring February is African American History Month in Santa Cruz. So I believe we have some folks here to accept the proclamation. And before I go ahead and hand that over, I thought I'd just read a, a few of the, the components. Um, so the African-American community in Santa Cruz has, since before the city's establishment, contributed to its trades, industry, arts, culture, philanthropy, education, and community, despite centuries of racial discrimination. And whereas the Santa Cruz chapter of the NAACP was established in 1949, partnering with the city of Santa Cruz in 2018 to bring about March for the Dream in honor for the Martin Luther King Jr. Day, which unites our community around common goals of fair treatment, unity, and universal human dignity. 
And whereas the Santa Cruz community embraces its diversity, promotes the teachings of African American history throughout the entire year, and acknowledges the invaluable contributions of its African American residents and visitors as we celebrate African American History Month. So now, therefore, I, Martine Watkins, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of February 2019 as African American History Month in the City of Santa Cruz. So we have the proclamation. So, uh, Mayor Watkins, I want to thank you and the council so much for this. I'm delighted that you decided to acknowledge all of the contributions that the black community, African American community, black community, African community have made to history. Uh, we really appreciate it. I'm not going to go on. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have a lot to say. I'm Deborah. And you're all looking very well. Remember my face, because I'm going to remember yours. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today to accept that. It's a pleasure. OK, so that concludes the presentations uh, for, for this afternoon. Um, so we'll go right into our business. I have a few announcements, and then we'll move on to the regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. Lynn Denton is our technician for both this afternoon and evening sessions, and I would like to thank you, Lynn, for your work. All city council members can be emailed at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com. If you would like to communicate with us about an agenda item, we'd like to receive your email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meeting. This provides us with an opportunity to review your email and include it with the rest of the agenda packet. Please do bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and city council do constitute public record and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, if you have sensitive or private information that you do not wish to be made public, you should not include that information into your correspondence with us. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left and it's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption. And we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside and outside of our council chambers. At this time, I'd like to ask if there are any statements of disqualification. Council members? Okay, seeing none. <coughs> City Clerk, are there any additions or deletions to today's agenda? There are not. Okay. Oh, except Pardon. for. City Pardon me, Mayor, I had sent the council a, uh, a message this morning uh, recommending tabling of one item, which I'm prepared to address now or when the item comes up on your uh, later in your agenda. Okay. We could address it when it comes up later. Is that appropriate? That's fine. Appropriate? Okay. Thanks. Great. Okay. Any, okay. So at this time, um, I'll make a quick announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. 
Oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. And I'll now turn it over to our city attorney to provide a report on our closed session. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor and Mayor Watkins, members of the city council. There were several items on your closed session today. The first I'm gonna to touch upon was not listed on your agenda. It was a uh, subsequent need item in a lawsuit pending in the Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals entitled <coughs> Zabriskie versus uh, Fannie Mae Corporation. Uh, on that item, the city council authorized the city attorney's office to join in an amicus brief being prepared to file in the Ninth Circuit um, on behalf of the Public Rights Project. And this has to do with um, Fannie Mae's reporting of credit history information in connection with a uh, mortgage lending. Um, more details are available on that if, uh, upon inquiry by a member of the public. Um, the rest of the items were all on your agenda. Item A was a conference with uh, legal counsel involving liability claims. The claims of Julie Gilbert, Alfred Gilbert, and Johnny Lewis Poff. Those items are also uh, on your consent calendar this afternoon for council action. There were two real property negotiation items as well involving <coughs> city-owned property in Scotts Valley. Uh, commonly known as the Sky Park property. Um, I'm not going to list the APNs, um, but they are listed on the posted agenda. City rep met with and gave uh, direction to uh, its negotiator, Bonnie Lipscomb, <coughs> with respect to um, potential agreements for the use of the Sky <coughs> Park property by uh, PG&E and also by uh, the uh, Scotts Valley Education Foundation. Uh, there was no reportable action on those items. Thank you. Okay. So um, we're gonna switch it up a little bit. And um, now is sort of an opportunity for us to report on some of our external communications. For those of you that are new to the council, this has been something that has sort of changed, I'd say, throughout my time <laughs> of rotating um, every other meeting or occasionally and generally would take place at the end of our council meetings. So today we thought uh, it would be a good idea or I thought it'd be a good idea to sort of switch it up and have an opportunity for us to briefly share out any types of um, actions or activities taking place in terms of your work and assignments as um, uh, advocates on behalf of the city. So um, if you could please um, share briefly anything in terms of uh, report outs to the council and maybe I'll start with you, uh, Council Member Crone uh, on my right. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, one group, the community advisory group and, and possibly Council Member Matthews wants to add something too. Um, I thought we had a fantastic meeting um, a couple weeks ago and a lot of information was generated concerning how we are gonna move forward uh, with a sort of partnership, it seemed to me, between university uh, in the community. Um, I think uh, Chancellor Blumenthal was very open. Uh, I actually heard him for the first time talk about 2,000 instead of um, 10,000, and I, and, and I took that as a very positive number. Uh, and I think that um, there was real work. It's the best meeting I've ever been to, to tell you the truth, from the university <laughs> city over the years, um, going back to 1998. Um, so I, I just, I'm positive, and I, of course, we've been meeting with the chancellor. I think everybody's been meeting with the chancellor, uh, meeting with him today, and uh, another another very cordial conversation, although he uh, does not think that we can, that the, that the campus is going to grow. Um, but I think that's, you know, hopefully a, a longer conversation, uh, and he knows where we're coming from. Thank you. <coughs> Councilman McLaughlin? Thank you. Um, we, uh, I sit on the Youth Violence Prevention Task Force Steering Committee, and we had a meeting in Watsonville at the um, health facility out there with different stakeholders. It was a little bit different of a steering committee meeting than usual because they invited different service providers from the area so that we could <clears throat> discuss the issue of racial equity. Um, they had been conducting some racial equity trainings and implicit bias trainings with different representatives from the service organizations, as well as figuring out ways to implement uh, racial equity training with police departments throughout the county. Uh, it was um, encouraging to hear the feedback from the different 
service providers as well as other elected officials and police departments that were represented in the room. What was one of the most encouraging was the Watsonville Police Department, I believe, which are the ones that are really taking the lead and not only having sent their officers to um, get trained as trainers in racial equity, but then also dedicating a sizable amount of hours within their police department for additional racial equity training. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how we may be able to implement that in Santa Cruz. Uh, yeah, I attended both the finance committee for Metro. I'm a seated member of that subcommittee now and also the Metro um, board committee uh, board meeting this month. Um, main report outs really uh, have to do with our partnership with uh, Metro <coughs> potentially on the Pacific Station project. Um, Council member uh, Matthews and I requested uh, a, a, a joint session on that at some point so we could inform each other of the opportunities of uh, and working with partners on a project uh, down there at the metro station. And um, other than that, I think those were the main main items. Yeah, so I'll be on the finance committee moving forward and uh, we also are starting to work on the budget for the metro as well. I just uh, thank you for reminding me, Councilmember Myers, um, that we also met for the community programs budget committee to talk about things. And that was really interesting and I look forward to whatever you decide to update the group too, but I found it really interesting um, because we were discussing the ways that we could dis um, distribute the home and CBDG funding, specifically CDBG, which is the money that comes from the federal government that allows us to fund uh, nonprofit programs and different things around there. So um, it was a difficult conversation because we're trying to figure out how we can span out $186,000 across projects that are the total, I think it was like $600,000 of requests that came in. So it's really a difficult uh, job to really figure out ways that we can prioritize that. From that experience though, and from the conversations that we had, I'm really looking forward to finding additional streams of revenue that we may be able to infuse into community programs. Thank you. Go ahead and... Um, just a couple of quick updates. So I sit on the Monterey Bay Community Power which is the Joint Powers Authority that over for now, I think 20 jurisdictions, one more coming um, in the Tri-County area um, that has um, taken responsibility for procurement of uh, power and distribution of, um, well, we in a, we still, we continue to work with PG&E for the time being um, on uh, the distribution, they still operate the power grid. But we, um, we had a conversation about um, how things might proceed. Uh, and what it might mean for ratepayers given pg and &E bankruptcy. And so far, it does not appear that there will be any significant changes. We, it looks like given that we've made some sound um, decisions in terms of our procurement, um, we're um, likely to be stabilized through the, um, this process. So I'll update you again if we hear anything new. Um, but for now, ratepayers can be assured that um, things should be status quo as pg and &E works uh, out its financial uh, dealings <coughs> with the bankruptcy courts. Um, the Regional Transportation Commission has been meeting. We um, finally uh, did approve the staff recommendation for the um, preferred scenario on the Unified Corridor Investment Study. This is um, going to lead to some pretty major investments in um, <laughs> highway and um, rail trail. Um, rail trail um, development. And so I think that for the city of Santa Cruz, what we'll be seeing most clearly and immediately, well, immediately in the medium term, will be um, improvements to the segments of the, the rail line and the trail that come through the city. So we've begun working on that and the city council has um, voted in the past to support um, the Measure D allocations for those projects, and, and so that'll be continuing here. If you're in South County, you'll see that freight, um, up, you know, freight service continues to operate on the rail line. We have a contract with Progressive <coughs> um, Rail as a as a common carrier for us, um, given the withdrawal of Iowa Pacific from the area. So um, everything's moving along smoothly there. Um, 
And last but not least, the um, Area Agency on Aging has met, um, we meet monthly, and um, have, I think I mentioned this at a previous meeting, but now things are kind of um, starting to move ahead. So there's a legislative agenda that they support, and I'll be bringing a couple of key pieces of legislation or with a request that the City of Santa Cruz sign on for um, some supports for senior services um, around housing and um, meals and other um, health care services. We finally have uh, some potential for movement there with the new governor, and so I'm hoping we can support those efforts. Um, and in addition, I think I've reported on the AARP um, has requested the local jurisdictions to try to become age-friendly um, jurisdictions, age-friendly communities. There's a process that we go through, and so I'll reach out to staff to try to bring a proposal back for us. Um, there's no f real fiscal impact um, at this time. However, we have, that may give us um, access to some funding through AARP, and so I'll be working with the county supervisors on the AAA to try to make that happen as well, to, to be continued. Yeah, several of mine have been reported on already. The, the uh, UCSC Community Advisory Group and Metro, really I think we're uh, reaching a very encouraging spot with Metro discussions on Pacific Station and, and looking at the, the broader possibilities there. Um, I sit on the Mid-County Groundwater Agency, which is collaborative for the uh, Mid-County Basin Aquifer, and um, we're continuing good research and um, progress on work with Soquel Creek on um, uh, aquifer recharge. Um, your comments about the um, uh, issues for aging um, reminds me that the Health Care and All Policies Committee met to kind of get that off the ground and that will be good information to incorporate as well. Uh, it, very general preliminary discussion with that subcommittee. Um, yeah, and we met community programs, so that's it, thanks. I, I do always say, I think, I appreciate you're putting this early in the agenda, because I think we all spend a lot of time on these subcommittees and assignments, and typically it's been relegated to the very end of long meetings and we're kind of fried. So I think it is important that we share these updates. So thank you. I like this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the feedback on that. <clears throat> so I'm going to. I'm on the um, Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments as one of the um, one of the committees that I sit on, and there's a presentation by. Um, so the acronym for Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments is AMBAG. So I'll refer to that the rest of the day. Um, there is a presentation by the AMBAG Energy Watch Program and it highlighted energy, watch, energy savings in um, our region. And um, from 2006 to 2018, annually, um, our region has been saving 103.5 million kilowatts of energy um, per year, which is, and in, six, and, um, in 2019, we're projected to um, have an annual energy savings of six million kilowatts uh, per hour for the year. And um, the AMBAG region has actually met the 2020 goals um, under AB 32 uh, targets in 2015. And so um, these targets that we um, were supposed to meet by 2020, but have now met, by, met already, uh, was a reduction in greenhouse gas by 20% back down to 1990 emission levels. And the hope is that by 2050, we'll reduce our levels by 80% of the emission levels that we were producing in 1990. Um, uh, there's a beacon program which honors voluntary efforts by local governments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, save energy, and adopt policies that promote sustainability. And in 2017 and 2018, the city of Santa Cruz won both silver and gold for agency energy savings, and we won platinum, the platinum award for community greenhouse gas reductions, uh, the gold award for agency greenhouse gas reductions, and silver and platinum awards for sustainability and best practices. And Santa Cruz County was the first county to ever receive a Gold Beacon Award. Um, so we're doing really great with, with <laughs> greenhouse gas savings. Um, they also announced that SB1 Local Streets and Roads Program project lists are due on May 1st, 2019. Um, so this is uh, dedicated $1.5 billion per year in new uh, formula revenues to cities and counties for basic road maintenance, rehab, critical safety projects um, on local streets and roads. And so cities will um, 
and counties will need to have a resolution approved by their councils or boards and project list information uploaded onto the online um, intake pool and submitted to the California Transportation Commission by May 1st to be eligible for these funds. Uh, moving on, I'm also on the um, yeah. Local Agency Formation Commission, so LAFCO, I just know it by its acronym, so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Patrick McCormick, who's the Executive Director, has announced his retirement and will be succeeded by, succeeded by Joe Serrano. And um, I just wanted to see if we could pull up um, something that I handed out, a map that I handed out. There's any way to... Oh, sorry. Can we do it on that side? Is that this one? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's copies by the window if the public want a copy of this map. Um, let's see if it comes up. All right, so um, one of the things that Patrick McCormick wanted to do before he left was uh, there hadn't been an official um, city map done for the city of Santa Cruz, and so he began working on this. And it turns out that in the late 1800s, uh, the city limits were extended in parts um, along the eastern bank of the San Lorenzo River and then south to the southern boundary of the county of Santa Cruz, which is three marine miles out into the ocean. And so this is actually um, a, a more accurate map, which hadn't been produced. And, um, and it shows that the, oh, the, so the city of Santa Cruz actually, their boundaries actually extend out um, into the ocean, um, three miles. And so we decided at that point in time that we should um, extend the sphere of influence of Santa Cruz uh, to meet the boundary limits. And so we voted to um, extend the, sphere of influence at that point in time. And so this is the accurate map of the city of Santa Cruz. I didn't take too much time on this, but I'm just curious about this this little carve out. Oh yeah. <laughs> you could I mean and people might be wondering what that is. Can you Yeah, so when when the De Anza property was um, included into the city limits, they did not annex that one sliver of um, of the three miles out into the ocean. And so if the city at any point in time, um, or if LAFCO at any point in time wants to annex that portion um, into the city of Santa Cruz, then um, since it's within our sphere of influence, it would make sense that we could go ahead and annex that into the city. That is not to load it on at this meeting, but it seems that this must have practical implications for us. <laughs> yes, no. So that's a question for the city attorney at some point in the future. <laughs> no, d don't even bother now. <laughs> Great to get a report if, if on that. If added this to our sphere of influence, it must have some significance. It's true. <laughs> Theoretically. Just one quick thing I wanted to point out. The, you'll see the little island where the water treatment plant is, the yeah. island of Santa Cruz. The other island that we have that's not shown in this map is the landfill uh, facility. So that's also an island of the city of Santa Cruz. Sky Park. Right. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. No, not Sky Park. We own the property, but the landfill is actually it, yeah. annexed into the city, just like the wastewater treatment plant. That's actually a territory of the city of Santa Cruz. Um, so I, a lot of the things that I'm involved in have already been reported out. The only thing I would add is that at the community programs meeting, we also had an update on the core process, which is the community investment process with the county and the city. Um, so there will be s probably some information forthcoming on that. Did you have something to add to that as well? Or I'm sorry, did I? I, when you're done, I do have a report out on the library board. Okay, perfect. Well, board. So then I'll just, before before we um, we move on to your report for staff reports, um, we have our budget subcommittee meeting continually on that. We'll have a presentation um, from Marcus uh, today. And um, there was a CJC meeting with the, the Criminal Justice Council and there was a presentation on the BASTA program as well as some restorative justice programming happening in our, in our city and county. Um, and I think that, I think everything else has been said. So, okay, please. All right. So, uh, the city manager participates on some of these uh, regional bodies as well. The one I wanted to report on today is the library board, uh, which has a uh, joint powers authority 
uh, that is comprised of the city administrators. Um, and so just to provide a brief update on what the board has been working on, uh, part of it has just been getting ready for the budget. So we've been receiving uh, presentations on budget assumptions and we'll be receiving another report from Marcus on budget projections in the coming months. So just getting ready to go over the budget uh, for the next year. Uh, in addition, we've been reviewing or starting the process of reviewing a variety of different policies, including a patron data privacy policy, library security, security cameras policies. Those will be first reviewed by the library advisory uh, commission or committee that's established and then it'll come up to the board. Uh, so the director's been giving us drafts and just giving us background information as we look to review and adopt those policies. Uh, and then the other thing, uh, just uh, more particular to the city of Santa Cruz is the uh, director is moving forward with beginning to implement the improvements at the, our two branches, uh, Garfield and Branch 40, the two smaller branches. And uh, they've done some preliminary designs and would be holding some community meetings. So be on the lookout for those meetings at each of, for each of the branches to get the public's input on the redesigns and remodeling of uh, those branches, which uh, hopefully will start later in the year. They've hired a project manager to get those, those going. So we wanna get those projects completed as soon as possible. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for your work in the community and for taking the time to report out today. Okay, so at this time we'll uh, move along to our consent agenda. And those are items five through 16 in our agenda. And all items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. At this time I'd like to ask, are there any council members who would wish to pull an item? I just want to make a quick, I don't want to pull anything, but I want to make a quick comment on um, number nine. Okay. Quick, very quick. Councilmember Kern. Uh, members of the public want me to pull item seven, and um, it'd be great to get a brief uh, report on item eight as well, so I'll pull both of those. Any other consent items to be pulled? I had a comment on one, but I'm trying to find it. If you would just bear with me for one second. Yeah. That'd be great. So we'll go ahead and move on to um, any uh, items that there's comments only. And I remembered what it was. Oh, you got it. Okay. Yes, um, it's item, um, the item regarding the Santa Cruz Affordable Housing Bond Initiative. Um, um, Is that item nine or? Yes, nine. item nine. Um, okay. Uh, asking the mayor to submit a letter of support to assembly member stone and others as appropriate and i would just suggest um, that we uh, also uh, send that uh, information and request for support to community housing advocates so we get more voices okay. supporting that action it is really really significant yeah, <laughs> to us and let others know what we're working on and to support mark's effort and I think this is the item you plan to yeah, make on so, as well. Yeah, okay. so, and I had a, a similar comment that was a um, uh, re request that we reach out to the um, Santa Cruz City School District to okay. see if they would also <coughs> support this, um, this bill. And um, I know perhaps through the schools committee we could take that action or just connecting with Chris Monroe. Um, and just also just to thank uh, Assemblymember Stone. I met with Assemblymember Stone with some our staff and um, he was um, quite... Um, amenable to, to doing this, and so I'm glad to see that we are gonna um, hopefully, should this pass, um, actually um, be able to make use of the $16 million and the funding that the city um, has and has been unable to use for the development of affordable housing in the future. And that was great. Thank you. Just yeah, a quick follow-up. I think as you all know, um, Don Lane and Fred Keeley have been continuing uh, uh, their leadership of a group interested in the future of funding for affordable housing, and they've got a deep list of people who are interested in that. So just asking them to spread this okay. message out would would spread the word well. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you, Councilmember Brown, and working with for working with Assemblymember Stone for this. Um, any other comments on items or any other <coughs> items to be pulled? Okay. So um, if I uh, want to make sure that I'm clear, the recommendation for item nine is to extend to have the letter go out to our community housing advocates and our Santa Cruz City Schools District. Uh, should we add, could that be a component of the motion to be yeah, added? Yeah, city schools could be included in and others with an interest in promoting affordable housing. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. 
So um, at this time, is there any uh, member of the public who would like to speak to any items on the agenda except items seven or eight, which have been pulled? Okay. Seeing none, um, we'll go ahead and return for a motion to uh, move the consent agenda with the exceptions of seven and eight. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay, motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Brown. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, we'll go ahead now and move on to the uh, polled items. We'll start with item number seven, and I'll have uh, you, Councilmember. Yeah, thank you very much. I wanna thank the mayor also for bringing this forward with me, and um, it's, it's something real important. It is a resolution support of HR 530 to rescind Federal Communication Commission regulation related to uh, 5G technology. It's a very, very short item, but it's just, it, it gives the power back to the cities is what it's gonna do to regulate uh, what we should be regulating um, correctly, I think, is, uh, and it's sort of our, where we're putting these boxes and how we're gonna deal with 5G technology as we move forward. But uh, as I said, a couple members of the public, I think wanna to speak to the council as well, so I'll turn it over to you. Okay, okay. we'll go ahead and no, thank you for that and happy to support this item. We'll go ahead and see if there's any members of the public who would like to address the council on this item. Please let, I line up to my left, okay. You'll be given two minutes. And just before we get, get started, you, you had requested additional time for the other item, correct? So we have that yeah, noted. Yeah, okay. okay. So two minutes for this one, please. Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, thank you, Mayor Watkins and council members um, for supporting on Ashu's bill. It's very important and I appreciate it very much. Um, the FCC is facing many legal challenges now, which I'm very grateful for. No one knows where this is going. We, we only have a small window of time left to choose wisely what we'll do before 5G actually arrives. Um, so I think there's many steps that we do need to take in addition to this one, although I'm very grateful you're taking this first step. I became an EMF refugee in 2014 when I became severely disabled by wireless radiation. I found ways to control my personal environment but it's still very difficult for me out in public, especially here today, but I, it's worth it for me to come. It takes me a couple of days to recover after I've been out in public. Every new tower limits where I can go. Very soon this is gonna get much worse when the 5G antennas, there's gonna be hundreds of them in our town come. Tomorrow, the first 5G satellites are gonna be launched by a company called OneWeb the first of 900 for that company. <coughs> There's been um, Elon Musk and SpaceX has been, uh, FCC has approved 4,425 satellites for them to be launching as well. 12,000 total is what uh, Elon Musk is asking the FCC to approve. So this is much more than just a Santa Cruz emergency, it's really a planetary emergency. And I just really wanna highlight the importance. It's I'm like a canary in the coal mine. I'm a person who actually feels this with my knowledge. I think everyone's being affected, but this is coming very quickly. So I ask you to please listen to what the butterflies are telling us as the butterflies are rapidly disappearing. It's been said, this is why. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, next speaker. Hello, Council. I refuse to get bogged down in spirit by all these things, and I thank you for taking up this resolution on supporting 530. I wonder if you've seen the letter from the Marin lawyer who has a lot of technical background and experience. It's um, <clears throat> it's very frightening to me at this point. I really think we have to um, take care. I mean, he's pointing out that is, okay, this happened with DDT. I saw thousands of pelicans and in two years they crashed. I crashed after early exposure and it took having to walk not even in the neighborhoods, but out just out in the wilds in order to gradually get myself back. Now with 5G, there won't be places like that. We will be condemning everyone. And here's the thing, if early exposure leads more and more people as it increases to become sensitive, 
were backed into a corner. We fought, barely got out of the DDT thing, you know, and reclaimed that. We've gotten the pesticides off of our street medians and out of where they were putting the cheerleaders on them up at UCSC and worked it out here. But <laughs> this is, I'm, I'm very worried. And if you think, oh, well, these are just good business people trying to make money, I mean, what is the purpose of this? All it is, it is really set up for is for there to be streaming that doesn't use cable. It's a money thing. People think about it from a money thing. They're not maybe evil setting it up, but look at the ways that we could destroy ourselves with this. Thank you, please. Thank you. Our next speaker. This is my first time here, and I, uh, I'm very impressed with our city people and what you're doing. That's why I clapped a couple times, and I want to thank you for even having this resolution. It's revolutionary. I remember when Santa Cruz stood for something besides itself. I mean, being selfish, like we all are tending to be, when we put up a sign that said, a, nu a nuclear free zone. Well, I protested against the nuclear proliferation in 95, and we stopped the Nevada test site for four hours, including Greenpeace and all the other people that were aware of the dangers of radiation. Look what happened with Fukushima. Look what happened around the world. We have now nuclear on, on every doorstep, and next we're gonna have satellites shooting down. Well, we already have satellites shooting down but they're gonna be shooting t to every corner of the, of the planet. And these are owned and operated by worldwide conglomerates, corporations. They don't care about any of us. They want us to die, is what I think. Uh, but you know, I only see what's going on around me. I started at HP with a master's degree and I did 25 years of Silicon Valley. I saw how corporations work. I saw how they don't care about anything but the bottom line because the law dictates that. If, and we're not gonna have any rights if you guys don't stand up. And I know you guys have got the guts to do it. And I'm praying for you and everyone on the planet. We need a lot of prayer right now. I wear this outfit because it protects me. I have shielding in my home. I spent most of my retirement money Thank uh, staying you. alive. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next speaker. Marilyn Garrett, uh, thank you for supporting Anna Eshoo's bill, uh, 530. And 5G is an extension of the untested, uh, extension of a technology we know is dangerous. All the microwave radiation from cell towers, cell phones, Wi-Fi, and as I've been coming here since I retired from teaching in 2000, you all have received documentation of the harm. Um, and one of the most recent uh, pieces, what I wanna give you on 5G is um, on uh, um, November 30th, there was a talk called 5G microwave onslaught, what it means for us. And the Anna Eshoo's bill just deals with the proliferation of the 5G. It really encompasses the totality of the exposures we're getting, which are multiple. So on this DVD, I'll give you, and I might have given one to you already, Chris, at an earlier event, Dr. Carl Merritt, who was trained as an uh, electrical engineer, worked in radar in the Canadian <coughs> Air Force, and knows about the biological effects of these exposures. He speaks, um, acupuncturist Mark Hedabakova, 
Dr. Brian Anthony, who's a chiropractor, and it also shows um, Verizon promotional videos on how this 5G goes through walls, millimeter wave technology, and they don't say this is what the military uses to debilitate Thank people. Thank you so, so much. So I'll leave this with you and something that appeared in the comic news on 5G, but I don't, Thank I'll you. give one copy. Please do Thank you for it. supporting this bill sure. and let's go further to stop the harm. And an additional speaker? Are there any other speakers who'd like to speak to the council on item number seven? Uh, Steve Con Cannon, a resident of Felton, uh, fourth generation Santa Cruzan. I, I won't go into the technical aspect of it, but um, somehow the telecommunication is very ambitious and moving quickly. They got into Washington with their wish list and they got it approved back in 96. Now we're stuck with it. I benefited from growing up here and seeing the changes. I went to local schools. I went to Cabrillo. It probably kept me out of jail because I found my interest. However, if the 5G materializes, I'll have to leave the area. And I think I have something to offer to it. And um, if you give this consideration, it's like we're uh, in a war here and we're calling for reinforcements. We're in the 11th hour. Um, I'm kind of independent. I'd like to see the federal government stay back there in Washington. They seem to be very, very busy, very intrigued with themselves. So if we have an opportunity locally to keep some independence, I encourage it. Thank you. Thank you, Council. And I believe you will be our last speaker unless we have others interested. My name is Rhonda Hafes. <coughs> I want to thank you for supporting Anna's Shoes, 530. Um, what you're seeing here today is really the tip of the iceberg of people who are being affected by this already. Um, I normally don't make it down here for the same reason some people have said. I've been very affected by this. I had to retire early. Uh, that's cut my social security. It's very threatening. And to add more, that there aren't places people can actually go to get away. I know someone that goes to the parks every day to get away from this is, is, is insane. And this bill at this point, cities and counties, I think have accepted it more on a financial kind of a outlook. You know, we can make the money here instead of having it go to Washington or to the companies. Um, there's a lot more to it than, than that. We would hope that you would think about the health of the community, even though we've been restricted from doing that. Um, we don't know. I mean, there's been lots and lots of studies coming out of Europe, Israel. Um, we sh you, you've been given a lot of these materials. I imagine Maryland could give you more. Um, this needs to be really looked at. You know, we need to be a leader in other ways and not be looking back, thinking about the tobacco thing and thinking, why didn't, why didn't we see this? Why didn't we pay attention? People, we have sleep epidemics, attention deficit disorder. We've got so many things going on. What are the causes of all those things? It's important. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So seeing um, no other members of the public interested in addressing the council at this time, we'll bring it back for action and deliberation. Councilor Bacone. Oh, I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to thank the mayor again and also Anna Eshu, our uh, representative, represents parts of Santa Cruz. Uh, resolution in support of, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, I make a motion to adopt resolution in support of HR 530 to rescind the Federal Communications Commission regulations related to 5G expansion. Second. So we have a motion by Councilmember Crone, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay. So we'll then move on to item number eight, and I will uh, go ahead and look to uh, Council Member Crone. Uh, I believe that you pulled this yeah, item. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, this has to do with um, it, our uh, city participation in a countywide landlord incentive program. I just had a couple questions uh, for our um, economic development director. Just uh, wondering what, and this is more just to inform the council, I, I think, and see if we can. Um, assist more in getting this program to work. 
um, as I understood it, 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 none of the money was 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 utilized, and we're asking for it to be a, a longer time period instead of just a year. Um, that's one question, and the other question was the twenty one thousand two hundred and ten. Is that rolled over from last year, or is it going to be effectively doubled, or is it, was it doubled from the previous year? Um, good afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council, Bonnie Lipscomb. Um, Economic Development Director. Um, Councilmember Crone, I'll answer your second question first, and it will roll over to the second year. So it's a maximum of up to 21,000 a year that's committed towards the program. And so any funds that weren't used in the first year, it's just, it's the same commitment of funds. Um, so in the follow-up um, and advance of this meeting, we had a few um, sort of back and forth um, Questions. So, Councilmember Crone had reached out to me in advance with um, with his question, and I would say, and from the feedback from uh, the Housing Authority, that that in the first year of the program, the pilot program, the program actually has been very successful. So, um, it's a it's a loss mitigation fund. So, even if we haven't spent the the funding, the fact that it's there and available, if there are problems with Section 8 tenants, is what makes the program successful. Um, the reason why we're requesting the expansion of the reach of the program beyond the first year of tenancy. So the way the program works right now, we initially, and in all the jurisdictions across the county, set it up so that you could only file a claim, a landlord could only file a claim in the program if um, it was a new tenant and it was within the first 12 months of that rental agreement. And the reason why we did that is we, we each had limited funding and we just weren't sure how widely or how many claims we would receive. So we wanted to limit it the initial year to make sure that we were attracting prospective landlords into the program. Um, however, after the first year, uh, we didn't receive any claims in the city of Santa Cruz. There were some other claims across the county. Um, we didn't receive any, but the success of the program during the pilot year is that they actually increased um, the number of landlords participating in the program by 65 landlords. So it went from 1,800 to almost 18, 1,865. And they added over 200 during that same time frame, over 200 units, um, new units of affordable housing countywide. Um, so uh, the Housing Authority feels like the pilot year has actually been really successful as, a, as an extra level of assurance for landlords that whether you're an existing landlord or a prospective landlord, that if you participate in the Section 8 program, um, that there's a loss mitigation fund for, for you if there are problems arising from any tenants that, are, that have Section 8 vouchers. So they really feel like this program is, has had a big impact. That is good news. I, I, that's the missing piece that I didn't realize. That, that, and I'll be ready to move it when it's time. Okay. Thank any you. other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Well, just <laughs> comment. I'm happy to support it as well. And I had many of the same questions, which I talked with Bonnie about. And it seems to me a double success in that uh, there wasn't much need to draw down these funds, but their availability really encouraged a whole lot of new landlords uh, and, and made more subsidized units available. And we all know it's it's a huge problem with people having a Section 8 certificates and places not willing to take them. So the fact that we expand the pool of landlords willing to take those certificates is a real step forward in affordable housing preservation and creation. So good work, yeah. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the council on this item? This is item number eight on our consent agenda. Seeing none, okay, we'll move it back for action and deliberation. Motion to uh, approve an amendment to the agreement between the city and the, uh, the city of Santa Cruz and the Housing Authority of Santa Cruz County for a uh, countywide landlord incentive program authorizing and directing the city manager to modify the existing agreement revising the program requirements to allow for participation from landlords with a longer term tenants. Yep. Okay, so we have a motion by Council Member Crone, seconded by Council Member Matthews. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes uh, unanimously. <coughs> right, so that will conclude the consent agenda. So that brings us to item number 17, which is the encroachment permit for the wireless facilities by Verizon at 117 at Morrissey Boulevard. And, um, go ahead. Uh, Mike Ferry, uh, planning. Uh, good afternoon, Council. So this item was continued from the last meeting because there was some confusion on plans and what had been reviewed. I did meet with uh, Sata Orion, and we went over the plans, and then she had some specific questions. <clears throat> I've 
attached the uh, RF engineer's uh, response to the staff report. Uh, since that meeting, uh, I think yesterday you got another email from SATA, and this morning I forwarded an email response from Hammett and Edison, from Bill Hammett. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions you might have, and the uh, Verizon representative is also here. Okay, great. Thank you all. Are there any questions of uh, Mike at this time? Seeing none, we'll go ahead maybe and open it up for uh, public comment and then we'll return to the council for action and deliberation. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this is item number 17? Okay, you'll be given uh, two minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, you have your, this is the additional one. You have four minutes for uh, additional time. Go ahead. Thank you for the extra time. Um, so I've, I looked through the report again and I saw there were still, there's still a major error that concerns me. Um, the antenna model is still not correct and, the, and it's being referred to in the body of the report as a panel antenna still, which it is not. So in the 220 report from Hammond and Edison, it says, and I quote, there are indeed three antenna elements within the shroud although the 360 degrees indicates that all three are always active, providing service in all 360 degrees around the antenna, unquote. To me, this, this explanation is not correct, and it's a misunderstanding of what the antenna actually, how it actually functions, which is not three antennas totaling 360 degrees. I went to the website on this, of the Amphenol website about this antenna to find out about it, and it describes it as having three different frequency bands with each band broadcasting a full 360 degrees. One at a range of 696 to 960 megahertz and two at 1695 to 2700 megahertz. But in the H&E report, it describes only two frequency bands, one uh, for AWS at 2100 megahertz and one at P for PCS at 1950 megahertz. Uh, there's nothing listed for the range of, six, of 696 to 960 megahertz, which is the third band on the antenna. Um, so if it's true that, quote, all three are always active, unquote, then this, is, this seems to be a very serious omission to me. So when I look at the table of prevailing exposure standards from the engineering report, it lists three possible frequency bands for this um, 696 to 960 megahertz range. None of those are listed. <coughs> what I also note about those three is that they're, they have much more restrictive public exposure limits, about half of what's allowed for the higher frequencies. So this is again, very important if that band is going to be active. Um, so um, so I, anyway, I consider this calls into question all of the RF you know, calculations because I don't see that this antenna is adequately understood in my opinion. Um, so I also take issue with the statement by Hammond and Edison that quote, it's a common practice for the zoning drawings not to include operating specifications <coughs> for the proposed facility. That is why we include the pertinent information in our reports, unquote. But to me, this is not transparent. I mean, how can the public see what's actually being proposed? I, I've spent hours looking through these reports and I've, you know, I'm not an RF engineer, but I've, you know, we're being asked to trust these reports as being true and accurate, but I've found all these errors. So how can, you know, it's just not the case. Are we trusting them because they're experts? How can we, we as the public, or even how can, when they are using a proprietary system, which they've stated for their RF calculations, we don't have the information that we need to verify how can a, how can a city engineer confirm these numbers are with the and within the FCC maximums exposure values? So, so this is the second time we've done this, and I didn't expect to find more errors, but I did when I looked more closely a couple of days ago. So I, you know, when I look at the conditions for approval, it says um, I had sent to you a number five 
that if there are errors in this, the documents, then that's reason for denial. So I ask you to do that. Thank you very much. Are there any other members of the public who would like to address the council? This is item number 17 on our, our agenda. <coughs> And you'll be given two minutes. I'm, I'm opposed to any additional cell towers being added. We have plenty of bandwidth in this county. Uh, only the uh, ultra um, high techers want to have even high, higher frequencies uh, thrown at us and we don't know what these frequencies are. It's all proprietary. Everything is private. We can't know, the, the public's too ignorant to know, right? And the city council obviously has to be come up to speed and uh, get information that's inaccurate in many cases. And um, one of the things I studied, I was, um, I was a technical writer for 25 years in Silicon Valley and part of the reason I am sensitive and I, ha and I love butterflies and I love bees and they are dying in droves. The insects are dying already. We don't need any more bandwidth. And in this bandwidth, what is there? Well, this is quantum physics, folks. And quantum physics is all about dancing. It's the universe is vibrating. And what do you think these, these insects do? They vibrate and have antennas to pick up the vibrations. And they, they, they migrate according to these lines that are invisible for us to see. And one of the things I found in trying to, to heal myself from this electronic ooze that has affected my whole life uh, and caused me to retire, or well, I just retire early. I had to leave because of disability from Hewlett Packard in 2003. And ever since then, I've been studying this phenomenon and trying to find solutions. And one of the things I found is what's called rife technology. You can look it up on the internet. It's about these frequencies. One of the most important things I found in getting my Rife technology, which helped me a lot, and why I'm still here talking, is Thank there's you. a frequency, I just wanna Thank say you. it and then I'll- Your time it. is up and you're welcome, but you're welcome to submit your, your comments to us. Okay, but your time is 1840 up at this time. hertz Thank you. Thank and you. 1910 hertz okay. are known to have Thank deleterious you. effects you're, and cause, and I'm cause- I'm gonna go ahead and say, your time is up so growth. everybody gets the okay. equal amount of time. I I'm appreciate sorry. you respecting that. I just had to add Thank that, you. that was Thank what I was trying to get to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, this is item number 17 on our agenda and you'll be given two minutes. Uh, I was just walking by, I had some city business and I noticed this was on the agenda. Uh, I'm a little surprised that there's this um, fake science, for lack of a better word, is still out there regarding uh, dangers of cell towers and RF radiation. In my previous career, I have a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering from Carnegie Mellon, and I was an engineer, and RF engineering is one of the things we, we uh, I worked on in the various defense co <coughs> uh, companies. Um, 5G is, the beauty of 5G is it's gonna have many, many smaller uh, size cells, so they'll be transmitting less. The danger, if there is any, and there is some documentation about, you could see the things on the internet where there's, the head is heating, it's from the cell phone. If you don't like the radiation, put your cell phone down. Don't own one, it's, very, it's, it's really that simple. The, ra the radiation is, again, the smaller the cells as 5G will develop, is less radiation. And just for point of reference, the, the um, we've been bathed in radiation since Marconi first, you know, uh, did his first experiments. And the human body absorbs, the peak abs absorption for the human body is 70 megahertz. That's not that far from your, from KPIG on your FM dial. So KPIG is doing more damage to us probably than any 5G cell towers or future, uh, <clears throat> future technologies. And also to deny 5G would be like denying the interstate system. It's a huge economic, I mean, there's, it's a 20, $50 billion projected industry, um, revolutionize the internet of things, the IOT and so forth. I can go on, but that's tough. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional speakers to item? Okay. Given two minutes and then you are interested, okay. Despite what industry says, no safe amount of radio frequency, microwave radiation has ever been determined. There is no safe 
amount. The effects are cumulative. When you watch the DVD, you'll see some of the independent science and the facts about it. In terms of FCC limits of exposure, there's an article here about uh, the violation of the FCC <laughs> radiation limits at wireless antenna sites. Monitoring was taking place. Uh, thousands of sites are uh, violated. So we're getting this involuntary mandatory exposure and putting these locations in the public right of way as has happened where I live in Aptos 13 in a square mile of Freedom Boulevard, Day Valley, McDonald. I have this detector of microwave radiation. I've shown this before. This is the sound component and it's way up in the red as it is by the bus stop where I go where they put an antenna Prior to that, there was no reading. The effects, I, I will give you just one report by Santini in France several years ago, titled Neural Behavior Symptoms Near Cell Towers. Fatigue, sleep disturbances, headaches, feeling of discomfort, difficulty concentrating, depression, memory loss, visual problems, irritability, and um, cardiovascular okay. problems, Thank the you. list goes on. And you're welcome to leave that with us. You, I will you, do that and you. I hope you deny this. Okay, and your time, your time is up. Because it will you. be committing this Thank harm. you very much. Thank okay. You. Is there any other speakers here to address the council? Okay. Okay. <laughs> if it's, you know, there is the ADA and you have no business ever allowing anything in the right of way since we already have people who are sensitive to it. Secondly, I wanna point out this Marin uh, lawyer is pointing out that the ways that we've been looking at are not the only ways that people are damaged when they compare it to microwave, the thing is, it all has to do with jostling and it is affecting chromosomes at much lower levels. Now, babies in utero already have their gonads. They already have all the eggs or sperm they will ever have. We have seen a dramatic <coughs> decrease in male sperm over the last, what, 40 years from all the th assaults, it may not all be um, wireless microwave, but by golly, it sure is. And those little babies, who knows whether or not they will ever be able to conceive. And <laughs> we're just setting ourselves up. We really have to just stop now. I wouldn't put any more cell towers in. I would make there be have to be a an absolute demand for it by the citizens in an area before you put anything more up because it otherwise it is just allowing ourselves to be walked over by an industry. There is no reason, if this were trying to give clean food or water or sewage treatment to people and you had to weigh the problems with the benefits, that would be one thing. But this really isn't a benefit. This really is something that is uh, making, bound to make more and more problems. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any additional speakers who would like to address the council? <coughs> Um, I only have one thing to say, and that is that when I looked at the map of where this is gonna be located, it surprised me. It's like right in the middle of a shopping center, it looked like, close to many businesses. People who have to be there at their jobs for eight hours at a time, um, or perhaps there's even some living areas close to there too. Um, this isn't right. They, these people, you know, they don't know this tower is going in. Uh, they may depend on this job, and now they may become ill or have to quit, and 
Uh, as we know, there's already a lot of problems. We're gonna have a homeless thing here tonight. I think you know how big the homeless thing is and how many people have ended up there, some of them because of this very issue. Please consider where this tower is. I think you're pretty close to the staff of Life, which is a, a health uh, business. And then I think 24 hour fitness, people are going there for their health. They don't really wanna be bombarded by any more uh, unhealthy uh, technologies than they already are. Please consider the location of this tower. It's a very bad idea. It's here for, they're doing it for the money. It's a money thing for them. What are we getting out of it? Thank you. Thank you. And I believe, unless there's any additional members of the public who'd like to address this, you'll be our last speaker. Go ahead. Just briefly, I, I have to uh, applaud the ambition on the telecommunication people. It's, it's, it's like a crusade. But when we went through the thing on the smart meter with PG&E and they, they gave us their information, some of it proved to be faulty. PG&E is kind of under the microscope at this time. But uh, there's a legal term, it says do no harm. And regardless of these philosophies or these pushes uh, for telecommunication, my God, uh, uh, young people and the unborn. There's experts out of England who are saying what this lady just said. That these young women, they're not protected as at the young stage. They'll have, they'll have problems in the birth even if many of them won't give birth. So it's, it's a very serious situation. Um, I, I frequent Morrissey Boulevard there and I, I think these things need careful review, judicious careful review. We don't want another cigarette debacle. And the estimate is the uh, tele, the Wi-Fi EMF is gonna far exceed the cigarette cover-up. That's all I have to say, and thank you, Council. Thank you. Okay, so seeing um, no more members of the public interested in speaking to us, we'll bring it back for action and deliberation to the Council. Is there any council members who'd like to? I was wondering if the Verizon person could answer a question Some questions for about the, the accuracy that people pointed out or the inaccuracies. Sure. Good afternoon, council, mayor. My name is Ben Haxted. I'm with Sequoia Deployment Services representing Verizon Wireless on this project. Um, I'll address that right off the bat. First thing I wanna address, because I keep hearing this, is that Bill Hammett is the Verizon RF engineer and that is incorrect. Uh, Bill Hammett of Hammett and Edison Incorporated is a consulting agency which we hired because we have to get an independent agency that will show that this complies with FCC standards, which in his report he states will be 0.089% of the applicable public exposure limits and is 0.2% of, uh, in the second elevation, 0.2% of the public exposure limits. Um, he also, in his transmittal that I believe Mr. Ferry uh, provided you, as well as his information this morning, um, which he was nice enough to provide us on very short notice, um, stating that the antenna that is on the plans, the antenna that is referenced in everything, the antenna that is with the encroachment or with Public Works right now and being reviewed, is the antenna they did their um, modeling on and their report, and he stands by his results. He probably, they probably do thousands of these reports for not only the carriers, but for cities who also want reports. Uh, not to mention, they will also be providing a report after this is on air to make sure that it meets the standards that it, it says it will in this report. As for the bands, it sounds like I'm hearing, she's saying there's three bands. Three bands aren't three antennas, it's not a band, it's like a radio, like a frequency. There's only two frequencies that are being used on this, so the third one is not being used. Verizon doesn't have the SEC rights to that frequency, so that's why it's the PCS and the, the other one. Um, that is why there's two bands, they are 360. As they also state in their report, they take in the worst case scenario. So the highest power levels, the most usage at one time, that's what this report is based on. 
Thus, also once it's turned on, whenever it is built, they will go out and confirm that these results are those. Um, as of that, I will answer some of your questions. Did I answer your questions? Um, I'm just, just a, and this is not a rhetorical question. I mean, who's, who's asking for more cell service? Because I've never once, uh, it's my seventh year on the council, I've never once had anyone write to me and say, we really have bad cell service. Could you please um, you know, get some more cell towers? Or I, I would encourage you to go online and just type in cell, you know, just type in the word cell tower and you'll get a million different forums, just as there's forums there who needs a cell tower. You'll find a forum of a million people who say, I get no service, this is crazy, I'm gonna move, uh, I have to switch carriers because of this, and that's the whole thing. And people say, oh, well, I don't need one. Well, you might be T-Mobile. I'm T-Mobile. I'm representing Verizon today, but I have a T-Mobile phone. Um, I have a T-Mobile phone because there's a tower that I can actually use. I live in a predominantly residential area where there's nowhere that, um, you know, you could get it through planning. <laughs> to propose a tower, so I have T-Mobile. It's almost a prohibition of service for the other uh, companies, but it is what it is. So that's how I'd answer. Thank you, Councilmember Myers, and then I think we have a question from Councilmember Myers. I just have a, two quick questions, um, and Mike, this might be you, I'm not quite sure. Um, you you uh, mentioned that that this, the company will you know be monitoring the, the tower and uh, the antenna and reporting out the, the, the levels, and if, there was an exceedance, what what happens? So is there someone on you know, city staff that would then receive that and how, how does that handle? I don't know if you wanna tag team it, but I'm just curious how we handle that as a jurisdiction. Uh, I, the only time I've ever seen, um, or and I've only seen it in testing, not in the actual, once the site was on air, but it, it will happen sometimes. You, you put a site and we have to see if it's gonna work. And, and, you, and if, if it's even close to the exposure limit, they figure out a different design. They have to reconfigure it before they even build it. Now, if you're saying from an after, we provide a report to him. Um, sometimes the cities even go out when they conduct those reports, generally not. Bill Hammond is a very respected person. He would lose his license and lose his entire company. Um, same as Verizon. Verizon, will lose their, Verizon will lose their license and will not be a company anymore if they break these FCC laws. It's, it's in their best interest to follow the law, um, like anything else. And, and Mike, just, are these reports available in, in the planning department if someone wanted to look at these, or how, how, how could these be looked at by somebody if they, if they needed to? If so when they're, the <clears throat> when they're ready to get a, a final, I give them like a temporary final on mm -hmm. the computer and put a little notation in there that says within 45 days, come in with an RF report. I usually get that emailed to me. It's a PDF and it shows, typically it shows that it's operating at what they predicted or even less most of the time. So they go out with meters and ground truth, the modeling study. And then I just put that in the file. So they are available if somebody wants to look at them. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, uh, I just have a question regarding the final paragraph on the agenda report, which says, a recent FCC ruling severely restricts the ability of public entities to regulate small cell installations um, to 60 days. Um, so this is time sensitive. Um, so my questions are, what are the limits and what happens if we fail to act? I don't know defer who I to asked city that one. or city. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, a new FCC ruling that goes into effect. Um, April fifteenth. So this, planning of this, uh, of this year. So planning and public works are currently going through ordinance amendments so that we can meet these new shot clock deadlines, and the deadlines are sixty days for all city permits from the day of submission to when the permit is, when the decision is made uh, for any new uh, micro cell site going on an existing structure. If they're going to put it on a new structure or a replacement utility pole, uh, like this case, uh, we have 90 days. And that's from when they submit their materials. Well, typically we can toll a clock you know, the regular uh, state permit streamlining allows you to toll a time limit. You get 30 days to uh, review an application. Um, we have 10 days with this new FCC ruling. 
So we'll get, we'll receive the applications. We'll have 10 days to either ask for more information or, or not. And then 60 total days again for um, uh, any new small cell that's going on an existing facility or 90 days for a small cell that's going on a replacement or new pole. So, um, and this is just an honest question. So, um, when the staff report says the ruling severely restricts the ability of public entities to regulate, is it strictly the amount of time they have to reach a decision or is it other criteria? And I, I yeah. do remember previous <coughs> discussions that you can't take into consideration health. That's, that's still um, uh, in effect. That's from 1996. So the health issue for us as regulators for the city, um, it's kind of, it's out of our jurisdiction. We are allowed to regulate the aesthetics of how these are uh, going to look. And so we've seen some, we've brought some up to city council where we had examples of some really horrible looking ones and, and uh, after working with the applicant, uh, some much better looking ones. So one of the things that we're gonna be coming uh, to you with is the, a design criteria that we would like to see. And, and that would be part of this whole catch up with FCC yes. recent rulings and existing rulings. Yeah. Any additional questions, Councilman Um uh, Mike, I was just wondering, so a member of the public said, if there are errors in the proposal, then we can deny the permit. Is that true? And are there any errors in this proposal? Uh, the condition is true. That's a standard boilerplate condition. I don't think that there's any errors. I think that the email um, that we got this morning from Bill Hammett explained some of the um, discrepancies that that um, Ms. Orion uh, talked about. If you look at, this is the email that came in this morning from uh, Bill to myself. And on number one, he's talking about the three antella, antenna elements, and he says that there is some confusion there. However, um, and, and the different bandwidths that she was concerned about. And the last sentence of his paragraph is Verizon is not authorized by the FCC to operate all of those bandwidths. So the antenna has the ability to operate five or six bandwidths, but um, <coughs> Verizon isn't allowed to use that. So they're just using the ones that they modeled and that's the result uh, that you see in that RF analysis. Um, and then there was some confusion about the antenna type and he's got a very complicated um, explanation, uh, each letter in those antenna models represents, you know, a panel, um, whether, uh, you know, if it's an O, then it's not going to use that particular panel. I didn't wanna, I could read the whole thing to you, but. So no, I think that this is accurate. Uh, and I should have said that he's an independent um, uh, engineer that's registered by the state. And we have used him as a third party review in the past so that when we get something that, that we're kind of scratching our heads about, we've hired this company to do a third party analysis. I think I've worked with him for 20 years easily. Thank you, thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, and uh, I meant to ask this as well. Uh, so what happens if we fail to act or deny the, the permit? Again, this is an honest question. Um, what happens now? <laughs> Failing to act in a timely fashion results in the permit essentially being deemed approved. Okay. One way or the other. <laughs> I just remind the council that this is uh, coming before you as a, a request for approval of an encroachment permit, but the uh, planning department already reviewed and right. approved a permit for this project yeah. back in I'm 2017. I'm just asking these, okay, to get it out there. Um, I will go ahead and move the item. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, I'll make a motion, the resolution authorizing the city manager to execute an encroachment permit to Verizon Wireless for installation and maintenance of underground conduits, vaults at grade cabinets and wireless canister antennas mo mounted on utility pole at 117 Morrissey Boulevard within the city of Santa Cruz's right of way. We have a motion. I'll, I'll second that motion, pointing out that we did previously take uh, action supporting a federal legislation that would give local jurisdictions more authority o over these types of facilities. And in fact, we have uh, virtually no jurisdiction 
right now other than aesthetics and I look forward to updates of the the zoning code but um, for what basis it's right now um, yeah I will support right. the motion so uh, Councilmember Butler yeah I'm um, just from what I had heard about some of the timelines associated with the shot clock the timeline for the new law starts in April so we have about another six weeks or something according to that timeline right April 14th so is there harm in delaying the decision until the council meeting before that April 14th deadline so that we can have as much information as possible or to follow the uh, process of the bill and all that stuff? Mr. Kondak? I'm not sure what calendar we're operating under currently, but the regulation that was uh, promulgated back in, I think, September of last year and that either took effect in January or or will take effect in April, shortens an existing shot clock. So it's not like we're not under any time constraints based on regulations that were in place prior to the new FCC ruling. Um, mm -hmm. So again, I don't know uh, what the sh current shot clock timing is, but it may um, result in our having deemed approved the project. So. I anticipated this question. So the application was submitted on August 31st, 2017. Uh, the zoning administrator approved it within 90 days. Uh, they approved it on 11, 15, 17. <coughs> and the shot clock for a 90 day project expired 11, 31, 17. So we have been working with the applicant. And, and this again is one of the reasons we're going to adjust the ordinance because after they get through the planning permit process, which is typically about three months for a public hearing. Then they have to apply for an encroachment permit and go through that process with public works. So we're very far behind the shot clock uh, cutoff. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I, just, I, Myers, yeah. I, I just wanted to state too that um, I think we're in a difficult decision. Um, and obviously we, we support um, legislation to try to provide local local oversight again for these facilities. So uh, yeah, I just would encourage that we stay on top of on top of that. And uh, but I did want to move the item. Okay, so we have Councilman McLeod. Thank you. I just want to go on record and say that I am concerned if there are in fact physical ailments that are experienced by some of our residents with regards to the increase of microwave technology, even if it is important for different aspects of uh, life for other individuals, I think it's important that we're making Santa Cruz a space and a city that works for everyone and trying to figure out, figure out as many solutions as possible to mitigate the impact or unintended impact of uh, installations of new cell towers on our vulnerable populations. Just wanted to go on the record and say that. So we have a motion by uh, Councilmember Myers, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. Just one question. I just wanted to, for, clar for clarity, if this were to not pass, you said that event, it would, the permit would go forward regardless? It will go forward. The question is, um, what, on the, what are the circumstances under which it will go forward? Will Verizon file a legal challenge asserting the, uh, in a declaration, uh, a declaratory relief action, asserting that the shot clock has uh, already expired, or will it simply um, proceed as though uh, the permit had been issued? My recommendation, however, is that you um, not just decline to take action on this because the encroachment permit has a lot of important conditions that we want to be able to ensure are enforced in um, when this project goes forward. So. So declining to take action it does not, um, without consequence, even though it may result in the application being deemed approved. Okay, yeah, th that is a point that hadn't been mentioned before. That there are a lot of conditions associated with the easement. And I would be quite comfortable, comfortable including in the motion that we encourage ongoing rigorous science, scientific investigation into the effects. Sure, I'll accept that. Okay, so um, did you catch that in terms of our support? Okay, so it seems that we have sort of limited um, choices here. I just want to put, have something for the record okay. that, um, that I hope that as a city we do our best to make sure that 
these types of like, technologies are producing the minimal amount of impacts on a community, if not you know, zero amount of impacts on a community, and we monitor them very closely. Yeah, I would, I would just add, and I know that the circumstances around the choices that we've made in, in other cases where we are not necessarily fully supportive of uh, federal law, um, you know, that we, the city has um, chosen to, in the past, stand up and say we do not support those laws, for example, with Sanctuary City, um, Nuclear Free Zone. Um, there are different circumstances, obviously, but, you know, I am reminded of a comment made by a um, uh, public commenter at our last meeting about um, sometimes it's time to stand up when it comes to um, you know, what we consider to be laws that are, um, you know, not in the public benefit and, in fact, have deleterious effects on um, public health. I know that we're not allowed to say that, um, or the federal government tells us we're not allowed to say that as per the FCC but, and the Telecommunications Act, but it doesn't mean that we can't say it, and so I say it, and um, I just want to make Yeah, I, I can't support the motion on the floor, only because, like I said before, I've never had anybody come to me and say, dang, I want more cell service, I want more cell service. Of course, your cell phone drops out lots of places around Santa Cruz, but it's not, I don't think it's because of this particular box. We don't have people who come to us saying we want more cell service. We have people who, who are here saying, um, really, let's, let's take a step back and really rethink this national policy as well as our local policy. So um, for those reasons, I, I'm not gonna support this motion. Okay, so, okay. Just one more. Um, on that note, just something uh, to, that came up from the city attorney's response for me was that if the concern or the reason why we're moving forward on this is threats of a potential lawsuit from Verizon, then I am even more principally concerned of moving forward with this for that reason because then we have the federal telecommunications department with telecommunications monopolies and a uh, large corporate entity threatening uh, with uh, community members that have expressed that this will detrimentally impact their life and ability to reside in the city limits. So I don't think it's a good idea. Um, I'll go ahead and see if you want to clarify your comments. My interpretation was something other than that in terms of the limitations for our control, given the constraints of the situation in general. Is that? That was my comment. I, I'm not concerned um, because I don't think there's a legal basis for the uh, telecom companies to bring a legal challenge against members of the public for merely expressing their own valid concerns about the health effects of EMF radiation. The bottom line is it's the city that is subject to the FCC regulations, not not individual members of the public, and and they are free to um, you know express themselves and advocate for what what they believe in. So uh, I didn't mean to suggest that it constrains. Um, uh, Ms. Garrett or, or other speakers who, who have for a long time now, um, at least as long as I've been in the city of Santa Cruz, um, advocated against the placement of these cell towers throughout the community. Okay, okay. so um, we'll go ahead and take a vote. We have the motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Aye. Okay, so that, was that a high or no? Okay. no. Okay. <laughs> so then that fails with, I mean, so then the ayes were Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Myers, and myself. The nays were Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Glover, and Crone. Councilmember Matthews. Just a question follow up. If we could get an idea of what uh, conditions of the easement um, are as a result of this uh, no longer enforceable, that would. That would be helpful. At this time, or in the future time? I'll have Public Works come up for that. Okay. Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works. The encroachment re permit requires that the person that's issued or the organization issued the encroachment permit provides the city with uh, insurance that indemnifies the city if anything happens you know, related to the installation. So without that insurance, we're, I don't know how well we're protected or not. Yeah, got it. Okay, so we'll go ahead. Okay, so that concludes the vote at this time. So the- Yes, I, I would just 
say if I could, I, I believe if there's if there are any second thoughts, it could be reconsidered today if someone who voted against it decided they wanted to reinitiate the item. Is that a correct statement? Yes, it can be it can be reconsidered um, during the same day that the action was taken. That's right. Okay. All right. Thank you. And so at this time, we'll move on to item number 18. And so item number 18 is the one possible reappointment or appointment with a term expiring January 1st, 2022, starting with council member Brown, each council member will name one nomination and once their nominations are complete, then we will have each council member say their vote. So go ahead and, okay. Um, sorry, to stall time, I didn't yeah. include public comment. So I don't know if you wanna do public comment before you do the nominations and vote. Okay, so at this time, is there any member of the community who wants to speak to us on item number 18? And that is the Parks and Recreation Commission appointment. No, it's okay, no, I'm glad, thank you. Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll go ahead and uh, return it back for nominations. I would nominate, um, I'll, I'll tear a hat. Yes, I'd like to nominate Ron Goodman, and I'd like to speak to the reasons for my nomination. Um, we did get a letter from Tony Elliott, the Parks and Rec Director, who spoke to about the uh, pillars of objectives for Parks and Rec agencies, which include health and wellness, conservation, and social equity, and urged us to consider diversity in our appointment. I'd just like to say that um, I have uh, known Ron not well, but uh, in the course of community activities for many, many years. And I think he would be an important addition um, to the existing commission. Uh, he and his family have been active users of a great number of parks and rec programs and facilities over the years. Um, he has a, a long breadth of community involvement in a wide variety of issues and activities. He has um, uh, professional experience in the development uh, and implementation of long range plans. I think that's especially important since we are um, about to um, move to adoption of our parks master plan. Uh, he's provided personal leadership in a variety of sports and athletic activities for both kids and adults in a whole whole range of activities, not anyone. He's He's widely respected for his constructive participation and leadership in the community. Um, and for those reasons, I think he'd be a really strong addition to the commission in its work ahead. And particularly since the um, we always have an eye to diversity, um, there's uh, currently only one man on the Parks and Rec Commission. So let's hear it for a guy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Is there any other names to be nominated? Okay, I don't have any other. No, me either. Any other names to be put forward as a nomination? Uh, no, Councilman Brown's still my nomination. <laughs> uh, Councilman McCrone? Um, I just wanna uh, read the last line here of Altera Hatton's um, application. L lastly, as a woman a significant, uh, with a significant mobility disability, I offer a perspective derived from a set of life experiences which are likely quite different from other commission members. I can confidently say that plurality strengthens any group and a diversity of perspectives allows for innovative problem solving. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and call the vote. We have um, Ron Goodman and Altera Hatton as the two uh, nominations put forth. And starting with my left, Council Member Brown. Goodman. I'm gonna go Hatton. Goodman. Um, I'm gonna go with Hatton. I'm with Hatton. Altera Hatton. Yes, Altera Hatton. All right, thank you. So at this time, we'll move on to uh, agenda item number 19 and that's the user charges for wastewater services and the proposed five-year increase. And we have Steve here.
So I can just say, uh, my name is Steve Wolfman. I work for the Public Works Department. I'm a senior civil engineer. And um, the subject today is the user rates for wastewater users, which we pretty much all are within the city of Santa Cruz. There are a few septic users around, a handful, just to let you know, mostly out beyond Meter Canyon, not Meter Canyon, um, further out. I can't remember the name. It's a ways out. There's about 12 uh, large lots out there. So um, I can kind of begin before my PowerPoint comes up. Um, really, the purpose of uh, there it is. the purpose of the action today is to approve uh, a flyer uh, because by Proposition 218, when we increase user fees, we need to uh, let everybody know who is a user on what the increase is going to be, and send uh, <clears throat> you know a flyer with uh, information on it. For those, for those users, and um, so you have before you, you have uh, you know the uh, user flyer and the rates that are proposed in the user flyer, and um, <clears throat> we would be sending those out to everybody, and then uh, 45 days after that flyer is sent out, uh, we would be coming back to the council for approval of the rates. <laughs> so, to come on up there. <coughs> anyway, so uh, there it is. That's a picture of our wastewater treatment plant down near near Lagoon. Um, the blue domes are the trickling filters. And um, also in the forefront is the, that's our secondary clarifiers. Actually, one of them is empty at the, t at the when this photo was taken. And then in the background is the, um, the earlier portion of the plant um, called advanced primary. <laughs> so we have a wastewater enterprise fund. Um, the money is used exclusively for the construction, operation, the maintenance of the system. Uh, we have a very extensive collection system, uh, usually one pipeline on every street in the city. Some are in easements, and sometimes we have two pipelines. So we have 160 miles of pipes, 25 pump stations, and we have the regional uh, wastewater treatment plant, um, which does include a state certified lab. <laughs> nice photos there. So <clears throat> the regional plant, um, we've won several awards there. It's a, it's a very well-run plant, very innovative. We generate uh, a lot of electricity at the plant from both solar and also um, we use the gas that we collect off of our uh, anaerobic digesters. Uh, <clears throat> we treat all of the wastewater from the Santa Cruz County Sanitation District. So I listed there, you know, it's, it's basically everything along the coast all the way to, I think there's even some in La Selva Beach that is part of the Santa Cruz County Sanitation District, but definitely all of Live Oak and Capitola and Soquel and Aptos, it, it all gets uh, collected by the Santa Cruz County Sanitation District. They have their own collection system. <coughs> they pump it to us and then we treat it. So about half of the wastewater at the treatment plant is from that, uh, that district and half from the city. Uh, 10 million gallons every day is about what we treat. Um, <clears throat> by, by state law and by the grants that we've received over the year, we, our, our rates have to be uh, based on the cost of service. So um, each user category, they're charged based on how much they generate, and more importantly, 
um, how difficult it is to treat, treat their wastewater. So a gallon of wastewater from a restaurant is more difficult to treat than a gallon of wastewater from a residence or from an office supply store or, um, or city hall. So the rates, there's different categories and different charges. There's just a list of the different users. That's kind of a repeat of that. Uh, we treat um, all those different types of users. The high strength users are the, mostly the restaurants and some uh, food processing type. Um, the medium strength users are, um, you know, different people who use a fair amount of water for some sort of business. So uh, last year, over the last year, we've we decided to do an infrastructure uh, equipment study. The treatment plant is, is aging nicely, but it's still aging. And a lot of the facilities now are 25 to 30 years old. We did major projects, uh, the advanced primary and the secondary projects in the 90s. Uh, we spent approximately a, a $100 million at the treatment plant to upgrade it to add secondary, but also to modernize the plant. So the infrastructure study, um, which really um, basically says you need to spend more money at the treatment plant to keep the equipment and the, uh, you know, up to snuff and, and really uh, <coughs> in proper working condition. Um, we maintain it very well, but sometimes you just have to replace uh, especially the electrical and the controls. It just, stuff gets obsolete. You can't, you can't get the equipment anymore, uh, the replacement parts. This is a list of um, projects that I would, uh, uh, I would hope that we would accomplish most of these during the five years of this rate study. Uh, the one at the top, the ultraviolet disinfection, we are under design right now to complete that. We have a pretty um, innovative system for uh, disinfection. We used to use chlorine gas. That was always very exciting at the treatment plant. Um, and then we went to hyperchloride, which is basically a stronger bleach, which we still have as a backup system. But we, we installed about, well, it says in 98, we installed the ultraviolet uh, system and it uses lights, basically. And the controls on that system, the lighting systems, it's just, it's very, it's obsolete now. Uh, the, the technology has come a long ways. We will save uh, power on that, but it just has to be replaced. Uh, the, the equipment is hard to find parts for now, and um, so we're pretty excited about that project. It'll reduce our maintenance costs, too. And then this is just a list. Uh, it's, uh, it's preliminary for sure, so are the costs. Uh, they could go up, hopefully they'll go down. So that's, um, this is kind of a summary of what the increases are for. Um, the top line is probably the most important. Uh, the second line there with uh, increased operational costs just from basic inflation. Um, and also because there are like, for example, the, uh, the lab is doing a lot more intense testing and has the ability to, so the lab costs have also gone up more than just uh, inflation. Um, the fund balance is approximately half of our operating budget, which is what um, you're supposed to maintain for a uh, for a, a, a operation like this. And um, without the fee increase, we would have no fund balance within two years if we do the projects, which uh, there's really no choice but to continue to operate the plant um, at that level with those projects. So <clears throat> we have um, a, a five-year rate increase, 7% uh, a year. I'll get a little bit more detailed about um, what that means per customer. Uh, you can see that the fund balance, um, you know, will stay around um, the $11 million mark, which is the targeted uh, mark for a fund balance. 
So for a single family resident, uh, this in the first year of the increase, it would be a little over $3 a month as an increase. Multifamily, a little less than $3. And we have the low sewage producer. It used to be called low water user rate. Um, it would be about a $2 uh, a month increase. And we can go over a little bit later if we have questions about what that low sewer producer is. But it, it's basically, well, our, our residential rates are flat rates. So whether you have six people living in your home and you do laundry every day or you're a single person and uh, you, you don't do laundry and you don't use the shower much or whatever, you know, it, it's the same rate. The low sewage producer gives that person who's a single person and they're living in a house and they're not doing, you know, maybe they're doing the laundry at a laundromat. And it also for multi-residential uh, apartments and such not, that if they have a really low water usage during the winter, which we assume is going to the uh, wastewater system, they have a special rate. And it is a significant discount for those users. And then we just have the low strength and the high strength business. Like I said, the high strength would be a restaurant, um, an increase of around $36 a month for the for those users, and that's for a typical, because your, your businesses, we are charging them based on the usage that shows up on their water <laughs> meter. Uh, this is cumulative. So over the five years, if you're a single family resident, uh, you would have a, a monthly increase of almost $18 a month. Um, in 2023, yes, 2023. And, and the same, you know, it shows what it happens to uh, the other user categories there. This is a cost comparison to the County of Santa Cruz, or the Santa Cruz County Sanitation District, I should say. Uh, we are significantly less than them um, in the uh, different categories. They do not have a low sewage generator category. Um, the $65.25 is their existing rate, and they're slated to also go up on July 1, um, and somewhere I have that information about what they're going to be, but it, it will be more than $65. And, um, you know, at the end of the five years, we'll be at about what they are right now. And they don't appreciate me saying that, but <laughs> how it is. So, you know, we, ha we have to increase the rates. I mean, if we're gonna keep the service that we have right now, and we have no real choice about keeping the service we have right now. I mean, we are providing secondary wastewater treatment um, we are, you know, um, we have a, a big collection system, which, you know, we have to maintain. We clean all the sewers, uh, usually once a year. Many of them we clean more than once a year. We have uh, inspectors that are going out and being sure that, you know, the businesses aren't putting more improper waste into the system that we can't treat, um, and of course, you know, we have to provide the level of treatment that we're providing uh, by law and by our environmental responsibilities. Um, I say here that the fees are modest. Um, I mean, you, you could look at over a five-year period that they could be significant, and I'm sure to some people they will be, uh, but it is a, such a critical uh, environmental system that I don't think there's um, any choice. And uh, this is a slide, I wasn't actually gonna show it to you, but this is a slide that does have some comparisons to some other um, districts in the, in the local area. I mean, um, Pacifica is quite a bit more. Uh, Watsonville is significantly less. Uh, probably has to do mostly with the fact that they have some very large uh, rural users um, that uh, they um, that helps quite a bit. 
Scotts Valley is about the same, and you can just look at the list. We're 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 doing pretty good in terms of our um, in terms of our rate when you look at similar sized and similar um, locations. So, um, any questions? Are we gonna let's see the best picture. <laughs> I like that one. That is our secondary effluent, our final. It's uh, the only thing that happens after that is it goes through the UV disinfection. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate the presentation. Are there any questions from the council at this time? Councilmember Myers. Um, Steve, I noticed in the staff report that there was a rate increase in July uh, 1st, 2017. I was just curious what that rate increase was and sort of it was less i think it was three or is it three percent. years oh no that rate increase was a that was part of a four-year increase okay and so that was a four-year increase um that was the last time we came to council for an increase so it was a four-year increase so um it would have been like the four previous years would have had an increase and that was the last increase but you you don't recall sort of the kind of the range of 3% typical. Uh, I think similar. that those increases, actually, you know what? I have that. Right <laughs> that increases, those increases were five, 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 and two and a half. And um, with the low sewer, uh, the, the lower, basically, user, yeah. the people who aren't, do, do you find those customers? Yes, okay. yes we so find you, all of those customers. you identify them? They do not have to apply. It is automatically done by our uh, IT okay. um, billing department. Thank you. And on, that's tied to the water use, isn't it? it, it, it you're it a low is, water it, user? It is tied to the water use during the winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions from council? You mentioned laundromats. Uh, where, where, do, where do they fit in uh, on that table? Uh, Laundry high mats, strength uh, user? Uh, I believe they're in the medium strength user. Mm -hmm. and Pretty um, much anyone who uses water as part of their business is typically like a, a small coffee shop that's not really doing dishes, yeah. or maybe he's just doing a few, um, things like that. How did you come to 80 uh, hotel motels? Well, um, <clears throat> when we developed the rate, um, that was just how many hotel motels were in this, uh, were in the system. Looking at UCSC, um, it's hard, it's hard, a little bit hard to see. It's a tiny font. Uh, it is on one of the colored pages that we have. Um, this is what they, this is an interesting example. So they pay right now, 51,000, almost 52,000 a month. Is that a, that's a month. And then it's, it'll top out with this rate increase at 67,000? Yes. I mean, I, you tell me, but yes, that sounds right. Yeah. Is it the single largest water user in the city? Absolutely, by far. By far. It used to be Silicon Systems, but now it's UCSC. And did you know the, the kind of like numbers they're using? Did we take any of that in consideration if they're going to grow by 10,000? So five thousand. They more. are they are one, the one sewage. Um, they are the one customer that actually has a meter on their wastewater discharge. So um, they are metered. So as they use more, uh, as they generate more wastewater, um, they, their bill goes up. And I just want to add um, that. I really appreciate um, the responses that uh, the Director of Public Works, Mark Dettel, has, has offered um, during, uh, we had kind of a back and forth on emails this weekend. Um, it's always great when you can get a department out on the weekend uh, to get to respond. It's, it's wonderful. Um, and I will say most of them do. Uh, so I was really concerned, a couple questions. Um, this is well above the cost of living, um, these increases, in, in somebody's paycheck. Um, there is, there's nothing for low income discount, and the senior discount was, you know, I think, responded to, you just responded to it. It's good that we, they don't have to apply for it, that we actually go out and find the low uh, sewage users. Right. Um, 
I just, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard going from, you know, that, mu that much of a percentage increase, even though the county is already there, you know, it's still, uh, you know, our, our, our customers haven't contemplated yet that, that yet. Is there, it, um, Director Dettel mentioned something about we can't, because of 218, we cannot give low income <laughs> users uh, a lower rate, but we can use the general fund, uh, if the general fund wants to pay the difference. I, I didn't exactly understand that. Go for it. Do you, do you want to respond and then maybe, or I'll-, I'll I, I can respond off. to Council Member Crone when, whenever you like. Okay, go ahead, I'm not. Is your, is your question related to the question that, okay. Yeah, Council just um, would the, so, and if the council were to decide event that we decided we wanted to provide some kind of subsidy because recognizing the Prop 218 <coughs> restriction, would it have to come out of the general fund or could it come out of water enterprise fund? So Mr. Conduct, I think, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I think you know, Tony will answer that. So, I mean, the way I look at it is that, um, that providing sewer service in terms of the fees that are collected in order to, to provide that service is sort of a zero sum game uh, where the full cost is attributed or is is paid for by the by the ratepayers, and under Proposition 218, the amount of the and uh, Proposition 218 defines different types of fees into different classifications, and and sewer service is is considered a property related fee or charge. So it's under the the um, rules set forth in Section Six of Article 13D, uh, which is Prop 218. Um, what it says is that the amount of the fees cannot exceed the proportionate cost of service attributable to each parcel that's subject to the fee. And so um, if, you, if you look at that in terms of what an individual rate payer pays and the cost of service study analyzes, it is how much does it cost to provide sewer service to each um, connection that is using the sewer service and were the council to take some portion of those ratepayer funds um, and, and use them to subsidize rates for a certain class of users, then that amount can't be attributed to the parcels that are paying the fees. So that type of a subsidy is not permitted under Proposition 218. Uh, and that's why the director's uh, reply, in my opinion, correctly states that um, the council's free to do that. You're not prohibited from by Prop 218 from doing it. You just can't use um, other ratepayer funds to subsidize, um, you know, a low income tier of, uh, of fees. Okay. Council Member Glover, did you have a question? My, my question was pertaining to the impact just because it is disconcerting. I, I really appreciate the, the uh, presentation and I, Totally understand the importance of uh, recycle or the water treatment and how we can use that with our wastewater and sewage management. I am concerned though about the cost of living and how this could impact low-income families, especially with the stagnant wages that we see and the unregulated housing market that we have right now. Uh, it could detrimentally <coughs> impact people's finances because I was just doing some rough math here, and I, I will reiterate just rough math. I'm a people person, not a math person, but at for a year at the, the total of the $17.80 increase by 2023, uh, then that's an increase of $213 a year on of someone's living expenses. So I just want to put that out there and express concern and I would be interested since now, um, I know it's not possible because of 218 for us to offer different levels of uh, costs for rates, I would be interested in exploring uh, ways that we may be able to supplement or subsidize uh, the cost for low income people. Mr. Kandari, did you have something you wanted to add? Or? I, 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 I share the concerns expressed by Council Member Glover. I don't believe there was a question though, and okay. I, I'm happy to respond to any questions. <coughs> um, thank you for the presentation, by the way. Uh, I was just curious as to whether or not um, if homes or businesses are to put in any kind of water saving mechanisms, would that be able to allow them to shift down in terms of um, consideration for how much they'd be paying? Well, we, <clears throat> for, for businesses, yes. I mean, if the business 
you, we, so we take a business and we assume that, like for example, for most businesses, we assume that 80% of the water that they used is going to be wastewater and 20% is used for whatever, irrigation and things like that. And so um, their, their cost per year, so especially let's say a restaurant, their cost per year is closely related to how much water they use, especially the larger water users like restaurants or maybe the wineries or the new beer um, you know, producers. So you know, um, they do save based on that. For, uh, for residents, um, the only time that that would really save is if they were able to get to the low sewage uh, generator. So that would be the only way that they would really be saving um, if they, you know, reduce their uh, use. Sure. Mark Duddell, Public Works Director. I just add that we do have a significant portion of our um, residents that are in that group. So that is, uh, I believe it's about. I think it's four. 4,000. 4,000, so it's not, you know, it's not a hard to reach level, but it just does recognize, so if they did significant water savings, that could put them into that group if they're close. And we do an automatic, you know, um, check of their water use so that it puts them in automatically. They don't have to apply. Thanks. Councilman Matthews. I just want to speak to that. It's easy. All you have to do is use less water, and then it appears on your water bill at some point. Congratulations, you're a low, low right. water user. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I mean, it's true. Uh, it's, it's a really nice, it's a really good program, um, you know, and the argument in the water department would be that it's, it's harder for your normal person, you know, a family is gonna, it's just gonna be really hard to reach, you know, it's, it's just not really for your typical, you know, four unit family and, you know, it's just, it's pretty hard. But we have 4,000 customers that are in that category. Um, and like I said, it can be a multiple, it can be multifamily units, um, which I think, you know, more than half are in, but there are a fair amount of single family uh, units that are in that uh, category. And it is probably the biggest question that comes over to customer service is about, I didn't, I'm not in it anymore, or, you know, or how can I get in it, you know? So it does happen where people go in and out of it um, based on their water use. One more question. Um, last question, is um, is that water consumption rate, like for each of those categories, fixed, and how is that projected to change over time? Just to get a sense of like, if people are in one category now, um, is that percentage level going to shift for the, and then result in them becoming at another level? For the residential or for the residential? Yeah, for the residential, it, it would shift each each year. You can qualify for the low uh, water, uh, low sewage producer. So each year they can shift. Um, the rate itself is going to go up evenly for each category. So if you're a low water, uh, low sewage producer now, your rate will go up. Uh, you know the the two dollars I think um, next year and then um, it'll go up, you know, $2 the year after, um, and it'll continue to do that, and if you're a single family resident, it'll go up the $3 each year, and, you know, so they'll, it'll always be uh, relative to each other. You know? I think I might have misspoke on that. Um, what I was referring to is the amount of waste that's produced, so I don't know what, for example, whatever the low sewage production rate is right now, is that expected to change adjust no. over time, okay. No, no, that would not, okay. yeah, sorry, yeah, that's, you're right. So, I'm just gonna open up to public oh, comment. Did go you ahead, go ahead. Okay, is there any member of the community who'd like to address the council on this item? This is item number 19 on our agenda. Okay, seeing none, we'll return back to the council for action deliberation, or did you have a further Thanks. question? Um, we have 8,000, it says here, the um, uh, multifamily, those are apartments? Well, exactly. uh, any, let's see, anyone who, it, it, could be a, it could be a duplex. It actually, um, we actually put into that a single family resident with a ADU. 
we consider that two multi-residential units, even though it's really one single family and one multi-residential, we, we consider it two multi-residential units. Would it have two meters or no, just one? Does, it, we, do not, we, do not, we do not judge on meters. So it would be <coughs> one meter, um, but their low water usage would be based on two units. So whatever they use would be divided by two. Out of the 8,000, how many um, do you think are single meters for a bunch of either apartments? Yeah, um, I think idea? we've got, I think about, it's how many, it's 4,000 and I think that it's, um, I don't know if I have that. I, I do somewhere, but it's. I think it's around 60 to 70 percent of that. That 8,000 is a, a, a single meter. Yeah. Well, yeah, I just have the number of connections. So for 4,000, the number of con connections is 2,800. Some of them are single families, so. Because the issue is like, I'm, <laughs> There's the incentives for, for um, you know, apartment dwellers to save water. You know, you know, there's none there if they're not paying it directly. If it's, but then I've heard during this whole rent control thing that people were getting their rents increased, and the justification was be beyond what the two percent was the water use. They said, oh, uh, now you, we're going to charge you for water. It was it was kind of insidious, but. I'm just wondering how do we give incentives to um, single, you know, studio apartments, you know, that are all in the same meter? Well, I, I mean, a couple of things there. I mean, in, the incentive here is for low sewage generating. Um, it is true that the water department has, over the years, has been encouraging uh, meters per unit instead of one master meter. But that doesn't um, really, um, well, I guess that would change things for us also, but. but that, that kind of gets to my question, appreciate yeah. it. But I, if I could address that, it's just, these are fixed costs, so they don't vary every month, they're fixed for the year. So mm -hmm. um, so it, it's per unit, so I think, I don't know there's justification to say that your sewer rate's gonna vary, so we're gonna raise your it's once the rate set for that year, then that's what it is. So I'm, you know, it's per unit. Doesn't matter how much you use. Right. Just to follow up, uh, sort of a follow up on the um, the ability to subsidize ratepayers. While I think it is true that the ability to um, get in a water conservation tier might motivate someone to use less water, thereby generate less. Um, sewage discharge. Um, the legal basis for doing so is that it actually costs less to provide the service to people who use less water yeah. and, and not um, per se uh, just to encourage people to use less water. And I think if I remember correctly in 2017, we talked a little bit about the just the sort of the cost of living challenges and the imbalance and trying to support people in ways that we can. And so I think that would be, we, I think if I'm here kind of getting a sense of the council, I think there is interest in exploring what that could look like in the most legally kind of a sound way, whether it be an application type program or such like that. Um, Cause I think I remember that conversation, I don't know for the council members that were with me then um, taking place then knowing that, you know, it is that cost of living imbalance that we're seeking to kind of bridge. Um, and we have aging infrastructure and a lot of needs, so how to balance that. But um, I think now would be the time for action and deliberation if, if Well, this is merely just at a public hearing, and this has been very informative, but I will go ahead and move that we set the public hearing based on the proposed um, uh, rate increases and other information presented to us. Second. Okay. Ooh, that was tough. That was really good. That was all okay. about like same time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say motion by Councilmember Matthew, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Any further discussion, Councilmember? So the public hasn't heard any of this yet, right? This is just here, and now we're going to send out postcards and stuff. Cor correct. So we might be hearing something. When yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole idea. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I. 
also just want to give big props for this thing that went out from the wastewater, this newsletter, which I thought was fantastic in speaking to the quality of service, the both the environmental and um, public health benefits, et cetera, et cetera. It was great. And I got to assume you're going to be doing, in addition to the notices, a good deal more visibility, public education. And, and um, both the, the aging infrastructure, the um, rising standards for environmental quality to protect public health and environment, all of those are just undeniable. You got to do that. So um, it's, it's one of those utilities we take for granted, but um, good work on this. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Okay, <laughs> so we're moving right along to item number 20, which is the um, budget adjust adjustments and information on the city's financial status. And we have uh, Tracy and uh, Marcus here. Marcus is giving me great budget justice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Testing me. Uh, th thank you, Mayor, Council members. We're here for part two of three part series on uh, primer on government finance. Th today we're focusing on a little deeper dive into the city's operations. Uh, we, part one, we recapped kind of governmental financial trends at a high level, what's going on in the state of California, what's going on in the country. Today we're diving a little bit deeper into the city. And part three, in a couple weeks, we're gonna focus in our unfunded needs within our capital investment program. Um, I have, I'm Marcus Pimentel, your finance director. I have with me, I'm proud to have with me Tracy Cole, our uh, uh, principal management analyst, uh, focusing on the budget. And she's going to help with our presentation. We had planned to do a combo presentation a couple weeks ago. And if you remember, we, we moved pretty quickly. So I'm going to share the show a little bit with her, with her tonight. So we, we thought because we moved so quickly, we want to at least start with a, a quick recap of a few of the slides, a few of the themes from last time just to orientate you. So that'll be the first few minutes of our presentation. Trace will be covering most of that. And then we'll get into what we're calling our big five topics that you should know about as a council members and what our community should be aware of. There's certainly other things and there's certainly deeper dives that we would be more than happy to go do, but we want to start at this level to make sure we're understanding at a high level what's going on in the city. So we're, we're gonna spend some time just orientating yourselves with a few of our financial reports, our budget document and how that's orientated, our annual financial report called our CAFR, our audited financial statement. Um, one of our reports that you see frequently, our investment portfolio report. So we're gonna focus on some high level just reports that we do. Then we're gonna jump down into our what we call our first full service plus concept and just orientating you to how much we do as a city of Santa Cruz. Uh, more above and beyond most cities might maybe our size. We do a lot of services beyond our boundaries. You've heard a few of them just prior in the prior session. We'll talk a little bit about the complexities of our reporting structure. We're bigger than a few checkbooks or QuickBooks. We're a very complex a business, um, service provider, nonprofit, hodgepodge of, 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 of funds. We also provide accounting and services beyond our city. So we do um, records for other another agency, which is a whole other com complex system. So we have, we're a very complex dynamic uh, model from a funding standpoint. We'll spend some time a little bit on our financial trends. And again, we can probably spend three hours on our financial trends, but we're, we're carving some, maybe we'll do a deeper dive in there. And we'll finish with the keys to fiscal health. All told, I used, would joke about, we have 40 slides, we do have 40 slides. <laughs> we're on time here. Uh, yes. Uh, so we'll, we might skip through a few pretty quickly. Some maybe we'll come back to March 12th, depending on timing. And we would definitely want to pause about every five or eight slides just to see if, if there are questions. We don't want to move beyond where you might be with questions because we're going to be shifting from different topic to topic. So that's my long, elongated intro and we'll get going. 
So Marcus, for clarification, yes. you'll go ahead and let us know when you're ready for us to ask questions yes. in terms of policy. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so why, why now we had this concept, of, really it's preparing for our May 8th budget study session leading up to our May 28th budget adoption. So we wanna start bringing you content, high level content so you're, you're orientated to what's coming ahead. We'll also wanna prepare for community engagement and presentations we'll be doing to you and other community partners and stakeholders and community members. This is a second of three study sessions. We plan to release our budget, our entire budget in April. So you'll see that document and the public will see that document in April. And you'll have hopefully close to a month before the budget hearings, if not at least three or four weeks. We also plan on publishing as they become available more reference materials online. And we're working with the, your city council budget ad hoc committee on some possible new financial reporting structures and, and tools. So that's something we're gonna be exploring over these next couple months. It's aggressive, but you know, it's something we, we wanna try to endeavor for. So that's our goal. And I'll turn the floor over to Tracy. Thank you, Marcus. So um, as Marcus mentioned, I'm just gonna recap a few of the items that we kind of rushed through the last time uh, we were here a couple weeks ago. Um, we're just gonna talk a little bit about the local government is not in a boom cycle, um, how the state is again uh, doubling our pension payments, um, our decreasing tax bases, we'll talk a little bit about that, um, the projected economic slowdown and um, some unreasonably low reserve levels. <clears throat> So why consider reductions in an economic boom? So local government is not in a boom cycle. Um, you'll see in a later slide that many, many other cities are facing the same budget issues as the city of Santa Cruz. Um, the state, again, will uh, double our pension payments to backfill for state pension investment shortfalls. Um, decreasing tax bases, our sales tax, utility users, gas tax, those types of taxes, uh, those are declining at this at time or staying very stagnant. Um, projected economic slowdown um, is just coming up and unreasonably low reserve levels. Again, we talked about uh, th there's no disaster contingency and our general fund reserve is only at 10%. Okay, projecting economic slowdown in the next 12 months. Right now we are in uh, the second longest expansion, um, soon to be the longest period of economic expansion in just a couple of months. Um, and why we feel the slowdown is coming, we've got a <coughs> regional housing crisis that's, that's going on. Um, the economy must see continued increases in consumer spending. Um, as increases, interest rates increase, um, as consumers will see their debt increase, their car payments, credit card payments, those types of things, housing, school debt. And we also have the federal and state government um, threats to our, uh, our city with uh, our impact fees and the fact that we're a sanctuary city. So I have to do this one. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about this. Um, pension investments, we, we hit on this a lot, but it's really important to understand we are part of the state's pension system. Most government agencies in the state of California are part of a pension system. Most government agencies throughout the country are part of a statewide pension system. Our pension system is underfunded by nearly 30%. They have a $144 billion, billion dollar shortfall in their pension system. It doesn't mean the benefit is unaffordable. If you look at the benefits between miscellaneous and public safety, there's there's some arguments and debates over the, the cost of public safety, but generally the benefit of itself is not what's causing this current issue. It's, it's the lack of investment returns. When we've done some general analysis of comparing CalPERS investments versus what they usually have done in prior economic recovery cycles, and then compare CalPERS investment cycles to what the market other index funds, eight different index funds, how they're individually doing, and we average those. And these are, you know, your run of the mill, normal index funds, not necessarily your high aggressive funds. Both of those scenarios turn out that CalPERS could be super funded right now instead of shortfall, which would mean we wouldn't have had seen our rates double and then poised to double again. So it isn't that we're saying that the benefits are not the, there's too much discussion on the benefit side, and there's not enough discussion on the investment side. And that's been a topic that hasn't necessarily got enough traction. And it's something that we've talked about as staff with the League of California Cities. We've talked about as staff with CalPERS. And it's something we, we, we wanna finish tonight with a little bit of support and see if we can get a direction to have this council take uh, direct staff and or yourselves to write a letter and, and appeal to the State Investment Board CalPERS to reconsider their investment objectives 
if, again, if they just follow the market or what they've done in the past, we wouldn't be in this situation as we are right now. And that's unfortunate. You know, we're, we're doing what we can to be prepared, but there are a lot of government agencies who just don't have the resources or flexibilities we're gonna have. So I'm worried about a lot of my peer, of our peer cities throughout the state as we go forward. So I just wanted to pause on that. Again, just a reminder, if it weren't for the investment shortfalls, not just the losses of 789, but their shortfalls since then in the recovery period, we wouldn't be having most of our financial issues right now. We'd be able to talk about how we're investing new resources into new programs. But because of that, we're seeing our rates double and double to 11 to $12 million a year. Again, just let that settle in. 11 to $12 million a year more every year to maintain this cost because of those shortfalls. That's a lot of new revenue that we have to find to offset. So that, that's a big, big issue for us. Okay, then we have declining and eroding revenues. This is a pretty uh, great slide. Um, we, we talk about our sales tax um, staying very stagnant or uh, declining. Tangible items that we used to buy, CDs, uh, sales tax programs, DVDs, games, we're now like downloading all of these online and, and doing this all online now. So there's no, um, there's no sales tax that are associated with those anymore. Um, we have aging baby boomers um, that are shifting their spending to non-taxable health care <coughs> and services. Um, and the law is still playing catch up for all those online sales um, that we love to do. Um, gas tax. Um, we have the ride sharing uh, reduces our fuel sales and the energy efficient cars. And you know, while they're great for the environment, that does decrease our, um, our gas tax that we receive. And then franchise and utility tax. Um, of course, online streaming is replacing our, our cable and you know, we'd rather just watch Netflix instead of you know, getting our, our cable through a provider. And um, <laughs> landline phones are, are vanishing, although I still have one, but a lot of people are getting rid of their landline phones and taking cell phones instead. And we are facing higher risks and occurrences of emergency failures. Um, some of these pictures are, are pretty, um, pretty crazy to look at. Um, I can't believe that Westcliff one every time I look at it. Um, but every, the city, every year the city has some major project that wasn't budgeted for, and it would be really great if we had funds set aside for this, uh, these types of emergencies or other general funds uh, CIP projects. Um, but we just don't have that at this time. Okay, and this is a slide that we've used before, but we've updated for the current fiscal year. And as you can see, with a lot of our comparison cities, um, we adopted a structurally balanced budget for fiscal year 19, but a lot of the other cities were not so fortunate. Um, and this is something that's happening across the state. Pausing for questions? So we'll pause there, that's <laughs> part one. Again, just to recap, we've talked about these themes a lot over the last couple of years. We pushed through it pretty quickly a couple of weeks ago, but just want to pause and see if there's any questions or comments on. Are there any questions from the council at this time? Or? Um, it's the sixth slide and you talked about um, the slowdown, federal and state government threats, and you mentioned impact fees. Can you just explain what those are? Yeah, certainly the, the feds are not in a position, our current administration, on looking to how they can help local government. That's not necessarily their, their poise. So we're concerned about a lot of initiatives where, you know, they've threatened that sanctuary, if you're a sanctuary city, then this is gonna happen. So that's a concern. But at the state level, in, in the sense of kind of similar story to what we're talking about, fuel taxes, that's a, there's a good story coming out of the state, but part of it could jeopardize a funding source for us. We rely on impact fees, traffic impact fees, building impact fees, parks relies on certain fees to help fund capital projects. And the state wants to a, either restrict or stop our ability to as barriers Levy impact to housing, fees. is that how they're? Yes, as, yeah, as a way okay. to lower the cost of housing. So that's that's a current, we'll see where the legislation goes, but that, that's a current new a new thing that we're tracking on because impact fees are a critical source for us to fund capital. Councilmember Brown? Uh, so on slide five and the slide four, I believe you repeat just to make sure we get it. Um, unreasonably low reserve levels at 10% at of the general fund um, reserve available. Could, and can you just remind us what a reasonable reserve would be? Yeah, and we'll, we'll come back to the, okay. the reserves a little bit later on in okay. this presentation. But bottom line is we, we set as the minimum floor to a two-month reserve a couple years ago. 
So 16.7% that's a minimum. Our recommendation, the, the data showed us to, that we should be looking at a 24 to 28% range for our city of our size and our complexity. So we, we don't, we're not quite at the recommended level. And then we modified a reserve portfolio to take advantage of some paying down PERS. So we've actually reduced our general fund reserve from 16 to down to 10%. So we can use that, that extra money to pay down some higher rate credit card debt essentially. Yeah, uh, I don't know if there's a long or short answer, hopefully short. Um, the, why is CalPERS not investing the way uh, you might want them to? Stick short. I can talk on this for a long time. They've made political and staff, I'm filtering. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like, they've made choices that they look bad when they lost so much money, so they don't wanna look bad again. But they made that choice during a recovery period. They've also made choices, political choices, as they've always done, to let's not invest in these funds or these things. That's always happened. But I think they've gotten ultra conservative because they're human beings and they don't want to look bad again. And so they don't want to put their fund at risk. By doing so, they've picked a wrong time to do that. Coming out of the worst recession period is the wrong time to be ultra conservative. Maybe not ultra conservative, but clearly too conservative. Who's on that board? Is there? Is it? It's a board that makes that decision. Yeah, yeah they're appointed by uh, the governor. No, they're independently elected through the Calper system. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm. Got it. Go ahead. And on new stuff. So there's five big topics we want to review today, and I'm just going to jump on in instead of keep babbling. So there's a lot of financial reports. Some you see, some, some you don't, but there's a lot of reports that we do as a city. Some departments do reports. We do a lot of reports in the finance department. So I wanted to at least reference a few reports and, and jump into a, a deeper dive on a few of them. Certainly you've seen, and we've talked about the city's annual budget a lot, but we wanna orientate you a little bit about how the do document's constructed and what's in there and what's important. What we don't talk often a, a lot is about our audited financial statements, our comprehensive annual financial report, our CAFR. I, can remember the 90s and a little bit of the 2000s when we would present these reports regularly to the councils and we'd be able to spend time breaking them down. In 2004, the reports were restructured in a way that made them more user-friendly to banks and bondholders and bond rating companies and less user-friendly for community members and council members. And we've since see, seen more changes in that document that unfortunately it's, it's a harder document to get to and to translate, meaning it's a 215 page, 215 page document audited by an independent firm <coughs> to its validity. And you have to get to page 51 to start seeing something that makes sense. And then you go about another 100 pages and you get to about 167 and you see some more things that make sense. And then in, in the beginning, in the middle, there's a lot of stuff that's really, 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 you know, accounting ease. You really have to understand the dynamics of it. You have to back this out and take out this number. Or so it just doesn't make sense. So it's a report that we, we, we struggle with, a way of how we can communicate that, but we build it into our budget. We build in some of that data into our budget as far as projected fund balances, our cash flow statements. So we build that into our models, but it's a harder report that we can, you know, it's not as easy as it used to be to digest. Happy to spend time on it whenever you want, really happy to, <laughs> just ask. But, it, but I wanna let you know it's a document we have out there, it's on our website. And every now and then a customer, customer, client, community member does call, you know, generally they have some banking background and they ask questions about it, but it's a report that's there, but it's, it's really tough to digest. It opens with mandated management discussion and analysis, but it takes things like blending your water fund and mixing that with the general fund and then talking about the aggregate and none of that makes sense because you can't talk about a general fund and the water fund in the same paragraph because you have to break them apart to make, to make it make sense. So it's a really hard report to digest. I'm gonna pull back a little bit because I sound like I'm bashing my own profession, but I just wanna point out why we don't talk about it a lot because it's just, it, it's a very difficult tool, but we do build a lot of that data into our budget. We do spend a lot of time doing our mid-year presentations. This year we're doing even more so, and we do a lot of budget presentations uh, around the budget time. So there's other information that we present during the year. And then there's some other reports, one that we'll talk a little bit about our investment report that you see on a monthly basis. You see a grants report that comes to you on a regular, regular basis on an update on grants that we're looking at. There's a state, uh, state controls report required by our state of California. There's numerous different versions of those reports that we do, aggregate on the city, down to road projects, down to some other 
places, and then we do we have reports that we work with bond rate agencies. These are some of the headline reports that from time to time we'll talk to you about, but just wanna call attention to these headliners. There's a lot more below the details and we'd be happy to drill down into any of them, but we thought we'd just do an orientation to our budget. So the last year's budget are awarded by the National Association of Finance Officers Association, very high, high accreditation, received its award for 2018, so we're proud about that. But some of the things you'll find in the report that you wanna pay attention to are our budget and brief. It's a newer edition we brought in a couple years ago. Two, we try to keep that to two pages. The information changes, but it's meant to be the two pages that you would need to have or want to have on different data points. So if there's something you're curious about or you think we should have in the budget, let us know and we'll get that on that page because it's meant to be the two pages that if you carry around with you then, you, then you have that. There's also the two messages, the city manager's message and the finance director's message, both with diff different themes. The city manager's message provides that strategic level overview of what's happening now at the high level and then what's coming in the years ahead. And the finance director is typically more numbers based, what's going on in the deficit, what's going on in the budget document. So there's kind of those three reports that are good to make sure you're aware of and looking at. Within the budget, there's a highlight of every department in the city. Uh, Tracy, do you remember which department we're looking at? <coughs> With finance. The best one. Yeah, finance, sorry. <laughs> um, this, these are examples of what's in there, and I don't mean to drill, we're not gonna drill down, I mean, we're not gonna ask you to read that. <coughs> But within the document, you get you get information about their goals, their accomplishments. You get the numbers about their, what their allocations are. You see pictures generally of who, who's in the departments. You get a get a sense of who they are. Pulling up a little bit higher, examples of what's in the budget schedule for each department. You'll get three years of data, the prior year actuals, the current year adopted, amended, and estimated actual budget, and then next year's proposed budget. You'll be seeing this in a, in in April, you'll see the more version, recent version of this. Within the schedule, you'll see the highlight of the total operations of each department by its major classifications, personnel and, and capital and, and operating costs. And then you can also see what its net general fund cost is to the city. So in this case, the finance department, although our total department cost is 8.3 million, our general fund cost is 2.8 million. So you, you can see the total cost of the department to run other activities but our core general fund cost starts at 2.8 million and then goes down even after that, after we start charging our time out to other operations. You'll also see the position count in every department. So these, just wanted to highlight the different details you'll see on this page that are helpful information to have. We'll talk more deeply in a couple weeks on our CIP. We wanna highlight different things in our CIP. You'll see last year's audit, last year's information. You'll see the current year's proposed budget. You'll see the next three years or next five years, what we plan to have in, in project costs. And you also get narrative, little narrative descriptions for every project, at least a couple paragraphs. So you have a little bit of an overview of what that project is doing. And projects are grouped by fund, department, and then whether they're new or existing projects. And we'll talk more about that later on. Getting back to that CAFR thing, I do wanna point out there are some good stuff in there. And things you might pay attention to that people are always surprised with is we have demographic data on the city in, in the audit, 10 years of data on that in the city. So we have average median income, we have um, population data. We, have, we, we, we compile information so that if somebody outside the city was looking at it, they get a sense of who we are. You, you also see 10 years of revenue expenditure information. You, you can get information on the top property owners. We list the top property owners in there, their assessed valuations. Um, so there's different data in towards the back, back, back of the report, page 167 and on. Like I said, page 51's good, page 167 through 215, there's some good stuff in there. Um, also forget, in the statistical section, we also track some high level indicators like calls for service, acreage, uh, number of classes that we offer in the Parks and Rec program over a 10 year period, so there's some other data. Moving on to our last of our reports we wanted to cover tonight is every month we, we bring to you a portfolio investment report. And what this does is it aggregates, it's the total aggregate of cash we have in the city. So at this point in time, we might have, a, we generally carry between 100 and $120 million in cash, depending on a capital project needs, payroll needs and other things that fluctuates. Our choice is either park that money in the bank and just let $100 million earn nothing or go out and invest it. So we have, we don't have an investment department. We don't have investment staff. We have other duties as assigned team that comes together and, and makes decisions on investments. So. 
what's important about this is council often has told us we don't wanna invest in these things. We wanna divest from these things. So what you'll see in this report is where we're investing every little transaction at and you can have assurances that we're not investing in stocks that you don't want or banks that you don't want or projects you don't want. So that's probably the most important thing of that report. It just affirms that we're adhering to council direction and policies. Yes, yeah. that? and that's slide eight of eight, so okay. we're done with this um, section. Yeah. Is that the thing? Sorry, Sounds I should like have asked to be no, recognized. Like I, I just, just quickly, is there, a, is there a committee? I mean, you know, CalPERS has sort of its investment. Which, who serves sort of as our investment sort of deciders, I guess I want to say? We have kind of two point. tiers. We have a, a not, informal group of investment bankers, brokers, that we contact. They're not part, we don't pay them money. They don't get a fee from us, but we call them with advice. They always want our service. So we will we'll inquire to what different people recommending in the market. We also check with our peers where people are putting their proceeds at. And then that comes down to our group within the finance department. We have a, a kind of a group structure that has different subject matter experts and we look at the different investment portfolios. Ultimately, there's kind of three criteria in any investment strategy. Yield, how much do you want to make? Cash flow, how soon do you need mo your money? And security, how safe is, is your investment? So we start with safety. You know, this is taxpayer dollars. We, we, we ultimately wanna be safe with our money. We next go to liquidity, there's the next prior, priority option. We wanna stay flexible. We don't wanna park all of our money in a 10-year bond and then have to wait 10 years to get access to it. And our third and last priority, unfortunately, is yield because that's our priority. So yield is our last concern. So that drives our portfolio down to a place where right now we're earning 2%. I can remember a time for evermore where you had, you can expect three to 4% rate of return in your yield for a, a similar type conservative portfolio. The market changed, interest rates went down to zero or negative. And so for a 10 year period, we've seen rates about 1% instead of 4%. That's cost us about $3 million a year. That just because of the Fed's decisions on pricing, when they bring down their rates, the things we invest in, the safer things, the two year, five year, 10 year loans, those rates drive down. So our portfolio hasn't been doing great, but really nobody else has either. So we'd have to get really bold and start going into the stock market or investing in crazy things like housing projects, which we don't wanna do, to really attract, go chase yield. And that's just not our primary mission is chasing yield. It's um, liquidity and security. Thank you for that. <coughs> Any other questions from council at this time? All right, I probably over explained that and I can do I that. So you throw things yeah. at me to let me know you're done. I'm done. So moving into our, our second, uh, only two slides here. So one, two, and then we'll quest, pause for questions. Just a, a full service plus, this is quick, you know this, you've been around, you've, you're from this community. We are a full service plus city. What this first slide does is it, it talks about our departments as units and then what their impact is on the general fund. So police, fire, parks and recreation, city manager, clerk, IT, and most of planning community development. They start with mostly general fund operations. Now, sometimes they charge their staff out to other projects and. and they, they, their cost goes down a little bit, but they start with their predominantly general fund, predominantly primary service departments. And then you get down some of our other departments, economic development, they also part of our housing, they have manage our housing program, so they get to, some of their staff live in the housing, not general fund. Finance, we're about 50-50 split. We, we, we have a lot of staff doing work for a lot of people outside of the city, uh, outside of the general fund, um, as does HR. HR has a, a bigger split and they also manage workers' comp and some other funds and then you get down to public works and then water ultimately, that there's no general fund impact in, in water. Public works has the road and transportation projects that's largely in facilities, that's largely their general fund impact. So that's, that's kind of our core service and you can see the, the hierarchy, who, who are predominantly general fund departments and which ones are, are lesser impacted. What is more interesting in, in, is, is this graphic that we keep working on and keep tweaking, but if you just assume that those core services like every city has is that center thing, you look around and you look at all the things that we do well above and beyond what most cities might. So m not all cities have utilities. A lot of cities rely on districts. Those are all managed by the city. And then our utilities go beyond our city districts. We serve well beyond our boundaries. Um, some cities have fire departments, some cities don't. Some cities have police departments, some cities don't. Very few cities contract out fire and bring in other fire services. We bring in UC Santa Cruz's fire into our operations. I, I'm, also not aware of another city that contracts out accounting services and, and financial reporting and budget services. We do that for the li county library system. We, we do all their accounting, we do all their budgeting. That's, we do their purchasing, that's atypical. That's not a very normal model. 
So those are examples of things. We have a very active marine safety program. We also have a lifeguard services we provide down the coastline, not just within the city, that's through contracts. So we're very complex, very big thought. How can we do things more efficiently for the whole community, not just Santa Cruz approach? So just want to let that settle. That makes us very complicated in doing things that not a lot of cities do, and it makes some of our staff in finance and accounting get a little purchasing, like, this is different. Why We have two different boards. We have a separate JPA board of its own entity, and they want different purchasing <coughs> roles and processes than the city council, and, and they're all the same employees. So it, we have a lot of complexities in our system, but I think we end up with a more cost-effective for the whole community system. But it does make us uh, very unique. I'll pause there. Again, all stuff you should know. <laughs> of course we are unique. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Any questions at this time? Yeah. Okay. Apologize for the slide. When it starts, it makes sense, and then when I look at it, I go, boy, this is this is wonky. So we'll work on this. But what it what it really does, it we're trying to graphically present how complex we are from a funding financial accounting model. So we have our traditional general fund that has some uniqueness. You have your typical departments that we're all used to. You can take an accountant from you know a city in Los Angeles or a small town, La Quinta out in Palm Springs or um, out, in or out in Fresno and drop them here. And they're used to doing accounting for a police department, a fire department. Those are typical things. Also in our general fund, we have trusts that not all cities do. We have the public trust. We have the economic development trust. Those are a little unique. Then we drop into our enterprise funds. They have an entirely different business system. They're a four, sort of a for-profit cover your cost system that funds their own capital. And they're accounted for as a business unit. So instead of treating them as a cash flow cost accounting system. We treat them as a full business as if they're a granite construction or a private uh, PG&E <coughs> utility. So we do a whole n another set of books for our, all of our enterprises, which makes us very complex. Every individual fund, water fund, storm water fund, wastewater fund, they have their own fund accounting structure. So every operation has its almost its own accounting system that's blended in with us. And their cash is restricted, legally restricted, and, and a lot of different reasons why we re restrict them. You know, our utilities are, are restricted for this purpose. Some of our grants have different types of restrictions. So it makes it very complex when you bring things together and you end up with a pile of cash that might be 114 million in our portfolio. But a lot of it is restricted money for utility, pro utility funds, enterprise operations or grants. So it, it makes us a very complex animal. So we have a hard time communicating that to the public. You know, you don't find a business that's on one hand delivering security services, AKA our police department, and another hand delivering utility services like our water and out of the same company, that's atypical. But we do that. And so we, 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 it's hard for us to tell our fiscal story because we're so complex. So that's what we're trying to get out and we'll work on the slide on that. And I just said all that, so I'm not gonna go there, but that's just a listing of the, or for different revenue restrictions. I'll pause there to see if there's anything, again, just kind of orientation, common sense stuff, I think. What's well, also important, hey, are we growing? I have family members, I have colleagues, I have peers. They look at the city of Santa Cruz and they look at their own staff and go, wow, you guys have a lot of staff. Wow, you're, you guys are always growing staff. Wow, that's that, that. Well, if you look to 2002, so this chart tracks back to 2002 and rolls forward to 2019. It's just snapshots in time so you can see the trend lines. We are just a little bit over our 2002 staffing, 756 in the city to 781 now. If you've backed out the 10 UCSC firefighters, you backed out the nine uh, rangers, and you backed out the five unfunded cop positions, we're essentially at our 2002 staffing levels. What isn't at the 2002 staffing levels is the service expectations. 2002, there were fax machines, mail letters, and we were talking about this earlier <coughs> last week. We're right wrong, we're indifferent. You might have three weeks lag time between when you got it, when you received it, and then when you opened it up and came to your desk and you responded to it. Now you have Twitter, you have emails, I mean, and instantly respond. And that's not a bad thing, it just, the service levels have changed. Our community has grown. We've become more complex in our service delivery. We've bring, brought on more programs into the city, not less. So since 2002, our service levels has really increased, but our staffing is still effectively at our 2002 staffing level. So it, it just, provides a little bit of context, and certainly if you look down in our Parks and Rec Department, 144 people in 2002, and they're, they're nowhere near that now, 87. So we, most, of, most of our growth have, has come out of our utility funds, especially our water fund, uh, most recently in our public works utility funds. 
outside of that, we've really not had a lot of growth in our city as a position count. We've done, a, and I'm really proud of this, to be able to communicate this. This is really this council's and the city manager's and prior city manager's lens on it. Like, being smart with where we're investing our money and really thinking about what the bang for the buck is. So this city's tried to do a lot of smart things with very little staffing. So that's the storyline here. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> So um, last year in 2018, um, management partners came on board and uh, did this really great analysis um, of uh, us compared to other cities. Um, we looked at the property and sales tax and transients and tax revenue. We're all on par with our other uh, comparable cities. Um, our business license tax is far below our peers, although our utility tax is um, above. Our police, fire, and parks and recreation staffing is on par with our, our peers or slightly below. And the administrative staffing that we have here in the city of Santa Cruz is one of the lowest. Um, and that's our city manager, who finance, human resources, information technology. And this, um, the full presentation is out on our uh, budget website. So if any of you feel you have the time, uh, check it out. It's, it's some really good information. And just to reiterate, this was a big lift that we did last year, and, and we like to update the data probably every two or three years. It, 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 we, we love to do it every month, but just the resources and the time may not get there. But we set, we established a really good baseline of how we compare and what are some B indicators, and that's going to help us as we move forward into things like performance measures that are based on the council's strategic goals that didn't inform the work plan. So ultimately, we want to get to the type of performance measures that make sense. A quick comment about that. Just from the room. Yeah. Um, thanks. Just and you know the so the the process of of doing the um, looking at those financial trends and also the comparisons with other communities was really illuminating. And so I thank you for getting that started. And I think we also talked about looking at some additional indicators as well as in the future. And so I just wanted to make sure we captured that. And I think that'll happen through our work on the <coughs> subcommittee and like, coming back to council. It sounds sure. uh, that sounds accurate to my recollection. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's you know, future indicators should be driven by the council's strategic goals. Right. The last goals were 2015, so I think when the new goals are set up, then you you decide which indicators you want to measure the progress on those goals. So I think we're we're in that place where we're getting closer to that certainly. So this is a hard slide for us because we're humble and we don't we don't do a good job telling our good stories or when, when things go good and when we get awards we say great job and we put it on the wall and we don't tell anybody about it let those types of things we want to pause a little bit and just talk about our our, our projection models because we, we do a lot of projections now we've reoriented ourselves instead of producing reports from like three months ago we we look out three five seven years and we start projecting out where things are going. We've been reinvesting how we do um, reporting in our department. And we've come out with a, 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 a forecast model that, best thing to do with our forecast models and say, well, how good are they? You know, how credible are they? And uh, it's a luck, but also a lot of hard work and a, a lot of thought goes into that. What we're, we're showing in this slide, and it's a little busy, but if you ignore the sections in yellow and you show that, that corridor in the middle, Within the last five years, our forecasts for the general fund have been nearly perfect. You know, again, a lot of hard work, some luck, but nearly perfect. I mean, 97% accuracy, 99% accuracy, 99.8% accuracy two years in a row. That's pretty darn good. To, to, we, we joke, like, if you think of your own self and your own business or your own family and you say today's February 26th, talk to your family and say, hey, by July of 2020, how much do you think we'll have spent in a year and then see what your guess is today versus July 2020. Well, you know, we've hit 99% accuracy in our models before, and that's great. But it gives us worry because our models are showing red. <laughs> and so that, that's good that our forecast has been pretty credible, pretty realistic, but it's also bad because our models are, are indicating we've got a lot of work still yet to do. Um, so I just want to comment on that. Again, we're, we'll, we're not afraid of saying when, when they're a little skew. In 2018, we probably overprojected expenditures. We thought we were gonna do a lot more, but our shift focused on certain areas, and so maybe we weren't as aggressive with doing other things, and we didn't have as much staffing replacement as we thought. In 2014, 
our revenues outperformed our expectations. That was the year of the year long drought and we ended up with a tourism all year long and our TOT revenue went nuts. We had a really good TOT year that year, but then TOT returned back to a normal level. So we're happy to say when we missed it, but by and large our projections have done reasonably really well and we're, we're proud of that and we'll let you know when they're not and we'll keep tinkering and, and adjusting. Getting into some data, you know, it's hard to talk up here, not get into financial trends. We want to spend these next two slides at least snapshotting. Again, we could do deep dives into a lot of our operations and we're happy to whenever you want, but at least give you some high level stuff of what's going on in our operations. So this first chart is police and fire, blue police, red fire, and layered on with their calls for service. So if you go back to 2009 through 2018, you can look at their total costs in the department and then their calls for service on the line above and they happen to correlate each other, and that's great. On the other hand, sometimes it doesn't matter. It, it, it's just coincidence that they correlate, but it, it, what, what we see here is that the police department from 2009 to 2018, their budget really hasn't increased a whole lot. They, they dropped a little bit and then came up a little bit more, but they don't have a, a, a growth trend line, yet their calls for service going back to 2009 at nearly 80,000 versus 2018, over 100,000, their calls for service has increased dramatically but their costs necessarily haven't kept up at the same place. Now, that's just an example of a different conversation that we'll have about performance indicators because you might look at that and say, well, that's interesting, but you could also look at that and say, well, shouldn't we, we be tracking FTE counts versus service indicators and what, what's been their staffing count? What's been their part-time staffing? What's their overtime costs? So A, it's a storyline that's interesting, and but B, it's also to be careful of when we get to that performance measure, it's really important to choose the right measures because you'll look at data and it might be telling you a story that it's the wrong story. So A, if I've confused you enough, this is interesting. And what it shows you is that police department's done a pretty good job controlling their costs while their cost for service has gone up. So that's probably the narrative there. When you look at fire, their trajectory of their budget has more closely matched the calls for service increase. So you see their calls for service about uh, 7,000 and now at 9,000 and their budget almost track exactly at that same level. What that doesn't correlate is UCSC coming on board. So that's an anomaly in their data that increased their budget, but doesn't necessarily significantly increase their calls for service, it, certainly a little bit. Um, but A, again, a good story there that you, you don't see these budgets doubling or tripling or even increasing at an exponential value. They're really holding steady on their total operations since 2009. So those are, those are both good stories, positive stories there. Here's a busy slide for you. Sorry about that. I can be known to get too busy. But what is on the slide, if you think of the left side of it with the arrow that points you down below, it, the top left corner tracks overtime. So that's overtime across the entire city. So all operations citywide, including the library, water departments. What people often might assume is we have, we, we, we use a lot of overtime in any city. And in this particular city, we don't. Uh, police and fires where you typically see overtime, that's exactly where we see overtime in this city. So if you think through our water department, they've had a big lift. Um, they've had storms, 17 and 18. They've had drought, they've had a lot of projects, yet their, their overtime is, hasn't tripled in cost. Same with public works, they've had a lot of demand for projects and yet you don't see their overtime because the city does a really smart job of how do we manage staffing and how do we limit our costs and overtime. So once you get beyond police and fire, you get down to water, public works, a little bit in parks for recreation. And then the rest of the city, I had to actually increase the parameters of that graph to see anything for the rest of the city because the numbers are so small. So that's just showing that we really don't rely on overtime in this city outside of police and fire. And then that fire jump, when you look at that, you'll see certain levels in their first couple of years and then it, it came up to a new level about 1.1 1, 1 .1 to 1 1.5 and then this last year it spiked up. Well, that chart below kind of tells that story. In this last year, in 2018, we had almost a million dollars of reimbursable overtime where we were sending people around the state to help with fires. So that, that's a big, big storyline in what was going on in that department's overtime. So it's, it's also telling the story that you can't just look at the total numbers, you have to drill down to see what's, what's going on and what's driving that. So just wanted to pause there. The charts on the right are just like, well, we, we, I don't know, <laughs> it got a little too carried away. But there, there are some of our other departments, Parks and Recreation, Public Works, Planning, Community Development, and all of our administrative services where you can see their trend lines over that same period of where their actual costs were and, and where they're at. 
And outside of uh, Parks and Rec that has had seen some increases, but a, a lot of that is known stuff that we were doing, you haven't seen a lot of dramatic changes in, in total costs in, across the city. Similar to that position we looked at before. Marcus, I have a quick question about yeah. the overtime. For the strike team reimbursements for fire, is that reimbursable by the state since they're being deployed? Yes. Okay. Yep. And, and it'll, it'll probably end up being more than that when you ac sure. yeah. accumulate it, because it, for us, that was our accounting period. But if we got monies in October or November, it, it's not reflected in, in, in those June of 2018 numbers. So it'll probably end up being slightly higher than that. This is another way we've talked about PERS. This is another way talking about their, their impact of their investment. So this is tracking uh, forward where we think PERS rates are gonna be 2018 through 2022. And again, they've already doubled. So we were already paying double more than what we used to just a few years ago. They're on a trajectory to double once again over the next five years. And what you're seeing is that blue bar on top is that shortfall investment. It's, if we backed out what our costs would be under a normal situation, it's those pink and red bars below and it's that blue growing bar on top that is what we're having to repay because of their shortfall in investments. Not, again, not just their losses, but their shortfall in investments. So it's just another way of looking at how big those numbers are and how hard it is, how much revenue we have to increase revenue or finding revenues just to keep up with these costs. And then we finish with just a, a quick snapshot of where our, our revenues are, our top tax revenues in the city are doing property tax, sales tax, utility users, and tax, transit occupancy. And what you'll see is sales tax and UT flat. You know, sales tax in a recovery period, you, you would expect seven, eight, nine percent growth rates. And we're not seeing that, we're seeing three, four, fives. And there's a growth rate in, in 2019, that's the measure of sales tax that was approved this past June. But outside of that, we're not projecting major increases in sales tax because the industry's changed. Consumers are spending money differently, and that's unfortunate because that tax base is not at the same growth rate that we'd like to see it at. We're, and I'll just comment on the TOT growth. We're not projecting major annual increases in TOT growth. What we're projecting is construction projects. So hotel <laughs> finishing construction coming online and ultimately a lobby here coming online. So we're, the, the significant growth there is more staggered to as more properties come online, we're expecting higher TOT returns to the city. And then finishing with, oh. If I could maybe just, yeah. we have a question by Councilor. Sure. Um, I'm just curious on the projection on the property tax. Is that, or I'm, wait, is nope. that property? No. Nope. Yeah. Yep. Is that purely based on uh, rising property values yeah. pretty much? Yeah. So the assessment. It, it, so you well, don't, you see the. The line keep going. Yes, and, and we haven't factored in what the impact would be from a recession on our local housing market. And realistically, Santa Cruz hasn't been impacted terribly by recessions in the past. The past two, you haven't seen housing prices drop. The greatest recession we hold steady. So typically this still is a desirable place to live and typically there's still, the values still hold themselves around here. So we're, we're assuming that there'll be continued increases in the property tax base. Thank you. And what you see on this last slide are some of our other tax revenues. Oh, sorry. Just one question. Yes. Please. What do you attribute the utility user tax growth to, like the, the slow in that growth? It, it's a similar thing in that more and more people are gonna go away from their landline phones, away from their Comcast cable packages, and away from other things that are currently taxable in uti utility user's tax. If we're gonna end up with a utility user's tax, it's really our own tax on water, garbage. Uh, solid waste, you'll see less and less happening until there's reform to capture these new industries that are replacing it. So we're, we're just continue, continue to assume that there's be less and less growth there. That's unfortunate. <coughs> and where that conversation, if you look down, we've added a new revenue that doesn't exist because it's not, it's called lost sales. <laughs> we just wanted to, Conservatively, very conservatively, the number could be easily double. What if revenue behaved more normally? And very conservatively, we looked at sales tax and we looked at TOT and utility users tax, and it's largely in sales tax, but we think very conservatively, there'd be at least a million dollars more in our general fund every year if things were behaving more normally, if we weren't having these disruptions in this new economy, if, if, our, if our tax system was reformed in a timely manner. That's, that's a very conservative, it's gonna be a lot larger than that, but that's the type of impact that we're seeing in our revenue base, at least a million dollars a year, if not much higher. 
when, and we put cannabis here because it comes up a lot. It's still a very small revenue base. It's talked about a lot, certainly, but it, it, it's not, you know, it's not a large revenue base for the city at this point in time. And where our projections um, have it at a, we're looking at a scenario where it's plausible that the rates, there might be pressure to reduce, reduce our rates going in the future. So that's why you see the spike in, in what would be this year's rate and then a possible reduction in, in our out years. I'll pause there. That was kind of expenditures, revenue in the general fund. Again, happy to go deeper and dive, but uncertain about how deep we want to go in this forum. Slide 32, we're almost there, home stretch. So we wanted to talk a little bit about our fiscal keys. And my colleague here, Tracy, we were talking about the slide and we both agree there's a better way of presenting it and we'll get there eventually. But what we wanted to what we wanted to talk about is our reserves and where our reserves are currently and where we're where we might want to look at things in the future. So currently our reserves, our pension reserve and our primary general fund reserves are, are funded where they need to be. When we look at our twenty nineteen budget and they're based on a percent of operations, ten and six percent. 10% and then 6.7%, we are funded our reserves. So that's a good thing. We, we were meeting our reserve requirements. When we look at our two trusts in the general fund, our city public trust and our economic development trust, together they're short about $2 million because over the last several years we've, we've eaten down some of our, we, we, we're, we're project red ink and we've been hitting some red ink from the past. So we're, we're starting to take away some of our flexibility in our, in our trust funds. We're hopeful that will turn but at this point in time, it, it, what we're highlighting here is we're at a place where we don't have a lot of excess cash in the general fund. In fact, we're probably, we are clearly short in our trust where they need to be. And we don't have funding set aside for natural disasters. Now this has become more alerting when you see the impact of fires and, and what it can do, not to a whole community, but even a portion of our community. We are certainly susceptible to that. Drought, susceptible to that, floods, climate change, very susceptible to that. So we don't have the money it would take to wait 18 months for FEMA to get reimbursed for, to give us that, that bandwidth. Our reserves that we talk about above, those are meant to help us as economies change and we can buy ourselves some time instead of doing what we had to do, most government agencies had to do in seven and eight and go to completely to closing services, shutting down services almost overnight. And so what those reserves are meant to do is give us a little flexibility in planning ahead and being strategic about that but we don't have those type of reserves to give us the bandwidth if we have an unexpected large disaster. And we certainly don't have what I call opportunity reserves, an operating reserve that if something comes up that we wanna spend one time money on, that we can do that easily. We don't have that setting aside. And a lot of operations, that's becoming a more best practice of thinking about not just your minimum reserves, but what type of opportunity reserves you might wanna have in case something comes up, because it always does. Every year there's something that unexpected a council request, a community request. It might be good to have a start building that reserve up. So those are the types of things we think we're short, let alone we might want to increase our reserves because we anticipate a recession coming. So now would be the time to start being prepared for that. Again, our story is at least we're funded at our minimum levels. We have other reserves in the city. So I want to just highlight the water water operations did a really nice job several years ago and they worked with us and talked to us about it the types of targets they want to have, and they set up an equivalent stabilization reserve. They looked at a 90-day operating reserve, and they do have an emergency reserve for that unexpected what, in case this happens, because they're very susceptible to climate change issues. More rain, less rain, and rain is money, no rain is no money. But consumers, anyways. Where we don't have a lot of reserves is what you heard today is our sewer funds, our solid waste, our parking, our facility, our wharf. We have other major operations that have large capital investments that we don't have targeted reserve levels yet. And th those might be a place that we're talking with operating departments about where those numbers might come in at. The good news is, is if you think of four keys to fiscal health, and these are things that many cities, when they get into trouble, don't follow well. They don't monitor their cash balances. They don't look out for what, what are the cash needs three years, five years out. They don't, they, they might have budgets that rely on one-time resources to fund operations. We don't do that. They, they don't look for the, far enough out and they don't invest enough time in developing models that are reasonable for projecting out. And they, they're not thinking about their service level. What does the community need and where are gaps? And I think this city, we can confidently say in those boxes, we hit those boxes. Now, the level of might be subject to the 
the lens of the person looking at it. But by and large, I would say that if I had to be asked, we hit squarely all those boxes. We're doing a good job with our long range planning. Sure, we could do better. We're doing a really good job with our budgets. We can do better. We're doing a good job managing our cash and we're doing a reasonably good job of listening to the community and what their service expectations are and we're trying to be responsive. And the, the main point here is government agencies all too often will delay the hard decisions, kick the can down the road and let somebody else figure it out. And this city for, has a legacy, decades, decades, decades of making the hard decisions, looking forward and planning ahead. So kudos, kudos to this council and, and city manager and all their leadership. Finishing with a lot of things we did last year and things we've had in place, we adopted a lot of budget policies that do things like, hey, one-time revenue should be used for one-time resources. Don't use one-time revenue to fund three years of ongoing resources. Adopt on-time budgets, build and rely on good forecasts. We've adopt, this council adopted and set some good guidelines in place last year and have pre previously used other guidelines to give us a strong foundation for how we manage ourselves fiduciarily. So we have a strong, fiscal fiduciary responsibility you do as elected officials and we do as staff to guide you on that. So kudos to all the work that's been done in that space. Finishing almost to the 36 of 40, recapping, that's things I've, we just went over. I could repeat them, I won't. <laughs> um, recapping the bigger picture of things, we're not in a, local government is not in a boom cycle. Our economy is doing well, we're not because of a lot of the things we've talked about. Um, we have concerns about what the state's investment issues are having with our pension costs and those numbers and that impact on our ability to deliver services. We're concerned that tax reform hasn't kept up with where it could be. And ultimately we, we want, as a recession is coming is as we have risk to other things, now would be the time to start preparing for yourselves with cash reserves, just in case things start happening. We can be responsive and we don't have to be so knee jerk in, in our reactions. Finishing with what's next, just as a preview of what's coming, and then there are some actions we need you to do. March 12th, we're gonna spend some more time in our capital investment program, more about our unfunded needs and just where, where that's at. We wanna work, continue to work with our community, our city council ad hoc budget committee on a lot of fronts, whether it's focus groups, uh, community orientations, presentations of this council, we wanna be listening and making sure that our, how we're presenting it to you and to our community is reasonable and, and makes sense. And of course we have April 22nd is our expected date the budget will be released. May 8th, a full day of budget hearings. You know, have your coffee, do your run, be alert. It's gonna be a good day. And then May 28th is our target for budget adoption. So that's the formal end of our presentation. I could pause there before we talk about actions that are in the actual staff report. Let's go ahead and pause. We'll do questions, maybe open it up to public comment and then we'll do the actual recommendations. Are we planning on doing um a committee as we did last time of folks from the community to look at the budget? Is that, gonna, is, is that in there or is that not? Yeah. Engage budget folks. Okay, I, yeah. but I, there's, there's no date on it yet or anything? We're still working on that. On okay, the and um, Marcus, I had one other question about um, uh, city public trust. Would, if, uh, would Sky Park monies go in there? Yes, th that's what that trust was created for, was specifically Sky Park. Okay, and you don't have anything going in there in 2019? We, we, we know we're close, but um, that will help. Thanks. Aren't any further questions at this time? We'll go ahead and ask if there's any member of the community who wants to address the council on this item. This is item number 20 in our, no, yes, item number 20 in our agenda packet. <coughs> Just really quick, sorry. Um, on 20, um, slide 24, big five, financial trends. Um, I'm just, sorry, just wondering, um, in terms of authorized positions, are we talking here about um, full-time equivalent, temporary? I mean, because I'm looking at Parks and Rec and that looks quite low, but I'm yes, assuming it, that's, that's it, FTEs. It excludes our temporary staff. Okay, because thank you. Okay. And I was remiss, I left a slide short of just recapping what's in our staff report, sorry about that. But we have some budget cleanup items kind of summarized as things that we would normally clean up, no impact to the general fund or no impact to the operating funds, just reallocations, carbon fund projects, some CDBG and HUD changes based on the final HUD report. We have a parks and rec utility equipment that was scheduled to be in the budget and just didn't get into the document you saw last June. And that was our, our error. And there's recognizing that we had some insurance reimbursements, again, no change um, for a claim that we have. We have about 600,000 that came in to reimburse the city. Those are budget actions instead of re required. And then we have some funding 
requ requirements. Certainly, we, our homeless support services have, ex you know, we haven't have a, a full adopted budget for that type of program, so we need to recognize those costs. We have some FEMA storm, FEMA 2017 typo storm damage administration that we have to do. We have our election costs, they're done. We had elections and the costs are higher than we had. And then we have an urgent project on our war with our fire marine, marine headquarters that has, it's ultimately the project building might be a $4 million project. We're trying to do a Band-Aid of about 80,000 to address some roof and some other significant issues to make a usable space for our employees who are there. So those are the actions that are in the budget. Great, thank you, Marcus. Staff report. Okay. Sorry about that. No, no, no problem. We'll go ahead and have public comment, and we'll have two minutes. Okay. Good afternoon, Bruce Van Allen, Santa Cruz. Um, I, I hope this is the right item. I saw this as some budget adjustments, and that's a little different from this very impressive um, presentation. Um, but I'm, are you actually making some budget adjustments? Because I have a request, if you are. Will you go ahead and pause on it? Yep. Yes, this, okay. this encompasses okay. the budget. So um, I'm here to ask you to reinstate the um, uh, funding that was adopted by a previous city council for tenant legal services. And at that time it was $15,000. What the group that was forming the, the legal services um, nonprofit found was that at that level of funding, um, a, a little could be done to get started and collect some data and do some outreach, but to actually have available attorney time, it actually, it really didn't um, fit within a $15,000 budget. And so um, we would also, we'd like to request that the 15,000 originally um, appropriated be reinstated and, and um, available and an additional 15,000. We have um, a couple attorneys who are willing to work at, at uh, reduced rates. Um, this services to provide um, tenants with legal support. Um, even and that additional amount would pay for very little courtroom time by attorneys. So mainly this is about attorneys who are available to advise. And um, uh, this is a service that no one is providing right now. Um, the California Rural Legal Assistance does have their own services. Um, and I know they're hoping to get funded to be back in the city, but they really do a different kind of thing from what this little um, uh, nonprofit is, is aimed at doing. So it's not really a duplication of services. Um, happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you. Good afternoon, council. Um, I'm here to um, hopefully infuse some opportunity for creative thinking. There was an excellent conference up at Peace United Church this weekend on um, reimagining God in the face of, God in nature in the face of extinction. So it sounds like it might not relate at all, but I wanted to use a concept that I heard from there. It was an excellent conference, very intellectual, very cerebral, so a little hard to follow in some ways, but it was excellent for helping us to really understand how to create platforms that are going to then translate into real tools to help us face these problems of climate change and extinction. So what I just wanted to say is, um, in light of that, if you can put that aside for a moment, um, with one thing I'm gonna extract, it's the concept of undercommons. So undercommons are things like animals, homeless people, uh, trees, forests, um, our water, with kind of the idea that all these things are helpful as long as they're healthy and we're all interrelated. So it might be a new concept, so just hang with me for a minute. I remember a few years back when Chief Vogel stepped up and said something like 1,996 tickets given out to homeless people, less than 2% resulted in any kind of payment whatsoever. Also another thing that I've seen is a constant beefing up of the parks and rangers walking down the uh, Pacific Avenue and all over our parks with guns. It's another police force. I'd like to see the city really analyze as long, and also the ambassador staff that also are there to help, but actually most of these people are harassing and moving homeless people on endlessly. I would like to know the actual cost of this and could we come up with creative programs, something perhaps along the lines of the downtown street teams, only with paying minimum wage, of course, for people to be employed and to revalue these things into our economy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other members of the public interested? In okay. We'll go ahead and return it back to Council for Action and Deliberation, Council Member Brown. So I, I do want to make a comment. Um, actually, I have one, que another question that I um, would like, or one question that I'd like to ask, and then I want to make a comment. So the the question is, um, 
related to the um, the budget adjustments. Um, I just want to ask the question about the $183,000 in FEMA services being charged to the general fund. I'm going to assume that those could have been charged to enterprise funds. Were they, were we able to charge them to enterprise funds? But I'm just wondering why it's all going to general fund given the nature of uh, what the FEMA funds are generally used for. FEMA funds have been hitting many funds. These particular ones were more attributed to cleanup costs attributed to general fund services like streets, debris removal, beach debris removal. So it's more about these types of costs and the projects we're reimbursing for our general fund. Oh, other other FEMA costs were for water and other things were. Were covered in yep. the other, okay. Thank you. And so I just wanted to uh, make a statement here about the request from Tenant Sanctuary. As uh, some of you will recall, we approved uh, la around this time last year, uh, a little earlier, uh, an allocation of uh, $15,000 with the expectation that we might continue that funding for um, tenants' legal services. And um, for a variety of reasons, it's taken some time to um, for, for the organization to, um, for the group to be able to um, actually deliver those services and then um, also for us to then actually release the funding. I, I was apprised of this in early January that we needed to actually take action in order to make those funds available now that they're ready to um, use them. Given that we had um, some tentative agreement to um, provide these funds in a, in an, on an ongoing basis, and, and this was really 15,000 for half a year over a year ago, um, you know, I would, um, I would, I want to support um, the request that's been made by the, the group, um, especially given that they're not in a position to um, provide any meaningful legal services without having attorney time. And given that um, the city has has not um, provided, has, does not ha support that in any other way, we we've talked, as you all know, about um, the what tenants are facing um, in our community, and um, I think that it's a it's a small amount, uh, it's a small request that would. Um, certainly get them up and running. It would also provide us with some baseline da um, data um, for future budget considerations um, when we, we talk about next year's budget. Um, if they actually were operating, we could see, you know, we talk about, um, you know, uh, data-driven decision-making, um, evidence-based, um, that would give us some um, some measure of what they can do with the, the, that funding and, and what we might be able to do in the future. So I would support, um, I know this is not the time to start um, asking for additional funds, but I think this is kind of a special circumstance um, given that history and the challenges that we've had in um, getting it up and running. So I, I wanna support um, that uh, request um, when we um, make the motion to amend. I'd, I'd like to include that as well. If I can, my recollection, like others. my recollection on that specific one was that we would be um, moving ahead with appropriating the money in the mid-year budget, given that there wasn't uh, the services used last year, and then revisit the process. Is that does that seem accurate to you? Okay, so I, I I'm not sure I've I've who we were working with on it was Casey, but maybe Bonnie or or somebody re can remember that fifteen thousand that we allocated in terms of the project. Okay, so I think it'd be important to revisit where we are, where the process is, what the expectation is, and then looking at, but I do remember the tentative understanding of that there wasn't the ability to get up and running. So there was this sort of understanding we wanted to roll that over for sure, that 15,000. But Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm generally sympathetic, but I would prefer that we just put that one off for two weeks so we can get the background. Yeah. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, but I do want to, I, I would like for the, the council to consider that request. So are you making a motion to move the item with that direction or? I guess it would be, so I, I'd, if, I, I don't wanna cut off other comments about the budget or any other questions that folks might have, but I'm, yeah. Okay, Council Member Myers. Uh, actually, uh, so yeah, I would be supportive as well. I, I talked with Casey quite a bit about the, the status of that. So, um, you know, but if we can maybe do it next, or, you know, 
But I had a question for Marcus on the 83,384 for the, some of the expenditures related to the homeless camp. Yes. Um, is there any way that any of that could be re realized back to us through any of the existing HEAP or cash funding or any of that? Is there any, is anyone looking into that? Yeah, so it, it's something we're gonna be coordinating with the city manager's office. They're certainly been submitting their requests and see what the criteria is because we've got a lot of possible eligible projects. Great, thank you. Councilor Burkow. Yeah, um, the liability insurance thing, could you go over that a little bit? And you'd mentioned in an email about a JPA pool, maybe explain a little bit what that's about and how we are insured. Yep, thank you, happy to. I like assume this had to do with the, uh, the Sean Arlt case. Yes. Like most government agencies, we're self-insured because the cost to insure a police department or a fire department would be astronomical. So we self-insure ourselves. Essentially, we set aside money, we, we cover claims, and we adjudicated them ourselves instead of having an insurance broker. We participate in a risk pool so that there's we pull our money together. And so anyone, if we have a you know a catastrophic claim, we can leverage other people's money so it doesn't traumatize any one agency. So we participate in a pool with other cities. We call, we put our funds together and we help cover each other's larger claims. So the first million dollars for us, we pay ourselves. It feels like a, a, a large deductible. Anything above a million, we can go to the pool and request a reimbursement back to us because we, we pay into the pool. And, and so that's what you're seeing here. We paid the first million and we have another 600,000 that went above the million that's coming back to us. In the long run, because we're all share each other's risk, we'll ultimately pay the full amount over a long period of time because we're all self-insured. But it, it feels kind of like an insurance program with a million dollar deductible, but there's some nuance there. Where does the million show up in all these numbers? It, it doesn't, it's, we have an amount that we set aside every year for an un, unanticipated loss. Mm -hmm. Every year we have certain claims. So we had that, we have a budget for unanticipated losses. This one, you know, consumed above and beyond our, our budget allocation. Uh, the other question I has, why did um, the election expenses go so far uh, um, above what we had budgeted? What had we budgeted? Yeah, I, I think when the budget initially came in, things like the citizens initiative that the city has to pay the cost for wasn't contemplated, you know, nine months earlier when the budget was firstly originally being put together. So that's a big, big driver. Do you remember the placeholder that we had there? The placeholder, so the placeholder, again, going back in time, we ended up doing a special election in June, and then we had the Citizens Initiative in November. We had had a placeholder for one election cost, not two, and then we had one that came earlier. So I can't remember the exact amount, but we had enough to cover most of the June costs, but not all of it, and then the leftover in November. Okay, thanks. And I had a question about the $1,000 for the Ocean Villa. I think uh, maybe Tony Elliott could um, respond to that or somebody from Parks and Rec possibly. Um, just wondering how this money was spent. I guess it was spent uh, as part of a vegetation debris removal, um, but I'm not understanding, does it happen every year or uh, is this a one-time expense? Yep, Tony Elliott, Parks and Recreation. This is an ongoing annual expense. Uh, this, excuse me, I've got chewing gum. Um, we, uh, this is an ongoing agreement that we have with Oceanville HOA. Uh, but basically, um, this has to do with the maintenance of the path. It's just an earth and walking path along the fence uh, near Jesse Street Marsh. Um, we do the work on behalf of the HOA. Um, we do that in partnership with Cal Fire. Uh, and leverage uh, employee, various employees or various opportunities uh, through CAL FIRE. For example, uh, the um, uh, corrections department, CAL FIRE will work with them to do the maintenance on the trail. So it's an ongoing project. Basically how this works, this budget item, uh, we will do the work and then we will bill the HOA. So this is the budgeted item to allow us to do that work. And so the thousand will go to CAL FIRE or go to the corrections department or? It would go through CAL FIRE, which is our contract, uh, and then a payment to the to the workers, to the labor, whoever that might be. And you don't know offhand how much they make an hour? I do not. Okay, thanks. I don't know if we can get, get that amount, possibly, if we could figure out how much the, the, I guess, the inmates who do the work, how much they would be making in an hour. We can get that information, yeah. Thanks. Councilman Brown? 
Well, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I am ready to move to amend the fiscal year 2019 budget. Um, with the, I'll, I'll just rather than listing them with the rec, the categories listed in the staff report and authorize the city manager to allocate um, within the applicable fund the budgetary changes to the appropriate accounting classifications to approve related applicant applicable transfers. And I would like to include in this motion, if it's appropriate, a direction to staff to um, come back to us to, for consideration of the tenants' legal services request at our um, February 20, or sorry, March 12th meeting. Second. It already is the 26th. <laughs> so that's a motion by Councilmember uh, Brown, seconded by Councilmember Crone. Uh, no, no. So that's fine. I sure I went back and checked, and it's scheduled to come back. So that was the plan. So yes. Okay. Thank Great. You. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. The, the last thing, if it's your di direction decision, we'll, we're probably going to do it anyways. But didn't want wanted to recommend that you consider a motion to direct Calpers oh, yeah. to oh. reconsider their investment strategies. They might be already doing that, but anything along that sp All space would be right. helpful. I'll I'll move that the city issue a letter to Calpers to. Uh, direct them to... Uh, and I may deliver that personally. Yes, please. I'll, I'll, second, that. <laughs> I'll second that motion. And I would say, as with the earlier motion, that we share our correspondence with League of California Cities and other local jurisdictions to get them to weigh in as well. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Glover? Um, I'd maybe suggest a potentially f friendly amendment to add the language of uh, encouraging CalPERS to make responsible investments that represent the values that we as a city support specifically um, there's an issue with their investment in the private prison industry that is a big topic of discussion around the state and i think it would be great if we're writing them a letter to encourage them to increase investments that we stipulate that we do not support the investment in the private prison industry or oil i'll, ex I'll accept the, the the amendment. Okay, did you catch the amendment? Okay, I will as well. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. All right. All right, so um, item number 21. And um, so this is the affordable housing inclusionary ordinance amendment. And this is the one I think, Tony, if you wanted to make your uh, statement, yeah. do you want? Yeah, I was just going to say if you, we were going to, um, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings and I were going to provide a, um, a short report, um, but given correspondence earlier today, I wanted to hear from the uh, city attorney first. Okay, so prior to having the report, we'll have the city attorney. Yes, thank you, um, <coughs> Mayor Watkins, members of the city council. Uh, earlier today, I, I sent the council a, uh, a message that attached a letter that we received yes, late yesterday from the Whitworth Park and Law Firm. As you know, they are representing the petitioners in the Hatch Pomerantz lawsuit, which is the Pacific Laurel project being developed by Dev, DevCon uh, that the council approved back in December. One of the causes of action in that um, lawsuit challenges the city council's decision in September and October timeframe to amend its inclusionary housing uh, ordinance in several respects. Um, this item is, as I read it, uh, in part, uh, a desire, expresses a desire to revisit that ordinance that was adopted last year and to rescind some of the provisions of that, of that ordinance. Um, <clears throat> and in particular, the, the lawsuit uh, challenges the 2018 ordinance on the grounds that it uh, allegedly does not conform to the requirements of Measure O, the affordable housing uh, provision that was enacted by the voters in 1979 that says that 15 percent of the residences, residences, residences uh, constructed in the city should be affordable to persons of average income. Um, so that's an issue in that litigation and against that backdrop uh, when I read the staff report, which un unfortunately I didn't have an opportunity to do before the agenda packet went out, uh, this uh, particular uh, statement caught my eye, which refers to the 2018 amendments and says, 
These amendments undermine the intention of the voters in passing measure O and in addition are contrary to the city's goal of increasing the number of affordable housing units for its residents. I'm not gonna comment on whether or not I agree or disagree with um, the statement, particularly with, ref res with respect to um, dis discerning the intention of voters by reference to something other than the actual text of the measure itself. But that being said, the letter that we received from the Whitworth Park and Law Firm recommends that the issues in the case, namely the validity of the 2018 ordinance and the validity of the council's decision approving the DEVCON project should be bifurcated for purposes of negotiating a settlement whereby the city would agree to amend its ordinance more or less along the lines suggested by this agenda item. And since we just received that yesterday, I thought it would be prudent for the council to uh, table this item now until you've had an opportunity to discuss what's proposed in the context of the pending litigation. So that's the right reason for the recommendation um, to table at this time. Council Member Brown. Oh, um, thank you for uh, the clarification. And, you know, I'll just say, um, just a quick comment. You know, it's unfortunate that we received this communication um, without enough time to actually make the decision to consider this in closed session earlier today, um, rather than um, deferring it. And um, you know, I had been in conversation with um, Mr. Parkin prior to the lawsuit about um, you know the our inclusionary housing ordinance, and then those conversations um, ceased um, when the lawsuit was filed. So I wasn't sure where, I, I, I just found out when when you found out um, where um, their counsel was looking to go. So um, given that, you know, and I'm, I'll just again express my impatience about um, getting this heard and, um, you know, it, uh, deliberated upon by the, the current counsel. But under these circumstances, I do think it is prudent to, um, uh, refer this to closed session on our March 12th agenda. I do also want to ask though, if I can, is it possible right now to clarify? Because I, like I said, I'm impatient and um, I, um, I understand that the planning commission meets the first and third Wednesday or Thursdays, excuse me. Um, so this would only, if the planning commission is indeed meeting on March 21st, this might result in only a two week delay in getting it to um, to the Planning Commission, as I think you all understand that the, the um, recommendation here today was not a, you know, a specific review of an ordinance or, or a reading of the ordinance, but um, rather to uh, refer it to the Planning Commission for um, their recommendation. Um, and so that would just trigger a whole series of, of actions that might be taken and, and other conversations. So um, I just don't want it to, you know, if, if, we, if we delay Will the Planning Commission be meeting? Can you, could you know? I mean, they're, they're scheduled to, but um, they don't always meet every other, you know, every, tw twice a month. So, okay, thank we'll you, here Mr. Butler. Sorry. That's okay. I was looking at you because you okay. control our calendar, but it's <laughs> not necessarily all of them. Thanks. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, the Planning Director. And yes, we do have those times reserved. Um, I would say, however, that uh, there's some work that needs to go into this. And so um, when we get the Council direction, we will pursue that um, uh, that Planning Commission hearing date and subsequent um, Council dates as expeditiously as possible. We haven't scheduled you know, what those dates may be, and it may involve some uh, consultant work in advance, depending on the Council direction. And another question, if we do uh, refer it to closed session, can we also place an item on the open uh, agenda so that we can consider it based upon what we, our discussion in closed session? We wouldn't have to delay another two weeks. That, that's up to the pleasure of the council. Thank you. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Cronin and then Councilmember Matthews. If it sounds like we might make a motion to table this, so I was just hoping to make a few comments if it's gonna come back. Um, so one would um, just be that if we could get the full text of the ordinance, we have just certain sections, and so I'd like to see sort of a red line version if possible, just to be able to read the whole ordinance through with. And then um, in my research on the ordinance that was passed in September, 
I just want to make sure that, um, or Tony, I would request in your review of the ordinance, um, just making sure that AB 1505 is, is that we, and in the staff report, if we can just make sure we're not getting into a, a place of where we might have some legal challenges. So I do want to just understand the, whether the consistency with AB 1505, if possible. Thank you. Fair enough. Councilmember Cronin. And, then and given that this is a report authored by council members, I think that might be a separate memorandum attached to the report. Yeah, I'm just wondering, Tony, wh why would this stop? All we're doing today is, as um, Councilman Brown just said, is referring it to the Planning Commission. So why why couldn't we still refer? We're not, we're not making a decision. So I mean, it doesn't tell the court or court in the future that, that we're approving it. We're just sending it to the Planning Commission. Yeah, and and I gave that some consideration. And, and just to follow up on Council Member Brown's earlier comment, I also considered whether we could bring this forward as a subsequent need item, given that it just came across my desk yesterday. Um, and I don't think so, because there's not any urgent need to take action um, that, that couldn't occur at a subsequent meeting. So, um, and you're right, referring the matter to the Planning Commission in and of itself doesn't amend the ordinance. And so wouldn't basically um, constitute acquiescing to what is essentially a demand made in the lawsuit. Um, but um, that being said, the time constraints also limited my ability to analyze fully um, the implications of uh, what is proposed here in the context of the lawsuit and in the context of the park and letter. So that's another reason for my request for additional time. Well, one more thing, it, it's, as we move forward, it seems like the word vested too is, be, is gonna become an issue. So it'd be great if we could get some responses to that later um, in, in your- That would be in the form of a confidential attorney-client privilege memorandum, which we're working on. Okay, thanks. Councilmember Matthews. Uh, I'm, I support tabling this um, to a future meeting. Um, I will say that um, as the city attorney mentioned, this was prepared by a couple of council members um, and um, did not have the benefit of staff review. Um, the language is unusual in that it is written in the first person often. So um, hmm? those were a couple of my notes. Well, whatever. I mean, that's unusual. Um, and there are many statements that are made as assertion, but are, are genuinely opinion. That's fine. It's written by individuals. But I would say when it comes back to us, uh, we did get additionally, uh, after this was appeared in the um, council packet, in the meeting packet, we did get some pretty uh, specific comments from staff on uh, disagreements that they had or clarifications. So when this comes back to us, I would like to have the benefit of um, a, a more fully fleshed out staff. If it has to be a second you know, companion piece, uh, then that's what it is. It would include comments from um, appropriate staff. It might be planning, it might be uh, economic development in terms of affordability requirements, it might be city attorney in terms of state legislation, but that way we'll, we'll have a, a more complete idea of what we're dealing with. Okay, we'll go, Council Councilmember Brown, and then I'll open it up to public comment and then we'll take it back to us. Well, I will just comment that um, we actually did, um, Vice Mayor Cummings and I did um, send this to staff we had we met with them we had um, multiple conversations and so this um this was presented in december and so we did put some thought into it the version that you received for a variety of reasons mostly technological challenges on my part um was not cleaned up however um those converse we we did discuss it with them and they have some ideas about um what they um, might do for um it should we decide to um, send it back to the Planning Commission that they will be involved in that discussion. And so we'll hear more from the staff. So we'll go ahead and open up to public comment and then we'll return back. Is there any member of the community who'd like to address the council on this item? We'll have two minutes. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. And I'm a former planning commission for the city, commissioner for the city. I spent two terms serving as a planning commissioner and I wanted to just share a little bit of a perspective from the planning commission's point of view. 
um, the ordinance that you uh, are considering amending was uh, the result of many years of work, um, not just by planning staff, but also by expert consultants and uh, of which uh, Cappy Head with uh, Kaiser Marston is a well-respected uh, expert in the field of affordable housing and um, economic feasibility. Uh, we also s received substantial input from members of the public who had much to say about this issue. And the entire package of amendments that um, you're thinking about revisiting was really designed to substantially increase the supply of housing in our community, both market rate and affordable housing. And one of the things that was somewhat, um, I thought, innovative was the idea of building in flexibility into our ordinance, which will allow us to respond to specific conditions that might uh, arise during the development of any given project or any given socioeconomic climate that we might find ourselves in in the future. Um, one thing uh, which, which goes directly to the <clears throat> paragraph 2416055.4, um, which allowed this flexibility with approval of the planning director and the um, economic director. And, and what I sensed in the staff report uh, was that there was a lack of trust uh, between the council and the department heads. And I thought, you know, one way of dealing with that would be to retain that very important paragraph <clears throat> providing flexibility and simply amend it to bring it back to council approval for okay. council approval. Thank, thank you. And you're welcome to submit your recommendations to us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, next speaker. You'll have Hi, Elise Casby. This is an issue that I've been um, diligently attempting to follow, follow and I've been to planning commission meetings. The ordinance um, that has been to refer to that was passed by the city in 2018, of September 2018, I'm not exactly sure on what that is. My concern is that the will of the voters and I think the, the entire issue that the city is grappling with, with, with really building more housing units that are affordable or including those affordable housing units in the market rate development. I want to um, to say that I think that on the part of the Planning Commission and the city in general, there is a kind of um, reluctance and a uh, an unwillingness to come to understand that there are designers and developers who use problem solving design methods with a much greater, uh, broader scope of uh, design flexibility than the current design dev, the, dis, the building contractor DevCon is doing. I think there's a habit in the city of going with certain kinds of developers and certain kinds of interests. And as long as this happens, we're going to have a very difficult time to want to allow the 15% inclusionary of affordable housing, let alone to really, I think, get more real about the need for actual low income housing and not and rigidify our class structures in the city, but really create pleasing designs and build housing supply that really is inclusive and allows for the diversity and liveliness of our city. So what I would just ask is that the city not go into um, contortions to try to, uh, as it seems in this wording, I might be wrong, waive the, or retain in lieu fees. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, let's go fast. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Robert Singleton. I'm the Executive Director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council, which is a consortium of the 80th or so largest employers in our county. I'm also a planning commissioner for the city who voted in favor of the policy you're attempting to rescind. Beyond that, I'm also a founding board member of Santa Cruz Yimby, a board member for the Housing Advocacy Network, and a board member for New Way Homes, a local affordable housing investment fund run by Sibley Simon. To put it bluntly, I'm no stranger to the issues related to affordable housing in our community. In fact, it's been my main issue for some time now. What I have to say about your council report, frankly, nothing you weren't expecting. I tend to side with staff 
and that I think your good intentions uh, about the policy you're hoping you enact will result in less affordable housing overall and less housing overall than the alternative. Keep in mind, we had a listening tour for over a year under Mayor Chase and Mayor Terrazas, which featured thousands of participants, which ultimately meant to inform the very policy we're discussing today. Beyond that, we did a deep financial feasibility analysis performed in the very policy you are considering, which was performed in accordance to state law, which explicitly requires a financial nexus study to justify any changes to an inclusionary ordinance. The bottom line is that staff, the housing community, myself, and others that are at a loss as to why you're doing what you're doing. I get that it's a campaign promise to stick it to the evil developers, but we all know how ridiculous that is. We don't have huge developers in Santa Cruz making windfall profits on the minimal housing production we've had over the last 40 years. We just don't. To put the affordable housing crisis in perspective, let's just say we could use the city's entire general fund exclusively to build 100% affordable housing. I know it won't happen ever, but for the sake of thought experiment, let's do it. That's roughly $130 million. So let's say you, you could build each unit, including the cost of land, for $330,000 a unit, which again, will never happen. But for the sake of easy math, let's do it. That means in the best year, under the best conditions, under completely unrealistic assumptions, you can build 390 units of deeply affordable housing. We have 24,000 housing units in the city of Santa Cruz. That means you could build roughly 1.6 uh, increase the city's housing stock. This number is interesting for two reasons. One, it's essentially the same figure that all of the Measure H, you, measure H you, money you could have been used to build over the entire life of that ballot measure. And two, it's close to the total number of units that have been built over the entire 40 year lifespan of Measure O in the entire city. By increasing the percentage area, you are making it hard to build housing. Um, there's no line of nonprofit developers hoping here to jump onto this market. Thank you, thank you. So okay, I just want to point and, you're that. and you're welcome to submit the comments. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, so that will, I believe, conclude public comment for item number 21, and we'll return it back to council for action and deliberation. Uh, this is item number 21 for affordable housing. This is the uh, suggested change to our uh, uh, inclusionary ordinance amendment. Okay, well, we're gonna go ahead and close public comment unless you wanted to say something specifically about the item. The, the item was to um, to make changes to our inclusionary um, housing provisions and in our, our uh, to increase the inclusionary percentages back to 15% from 10% is the is the main there's some other things in there, but we're um, likely to defer that for today. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close public comment at this time. Council Member Matthews, did you? I did wanna just add, I do understand that the authors of this agenda item um, consulted with staff uh, at the end of 2018, <coughs> but my understanding also was that there were some serious issues that were not incorporated into this. So I do wanna make sure that there's the opportunity for a full staff commentary in some form or another um, for the issues that are presented. Okay, so do we want a motion to move forward? Council Member Brown. Yeah, I would move that we refer uh, the um, uh, recommended action to our closed session for March 12th. I wanna be clear that I'd like to have this happen as quickly as possible, so for our March 12th meeting. Um, so we have a council, uh, we have Councilmember Brown making a motion to refer this to closed session for the March 12th. I'll meeting. second it. Okay, seconded by Councilmember Myers. Further discussion? No? Okay. Can, can I, I just want to make one comment because I know that there are council members who are wondering about my decision to do this given that it um, may not um, have uh, bearing on, on the lawsuit. I do want to respect uh, the ability of other council, our council colleagues to, to have that conversation um, and given that there's a lawsuit, um, there's some things that we just won't be able to discuss here. And so I just wanna make sure that um, people get that opportunity. Um, and so that was, that's my thinking. If it, if it doesn't delay things much longer, we've waited this long and um, we've, um, I think that's, that's fine with me. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. So that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Myers, Brown, Matthews, and Vice Mayor Cummings voting yes, and myself voting against. Uh, related, I just wanted to point out for those who uh, wanna take advantage of this, we did get a, um, information about a webinar about uh, Meeting California's Housing Best Needs Practice for Inclusionary Housing webinar series sponsored by the Local Government Commission, Western Center on Law and Poverty, and CRLA. Um, it's coming up February 27th and uh, another day shortly thereafter, March 13th. So um, if anyone's interested, easy to attend. <laughs> February 20th, so that's tomorrow. 
pass that around. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on with the agenda. And now we're on to agenda item number 22, which is the uh, motion that was uh, made at the last meeting to consider scheduling a study session related to transportation demand management. Um, the agenda report was written by staff, but it was a council direction. Um, Martine, did you wanna? No, it was not written by staff. Well. It said submitted by Tina, but. There, yes, there was, initially there was a uh, staff report that was prepared and then subsequently uh, 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 Council Member uh, Cummings uh, submitted the, an additional report, which is included in your packet and is listed on the agenda. Um, just because there was some mis miscommunication about whether we had the report or not, but it was submitted and provided in the packet. So essentially what this was the council, uh, this was a proposal to put this forward and so. I would think I would turn it over to Council Member Cummings. Okay, so it's Vice Mayor Cummings, do you want to present the item? Sure. Um, do you have any extra copies? Because I, I didn't get one. I don't have everyone. Oh, yeah, where, one. where are they? Is it here at the, at the dais? No, that's, dais, okay, that's, yeah. that's an attachment, but okay, thanks. Um, this was brought forward by a number of members <laughs> in the community. Um, as we begin to see new developments, in the city, parking come offline and shifts in modes of transportation. Members of the community brought forward a proposal um, of ideas and justifications for the council and staff to consider on uh, parking alternatives and uh, transportation demand downtown. And so what they brought forward was a study session uh, would be uh, containing presentations by Professor Adam Miller Ball of the Environmental Studies Department at UCSC, Barrow Emerson, Chief Planner at, of the Santa Cruz Metro, uh, Patrick Siegman, Transportation and Parking Consultant, and Sibley Simon, uh, President of New Way Homes, um, who's developed an innovative approach to uh, financing affordable housing. Um, bringing forth this study session on March 19th at 7 p.m. And this study session would look at the impacts of parking and pricing downtown, alternative commute incentives, parking requirement reforms, and leveraging parking funds to develop more affordable housing. Is that your presentation on the item? Okay. Um, are there any questions by council members? Okay, I have a question. If this was community initiated, um, was it considered to have it as a community meeting that would be sponsored by the city as opposed to a study session? Because my understanding, there's a different process for a study session. I think it would be considered as a study session. Okay, so do you wanna say more if I could ask our city manager to explain the study session process? Because I'm wondering if there's maybe a inconsistency with that. Okay, sure, sure. So uh, if the question is how do we have, how we, how do we normally do study sessions? Uh, so typically study sessions, the, the way they've operated, you know, ever since I've been with the city is uh, typically they come at the request of the city council and typically they are, uh, the council says we want to study a particular topic or issue area. And what they, the council would do is to direct staff to uh, develop a study session and the council, you know, identifies the topic, the, the issues, the questions, the things you'd like to explore. The staff then works uh, to put it together uh, and, and that might be uh, with, with respect to collecting data, information, presenting the city perspectives, uh, work that's been done, policies, uh, and then at times also if there's a need to get uh, uh, outside uh, uh, out, to do outreach and, and, and to get information from different sectors, uh, the staff will do that too. So that's the typical approach uh, where the council sets really the policy goals uh, or the objectives of what you'd like to understand and get more information about. And then staff does the work of, of uh, getting it organized and getting it together based on council direction. So that's the, the typical <coughs> approach for uh, creating study sessions that we've had historically with the city and most cities have it that way. Other just one more other thing. I just wanted to point out too that uh, Alex uh, Clifford did send me a correspondence uh, regarding the, the 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 best districts participation. I think he also sent it to the the, the representatives from the the uh, metro on our council. Essentially, uh, saying that he he would he would uh, I'll read it. I would re I would like to respectfully request of you and the city council that the city identify city staff member to participate in a study session instead of Mr. Emerson. Um, and I think I, I think his perspective on it is he'd like to have, uh, I think the city staff participate was, because again, that's typically also for other agencies, the way study sessions are done. So I think he'd just like to have that uh, typical process. So I just wanted to communicate that as well. Councilman Brown. So 
when the motion was made to agendize this for consideration, I didn't, um, I didn't understand that to be, um, you know, uh, declining to have city staff be involved in this. This was simply um, what I, I understand, maybe um, Vice Mayor Cummings, you can clarify um, that these were, um, folks, you know, outside experts that um, we would, that at least some, the majority of the council uh, said would, would like to have um, be present for that study session, but I didn't understand that to be precluding um, city staff preparing um, uh, a presentation as well. And I thought that was coming our way anyway, and that they might be, um, that might be included. So I just, if you could okay. say anything about that. Okay, Council Member. Yeah, I, just to follow up too, I, th that I would welcome staff's participation in such a study session, in fact, because we want to hear various points of view. Um, sorry, Mr. Emerson um, is being pulled back because I think that he would present a, 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 a very good, interesting point of view. Um, also, you know, we, staff is, is needed to put the whole thing together, and uh, I don't think anybody's saying no, um, we don't, want staff participation, I think uh, it's the opposite. Okay, uh, so, um, okay. <laughs> so why don't I go ahead and open it up to public yeah. comment or? Uh, just one more comment, uh, I'm sorry, I was just going based on the, 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 the uh, recommendation that was listed here. And so I would just say that uh, with respect to, if there is an interest in council uh, directing staff to put it together, that I think we would need more time than March 19 to do that together, to put it together. Uh, so I just wanna point that out as well. Um, if I could, my understanding is that usually you, there's a topic and then you build the, the presentation around the topic you hope to understand more as opposed to having a sort right. of design. I, I just like the opportunity approach. to go back and talk to staff about uh, this, the timing and the scheduling and, and all of that. We had really had that conversation. I, I, I understood that the proposal today was to to have a study session based on what was outlined here. So, and I know you'd have a discussion about this, but uh, in terms of the feedback, uh, I'd just like the opportunity to go back to to, uh, to staff and to talk about the timing for it. And we can get back to you. I mean, it looks like it's an in-between Tuesday, so we could you know schedule an in-between Tuesday and get back to you with a reasonable time frame. As I understand, there's no uh, particular uh, decision or action that has to happen by a particular time necessarily. So um, I think given, the workload and everything that we're working on, particularly on some of these other issues, we probably would need a little bit more time. And in regards to a community event, the this, this city often can support those if that was the different route to take in terms of the... Oh yeah, sure, alternatively, yeah. So if, uh, if a particular group wanted to, and that happens all the time, to uh, sponsor work, uh, uh, some kind of workshop or some kind of session, that's, that's, that's an alternative too. And uh, you know, we can certainly um, participate in that as well. Okay. Let's go ahead and open it up to public comment, then we'll return back to the council. Does any member of the community want to speak to us on item number 22? And you'll have two minutes. Um, good evening, council members. Rick Longinati from the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, I just wanted to add uh, maybe part of this agenda for the study session. The city has an ordinance that maybe you haven't heard about. I didn't hear about it. Uh, it's called the Trip Reduction Ordinance, and it asks employers to gather data about their employees' uh, commute habits. And as far as I know, it's never been enforced. So um, that would be one thing for staff to to report about um, the purpose of that ordinance. You know what what the uh, uh, what the prospects are of actually enforcing that. Uh, City of Santa Monica has a model uh, trip reduction ordinance, and um, so I refer you to that. Um, the, there is a trade-off in, in postponing it past uh, March 19th, which is that the speakers that are identified there in the motion are available on March 19th. Um, so uh, that would be ideal from that point of view. Um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it, and I, I think the community will all learn from it. Thank you. Hi, Council Elise Casby here. Um, I, I, I don't think we have any time to waste on this. I understand uh, City Manager Martine Bernal's comments about wanting to consult with city staff about their workload, which makes complete and total sense. At the same time, perhaps um, 
the study as it's being presented with staff being invited and not necessarily needing to do anything other than be present. In that case, it might be, um, it might make sense to just ask staff to attend. The reason I just wanna stress this again is I just came from this conference that is um, dealing with extinction, which is what we're going to I mean, to say that this is a crisis is kind of, and I, it's an understatement. This hasn't happened in 252 million years, and we need to inject a kind of sense of urgency and speed and allowing ourselves to study up. And I'm not sure what was just said about um, CEO Alex, Alex Clifford. Um, I think I may have heard that Barrow Emerson was pulled from attending, which I find to be um, uh, just a shame. I'm not sure why that was, if or even if I heard that correctly. But I do wanna say that I think that we have influences in the community that are working to uh, abbreviate our bus routes and to cut uh, bus uh, attendance, and one of the main ways that they're doing that is by privatizing and encouraging riders to have to go with companies like Uber. And we need to get the, comp the public involved and to invite people into this discussion and have this happen as soon as possible. This seems like an excellent opportunity. I just wanted to ask that you vote to have this study session on March 19th, thank you. My name's Dave Willis, and I think it's a really good idea to invite and have the community involved in these sessions. Another thing is, I don't know what all the studying is about. The studies in the past, they've been ongoing, and putting it off, we should be fast enough where we don't have to put nothing off. Let's do it, and we're in the work. To put something off, it just don't make sense to me. So another thing is when you're speaking, a lot of things I cannot hear him say. So I need to know what you're saying. If you're gonna speak, I need to hear it. So, you know, to get this session, this information going sooner rather than later is a brilliant, great, good idea. You know, it's time to like just put in and go and get the good work done, get it, get it going. Thank you. Are there any additional members of the public who would like to address us on this item? Okay. Seeing none, I'll return it back to council. Um, first, we'll have uh, Councilmember Myers, and then I had a comment, and then Councilmember Matthews and Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, I guess my main comment is it's, it's titled Do It a Transportation Demand Management Study, but when I read the report, there's a lot more in here than um, just TDM. So I think if we could also just, I, I would request that the council members who um, prepared or staff or uh, is just because it starts to talk about using parking district funds for affordable housing. So I just want to make sure the community's clear on what the session is about. And it seems to be a little bit broader than the TDM uh, piece that is in just in the subject. So it, it, I'm not I'm not saying I don't would want to talk about these things, but I think if we can also revisit the the title and make sure we're grabbing the right staff um, so that we can. Um, I, I I see a general trend in the in the report of, around um, ending at housing and how do we leverage potentially some funds. But I just want to make sure that. Uh, the, the community understands what the study session will be in totality. Okay. So I'll, I'll just briefly say, I if the March 19th date with the select speakers is the intention of the item, then I think having it as a sort of a community sponsored event makes more sense to me. If the interest is having a study session on a specific topic with a diverse set of speakers and informed by um, input from the council and from staff, then I think a different approach would be more fitting personally. So that would just be my statement um, in regards to this item. And then Councilmember Matthews. And yeah, I, uh, your suggestion, if the um, citizen, citizen advocates who've put together this list want to put this on in the community, it would be appropriate for staff to participate. Is that what you're saying? It would sure. not be a city sponsored event. It wouldn't be a, yeah. a city sponsored event. Um, 
I, I certainly understand the interest in um, the whole field of TDM. I think the motion or the um, agenda item as it's been presented to us uh, suffers from a lack of clarity and also is really um, not ripe for action. And also the, um, in terms of a study session, uh, puts an unrealistic demand in terms of timing and staff attention to do a good job on this. Um, as um, was mentioned, the topic is TDM, Transportation Demand Management Study Session, but many of the items com contained in this report we've already done. We do did them at our last meeting. So um, the report seems to some extent already uh, moot in some cases. Um, again, there are some assertions uh, that are presented as fact, which I think um, well, again, that's the, that's the prerogative of the uh, individuals that write the report. Um, I, I really am much more interested in looking at uh, a study session on um, our downtown in general. Uh, I guess there's a, a, a little bit of a lack of clarity also. <coughs> Is this a TDM proposed as a TDM study session for downtown or as a member of the public said, a trip re reduction ordinance which uh, pertains to the city generally. So what is the animal we're talking about? Um, to my mind, um, council direction for a study session is is really primarily for the, direct, for the benefit of the council. And of course the community is fully invited and commissions are invited, but it's typically been an opportunity for council members to get deep study on a big issue that informs our knowledge of the, of the topic. Um, and I think in that respect, topics for study session, which do take, uh, it's, it's cer certainly one more commitment on council members part, but it's to do a good job takes a, a good deal of time, thought um, and organization on the part of, of staff time. So, um, and in that sense, I think we should give direction as a council on our priorities. I, I would like to ask the city manager, when do we see uh, establishing our goals for the coming time period? Well, I think that's something that uh, we want to uh, schedule as soon as possible. Um, we've talked about, uh, and historically what we've done is, I'll try to speak more clearly, historically what we've done is to uh, have when new councils are uh, elected is to do the, an initial session that's a workshop on, you know, getting to know each other, team building, norms, that sort of thing, followed by workshops on establishing the work plan and the strategic planning process. So we have to schedule those. Uh, my sense is the council's interested in scheduling those as soon as possible. Um, and, and, I, and I would agree with that. So that's the other set of uh, workshops that have to be uh, established to do that. Um, and I think th th the question is, how does the council want to do that? So we've been working with the mayor and vice mayor to do that. And just to add to that briefly is we've been talking also about other types of study sessions to explore in preparation for the budget hearings. So there will be, so that is already underway right. in regards to the- Well, you know, um, there's just limited time and resources. So I, I think the uh, topics that we set aside for a study session should in fact um, reflect a bigger picture of what, what faces us and uh, what we need to choose from and focus on. Um, particularly since we've had, to my experience, so much attention on transportation demand, <coughs> demand studies and the adjustment of the parking rates downtown and all the incentives that we just uh, voted on um, at our last meeting. Um, so. Uh, I'm not sure that this needs to be a priority, TDM needs to be a priority for the time and effort of a study session. Personally, I would favor uh, a study session on the topic of what is our vision for downtown broadly and how do we use our transportation uh, resources of all kinds to reinforce that vision. And that vision should include a, a healthy, business district, it should include housing, it should include visitors, it should include civic spaces and civic activities, all of these things. And I don't think we've had that kind of a, a focus in a good long time for this city. We're, we're leaving out big swaths of the big picture. So um, that's personally what I would adv advocate for if we're gonna do a study session, but I think um, the focus of this and the timing um, is is not appropriate and 
um, particularly to have a study session um, uh, developed exclusively by an outside group without staff involvement uh, is problematical. And I should also just say finally that one of the speakers, I believe, has uh, what I would just call a tainted relationship with the city, and I don't uh, believe it would be appropriate to include that speaker explicitly um, in the, in the uh, lineup of a city-sponsored program, which is why I think it's important to give more thought to, to who, what is the topic and who are the presenters. So I have Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Brown, and then uh, Glover, and then Myers. So. I think one of the pieces is that um, I don't want to underestimate the ability of members of the public to put together a well thought out and well developed uh, presentation. Oftentimes, um, members of the public have only up to about four minutes to speak to city council members. And I feel like what we're trying to do is provide an opportunity for um, a community group to actually have more time to provide a deeper presentation to the city council. Um, I do um, understand, understand how um, staff is under a lot of pressure right now. They have a lot of demands. And I think that this could be the first step in a broader conversation um, around um, this vision of downtown and how we can utilize our resources to, um, um, to have a productive downtown environment. Um, given the fact that there are speakers who've been preparing for this, um, I, th I, would, I think that it would be good if um, we give ta st staff the time to um, develop you know, a presentation and a study session around downtown vision, but that we also um, invite staff, we invite our commissioners to come to this presentation that will be provided by members of our community so that we can get their perspective on um, this issue and allow staff the time available to come back, incorporate some of the ideas that maybe have come from that and some of the ideas that have come from community members and present them or incorporate them or not at that time. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with uh, um, Vice Mayor Cummings' comments, and, and I would just add that in the time that I've been on the council, we have had multiple study sessions on a variety of topics. Um, those, um, the uh, um, outside experts who have been invited have been exclusively determined by staff, and you know, I certainly have made recommendations about um, folks that I thought w might be good to participate in those study sessions. They have never been um, included. And so I don't see why, just because this is not customary, it is not um, something that the council ought to have some say in who the experts are who come to have a conversation with us. I think it is a, it's an opportunity to have some kind of thinking outside of the box, get some new ideas. We've done this at the Regional Transportation Commission on multiple occasions related to our, um, our rail, you know, potential use of the rail corridor, and it worked very well. Um, and we did not have, uh, uh, you know, any concerns expressed from the staff there at the time. In fact, they helped us organize it. Um, and so I, I want to support moving ahead. And like um, Vice Mayor Cummings said, see this as a first step in, um, you know, maybe getting generating some some new ideas and um, incorporating those into future planning. Member Glover and then Myers. Thank you. Uh, yes, I would uh, echo the support that Councilmember Brown just said for Vice Mayor Cummings' statement and for the idea of the logic and, in my opinion, urgency around this. I also agree with some things that we heard from the community about the importance of moving as expeditiously as possible into understanding transportation demand management and how we can better. Uh, move forward in the city to be as sustainable as possible. I do want to point out that when it comes to TDM, the, the conversations have been going on for a while, but I do want to emphasize that there has been, some could say, a shift in the focus, potentially, or in the vision of council members on the body. So to be able to all make sure that we're on the same page about transportation uh, and have a study session with uh, community experts or community individuals that have uh, a lot of knowledge around the issue, I think is important as well. And also just to reference the conversations around the parking fee adjustments um, that were mentioned before, those were, in, to my knowledge, done with the understanding that there was going to be the need to offset a maintenance cost for the parking garage that was supposed to go in with the library. So with that, uh, 
perspective and looking at how we can move things around so we can add additional cars, if we're doing a new study session, that may change the decision of the city council on how we may be able to use that extra approximate 2.5 million that are generated from the uh, changed parking fees. So I think this is timely, I think it's important, and I think that with a group of uh, community-based individuals, um, at, just as similar to what Councilmember Brown said, it should be a fantastic opportunity for us to learn and um, nothing against staff and their decisions or their choices. I'm sure that they're making the decisions and the, what they think are the best, uh, but I do think that it may be a good opportunity to try something new. Thanks. Councilmember Meyer. Um, I just have a question. I, we were, I'm not sure what this item is. This, I've read it and I don't really understand what it is. I don't understand who wrote it. Again, this is, this is my struggle. Um, so, and on the back of this sheet, which doesn't have a, any, I don't know if it's a city document, it says, the last sentence on the last paragraph, first sentence on the last paragraph says, Metro believes in addition to discounted transit passes, which reads to me like this should be coming from Metro. So I'm just uncomfortable with this kind of paperwork and then talking about really important things about parking and how we how we're going to move through downtown and so i'm not i'm not going to support the item i don't it's not that i don't want to talk about these items these are the most important things we should talk about as a city council but i don't this doesn't help me get there because i don't really understand what these pieces of paper are and they're unidentifiable and i don't know who writes them so that i i I, I think that there's more work to do. March 19th is right around the corner. And if this is sort of where we're at right now, I'm just not comfortable with moving forward on it. So, so uh, city clerk? If, if appropriate, I can yes. answer that question. And if you look at the staff report, um, the updated one that was provided, that is a Metro document. It, it, the staff report indicates C attachment, but we didn't get the attachment until Okay. too late to include it in the packet. So it is an attachment um, related to Barrow Emerson's position. Okay. Who is now, has, okay, okay. But the staff report, just to be clear, for the staff report was not a city staff report. Yeah. It, it was the council member Directed report. Just, just to, right. to differentiate that too. Um, also just to be completely you know transparent here too, Staff does have a concern about, uh, you know, in looking at the staff report or the report, agenda the agenda report, there, there we do have some concerns about some of the items that are in there. They're not exactly accurate. Um, and so again, that's the concern about putting together a study session without the staff working. I mean, many of the, of the workings with respect to the parking fund <coughs> and its financial status and what can be it can be used for is really something that, you know, the staff would, would be able to look at and explore and work with the city attorney on. Um, so anyway, I just have, I just want to be clear. I just have some concerns about that too. And so if, if you are going to do a study session, I think it would just make sense to have it be a, a well prepared, well developed, and then you have all the information that you need. Um, and so again, we're not against uh, putting one together. I just think it would make sense to, to have it be, uh, you know, coordinated uh, uh, with city staff and, and, and we can work to do that as soon as possible. Okay, so I'll just briefly make my comments and then I'll acknowledge Councilmember Crone and then Councilmember Glover. Um, I, I agree, I think that if there's, if this is the date and these are the folks, then I think, and it's a community initiated effort, then it makes sense to have it as a city sponsored community event. And I think staff, staff could participate in it and that would be the appropriate process for this. Um, in terms of the study session, I think that more needs to go into it. So I don't feel comfortable scheduling it as a study session. Um, I don't think it could necessarily um, result in this not happening if it's just a community sponsored event. It just wouldn't be necessarily qualifying what I think would make what I would hope our standard of a study session would be. So Council Member Crone, Council Member Glover, and then we'll reach, okay. Um, I'm, I'm very much in support of the concept of a study session. And um, I don't know, I, I, I agree with, uh, with Council Member Matthews saying about a deep study of, of big issues and a vision for downtown. I think that this would be part of that, a vision for downtown. And I think it does include housing and TDM and parking, if that's part of TDM and, tra and, and, and um, any sort of transportation issue. Um, I, th I think that it, we're, we're running late here. We're running, you know, it, there's a whole, you know, 
global warming issue and we're, we're, we're not really keeping up. And I think this study session uh, reflects that we are trying to do our best and uh, actually provide opportunities for people to get involved and implement ideas now. Question. To the extent that any of the uh, uh, named speakers are not able to participate, uh, what, how will the decision be made to replace them or, or restructure? Would that so involve, uh, I would hope, if, if this is going to be a city-sponsored event, I would hope there would be staff involvement. Let's, I'll go ahead and go to Councilmember Glover and then there's not a motion on the floor at this point, so. With uh, just a, a question about process, if this is set up for the 19th and there's council direction to move on scheduling it with some parameters, is that, would that not provide staff time to compile the information that they think could be changed and then share that at the meeting to say this is what's going on? Um, I, I don't I don't believe so because I think we may you know uh, want to because the question comes up well who else should we include I mean there's certain perspectives again it depends on the scope so for example if you want to talk about housing well we might want to include some housing developers uh, or nonprofit housing developers if you want to talk about the downtown and how that might affect downtown businesses well we might want to include downtown businesses and so there's a bit of, of outreach that has to be done the list that's here doesn't include everybody that might be impacted by these programs. And so if you want to be inclusive of all these other groups, we excuse might want me, to excuse extend. Excuse me, I will go ahead and pause. We might want to extend. So, sorry, excuse me. This we is now, the, to, go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and say the community, this is now a time for the council to deliberate and there's not a time for the for public comment. So we've closed public comment. So if, if, please keep your voices down. That's a warning. If you decide to continue to talk, I'll ask that you uh, be uh, escorted out. So you've been warned to not disrupt the meeting, and if you continue to disrupt the meeting, you'll be asked to leave. Okay, please go ahead. So I was gonna say, so we might wanna extend an invitation, and so again, depending on their availability, you need a little bit of lead time because you have to find out when people are available, and I mean, I think much much like this was done, but again, to, to, be, to have it include other components just requires time to get it ready. So that's come, I can't, I can't tell you for sure that we can have it ready by March 9th. We can work to get it, prepared as soon as possible, and we'll do our best to get it done as soon as possible and come up with a date and report back to you. Um, so again, I don't wanna commit to something that we can't you know, meet uh, and, and have unreasonable expectations. And then just to okay, we'll go ahead and, first of all, I think it was that, uh, there was- a follow up to that though. I hear you have a follow up question. We'll go ahead, there was somebody who wanted to be acknowledged on this side of the Around, Matthews? No, okay, go ahead. Um, with um, the time frame, because I know that Vice Mayor Cummings brought this forward at the last meeting, so it's been two weeks since the last meeting. Has there been any preemptive kind of exploration into finding people that staff might be interested in to come with like some options or to say, hey, staff would like to bring these to the table or have are we starting at ground zero? Um, I think other than, obviously, uh, we, we, we weren't sure what the council was going to, to direct. I think other than, uh, discussing the fact that it would be helpful to have you know, a variety of input uh, in, in general, uh, but no, we haven't necessarily, I don't, at least I'm not aware of that, you know, particular individuals or groups have been identified. Uh, again, you know, we didn't wanna predetermine exactly what the council was going to direct. Um, and, but, and then again, I, again, there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's just no particular urgency to this particular topic at this time as far as any sort of council action has to happen. So that's the other consideration. Okay, thank you. Is there a, okay. okay, so now would be the time for action and deliberation or <laughs> if anybody wants to make a motion, I can't. I'm gonna make the motion to, um, since Beryl Emerson can't come from the Metro to remove that portion of this um, and direct that we bring Adam Miller Ball, Patrick Siegman, Sibley Simon um, to present on um, issues related to downtown development and the vision of downtown um, around parking pricing downtown, parking, uh, 
parking reform requ re reform of parking requirements. Just apologize. Um, and leveraging affordable housing as the first study session with regards to um, our vision of downtown brought forth by members of the Santa Cruz community. I'm going to second that. As a friendly amendment, could we have the city manager get back to Mr. Clifford and ask him to reconsider that Darrow Emerson uh, join us? Yes, I'm also going to add that we invite members of staff to also present and also invent members of the Planning Commission, Downtown Commission, Transportation and Public Works Commission to attend the study session um, in addition with to uh, the Santa Cruz community. Okay, so we have a motion second. by Council Member, I mean, Vice Mayor Cummings, second by Council Member Crone. Any further discussion? Yeah, I, I just want to, um, I will add that based on personal conversation, I understand that Sibley Simon uh, is uh, not interested in participating at this point. I don't know if he's communicated that to others. Um, and uh, again, I want to reiterate my opposition to paying someone to come and participate who has a contentious relationship with city staff. I don't think that's productive. Okay, uh, Council Member Glover. Um, so it's my understanding that uh, Mr. Simon isn't coming because he has other projects that he's working on and doesn't want to risk divisive decision making, which is unfortunate that people are having to decide which issues they're going to advocate for. Uh, the second thing um, along with that is it's the second time that we've heard that someone has a bad relationship with the city, but there's been no, like, I'm, I, I have no idea who or what you're talking about. So it's pretty vague. Um, and so I can't make a decision based off of something I have no context. Okay. So, um, okay. Vice Mayor Cummings. If the information is correct that, um, Sibley Simon is not available to make this meeting. Is, has anybody had, oh, can I ask a question of other council members? Because it sounds like other members of the, of the council have had conversations with Sibley Simon. I just want to verify whether or not this is correct. So I'll direct that at council member Glover. Um, I'm trying, I'm, I'll try to find the correspondence right now. It was updated that uh, I got a message saying that he had pulled out because of the concern of this being divisive and could damage a conversation around housing that he's working on with his housing project, so. Okay, okay, so at this time we have a motion and a second, and um, you call the what's question? there to be for the question? Call the question. Okay, all those in favor, okay. please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. no? No. So that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crone, and Councilmember Glover, Glover voting in support, Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Myers and myself voting against. Okay, so we have an additional item, and that is the second reading of the um, ordinance. And we'll have a brief presentation followed by. Uh, okay, you could go ahead and leave. The, thank you very much. You could go ahead and leave now. You've been warned, and thank you. Okay. Okay. Okay, so at this time, do we not have a presentation? Okay, so it's just uh, right now we have the second reading and if there's not any questions, we'll go ahead and open it up to uh, public comment and then return for action and deliberation. Are there any questions at this time? Is there any member of the public who wants to speak to us on item number 23, which is the second reading and final adoption of the ordinance related to the accessory dwelling units? We'll have two, two minutes. Hi everybody, my name's Meryl Lewin. I came in here the last time and I'm just uh, wanting to thank everybody for considering this. I'm really happy that this looks like it's going to pass. I think it might really help with um, people who want to build accessory dwelling units because it's so expensive to do it. This would be uh, a real boon. And I thank you for your consideration. And I want to invite everybody when my unit is done to come over and see it. I, I'm very proud of it. Maybe in another month or so it'll be finished. I'll let everybody know. So just wanted to say that thank you, everybody. Thank you. 
Unless there are any other additional members of the public who would like to address us <laughs> on the second reading of the uh, ADU ordinance. We'll be given two minutes. My name is Dave Willis. I just want to say um, <clears throat> thanks a lot for all of y'all's work on all of these issues, especially this one right here also. So thanks a lot and um, good work. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close public comment and return back for action and deliberation. I'll, I'll move the second reading and adoption of the ordinances before us. Okay. I'll second that. Any further uh, discussion? Okay. All the motion by Council Member Matthews, seconded by myself. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, so we have uh, one more item, and that's the meeting calendar. And uh, clerk, are there any updates to the meeting calendar? No, nothing. Councilmember Glover. Yeah, so as some of us may be aware, there was a raid by DHS Homeland Security ICE here in Santa Cruz last week, uh, or a week and a half ago. There has been very little uh, community engagement around it, especially from the side of the city, and I, as well as some of the fellow council members, were able to go and meet with the neighbors that were uh, impacted by the raid, as well as the fa uh, member of the family who uh, was detained and, in my personal opinion, terrorized by the uh, federal agents that came into our community. So I think it's important that we really uh, assess where we're coming from as a sanctuary city, policies that we may need to put in place, statements that we might need to write, and also the structuring of a community conversation that includes not just the city council, but also uh, representatives from the police chief, the sheriff's department, the sanctuary movement, immigration and attorneys, as well as other members of the community like the neighbors. So I'd like to see that on the next agenda on March 12th. I make that motion to have all of that. So there's a motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Brown. Any further discussion? And just what's the nature of the motion? To, agen to agendize the topic of the ICE raid and potential actions and response, not limited to, but including potential policies, uh, community conversations, and uh, letters slash responses to the federal government. So if I could just, with respect, because I think there are two um, kind of tracks here, one of them would be uh, action that the council will take, might take uh, with respect to um, uh, r recommendations or, or um, expressions of concern to um, other jurisdictions and representatives, um, as well as potential policy options, and then the community conversation. And, and so um, I'll have it as one motion, but I think that, that that's a discussion. We just want to clarify that that is the discussion we'd like to, that I certainly would like to have Absolutely. agendized so that we can set um, the date for some kind of community conversation in addition to the other. I just have a question. Are you anticipating that you would, you're, you're asking, or you're asking the motion to have it on the agenda, but you would write the agenda report? Is that what you're anticipating? Or you would have staff write the agenda report? We can write the agenda report unless staff wants to, we could all write it together. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Councilmember Matthews. Uh, there have been community conversations um, in the somewhat recent past involving a great number of community groups. Uh, do you know if there's anything else going on that would be not just the city of Santa Cruz, but a broader community conversation that we might plug into? So I'm not sure about anything that might be actively happening anywhere else in the county to address this because it happens specifically in the city of Santa Cruz. I do know that the sheriff's department was in direct cooperation with the raid and um, according to uh, testimony, uh, provided the interrogation rooms. So there's the question of the sheriff's countywide involvement as well as the county's participation with ICE, uh, but I don't, so, but I think that we need to move forward as a city expeditiously to, to have the conversation with our residents and community. And then if representatives from the county or the sheriff want to join in on that, then that's great. But I don't think we should be waiting for other people to lead the charge. I'll just to add, and then I'll, I'll acknowledge you. There's, there is a group that meets on an as needed basis to address any types of issues related to immigration. And that's being facilitated out of the city of Watsonville and we've connected with them in, in the past. So if anything, I think that would be the place to check I think in that's about. in the whole sanctuary Absolutely. community group. Right. Yeah. 
Okay, Councilmember Brown. I'm trying to be careful here of not getting too far into the substance of a discussion about this because this is not an actual agenda item. It's Thank not, you. So, um, but you know, we had a conversation with neighbors, and, and there are um, uh, folks who are really, you know, anxious for the city to take a, a leadership role here. Um, I, certainly, we can partner with other um, groups. But I think that's a conversation that we need to have when this is agendized and it's 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 um, okay. so there's notified a, to okay. the public. So I'll just, if I could reiterate, there's a motion to modify or to make a, a specific attachment for the meeting calendar to agendize on March 12th um, this topic. Is that correct? Yeah, with the with the actionable item of council action to write letters or send statements to bodies discussion of potential policies locally and also uh, the establishment of a community conversation. Correct, great. And I'd like to call that to question so that we can move forward. I second it already. Okay, so there's a motion. We'll call it. Okay. So, okay. All the, it's been called. Call the question. Called All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. If I could make a follow-up yes. comment, I would like to ask that as the uh, any material being prepared for this be um, given to uh, appropriate staff, whether it's city attorney, police department, whatever, that they have time to oh, yeah. give it a legitimate review. I mean, it's a short turnaround time I already agree. to get it on the agenda. So, um, and that maybe some things could be anticipated <coughs> for action at that meeting and others deferred for more thought. Okay. So that will conclude the uh, afternoon session. I just wanted to bring back. Vice Mayor Cummings? Well, I'll, I'll bring back it later. No problem. Okay. So that then concludes the afternoon session, and we will adjourn until our 7 p.m. oral communications. Yeah, I'm trying to do my best behavior. But yeah, I think so. Are we on? Um. Bonnie, we good? Okay. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. If I could get your attention, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. 
I realize we have a very large crowd this evening, and I appreciate your patience as we uh, get started. At this time, I'd like to welcome you to our 7 p.m. session of the February 26, 2019 meeting of City Council, and I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Crone? Here. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Um, before we get started, I want to announce that we have set aside overflow seating capacity in the Civic and the Tony Hill room. So right now we're about to begin our oral communications, and then after oral communications <coughs> concludes, we'll move on to our 7.30 item. Um, and for those who are outside or unable to get a seat, we do have room at the Tony Hill room. Before we also get started, I'd like to um, briefly go over our uh, council principles and, um, and ask that as we all are here to um, participate in this process that we respect one another, that we engage in open and honest communication, that we be truthful and honest and, ad and address difficult issues. We seek to find areas of common ground, be open to different perspectives, give the benefit of the doubt, to role model good leadership, and to be considerate of each other's time. So I will now um, ask our uh, fire chief to please uh, maybe say a few things about some of the considerations for capacity here. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, so for everyone who's here inside the chambers, we have an occupant load of 114 people. I think we may be at that or a little bit above that. And I'd ask that everyone who's outside to please um, respect the, um, the orders of the fire marshal that we have, the deputy fire marshal and the police officers. We're not trying to limit anyone's speech. We just wanna make sure that we don't have an incident where people are crushed or pushed because we have too many people here. Uh, like the mayor said, we do have overflow at the Tony Hill room, and we will line up people for uh, comments when uh, we get to that part of the meeting. So I would ask that um, we all respect each other and that uh, we get through this night together and that we do have a lot of people here. So um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So it's my job to um, ensure that decorum is met while in the chambers and to ensure that we're respectful for one another and that we um, follow the processes uh, to ensure that the night and the process can, 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 can continue in a way that has um, some order and, and folks can feel safe to come and speak to us. Um, so that said, I want to um, just let you know that if there's disruption and I, and I am able to identify who is disruptive in the audience, you will be given one warning. If there's continued disruption, then I will ask that you leave the council chambers. Everyone has a right to speak to us, whether or not we agree with each other's opinions. They have a right to, without fear or intimidation, to express their feelings to us. So at this point, as mentioned, we're now um, going to begin our oral communications. And oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. Are there the member, any members of the public who are here to speak to us um, for oral communications? And if so, could you please try to make your way to my left? Um, and I want to uh, let you know you'll have two minutes to speak and um, you are not required to say your name. And as mentioned, please, uh, out of respect for other members in the, in the public, um, many who aren't necessarily used to coming to speak before the council, um, please refrain from disruptive behavior <coughs> that might discourage all of our members of the public from stepping to the microphone to have their voices heard. Um, I want to first invite up a uh, representative from SEIU who uh, reached out to me in advance uh, for four minutes. And please. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Watkins and members of the City Council. My name is Lillian Lane and I work in the Public Works Department for the City and I'm here as a member of SEIU 521 to speak on behalf of our frontline employees. Do you know who our city service employees are? These are the people who keep the city running. If a water pipe breaks, they fix it. If a tree falls in the middle of the road, they clear it. If a road closure is needed to assist in emergency situations, they do it. They keep the parks clean and beautiful. They keep the water running. 
They keep the streets clear of debris and garbage, and they are the first responders. Without the city's service employees, the city would have no running water, no functioning roads, rundown parks, and the administration of the city would be in complete disarray. The recent city compensation study shows that our workers are substantially underpaid, which has resulted in 55% of our workers being un unable to afford to live in the city of Santa Cruz. We are currently <coughs> seeing departments across our city struggle to be able to retain enough employees to provide the services that our residents deserve. The city has an employee retention crisis. We are una unable to keep many city departments staffed and the community suffers for it. Our workers need to be able to keep up with the cost of living. We also need to have a clear commitment and plan for how to close the wage gap so that we can retain competent and knowledgeable employees and continue to offer the excellent services we currently provide this community. We have proposed at the bargaining table a path towards having the city commit to addressing the issue, but we, but we need to have your support in being able to make it happen. We hope that we can count on your support. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Hi folks, um, I'm Luis Garza. I live at the Tannery. i um, here on behalf of my household today to discuss a matter of the Ross Camp in relation to security at I'm the gonna, Tannery. Can I go ahead and pause you for a second? I apologize, I realize that this could be a little bit confusing. Right now, oral communications is a time for items that are not on tonight's agenda. We will be discussing that item after we conclude oral communications at 7.30, at which time you can address us on that item after our uh, staff presentation. Do, do I line up back over here again? Or? You won't necessarily need to line up at this time because right now we're opening it up to oral communications for folks who want to address the council on items that are not on the agenda. Great, Thank great, you, I, I can I understand that that could be confusing with the, okay, the mix of the items. Thank, Thank you, very you. Much. So again, this is a time for us uh, not, we, you will have an opportunity to address us in terms of any of the homeless related items that will be coming before us at 7.30. So now is the time to address us on anything else that was not on today's agenda. Okay. Good evening, council people. Short. I sp I'm speaking in support of Drew Glover and Chris Crone. I've known Chris for almost 25 years and Drew for almost four years. In their actions, deeds, and writings, they have both proven to be staunch supporters of women and the empowerment of women. They are proven feminists and civil rights activists in that they treat everyone, regardless of race or gender or economic status, equally and with respect and kindness. On the other hand, they in turn have not been treated this way on this council. Drew and, Drew and Chris were publicly called bullies and sexists at the last meeting, but they were not allowed to answer accusations then and there. Then le le letters repeating these words began to appear in the local paper. Drew has been denied by the mayor a seat on several advisory bodies he specially sought because of his expertise. He proposed agenda items addressing homelessness Oh, I'm sorry, his proposed agenda items addressing homelessness were not accepted by the mayor who changed the submission deadlines without notice. So he had to force a vote to get them on the agenda. For 17 years, <coughs> our council has been totally controlled by conservative spendthrift majority. Now there has been a shift to a more liberal majority with a humanitarian agenda. I see these criticisms of Chris and especially Drew as a denial by the old guard to respect the will of the voters and a desperate attempt at regaining the majority. To me, this is bullying and reverse sexism. This new majority hopes to use our city monies to address the homeless situation 
with concrete, creative, and compassionate ideas instead of wasting $17 million of taxpayer money on a failed desalination plant or millions on a golf course. I hope they will enforce okay. measured Thank oh. you. Yeah, your time is up. Thank you. Don't okay. throw away Go this ahead. opportunity by Thank being you. divisive, please. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank so you. every member of the public will have two minutes to address the council. And um, when your time is up, then I will uh, go ahead and ask that you conclude your comments so that our next speaker can address the council. Good evening. My name is Sadak Shakib. I live on the 20, uh, 220 Atlantic Avenue in the building, and it has one side on the First Avenue, another side on the Atlantic Avenue, and the third side on the, the Second Avenue. On Sunday, we wake up and we saw some uh, colors put by the management to ask some people to come to cut the trees. And uh, I wasn't informed, nobody was informed, and the trees, they were, you know, they have the trunk big enough that they were required by the law to be saved. So on Monday, I called the city, and on Tuesday, one member of the city, she came, and she faced that uh, people that they were coming to cut the trees, and she told them by the, by the law and the rules, they cannot touch those, but they can touch those things. The one on the first avenue, their, you know, their trunk is big. The one on the second avenue, they are as old as the other, but they are divided. They are divided. I have some pictures here. And they are as the same size, but I don't understand why they allow them to be cut. For, for two reasons, they have the same size like the first avenue, and and, and, and the, the person who came from the city, she was very kind, very nice. She explained to that, uh, you know, to the people that they come to the race, they can do that. But the, the management insists they will come and cut the one that they're on the first avenue because they have just, you know, those branches. But, but, but the bottom is as, 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 as big as the other one. So I want to ask you kindly and remind you, if I may, the trees have a life like us. Yes. The trees, they pray. Thank you, thank you. I just wanna um, let you know, you're welcome to submit that and your information and we could go ahead and follow up with you. So what should they do, please? You could leave that with our, our city clerk here and you're welcome to leave your information. We could also follow up with you in terms of what happened. Okay. Hello, my name's Maureen Davidson and I'm here to talk about the ice raid. On Friday morning, the 15th, I received a wake-up call from a neighbor and friend in Seabright, and uh, she asked me if I knew what was going on and if I knew anything about an ice raid. And uh, indeed, she was almost crying, and uh, there were grenades, there were explosions, there were people shouting, what's happening in Santa Cruz? That's my message. That's my question to you. Uh, this was supposed to be a uh, well, there were claims made about what this was, but this was not business as usual. It was a brutal raid whose every aspect was calculated to inflict terror, trauma on the impacted family. DHS says that the two people sought in the raid were wanted only for questioning. They are not suspects and they were not named in the warrant. And if that's the case, then why bring two armored personnel carriers uh, why block off the street? Why knock down the door and throw flash grenades? The city council, we do request, please, and implore and demand that you take a stand against these violent, unnecessary raids. The city council needs to put this item on the next agenda, please. There must be official communication from the city to our elected representatives in Congress to pressure for an investigation and ensure that this type of militaristic, over-the-top raid is not repeated. Please, um, what is happening to Santa Cruz? We have to stand up to this. Thank you. I'll invite our next speaker up. Before, before you speak, if you can, if you're holding a sign, please hold it down so that you're not blocking um, anyone behind you. If you're in the back, you know, that's one thing, but if you're sitting down, you're blocking or just and um, not, and obstructing people's view behind you, please hold your sign down. Okay. 
And I'll just also let you know that the, 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 this item was agendized earlier in today's meeting for the for the February 12th, I mean for the March 12th meeting. Okay. okay, go ahead, you'll be given two minutes. Hello, good evening um, everyone. I am here representing the undocumented community here in Santa Cruz. My name is Gabriela Cruz. I am a woman of color. I am an immigrant myself and someone who was personally affected by this raid that took place on February 15th. I come asking for questions. I have lots of questions. And one of them is if our sanctuary policies were violated with this raid. I wanna know if the militarized action that took place was necessary. I wanna know if the trauma that my 10-year-old goddaughter will forever have to live with was necessary. I want to have answers to these questions. And I also wanna know if immigrants like myself should be treated as second-class citizens here in Santa Cruz County and Santa Cruz City more specifically. I've lived here for 29 years and in my entire life, I can count the many times where ICE has been allowed to enter our county and our city and terrorize our community and the lasting impacts that that has on our community. Not just as a person who's personally affected by this, but also families of mixed status who have to hide their children under their beds because they don't know if they should go to school or if they're gonna be coming down and knocking on their door as well. What happened on Friday the 15th was a horrible action. It should have never happened. I felt as though even though we have these sanctuary policies in place that they were not respected. And I don't know if there's a conversation to be had with the sheriff's department on their cooperation in this incident. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I am Mary Reynolds. Um, and I'm also here to talk about the raid that was on the 15th. And just to say that this seems like a war against sanctuary cities. The administration and DHS has made no secret of their contempt and outright hostility to sanctuary cities like ours. These people who are targeted are obviously intended to send a message to the rest of Santa Cruz and other sanctuary cities saying, we will come into your town and we will do what we want and there's nothing you can do about it. So I am pleading to you as our representatives, is there something that we can do about it and will we do it? Because we can call ourselves a sanctuary city, but if this keeps happening, we're just bowing to the fascists. Thank you. Hello, thank you, um, and I wanna thank um, council members Drew Glover and Chris Crone and Sandy Brown for coming out to a meeting with neighbors um, yesterday. Um, I really appreciate that, and I appreciate that um, this item will be on the agenda apparently for the next council meeting. I just want to make clear that uh, the city needs to make a strong statement that we absolutely do not trust the Department of Homeland Security. Remember, this is the agency who lost thousands of children and it was too much work for them to document what happened to these children. They have a clear record of misleading and lying about what they are doing. There is no transparency. Um, and remember that the Department of Homeland Security was, it's a new agency, it was set up in 2001 specifically to target immigrants, people who do not have the same rights to counsel that we do. They may have a lawyer, um, if the lawyer can find them, um, uh, and the local law enforcement is clear about where they are, uh, but they, they do not have the right to, uh, you know, public defender like we do, uh, citizens do. Um, and the city needs to say loud and clear that, they, that there's no gray area for civil liberties, that the people who live and work and go to school alongside us should have the same rights. Um, and the city council needs to take a stand. I urge you to reach out 
to your congressional representatives, to our congressional representatives in an official statement uh, or resolution calling for an end to these kind of violations of our civil rights with militaristic um, and over the top terrorizing tactics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor Watkins and uh, Council, thank you for uh, allowing me to address you. My name is Ray Mendoza. I'm a neighbor of the house that was uh, raided in this raid. Uh, I've been a Seabright resident for 18 years in that spot. I've been before. I've been here for years um, w with these wonderful neighbors where this happened. Um, I am a supporter of the police. He, my brother's a, a highway patrolman in uh, Riverside, and I'm very cognizant of the fact that, that these people have to put on a bulletproof vest to do their job. I'm very aware of that. I support uh, law enforcement. Uh, however, in this situation, I could not see the reason why HSI, a division of ICE, would have to use these military tactics, military vehicles, unmarked vehicles, plain clothesmen, uh, and uh, uh, full tactical gear um, uh, officers also. Uh, I, I don't understand why that was used. Um, I appreciate the fact that you've just put this on the agenda and I thank you very much for that. So this will be dealt with further. Uh, there are some very um, pressing questions to, to be answered and I hope that the council can get to the, to the answer of these. Uh, why were flashbang grenades used? Why was the door smashed in? The, the fellow who lives there was, was in the act of opening the door when they came through with the ram and smashed into him and then threw a grenade at his feet. Why did that have to happen? Why were the people who were arrested for questioning, questioning, not suspects, why were black hoods put over their heads and they were taken to questioning? Uh, why was no warrant shown at the entrance and at the beginning when the people asked for a warrant? No warrant was shown, only at the end when they left, they left the warrant with them, also a violation. Why was a gun put to the head of a 10-year-old girl? Why was that? These are, these are, I think, I hope that these are questions that, that you can help us understand as a community and it has an, an impact on our whole neighborhood, our whole, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Samantha. I'm here in support of Sanctuary Santa Cruz and also as a representative for Cosecha Santa Cruz, which is a movement that is completely devoted to providing and winning um, permanent protection for undocumented people in the US. Um, and so first and foremost, um, this recent raid was a racist attack. Ask yourself if they would ever come for a white family at four in the morning put them in handcuffs along with everyone else in their house, march them out of the house with hoods on and deny them food or water for eight hours of interrogation, all because they might know something about a crime that happened in another county. It doesn't work that way and it shouldn't. Um, so I would really, really um, consider as a goal for the next meeting to really establish a way for us to react to have an action plan an action plan in place for the next raid that happens because this is not the first and it won't be the last right and so our neighbors are going to be continuously attacked and degraded and traumatized by the events that are happening um, and when we allow this to go without any kind of public outcry, without any public action, it says to our community members that if you're not white and if you're not a full legal citizenship citizen, then this is okay. That the way they treat you is normal and it's not. And if we're a sanctuary city as we like to you know, identify as, as a community that is safe for individuals, of any status, of any color, then we need to, you know, do the work. And I really hope that the city council will be able to r respond to this in an appropriate manner, because I have not seen that. And this was an event that happened a week ago, and we need something to happen. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Vicky, and I'm also here supporting Sanctuary Santa Cruz. And as a participant in Movimiento Cosecha, 
which is a national movement um, looking to win permanent protection, dignity, and respect for all undocumented people in this country. Um, I'm also here regarding the raid that happened on February 15th at 4.30 in the morning to a family in Seabright. Um, we know that this was obviously an immigration raid. We know that beforehand DHS contacted the Santa Cruz Police Department um, and identified this as a criminal matter. Um, and we also know that after the raid, DH DHS also told the Santa Cruz Sentinel that this was a criminal matter. Then the question becomes, why, when this family was detained and taken into questioning for hours, were most of the questions immigration related? Why were, when their house was raided, why was immigration related paperwork seized? These are questions that we absolutely have to find answers to. Um, and I'm here um, with all the other members of the community um, asking the, the city council to really take a stand on this. It's good to know that this is on the next agenda, um, but we need to take a stand and we need to, need to take a clear stand. Um, and council members need to uh, educate themselves about the brutal tactics that are being used, that are being, in, being employed uh, against the immigrant community, um, as well as educate other staff members. Okay, thank you. Good evening, I agree with all the previous comments about the heavy-handed ICE raid, and I wanna comment about a different uh, travesty of democracy that's been experienced recently. <clears throat> uh, starts at the top, our president apparently believes he is um, perhaps above criticism or he's too thin-skinned to deal with it in a constructive way as far as uh, dealing with the democratic process of discussing issues and evolving opinions. He chooses to do personal attacks and character assassination instead. Uh, apparently, that is unfortunately using the term trickle down to our local uh, government here. I'm referring to the last council meeting where uh, Con Councilman Glover uh, tried to raise a political issue as far as agenda manipulation by the mayor where the goalpost was apparently moved where uh, people couldn't get things on the agenda when they expected to and they weren't even notified in advance. Uh, I think Councilman Glover uh, totally legitimately complained about that and the response from the mayor was to get on a personal level, not to deal with the issue, to accuse him of uh, sexism and bullying for standing up for his rights as a public representative. So my question is, are any of you immune to criticism? Should I leave? If I, am I gonna say the wrong thing here? Will I be removed for, for criticizing an elected official or will I be called names? You know, uh, Harry Truman put it pretty well. If you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. If any of you got elected thinking that the public or any council member cannot come up and give their opinion about your activities, you need to leave. This is the process. This is called democracy. People have a right to discuss issues, and if someone doesn't like it, they have a right to respond, okay? So if any of you, and particularly you know who I'm talking about, can't handle criticism, what are you doing here? Resign. Um, hi, um, my name is Pedro, I live on uh, Felke Street. And I'm here to ask your help. Um, our our street is be, is being known as the uh, heroin highway. Um, so I'm here to ask for your help to change that. We'll go ahead and pause it really quick. We're still on oral communications, which is a time to address the council on items that are not on tonight's agenda. We'll be I, discussing the Ross camp. Uh, yeah, I, I believe that's not on the agenda. That, that's that's totally separate from the Ross, Ross and Common. Okay. Is that, okay. Is that going to yeah. be addressed? Uh, we. My understanding is we were gonna discuss that. We're gonna be talking about um, council direction as it relates to security at the encampment, and there is some carryover to the tannery in Felker Street. I'm not sure if that fully intersects with Pedro's comments, though I'm this, not. This is, this is uh, way before that, the okay. issue that we, that we have going on. Go so what I wanna say is the, uh, a few years ago, the uh, uh, pedestrian uh, bridge over crossing was built and I believe that the intention was to communicate the levy and to make it usable for, you know, for um, communities to use the levy. And then I think now it doesn't serve its purpose anymore. Uh, years ago, we've been having this issue where we get a lot of uh, food traffic to our street. So 
Um, what we're asking is if there's any way we can deviate the traffic and then the foot traffic to move it along the uh, Avram so that way they don't have to go through, through our street. Uh, we've been so patient for so many years, haven't said anything. With that, then nothing can be done, but uh, I believe that you know, with the city approval and the city work, uh, things can be done. Um, so anyway, so that's the one thing that I wanna say. Thank you. Our next speaker. Good evening. My name is Regina Langhout, and in addition to um, living and voting in Santa Cruz. I'm also a professor at UC Santa Cruz. And in that capacity, I am the lead <coughs> author on a policy brief from the Society for Community Research and Action. This policy brief is a policy about a policy brief about deportation and the effects of forced family separation on individuals, families, and communities. So I'm here today to thank you for agendizing um, the raid that happened about two weeks ago. And I hope in terms of what we will discuss when that comes up and when we talk about it publicly is that we will find out more about who knew what before the raid happened, that we can also learn more about the police and the sheriff's department participation in that raid and that we can talk about the policies that we have here in Santa Cruz in terms of our sanctuary ordinance, and if we need to put any additional policies and practices into place so that we are living up to that particular ordinance. I hope that we can talk about the effects not only on the family um, that lived in the home that was um, where the door was busted down and where the flash grenades were thrown, but also on the effects on our broader community. And with that, I hope that I can get to you the deportation policy brief. Um, although it focuses mostly on forced family separation, there's also information in it about what happens when we, and when, an, when a community experiences such violent raids such as these, and what local governments can do to help protect um, our entire community because this does affect all of us. So thank you. Good evening, my name is Peter Klotz Chamberlain and I want to add to many articulate statements that have been made already about that horrendous terror attack on a residence and a neighborhood in our community that as Professor Langhout just said, not only traumatizes the family, but really traumatizes the whole community, especially those who are our neighbors without papers. Um, it seems to me in addition to, I hope that all of the great suggestions are, are recorded and will be brought back uh, when it's on the agenda. I think investigation into, as, as I understand it, both the chief of police and the sheriff knew about uh, the raid ahead of time. Did any civilian uh, elected officials or appointed officials know about it? And uh, how can we strengthen our status as a sanctuary city to not only uh, uh, have a small circle know about something like this, but enable uh, YAR and uh, other citizen responses who want to be right there in support of a family and be able to document uh, when something like this happens. Um, everybody should know about it right away, and I hope that the city can play a role in that. And also, in addition to that event, the aftermath for the family. Can the city uh, either push for through our <coughs> member of Congress or the city itself um, devote any reparations to the suffering that the family endured? Thank you. So before we get before we move on to the next speaker for oral communications, I want to um, let the community know that from seven to seven thirty is the time for oral communications. I realize that there's still folks who'd like to address the council. I will extend it just a little bit because we got started a touch late, um, but unfortunately, I will have to cut it off and we'll have to move on to our seven thirty uh, general business item. If you are interested in reaching out to the city council, you're welcome to email us. Um, We'd be happy to, uh, also we take meetings, so we'd be happy to con connect with you um, other than just tonight. Um, you're also welcome to stay, and if we want to reopen oral communications after our conclusion of our evening item, we could do that as well. I realize that could likely be late, but um, in the interest of uh, my role in uh, maintaining the meeting going, um, I, I will unfortunately have to cut off the oral communication. So we'll have about, uh, maybe about Five more, two more speakers, and then we'll go ahead and end, end the oral communications for about five more minutes. Excuse me, were you in line for oral communications? Um, I, I, I had, oh, okay. 
Thank you. Okay, well, we can have you as our last, if, if for an item that's not on tonight's agenda. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, my name's Damon Bruder, Concerned Citizen. Um, I'm here to speak about the, the events of the last meeting um, where you stood up for yourself, Ms. Mayor. Uh, you stood up for yourself in your position and put it on record um, how you feel uh, and how you feel you've been treated. And I very much applaud you for that. Uh, I feel that the mayor is in charge of the show. She gets to set the agenda. Um, when the next mayor comes along, they get to set the agenda. If you want to whine and cry about it, don't do it in public. It's not the Sweetie Muffin Top show. We deserve better. Grow up, be mature, all of you, and treat your city the way it needs to be treated. you'll have two. Hi, my name is Melissa Freebaron. I saw you guys last time about needles. I just want to say thank you for putting a sharps container down on the levee and acknowledging that over 60% of the people that are currently there are actually using drugs and those maybe those needles will not flow onto our beaches. I'd like to extend that symbolism now to actually our parks and beaches, which you guys are actually in control of making <laughs> sure those sharps kiosks get in there, even though the county runs the syringe program. I've already heard from the county point the finger at you guys that the reason we don't have sharps kiosks is because of the symbolism we're way past that here we have a lot of addiction issues in this community if you've grown up in this community you understand that and i'd like to see this money spent towards actual meaningful rehab beds not 10 beds for a sobering center that doesn't help people okay not a for-profit corporation that does our <laughs> medical care in the jail that doesn't actually help people. Not county mental health services that are splintered, not actually connected with city services. The city and the county need to stop pointing fingers at each other and do their job. It's our money, okay? We've already spent $25 million for 64 beds at Roundtree that have stayed empty since we've built them. Half of those beds have been empty. Where's the meaningful change, okay? Now we're doing the FIT program, 30 beds. So for 30 people, you're gonna spend a million dollars, okay? We need you to do your homework. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. These policies are out there. And also, as a mother who lives in the Seabright community and whose child goes to Galt, I'm extremely offended at the way we treat our neighbors, my neighbors who live here with their children, who are maybe undocumented. I don't need the Department of Homeland Security coming in in unmarked vehicles terrorizing our children. It's unacceptable. We won't stand for it. Thank you. So we'll uh, conclude oral communications after our last speaker, which I didn't realize you were there. So. I'll make this really short. I would like also, uh, as far as you asking uh, the, the people here, the public, to have some respect, is that if you could treat us with respect, and that means letting us finish a sentence, the two minute bell, maybe even one more sentence, to cut us off in the middle of a sentence seems extremely uh, rude. The other thing is, you knew this was going to be a very large attended city council meeting. Why are over 100 people outside? Why can't it be at the Civic? It's been requested many, many yeah. times, you knew about this, yeah. to divide us up, and so, and, and for the right-wing people in our city, the NIMBYs that are in the city to line up and get here first so that they can, they can look like they're the loudest and they have, and, and that, that represents the people. It does not represent the city of Santa Cruz. It represents a very loud, uncompassionate group of people that are basically in this room because you would not have it in this civic where all of us could be there at the same time. So I request in the future you have this at the civic. I'm glad you're agendicizing uh, the ICE raid and even though it wasn't ICE, as you've heard, uh, they were asking uh, questions about immigration when they were detained. So 
um, I'm glad that's taken care of, that you're gonna agenda sizes, but please, next time, can you please have it at the Civic? Thank you. Yeah. 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 At, at this time, um, I realize there's other members of the public who would like to address this during oral communications. I have to conclude oral communications um, and we'll have to move on to our general business at this point. And, um, and again, please feel free to reach out to the council. You can e reach out to us by email or set up appointments and or if you're inclined, you're welcome to speak to us at the end of the uh, evening session. I'll just for the, uh, for the community to know that the Civic was unavailable this evening. So just sort of as an, as an FYI, uh, we do um, have the overflow room at the Tony Hill room, um, and I recognize that that we're at a, at a very full capacity. So at this point, we'll go ahead and uh, conclude oral communications, and we'll move on to our general business item. Mayor, and Mayor could, just, um, could we get a report back on the trees at First and Atlantic? Uh, I assume that they were referring to Leslie Keedy. I just wanted to hear what happened out there. Okay. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, begin our evening session. And the evening session is the sole item on our agenda, which is the item of the homeless state of emergency, the overnight parking restrictions on portions of Delaware Avenue, and the status of the joint plan for emergency shelter provision and encampment management, and council actions on homelessness. Um, before we uh, go ahead and get started, I will uh, again just remind the community that this is an opportunity for us to uh, hear from our staff, for the council then to ask questions of our staff and um, for more clarifying questions in terms of the topic, at which time uh, we're able to conclude those questioning, we will open it up to the community for public comment. Um, once public comment is uh, complete, then we'll return back to uh, the council for action and deliberation. So just sort of a summary of what to expect. We will have an opportunity for he to hear from you um, and uh, we also ask that you respect us while we have an opportunity from our, to hear from our staff to ask questions and uh, to respect the process. So at this time, I'll go ahead and um, ask our staff to uh, take it Martine, away. Martine, uh, just a quick question. Just in terms of process. So uh, after the staff report, are you intending to have public comment on all three items at once and then bring it back? And then could we take the items one at a time? Yeah. Okay. So after the staff report, we'll actually have a uh, brief uh, uh, report at the request of Councilmember Glover, um, and then opportunity for questions then, and then uh, we'll return back for deliberation on all One of them. at a time. Mm -hmm. Council, Vice Mayor Cummings. After the staff report, is there opportunity to give provide direction with st to staff for future um, actions? That would be during, um, after we hear from public comment, we'll take action and deliberation. Yeah. Okay, all right. Good evening, Mayor Watkins, council members. I'm Tina Scholl, assistant city manager, and I'm sitting to my right when she returns is Susie O'Hara, assistant to the city manager. And we have a very comprehensive agenda item for you this afternoon, and we actually have a presentation team. So in addition to myself and Susie, we also have Fire Chief Jason Hyduk, Planning Director Lee Butler, and Parks and Recreation Director Tony Elliott chipping in as well. Um, at your last meeting on February 12th, when you discussed homelessness, you had a very extensive discussion, a lot of public comment, and gave multifaceted um, direction to staff. And after, um, Toward the end of that discussion, it was clarified that there were two items that were requested to be brought back for action, as well as updates on the remainder of some items. So just to go through um, an, an agenda of today, tonight's discussion, we are first going to review the motions briefly from February 12th, because there's been a lot of confusion and some questions around what was taken. It was a long discussion. Um, we are then going to move into an update on the city county joint action plan operations, talking about the outreach, shelter provision, and security and encampment footprint. This is all responsive to council direction. From there, we'll move into a multi-part um, report out on the one of the, the fourth major motion that had about 10 or so subparts. So we'll get into each of those. And we did not have time to provide full updates in the staff report because that was due last Thursday. And we had to move really quickly between the 12th meeting to be prepared for today. But we're delighted that we can provide more information for you tonight. And then at the end of that, um, we can give you a summary and set forth where we were asking for council direction or suggested action. 
Okay, so first just going through the motions, there were four major motion or four motions um, passed by the city council on the 12th. And um, if everyone can look on the left side of this chart, you see the number one motion, and that was the one that was the city county joint action plan to address the encampment at the Gateway Center. And there was some changes to it, but that was adopted by a majority vote to to do three things. The first is to work on <coughs> alternate uh, sheltering options through outreach and navigation to begin the day after the council <coughs> meeting. The second was to fully evaluate other sheltering options, and you can see a, a list in there under sub-item B. And then the third was to do noticing and work toward a closure of the camp by March 15th. Um, another aspect of that motion was to provide $5,000 from the warming center to help with some supplies and bedding. Um, the second motion, and this happened later in the evening, was to clarify some direction around security, around neighborhood impact at the encampment, to move the fencing back along the encampment to be further away from the river walk pathway, and, and in the future to develop proactive neighborhood outreach when shelter ideas are being suggested, and also to do more extensive data collection. So the city and the county have a better sense of who's being served and the various needs and, and demographics of the population. The third motion I'll just cover directed us to also explore the National Guard Armory as a possible um, sheltering option. And as a quick reminder on that, that had been um, a choice of the council to explore. The city and county had been told it was unavailable for renovation, but that renovation never occurred. So similar to other communities down in Southern California who are using armories for sheltering purposes, the council said, please go back and look and see if that's a location that can be considered. We have a report on that. And then the second part of this motion was to reach out to US, UCSC about reports that their students who are sleeping their vehicles on campus were um, being asked to go elsewhere and could the university provide a place for safe parking. And then um, the, an extensive motion we received that we will go into these subparts is, is um, the fourth motion that um, has subparts A through J. And we are going to be walking through a through H, um, I and J, this was looking at ordinances and some data collection around some municipal code um, provisions was to come back within 90 days. So that will not be presented tonight, but we have reports on everything else. Okay, so it's a lot to cover. We wanted to have that in there for you so you could refresh your recollection because it was a very busy evening on the 12th. And so um, at this point, I will turn it over to the assistant to the city manager, Susie O'Hara, as well as Fire Chief Jason Hyduke, and they are going to walk through the first portion of our agenda, which is number two here on the screen, an update on the city county joint action plan operations related to the gateway encampment. All right, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members, Susie O'Hara, and I'm the assistant to the city manager, <coughs> excuse me, getting over a cold, as usual. <coughs> so I'm gonna be going over this slide and then I'm gonna turn it over to Fire Chief Hyduke to talk about um, outreach and engagement and really trying to get a better understanding as to the number of individuals that are currently at the Gateway Encampment and their needs. So the day after um, our last meeting, we did uh, develop an outreach strategy. This is between the city and the county um, to ensure that we are engaging <clears throat> with every um, individual that currently resides at the Gateway Encampment um, about alternative shelter options. Um, as you can imagine, there's um, quite a number of people out there. Um, there is a distinction, I believe, between the number of people that are sleeping out there and those that are, using the, the area during the day. We're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. But that first re week of outreach started last week and I'm gonna talk a little bit about outcomes of that. So, as I mentioned, the weekly shelter outreach team, um, which is comprised of city, county, Salvation Army staff and volunteers. Last week, we focused on women um, predominantly, and we also did outreach to a number of men and other um, non-binary individuals. Um, our Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women did um, come out and provide volunteers um, for this outreach efforts, because um, they are very focused on uh, 
engaging with um, vulnerable populations in our community, especially women, as well um, as um, we also are engaging with those that are um, doing harm reduction on Thursday, so that's Denise Ellerick and, and Steve Pleitch who have been out helping um, as well. So I wanted to express my appreciation for that. Um, last week on Wednesday, we contacted about 40 individuals. Um, we, we passed out 17 vouchers, mm. and on Friday we provided um, a transition with our pool van here to folks at the VFW and at the Laurel Street uh, shelter site. Only six people ended up transitioning over. Um, I think for the first week, um, we were optimistic about getting as many people as we can, but it was you know, a pretty significant endeavor for our volunteers and city staff and something that we had to put together pretty quickly. So, um, and I also want to express my appreciation, I don't know if he's in here, I suspect he is, to Brent Adams of the Warming Center. He did come out on Friday and provide provided a, um, a uh, tote <laughs> for the storage center and really did facilitate folks who were paring down their items um, to provide storage for folks that were transitioning to other shelters. Um, in our um, look at the population last Wednesday, there are anywhere from 150 to 200 people there um, during the day. Um, we were also there coinciding with county um, health and human services um, there is a lot of foot traffic. It, it is very hard to, dis to discern who is spending the night there and who is there during the day. Um, there is also, from my perspective, and I think my, my perspective is shared amongst the volunteers and staff that are out there, significant health and safety concerns. Um, a lot of what I would characterize as medically vulnerable folks out there. Um, a lot of um, really high dens density in terms of population, um, you know, potential for a lot of risk associated with this um, population. So I'm gonna have um, the fire chief talk about that more. In addition to the outreach, we are still steadfastly working on shelter provision. So the Lower Street Salvation Army opened um, the day after your council meeting, our last council meeting with 40 beds for women, families, and mobility impaired adults. Um, the program at 1220 River Street, <clears throat> we're in the final process of developing the infrastructure and operator plans, and we are poised to enter into a nonprofit contract to operate that program. So we're very optimistic that we're gonna be able to open that up with a 60 bed capacity. The use of the armory, we are in talks with the county about, uh, about this, and they are shepherding that process, um, working with the Department of the Military to understand the cost and feasibility of using that facility. And then we also, <coughs> excuse me, we are also um, expecting the outcome of the letter of interest for emergency shelter provision to be um, this week. And that will likely include alternative shelter options as well. So safe parking and other things that we've been talking about over the last number of weeks. In addition to shelter provision and gateway encampment outreach, <clears throat> we're also, I wanted to give an update on encampment and neighborhood management. We did secure 24 seven gateway encampment security that started this week, a few days ago. The footprint to the encampment was set back. I believe that was last week. Um, the downtown streets team um, did move their levy team over to Felker Street and they are cleaning Felker Street five to seven days per week, um, which is a wonderful addition to the work that we were hoping to ha have happen out there. The mobile command unit has been placed at the Ross um, parking lot and the syringe kiosk has been installed. So a lot of the things that we talked about at the last meeting have, have taken place. I'm gonna turn it over to the fire chief to talk a little bit about um, outreach and engagement on behalf of the fire department. Mayor, councils. So th this has been a, a very challenging um, demographic to kind of engage with. And so I reached out to the county, to the EMS medical director, as well as the uh, county health, try and get some numbers and a sense of what was occurring there. Um, so far, um, and these numbers you see up here, EMS calls for service 65 total year to date with 42 being between November and, and February. It may not seem like a large number, but uh, any single address that gets more than 100 calls in a year would be a significant address. And some of those would be ones that you would expect, a healthcare facility or a skilled nursing facility where you've got a population that would um, have medical conditions that we would respond to on a more regular basis. Um, 
we also were asked to try and get a, a sense of who was in this camp. And like Susie was saying, there's a daytime population, but we were kind of curious about what the nighttime population was for people who are actually sleeping. Uh, so we modeled it after the uh, point time count uh, that I participated in a few <coughs> weeks ago. We went out early in the morning before people were mobile. Uh, we went out on the 23rd at six o'clock in the morning as the sun was coming up. And, and talking to a, a number of the occupants um, and looking at the tents, um, and some of the tents, it's kind of hard to tell which is a single tent and which one are kind of joined together. I would say that between 60 and 70% of the tents on that morning were occupied. Um, and in talking to uh, two different residents there, they had a sense that there was approximately 100 people or so sleeping at, at uh, the camp in the evening, which is different than the daytime population. Uh, it's a very porous uh, border as far as people coming in and out. It's not a single gate, it's not a single door. Um, and that daytime occupant uh, use, uh, there's a lot of drug activity occurring um, in addition to the shelter needs that we're trying to address. Um, from a fire department uh, aspect, um, and I share this with the, the county, is we have access issues into that uh, camp for medical calls. And one of the things that we've been doing with the outreach team with the county, um, and also with some of the volunteers there of the idea of self-extrication. Uh, AMR, our county ambulance provider, uh, they have concerns for their uh, work, worker uh, safety, and they do not want to go into the camp at night for a number of reasons. One, because it's not lit, and they don't feel safe there, but also because it's not a hard surface. It's not an engineered site where you can roll a gurney, you can get uh, someone in and out, and they're having significant decon issues with their equipment. And so they, uh, from a county perspective, have asked that people um, come to the parking lot uh, w when we come there. The other thing with this, with the, with the numbers, that's a little bit challenging, is that it's not a fixed address when someone calls. Um, it, it comes in as a lot of different names. It doesn't just come in at 650 River Street or Ross Camp or the bridge at Highway 1 or you know, the pedestrian footpath. So these numbers are, these are specific to that address, but my gut feeling is that these numbers are a little bit low, but I'd rather report what we have on um, factual you know, data for that uh, address. Um, and then the concerns, and the county shares this as well, is it's because this is a non-sanctioned and non-conforming uh, camp, um, there's issues with that that we've always had in our community, but because of the aggregate number of people within that space, uh, they're concerned about the transmission of disease. <coughs> we're concerned about the ability to access. We're concerned about uh, fire. As you know, it's been cold. We have a lot of people that are using equipment to stay warm, which I recognize is a human need, but because we don't have the normal standards that we would have a pla in place for a building or a campsite, uh, the spread of fire from one tent to the other uh, is a significant concern, as well as the spread of disease. Um, there's the county uh, vector control is going to be doing outreach there. Um, we're trying to remove refuse from that area as regularly as we can, but they're worried about uh, disease being transferred uh, because of animals that are there um, and because of the uh, living conditions. Um, the use of, of heating and cooking equipment is a concern. Uh, there are propane tanks there. We've been fairly uh, rigid about the use of fire, uh, not having open fire pits, open flame, uh, just because of the proximity of the tents and the number of tents. But we also have concerns with people using heating devices in an enclosed space for carbon monoxide. Um, and so th there's a lot of concerns besides just the, um, the, the human outreach for shelter. We also wanna have shelter that is functional for those people. Um, and this group has been very reluctant to engage with us on uh, enacting any kind of standards, um, even with the outreach we did last week where we were down there for hours um, with volunteers, with people who are familiar with the community. I got very limited interaction for the number of people who wanted to come and engage with other shelter services. Uh, we had 17 people um, that said, yes, I, I wanna change, I wanna go somewhere else. And at the end of the day, in the evening, we were able to transport six people. So we have a large population that um, is there. I don't know that they want to transition to another place and where they're living has some concerns from uh, a health, a health and safety uh, um, consideration. Okay. Thank you, Susie and Jason. So that concludes that portion of the update on the encampment. So to recap some of the major themes is we are going out and conducting the outreach as directed by staff 
and the Board of Supervisors as well to their staff working with the city, the county, Salvation Army, and other volunteers, and thank you to them. Trying to really ascertain what is the sleeping occupant population, because that's the cohort. Those are the set of people that we need to find shelter alternatives for. So knowing that number is really crucial to us coming up with the final shelter products. You've also heard um, a good update on, on having hopefully about 100 beds online with in total within the next few weeks. And we also are, through our outreach, talking to folks and getting a better sense of what are barriers to shelter that we need to be aware of. What are maybe different alternatives we might need to explore to meet some needs. So these are all part of the conversations that are going on. Um, yes, yeah, so finding that accurate count. And we will pretty soon have to shift into getting an actual by name list. We're gonna have to know with some specificity exactly who's there. Where are you? Where, what tent are you in? So we can know you, know your circumstances, and know what help we might need to help connect you with. Um, we, the, as you heard, the health and safety is still a very significant concern from us from many angles. And you heard some stories, and many of you have been out there and experienced um, some of the graphic things that um, were just touched a bit on tonight. And, and finally, again, just that outreach really will help us understand our barriers. So we're gonna continue that. We're gonna continue on with the council direction. Um, we will be coming back to you at your next council meeting on the 12th as well to give you, you know, sort of the, the final update on, on that. So um, thank you again to Jason and Susie. So then shifting into the next part of the agenda, and I can reorient you, but this was part three of the overall discussion agenda where we start marching through the, the more lengthy motion and talking about um, all of the various subparts that the city council asked us to work on. And specifically, again, we were asked to bring back two action items and reports on the rest. So this first one is an action item. And um, this was to bring back an, a, a, a resolution declaring a state of emergency, a state of homeless emergency. And so we did not have that prepared in time for the agenda packet, as you may have seen, but we do have an instrument that we can hand out tonight. But I'm also helping, hoping to have a discussion about different instruments under the law, under the California government code, that are sometimes talked about as a state of emergency. Um, and and there's, so there's a few different pathways. So I'd like to have that discussion with the council, talk about different pathways, and ultimately you'll provide the direction on what you're seeking to achieve through various things. So the first, um, the first creature under California law in the, in the California government code is something called a declaration of a shelter crisis. And the council actually has a declared shelter crisis. And I'll, <coughs> this was in your packet, and I'll also pass around a copy in case it's helpful for you to have the hard copy at your fingertips. Um, but what the shelter crisis does, a council may declare it if it finds that a significant number of persons are without the ability to obtain shelter, resulting in a threat to their life and safety. And by doing this, a few things are opened up for cities. And when the city did this back in January of 2018, it was contemplated, does it make more sense to go with a um, local emergency declaration or to go with a shelter crisis declaration? And at the time, thinking about what the city was trying to accomplish, this was the path the council ultimately chose. And the reason we did that is that we were trying to stand up shelters and we thought that we would like something that would help reduce barriers to, to build things, to have flexibility with health and safety codes. You know, knowing that this is an actual crisis, we need to be able to move more quickly, more rapidly to providing shelter uh, provision for people in need. Um, another important part of the shelter crisis is, is that it provides immunity from ordinary negligence. So again, you're moving quickly, you're trying to really respond to a crisis situation, you know, we, we do our best to maintain everything, but if there's just some, some very basic minimal liability, then we would be immune from that. Um, gross negligence, things like that would, of course, not be covered, but of course we would not engage in those sorts of things. So you can see here on the slide, um, I mentioned the immunity, allow suspension of any state or um, local regulatory statute, et cetera and allows for alternate health and safety standards. So the, the version I sent around, you can see is fairly simple and it is somewhat tailored for the circumstances we were in in early 2018. That is moving into the River Street camp. That was about that time where that transition was happening and we weren't exactly sure what was ahead of us in terms of shelter or options. Um, and so in looking at this again and conferring with the city attorney, there's a sense that this instrument itself, the shelter crisis declaration could be improved. It could be expanded to have 
maybe perhaps more general application. It also could include more specifically um, other land use regulations such as the California Coastal Act and CEQA, just to be very clear that we want to maximize our flexibility. So an option for the council could be to have us go back and provide a revised um, shelter crisis declaration that has these other features the city attorney said could be useful. And it very well could be useful as we were trying to be very flexible and creative with our shelter options. Now, um, the, the second uh, possible vehicle under state law is a declaration of a local emergency, and that's what we were directed to bring back tonight, and I'll send around a draft of that in a moment. And declaring a, a, a local emergency, first of all, there is no um, specific homeless like a state of homeless emergency, that's used, but there is no specific legal creature that aligns with that. So it would just be declaring a local emergency, but the basis for that would be a homeless emergency. So that would be, and um, having that interpretation is allowable under state code. Um, because as you can see here on the slide, they may declare a local emergency if it finds existence of conditions of disaster or extreme peril to the safety of persons and property. And the council can interpret the, the, the genesis of that extreme peril to persons and property. So a declaration of a local emergency um, does allow the city to call upon mutual aid and potentially financial support if the governor of the state would recognize the declaration and send funds down to the city. Um, we have used it twice before for the winter storms in 2017. So we had, I think, a couple of declarations in January and February of 2017. And then also with the 2011 tsunami surge that we were mostly hit in the harbor. Um, shelter emerg or local emergencies have to be renewed every 60 days. So the council would have to take up a resolution to continue the state of emergency every 60 days. It used to be 30 days. It just changed in state law in January of this year. Um, so with this, um, and there's, there's maybe varying uses. I've seen a few cities around the state that have declared an emergency. And um, to, to my research, although it hasn't been completely extensive, I don't know if the governor has accepted any of these, declared a state of local homeless emergency and actually sent funds down to localities. So you see communities using it as maybe a call for action as well, or to heighten the sense of awareness in the community or the, the sense of the, the depth of the crisis. Um, so anyway, that, that's just a couple of things that the council can consider. And I do want to pass around then a draft of a um, local homeless emergency declaration. There are copies in the back window um, as well for people to read. And I can pull it up here on the screen if you'd like. Would that be something you'd like to see? Okay, so let's see if I can zoom this. Okay, all right, so hopefully this is viewable. It looks pretty big back there. So the first few recitals just talk about the fact that we have nearly half the county's homeless population here in the city of Santa Cruz, 1,204 people out of 2,249 counted in 2017, the last point in time homeless count. I'll say I mentioned this last time, but the 2019 count just occurred on January 31st, but we won't have that data available until perhaps June or July, because there's a, a lot of, um, there's a follow-up survey that has to be administered and all the data compiled and report written. So we, we don't know where we are now. The data are two years old, but this is the best we have. Um, the next recital just talks about the, the homeless populations um, being a variety of individuals, um, many with co-occurring disabilities and conditions. There are inadequate homeless services and shelter supply countywide, resulting in a significant number of people um, remaining without the ability to obtain shelter. Often when you're unsheltered, you're without adequate sanitary uh, facilities and are at risk of theft, crime, and weather conditions. And these conditions result in an extreme threat to the physical and mental um, health and safety. Those experiencing homelessness in addition to such conditions also result in a critical threat to the natural environment and the public health, safety, and well-being of the surrounding community. So those are the, the recitals. They're very basic. They're similar to the recitals that you'll see in the shelter crisis declaration you've already adopted. And then the remainder of the clauses just cite the government code sections um, 8630 through 8634, which cites the authority for you to take this action. The requirement that it be renewed by your body every 60 days. 
And then there are um, the resolution clauses resolving that you've, you're making the finding that these conditions exist within the city and that you resolve that you're proclaiming a state of local homeless emergency within the city and then calling on the governor to um, declare and proclaim a state of emergency in Santa Cruz and provide support and resources. So this is uh, just a draft we, we put forward for your potential consideration when it comes time to that later in your agenda item. Um, so then to wrap up this aspect of the report out, uh, there's a few options in front of the council. One is that you can um, direct staff to go back and do some revisions and expansion of the shelter crisis declaration. You could adopt this instrument this evening or ask staff to go back or revise it here or ask staff to go back and revise it and bring it back. You could do a blend of the two, but we just want to present the full options for you, knowing the history um, that the city has already taken. All right, so if that's all right, I think we'll move on to the next one. Okay, as the head nods, okay. Okay, thank you. So now we are shifting on to the next element of the motion. Let's just shuffle my papers. And, um, and you'll see actually at the top of these slides in the gold text, in parentheses to the side, you'll see reference to the subparts of the motion we're responding to in that section. So 1A was the emergency declaration. 1B, D, E, and G all had a commonality around they directed certain aspects of looking at transitional encampments. So we merged all of those subparts in because they all were different, um, different levers or mechanisms um, affecting the same um, issue. So for this, I will be inviting up Lee Butler, the Director of Planning and Community Development. But before I do, I did want to orient the council to the project charter that he'll be referencing. And I believe Susie passed around a copy and this was in the agenda item. So I just wanna walk through the structure of this document so you know, for the public and the council, so you know what you're looking at and why we do this. So when the, the city embarks upon a substantial policy effort or new project, we like to put together a project charter. And a project charter helps I outline in great specificity what you're trying to accomplish, why you're doing it, the steps you might take, the considerations, the risks. And so you really have a full sense of the scope of the work before you leap into it. You're making sure that you're carefully considering the implications, thinking about what I wanna make sure I don't miss early on. So you'll see that this is a, a three and a quarter page document. You can see the team members, the, the staff members that would participate in this work, the mission, the business case, that is why do the thing, objectives, the process <coughs> scope, the deliverables through the process, the stakeholders that should be involved, roles and responsibilities of team members, the resources need, assumptions, risks, boundaries, et cetera. So it's an extensive document, but it really does help clarify thinking around it so that we are very sure when we embark about something that we understand the work that we're doing. So we're presenting this to the council today and um, Director of Planning and Community Development, Lee Butler will walk through the substance of the document. Thank you, Tina, and good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, the, as Tina mentioned, the motion itself is listed up there um, in small text, and I'll quickly paraphrase. Um, and the Council was asking that we identify public and private sites that can serve as transitional encampments and to develop either an ordinance or a policy that facilitates the establishment of transitional encampments for people experiencing homelessness. And I'll just quickly um, summarize what a transitional encampment is for the benefit of the public. It's essentially a, a camping site that would be located uh, throughout the community or at multiple locations throughout the community that serve as a safe place for people experiencing homelessness to temporarily live while they find and or are assisted with finding permanent stable housing options. And so in response, as Tina uh, indicated, we developed a project charter and um, we identified four key items as the purpose of this exercise. And the first would be um, identifying public property locations that we vet with the community that could serve as uh, transitional encampments. The second would be to identify locational characteristics that um, would serve as um, 
preferred locations for private properties that could accommodate transitional encampments. Um, we also would want to establish operating criteria to ensure quality of life for all the stakeholders. And finally, we would come up with a process whereby public and private entities can establish these um, transitional encampments. So the, the first step in this would certainly be researching similar models in other cities and looking at the locational criteria and operational criteria and best practices that they've used. Um, there are some examples that we've already looked at that Susie will speak to in just a few minutes um, in Seattle and Portland and Eugene. And she's actually been up to visit some of those and so can speak firsthand to some of the um, operational characteristics that they have um, and that they developed um, through a community-driven process to um, establish those camps. And the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> certainly outreach will be a critical component of this process. The council is aware we've got our community outreach policy and we would be engaging stakeholders both um, in small focus groups as well as uh, inclusive larger community meetings to really hear from a broad spectrum of the community and um, engage with as many people as possible. We have a variety of objectives with the outreach. Um, we first would wanna learn from nonprofit operators, how their needs um, can be facilitated through the process that we develop and how we can encourage them to pursue these transitional encampments. Second, um, we would be learning from community members and um, all the stakeholders how the transitional encampments can be operated in a manner that best, best serves the camp residents and um, provides them with assistance in achieving improved living situations, as well as um, operating in a manner that is least impactful to the surrounding community, the businesses, and the environment. So, Based on the materials that um, were provided at the last meeting, we um, developed some uh, thoughts that serve as an initial step that we would want to um, vet here. First off with the council and of course, you know, our recommendations could change through the community outreach process, but just getting a good understanding of what the council sees as um, how these camps would function would be helpful in pointing us in the right direction for our initial conversations with the community. And so um, we had a few things that we wanted to um, specify that we, uh, how we understand the direction and as part of the council's deliberation later in the meeting, we'd hope to uh, hear some uh, conversation on these and that may be helpful for us in embarking on this exercise. So first the nonprofit as the business operator, um, they would be uh, doing things like arranging for the um, any uh, porta potties or shower facilities and so forth. We would have a common set of rules for the residents at the facilities. Um, there is uh, the idea of self-regulation and enforcement um, through the, the camp. And then um, we wanted to confirm that these would be temporary for private properties. And we have some codes that allow for um, uh, an initial one year term uh, and an extension of one year for areas outside of the coastal zone. And then six months and 12 months for areas inside of the coastal zone. Um, and whether or not the council sees that as uh, an appropriate timeline for public properties. And part of that is, um, is important because it helps to establish the process that we will need to, um, to vet with the community, whether that is a policy that we may be able to move forward or if it would actually require ordinance changes. And so hearing the council's thoughts on that would be helpful for us. 
So we have put together um, what I believe is an aggressive timeline. We recognize the, um, the importance of this in, to the council and to the community. And um, there is a, a substantial amount of uh, effort that goes into this. We would be coordinating this effort with at least seven uh, different city departments as identified in your agenda report. And we would um, start off by completing additional outreach, uh, or excuse me, additional uh, research and analysis and uh, that initial outreach in the next couple of months, um, followed by putting together some draft policy recommendations that we would vet with stakeholders um, then we would be refining the ordinance and policy language. Depending on um, what type of uh, process we have to pursue, whether that's a policy uh, issue or an ordinance issue, um, and whether or not public parks are identified, um, we may or may not need to go to um, the Planning Commission and or the Parks and Recreation Commission. So this timeline builds in uh, touch points with those um, commissions for uh, their recommendations. And then we would be bringing the policy and or ordinance recommendations as well as the public site preferences or locational characteristics back to the council in August. And with that, I will turn it over to Susie who can speak to you about some of the other models. So I had the good fortune of having a scheduled uh, family vacation to Portland last weekend. And so um, we got there on Thursday evening and I opted out of a family um, trip to Powell's bookstore to go meet with the city of Portland. So I will suggest that was a pretty, <laughs> Pretty, uh, they were bummed that I wasn't able to go and I will go next time. So I did meet with the city of Portland and the county um, as well to talk about the transitional encampments there. We have talked about Dignity Village and other um, encampment models and I really wanted to have some firsthand experience as to what was the process for which the city of Portland and other Pacific Northwest cities came to the conclusion that transitional encampments were an appropriate um, program in the continuum of shelter services for that those areas. Um, understand about their genesis. Um, why did they come to fruition? How are they functioning now? The benefits and potential drawbacks. And then also in addition to that, how are those cities experiencing unsanctioned encampments as well um, as they continue to um, shepherd transitional encampments and other, uh, other types of models that are really more of a, um, an alternative shelter site that might be outdoors or in, in tiny homes, et cetera. So um, the city of Portland <clears throat> was infinitely helpful in thinking about how transitional encampments may fit into our community and I wanted to provide some perspective. They also gave me a ton of information on uh, the city of Se Seattle as well as the city of Eugene. And I have reached out to a council member at the city of Eugene and have gotten a point of contact from Mr. Uh, sorry, council member Glover on um, other programs there. So um, we will continue that research as well. So I'm gonna kind of step through these different models because I think it's really important um, in my research, transitional encampment is just one model. There are many different models that we could be considering. And they also um, really cater to a specific uh, type of population. And as we contemplate um, our process around uh, the closure of the, the gateway encampment and thinking about how to diversify our sheltering options to meet the specific needs of our community members, I think it's important to think about all these different models. So I'll just briefly go through what um, each of these cities has in their portfolios. So the city of Se Seattle has currently nine city permitted villages. Their capacity is ranging from 16 beds to 60 beds. Um, and that's across a different type of structure. Some um, tiny homes, some uh, kind of tough shed models, some encampments, and some of them um, have all of those different types of structures in one place. Um, all are partially, or um, I'm sorry, all of the Seattle programs are operated, operated by a, a nonprofit. All are either partially or fully self-governed, and I'll talk a little bit about how that process works. Um, all share very strict rules of conduct, including a zero tolerance policy for out drugs and alcohol, use and possession, violence, et cetera. Um, all in, in the city of Seattle have community advisory committees. 
Every single one of their meetings is online. It is a wealth of information about the type of people um, that go to the type of structure around these community um, advisory committees, the city's involvement, the neighborhood's involvement. Um, there is a lot of communication between the encampments at, and the neighbors to ensure that there's, um, you know, uh, issues are resolved quickly and there's good neighbor policies. Um, unsanctioned can't, however, Unsanctioned encampments remain a significant challenge for Seattle, even with these nine city uh, permitted villages. Um, currently, this, um, sorry. Um, currently, the city of Seattle has, and this is um, a kind of a point in time count um, right now since January, 900 locations within the city where people are sleeping outdoors. So 900 encampments, um, and if you compare that to the nine um, city permitted villages, obviously they're serving a very small population of those in need in Seattle. Um, Seattle's navigation team of 30 staff members outreaches unsanctioned encampment residents for impact assessment. So they go in and they do an impact assessment to see about impacts on residents and impacts in the general uh, vicinity, neighbors, business, businesses, and they make decisions about um, what to do in terms of prioritizing cleanup and moving folks into other shelter options. Um, and they also um, obviously navigate folks to those other services. So the city of Portland has three different programs. <clears throat> The Kenton's Women's Village is um, a proactively piloted um, and sanctioned encampment or village. It's very small, it's only 15 beds, but it is the one encampment in Portland that was, that was proactively developed and not reactive to an unsanctioned encampment. And I think that's an interesting point to make. Capacity ranging from 15 to 70 beds. <clears throat> Um, Kenton is the one that is exclusively operated by a professional nonprofit. Dignity Village is um, completely self-governed, but there is nonprofit assistance with services. And then the Right to Dream, which is an overnight program or a rest area, is um, self-governed as well. Um, in addition to Seattle, unsanctioned encampments in Portland remain a significant challenge. Last fiscal year, there were 25,460 um, encampments that were um, brought to the city's attention for um, mitigation. I believe that they cleared out about 4,000 of those last year and are continuing on that pace for this year. And so the point of that re really is, is thinking about kind of this, this um, duality of um, how do we provide services to our um, homeless population in a, in a way that is meeting um, individualized needs and understanding barriers, but also having a lot of pragmatism about what, what kind of solutions will actually make a difference. And I'm not suggesting that encampment, uh, sanctioned encampments won't, I believe they will, but I do believe that they need to be part of a continuum of services, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, and so with those 25,460 um, encampments in the city of Portland, they spent about $1.6 million to clean up um, those camp encampments last year. So the city of Eugene <clears throat> has three different programs, a car camping program, much like a safe parking program that we have talked about here, rest stops, which are an overnight program, which is distinct, distinctive from um, a sanctioned encampment or a transitional encampment. And then, on, um, excuse me, a dust to dawn program, which is similar. It's an overnight program as well. I think it operates from 4.30 p.m. to about 6.30 a.m. Um, the capacity of the city of Eugene's programs is for anywhere from 20 to 125 beds. They're all operated by professional nonprofits. Some of them have clients or residents that pr provide security or do other jobs, but most of them um, are operated by, or all of them are operated by professional nonprofits. Um, and in addition to the uh, two other cities, the city of Eugene still struggles with encampment, unsanctioned encampment issues. Um, ironically, um, in my research just last month, they were managing a very similar process to what you're, you're managing now. And because of an uptick in unsanctioned encampments in their downtown area, I've recently gone through a process of um, having a consultant do a shelter feasibility study. And um, all of these cities have been um, really focused on emergency shelter, much like the city is. 
So key takeaways from the Pacific Northwest research, uh, there's a lot of similarities to what we're experiencing um, down here. Um, all of, all of the cities provide these alternative sleeping and camping, camping options, but they're all in very structured environments, and I wanna talk a little bit about how that might <coughs> be distinctive with from the population that is currently at the Gateway Encampment. Um, as I mentioned, all of the cities continue ha to have significant challenges with unsanctioned encampments, and they have developed um, very specific mitigation plans for those that really think about community impact, within um, the residents at the, of the encampment and then adjacent um, properties as well and how to prioritize that. And I think that's something that this council should consider moving forward as well. They are all developing emergency shelter programs with the utmost urgency um, in addition to supporting these um, sanctioned encampments. Um, the sanctioned encampments are part of a continuum of homeless um, response programs and not considered a solution. They uh, appeal to and serve a very specific demographic that may not be consistent with our currently, the demographic concern currently residing at the Gateway Encampment. And I just wanna draw your attention to, um, we had some public comment on this and the fire chief spoke to this t as well. And um, there are a lot of harm reduction services going on at the Gateway Encampment because there is a lot of drug use at the Gateway Encampment. So in thinking about the numbers of folks that we have there, their potential be, to be able to be transition to a transitional encampment with these types of um, restrictions on um, substance use disorder uh, is something that we should be considering. Um, emergency shelter navigation, <clears throat> safe parking, transitional camp encampments, safe sleeping, et cetera, they all provide different types of programming and different barriers to entry. And it's something that we should th be thinking about this entire continuum. Um, and I think uh, we should really be focused on the specific needs in our community and what types of programs will meet those needs. Home homelessness sheltering must provide a diverse set of models. And I just said that. <laughs> And then so in bold here, I do believe transitional encampment models should be studied and including um, safe parking, rest stops, tiny home villages, dust to dawn programs, et cetera. The distinction is we need to make sure they meet the needs of our community. Um, all provide a dig dignified place, uh, space to sleep, crisis stabilization and a first step out of homelessness, but don't necessarily meet the needs of our gateway, our current gateway encampment occupants. And um, quite frankly, our greater homeless unsheltered population, we have a high population of folks experiencing co-occurring disorders. Um, my perspective based on the research is folks in these Pacific Northwest transitional encampments are a pretty stable population. Um, and so thinking about moving forward with transitional encampments and kind of going through the study that um, Lee talked about, really getting to our own and the needs in our community and how best to serve folks that um, are currently unsheltered is, will be of the utmost importance. All right. Okay, thank you Lee and Susie for that uh, very in-depth report and for taking your time to go to Portland. It's great to have that firsthand information. Um, so there are three more parts to the staff presentation if you're tracking. Um, so I will cover the next two parts and then we'll hear from Tony Elliott, the Director of Parks and Recreation. So the two parts I'm gonna cover now were motion parts 1C and 1F. 1C, this was a direction to bring back an action item for the council. 1F was exploration with UCSC. So first 1C, this was about overnight parking restrictions on Delaware Avenue from Swift Street to Schaefer Road. So you saw there was a map in the staff report that just showed the, the length of that. And um, we explored what would it would take if the council would choose to remove the restrictions. And it could be done by council motion, direction to the city manager to not enforce the parking restrictions. And um, the, there are signs that all along there that have been in place since I believe 2004. And the council could direct those to be covered or just removed, whatever council wishes to do on that one. Um, and then, so the next part is with um, UCSC. So there were two aspects of the council direction on the 12th dealing with UCSC. The, the first was asking staff to, um, to 
actually reach out to UCSC about could they let students park and sleep in their cars on their, uh, in some parking lots up on campus. The second was a more formal um, approach to could the city actually lease <coughs> <coughs> parking lot at their 2300 Delaware Avenue for a safe, safe parking program. So we reached out to, thank you to Bonnie Lipscomb for doing the outreach on this, reached out to UCSC on both of these points and they provided an official statement which was part of your packet. I'm sending it around again in case you like having a hard copy in front of you. But I will read, um, first they have a statement so I'll read that and then just uh, touch on these two points. So UCSC states, first we want to address our <coughs> commitment to providing housing support on campus for homeless students. The issue of housing supply is first and foremost a priority for us. We are focused on bringing online over 2,000 beds of additional on-campus student housing in the next few years to help address the long-term affordable housing needs of our students. In addition, the university has made and will continue to make available transitional housing for any student who is in need of housing support. As each student's situation and needs are different, students are asked to contact our SLUG support office, and there's a link here if you see the document online, to obtain these support services. These accommodations include temporary hotel accommodations, temporary or permanent on-campus housing and or adjustments to financial aid. We can work with the student to ensure they have a safe place to live and will take into account their ability to pay. We will not turn away any student in need who seeks assistance. As you know, the university can't require students to live on campus, nor do we restrict students from obtaining services that they are eligible for through off-campus providers. <coughs> However, we offer services and resources to any student who comes to us in need, but we can't require them to take the assistance offered. So that's a statement, I just wanted to read that in case people hadn't seen that. So then they, they provided answers to the two questions we posed to them. First, with respect to evaluating proposals for student overnight sleeping in cars on campus, they said, that um, they are currently evaluating and analyzing different proposals. So they're actively looking into this. They're, um, they're assessing things like risk <coughs> considerations, cost, locations, et cetera. So we don't have a definitive answer on this yet, but we expect to hear back from them in the future and we will stay in touch with them and make sure to report back as soon as we hear something on this. Secondarily, with respect to our request to lease the 2300 Delaware's North parking lot for a safe parking program, they declined that opportunity. <coughs> they said that they actually have some short-term, near-term plans for use of the lot for academic and research purposes, so they're not willing to enter into lease negotiations with us on that at this time. So you can have the answer also appended to their statement is there are attachment A and B which list their UC and UCSC codes related to camping as well as the UCSC parking and program rules, transportation and parking services general information. So that's all the resource and it is attached to the agenda item for those who haven't seen it online. Okay, so with that, that now covers motion subparts 1C and 1F which leaves just one more, and um, this is sub motion subpart 1H, and so with that, I will invite up <laughs> Parks and Recreation Director Tony Elliott. He will walk through um, the charter for hours of public facilities, and, and I've already done a preview of what a charter, so I won't do that, so we'll just invite Tony up to go over that. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council members. Um, yeah, I think Tina fr uh, framed it really well. This is item 1H, uh, report from the Parks and Rec Department uh, regarding reopening of public facilities and bathrooms. Um, <laughs> This item, again, we created a project charter uh, that we shared uh, with the council before this evening. Um, and really there were, um, I think in the, in the recommendation, it uh, referenced the materials submitted this evening. There were several documents tied to this in the motion uh, two weeks ago. Um, in that, there are really three main parts to this motion. So I just wanna kind of cover those three um, aspects to this item and then briefly talk about the process very similar to the planning director, uh, Lee Butler, what he covered with you just a, a little while ago. So um, the summary of the action items, um, and really again, this is explained in, in great detail uh, in the project charter. Um, the first is to de develop recommendations uh, for changes to the municipal code. Um, and this is regarding the city ordinance um, 
that essentially grants the Parks and Rec uh, Department authority to limit hours effectively closing uh, parks um, if need be, when need be. Um, and in the city ordinance, it really explains that the two items that could lead to that are related to public safety and preservation of assets um, in the parks. <coughs> that language is included uh, in the project charter specifically as well. So the recommendation was for um, uh, essentially adding language in that, considering adding language for uh, uh, n essentially necessitating council approval for any closures extending uh, more than 14 days. So we'll uh, review that. And I'll talk about that process uh, here in just a little while. Um, in terms of, I think one of the underlying pieces of that ordinance in the process um, is really a need for greater transparency and consistency. When we change the hours um, of a park facility, of a restroom, if we were to close anything, I think part of the, the challenge there and part of the opportunity that we have through this motion is to, is to lend a greater transparency and consistency through that process. So what we may do to sort of supplement those changes to the municipal code would to bring uh, potentially a recommended um, administrative policy or procedure, something internally that would lend to greater communication, uh, lend to that process of both council review, but also um, uh, internal review, and then also engagement with external stakeholders, for example, county parks, state parks, things like that. So we may bring kind of a supplemental um, administrative uh, policy uh, order as well with that. Uh, the second piece of the, um, of the recommendation is to provide a, re a response to city council regarding facilities and properties currently closed. Um, a big piece of that is including data, operational data. What is currently closed? Why is it closed? What's the history on that? And that really lends to uh, these recommended changes uh, that we'll get to with the municipal code. So uh, what are those thresholds? What are the reasons why we have limited hours or closed things in the past? Um, and what can that do to inform us on developing this uh, uh, amendment to the municipal code um, or policy changes moving forward? So we'll bring that um, uh, as well. Number three is to submit a detailed funding request uh, to support operations necessary uh, to keep uh, parks and facilities open. Um, so this could be a range of things and this will be, um, uh, this will be a, a very broad exercise that we'll go through, but considering personnel, considering changes to our infrastructure, um, considering uh, different type of materials uh, uh, or, um, um, you know, different type of strategies for facilities, for parks, the environmental design and so forth. What are some of the funding needs uh, that we could request or submit to council to be considered as an additional appropriation uh, to allow us to keep uh, parks uh, and facilities both open, but also safe uh, for all users uh, as well. So on the next slide, in terms of the, the process um, that we'll go through, really a lot of this is gonna be focused uh, internally to sort of craft some, some different uh, concepts with the city attorney, with city staff, city manager's office, uh, but really to work with um, the community partners as well. Um, so on number one, the municipal code, um, really kind of crafting some ideas on functionally how could this work, how would we change uh, this language, um, but then engaging groups like the Coastal Commission, the county, state parks, so on and so forth. So um, thinking about what that impact would be and operationally uh, how that would function. Uh, we would take that through um, the Parks and Recreation Commission um, as well, and then eventually get that back to city council. Um, on number two, the parks and facilities closure, again, very similar. What, um, what is closed, why is it closed, what's the rationale, what's the documentation, what's the data uh, behind that? Again, what are those thresholds that we've hit um, uh, in the past that have caused us to um, to act on the current city ordinance to close or, or limit access to, to certain uh, uh, lands or facilities. Um, we wanna do some research on how other uh, California communities are managing um, similar ordinances or, or policies. Um, but again, I think similar to some of the topics we discussed this evening, you know, those don't necessarily dictate uh, what we do here in Santa Cruz. I think we are uh, unique and I think the solutions that we come up with need to be unique to, to our community. Um, uh, again, community engagement, I think this is gonna be a big piece of it. Uh, we have new adopt-a-park groups forming a variety of park and facility users from um, activity <coughs> partners, program partners, um, uh, from youth to seniors. So we wanna engage our community uh, and parks and facility users um, as well. Um, and then again, reviewing that with the Parks and Recreation Commission. On the budget piece of it, um, 
again, very similar. We want to review past, present, and then upcoming sort of anticipated operational uh, financial impacts that we may have. We want to talk with our finance department too about where funds could come from. Um, if we are asking for an additional appropriation, having that background ready for city council to say, well, here's where funds can come from. Here's what that impact would be um, in the sustainability of, of utilizing different uh, funds for those needs. Um, so creating a proposed budget, and then again, similar uh, review with Parks Commission, internal city staff and stakeholders uh, to get that back to city council. In terms of our timeline, we are going to aim uh, to do this work um, and get a, uh, at least some draft proposals to the Parks and Recreation Commission on May 6th. Uh, that, that's our target, um, but if that moves back until uh, July, um, uh, you know, it, it's gonna be somewhere in that time range, very similar to what uh, Planning Director Lee Butler outlined as well. So May to July for review at the Parks and Recreation Commission and then bringing these items back um, uh, for the City Council uh, shortly after that. Okay, thank you so much, Tony. Okay, so that is, um, going through all the subparts. Now we have a summary for you because I know it's probably a lot in a very wide ranging scope. So um, a summary of the council direction or feedback we could request from you or you could take. Um, and you can see the green bar show the various subparts that we covered in our discussion this evening. So the first on the city county joint action plan, um, as we stated, we are continuing shelter outreach to provide alternatives and better understand, understand the basic needs and barriers to, um, to for shelter for the encampment sleeping occupants. Um, finalizing plans for 1220 River Street program, as um, was stated, we believe we're very close to that. We're not in a place where we, we have anything finalized, but we're very close to that. Um, considering other sheltering options to meet the needs of the encampment occupants. And the intention is for the gateway encampment closure to be contingent on every overnight sleeping occupant provided suitable shelter alternatives. This was a clear discussion point with the council at your last meeting and something that we are working to achieve and we feel is attainable um, by our timeline. Second, on the emergency resolution, there were a couple of, of options we outlined with respect to um, either enhancing or, or revising the existing shelter De shelter crisis declaration you have on the books and have had for about a year, taking action on an emergency declaration, so declaring a local homeless emergency either today or at a future meeting. Um, next, on the transitional encampments, you heard uh, the in-depth project charter and read that. So a sense from the council on direction is did we capture what you would like us to do? We put a lot of thought into that, as you can see, involving a lot of people working very quickly and thanks to all the staff that were part of that. But are we on the right track to meet the, the, your needs? Um, fourth, on the Delaware parking, um, we were asked to bring back an action item on that. So if council wishes to direct the city manager to remove or to not enforce the overnight parking restrictions on Delaware between Swift and Schaefer. Um, fifth, on the public facilities and bathrooms, you just heard the report from Tony Elliott. Um, there, similar to the transitional encampments, does that charter sound right? Do we have a good work plan we think meets your needs and meets your expectations? Um, sixth, for UCSC, safe parking, um, there is one element we'll continue with updates on, that is for um, their ability to um, have house um, students and their cars up on campus somewhere. So we'll continue that dialogue. And then finally, just to close the loop on subparts 1I and 1J, um, we did not bring that today. The council direction from the 12th was to return that within 90 days. Um, so that's a summary. If you have a sign up and it's blocking someone behind you, can you please lower your sign so everybody can see? Thank you. Okay, please. Go. Okay, and, and with that, thank you very much for your attention. And that concludes our presentation. Okay. And we're happy, to, um, any of us, to field any of your questions. Thanks. Well, thank you. That was a lot to cover in a short period of time. <laughs> Very impressive. Um, I want to thank all the staff that would and you put together this comprehensive uh, summary, given the short period of time and um, <laughs> magnitude of direction. So <laughs> many, many thanks to you for being here and presenting it. Um, at this time, it'd be an opportunity for the council to ask any clarifying questions of our staff. Um, and and that, that after that is concluded, then we'll uh, go ahead and have uh, Councilmember Glover's presentation. Councilmember Matthews? Um, in terms of the um, encampments, the structured encampments that you got information on, 
Seattle, Portland, and Eugene. Um, it was a relatively small number of encampments serving as it appeared a relatively small percentage of the overall camping. And um, I'm just, I think, reiterating. Yes, I'm um, reiterating the impression I got that uh, there was a certain demographic that was appropriate for those and that um, a great number of others were not. And particularly that the um, demographics at the gateway encampment. I really, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, that the campers at the gateway camp uh, have a high percentage of um, drug drug users, substance abusers, um, that may not be suitable for the kind of structured encampment. So we should be realistic about our expectations for that. Is that a fair recap? Yeah. So um, sorry. <laughs> So yes, that is a fair assessment based on my research and based on the discussion with the city of Portland. Um, and you know, we also city and county staff will be meeting with Brent Adams on transitional encampments this Friday as well to hear about his perspectives about that. Um, my understanding, um, and I have also heard from Mr. Adams about this as well, is that um, these self-governed encampments um, F to be harmonious with their neighborhoods um, that they are placed in and to have that good neighbor policy, it is somewhat of a self-selecting group of individuals. Um, in my research through the city of Seattle, um, as I mentioned, those um, uh, committees that they have that oversee the um, villages, um, each one of those minutes that I looked at does talk about folks being discharged for drug and alcohol possession, um, having zero to tolerance policy about drug and drug and alcohol use and possession, as well as you know bringing in paraphernalia. I believe in large part, um, those types of transitional encampments, as well as you know, you know, the right to sleep, right to dream, sorry, program in Portland and the rest stops and dust to dawn in Eugene um, do have that barrier to entry around substance use disorder um, and then have also just a very um, high set of expectations around behaviors and, and issues that might um, not be conducive to folks living in a smaller, more um, a, den a denser environment with more people living in a small space. So yes, that is a fair characterization. And then there's just a whole lot of other people out there camping. Um, in the Pacific yeah. Northwest cities? Yeah. yeah, I mean, they they are, I think it's across um, the Western United yeah. States. Yeah. I, I don't think we are different than any other city, um, coastal city um, across from San Diego all the way to Seattle. I think unsanctioned encampments and issues around unsanctioned encampments from the perspective of health and safety within the encampment, and then there are also their impacts on neighborhoods are being experienced across um, the Western United States. Okay, Councilmember Myers, then Councilmember Glover, and then Vice Mayor coming. I just had a question um, about the transitional encampments. Um, did you get a sense of whether these were places where people were then transitioning either back to their family homes or into regular housing and uh, just curious sort of w what the continuum of care kind of, of uh, condition was for, for folks who are in these so ironically, I did not get that feeling from the city of Portland and their staff. Um, the feeling that I got, or the information I got from the city of Portland staff is that um, they really considered those three different program models more as an alternative to housing and not necessarily a sheltering through the continuum of care um, process. However, I did look um, at the city of Seattle and as I mentioned, those minutes that they have from their, their monthly meetings, there are people exiting to permanent supportive housing, to back to families. Um, each one that I opened up and looked at, there are people exiting out of those programs and they're relatively small programs. So having one or two exits um, per month is, is, you know, out of 30 is a pretty high rate actually. So I think it, it remains to be seen in terms of the number of people that are transitioning to better living um, conditions. But um, in large part, these are programs where people are spending a lot of time. 
So I would say Dignity Village, um, it, is, it is online that um, the expected stay is up to two years. My perspective, people stay much longer than that, potentially, um, but there, are, there, are, there is evidence that people are transitioning to as, um, better living conditions. And just one more question. Um, the, so looks like, yeah, uh, two of them are in Oregon, one of them's in Washington State. Are, is there state money that's helping fund? You, you, we know that peop, uh, nonprofits are largely operating these, but is, what, what are the, where, where's the uh, funding or the funding coming for supporting, supporting some of these? I don't believe there's any state funding going to these programs. So there is, the city of Seattle um, does support the nine, per, nine permitted villages. I don't know at what level, but I know that um, based on my research that there is city involvement and city staff that's part of their operating structure. Um, with, with regard to Portland and Eugene, um, I believe Kenton's Women's Village is supported financially. The other two through provision of infrastructure, so fencing, um, trash removal, uh, hygiene facilities. With regard to the city of Eugene, I believe that, um, actually I don't know. I don't know if they're funded or not, but I don't believe any of them are funded through state funding. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Um, Thank you for putting this together, Susie, and for the rest of the staff. It's really wonderful to see this presentation and how, uh, just all of the information you've been able to gather. So thank you to you and all of the department heads that have been working on it. Uh, just on that topic of access and people being able to get into or use the facilities, I know that um, we have heard the statements of the percentage of people being observed using either over at the camp or using drugs or alcohol. Uh, and that may be a barrier for them to be able to get into the transitional encampments, but we know that that population of people using drugs and alcohol are not the, are not all of the population, right? So we wanna also be able to offer those opportunities for people to move into spaces. So in your opinion, even though there's a percentage of people in the camp using drugs, do you feel that transitional encampments from your research would be an appropriate beneficial option for the people in Santa Cruz who are not using drugs or alcohol? I think it, they should be considered along with all of the other types of programs that um, I've looked into. I do think that Seattle and Portland and Eugene have put a great deal of thought into those myriad of options and seem to have some type of either rest stop or transitional encampment. So I think it really would make sense for us to consider all of those as we come up with different strategies. Thank you. Vice Mayor Cummings. I said, this, this is kind of going back to just some of the experiences I know that you all have had down to the camps. And I know that initially when there was a census done, um, people were asked if they were from Santa Cruz, or if they've been long-term residents. What percentage of those people at that time, do you remember, are from Santa Cruz or were, have been here for a long time? So I don't think we asked, so the county um, did a census and did kind of a preliminary census and this was probably six weeks ago or four to six weeks to go, uh, ago. Um, I don't believe they asked specifically where you were, where you are from or what part of the county you are from. I think in large part, and this is an anecdotal, but I think there have been a number of different outreach um, operations out there from the perspective of the um, county and now the city is part of those outreach processes as well. In large part, when the encampment formed in um, late October, uh, November, the, the folks that were outreached um, through HPHP and the Homeless Services Center, et cetera, were in large part a familiar population. I would say now, um, based on what I'm hearing from county services, what we're seeing as well, through my unique experience as one of the city staffers who has had a lot of contact through my work on PACT and with the River Street Camp, um, I would say that the population is very diverse now and not necessarily our exclusively local Santa Cruz community. I think we have a lot of South County folks there, potentially even Northern Monterey County folks there. So I do think that as the, the camp grew in size and structure, it became attractive to a more diverse population than just our localized community. Okay. Um, I have a follow-up question and I was just curious about how often, so like, um, number of hours per day, days per week, our county and city staff down at the encampment currently? 
Yeah, so the county is there Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I believe multiple hours on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and they are providing health and human service support. So that's HPHP, um, you know, providing medical support. Um, there's um, Smart Path assessments that are being done. Um, they're also um, getting people, um, el you know, people that are eligible for benefits, benefits signed up for general assistance, food stamps, you know, whatever people are eligible for. So that's happening Monday, Wednesday, Friday. In addition to that, starting last week, um, the city, county, Salvation Army volunteer group is going out Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So, and that's for multiple hours on those days. Um, I failed to mention that we hired a temporary employee to help work on this. Her name's Megan Bunch, and she has um, been a phenomenal asset to the city uh, thus far in helping to shepherd this process. In addition to that, we're really trying to capitalize on the existing outreach service or services that are out there those days. So a harm reduction team is out there on Thursday. We're really trying to be out at the same time um, because there's folks that have been out there for many, many weeks that are familiar with the population, who have connections with folks. I'm really trying to capitalize on that so we can have deeper conversations about what people's barriers are, what their needs are, what do they need help in, um, achieving a transition to a better living situation. And so, you know, I, I suspect that we will continue to evolve that process, but, um, you know, it's on order of 20 hours a week that people are out there. Can I ask a follow up question? Um, I know that you all are working really hard, and I also want to, I probably didn't say this earlier, but I want to thank you all for the work that you've done to bring all this information to us because um, I think it's really beneficial for us to, you know, have this information. And I know that there was a lot that was put on your plate last week, so <laughs> it's pretty phenomenal what you all have been able to do in this time, or two weeks ago, sorry. Um, I know that 1220 is moving forward, and I'm just curious, um, given what you all presented on transitional camps, um, would 1220 be a low barrier shelter and, or uh, transition, or camp, I guess, uh, and, um, yeah, so I'll just start with that. Yeah, so um, I can provide some context to wh what we had out there before and the benefits of the River Street <coughs> Camp. Um, you know, understanding it was in, you know, a relatively expensive model is actually the same cost, if not a lower cost, than our overnight shelter option. So I just wanted to be really clear that shelter is expensive. Um, that's just what the fact is. Um, as it relates to low barrier vis-a-vis -vis substance use disorder, the River Street Camp, I believe, was the exclusive program that did not search folks when they came in. We really monitored um, behavior and the actions of our campers around um, their um, their relationships with the community, with staff and clients. Um, we don't have any other shelter options at this point that um, have that level of, um, I guess, that low barrier as it relates to substance use disorder. Um, moving forward, with regard to 1220 and its potential for a transitional encampment, as I understand, the um, transitional encampments to be functioning in these, uh, these other cities that I talked about, um, I don't believe it's a good candidate for that for one for a couple reasons. All of these cities piloted programs first. They didn't just start with, you know, we're going to decide to do a transitional encampment and move forward with a piece of property and just move forward. They piloted based on conditions that neighborhoods came up with in terms of what would be an appropriate level of um, what's the right word, um, compatibility with the neighborhood. They also piloted for a year, six months to a year, as to what outcomes were they expecting from um, kind of that neighborhood impact perspective as well as client perspective. So in terms of pilots, um, you really need a s stable um, site for that. The fact that our site is adjacent to our water intake, there's a significant amount of environmental con um, considerations. Um, I think it's potent, you know, we should consider piloting a transitional encampment if that's the will of the council. I don't believe it should be at 1220. And just, just to follow up on that um, with regards to the low barrier, because I know that 
Um, one of the issues that, having gone down the camp multiple times and spoken with people, one of the barriers outside of um, substance abuse is like couples and people who have pets. Is that something that would be a barrier at 1220? Because I think that that would, you know, also um, warrant wanting to have a, a different style of camp for those types of people as well. Yeah, so <clears throat> I put a lot of thought into this and um, have gone and back and forth about what would be an appropriate um, type of program at 1220. Um, we have considered tough sh a tough shed program. <laughs> we have considered do doing a sprung tent structure out there. We have landed on doing individual tents again for the purpose of um, maintaining folks' privacy. I mean, it's something that I believe um, the gateway encampment residents, uh, that's a strong need that they have out there. And so I think moving into 1220, we really do wanna maintain that level of privacy for folks. I think we'll be more successful in transitioning folks from the gateway encampment to an individual tent model. So we will be moving forward with that. And yes, pets will be allowed. Pets are allowed at the Salvation Army programs as well. I mean, you can't have a, a, a you know animal that's a biter or violent, but pets are allowed. So um, much similar to the River Street camp model, we would be providing storage, allowing for cohabitation with partners and allowing for pets. I just have one quick question. In terms of being able to think of the continuum of care, and I know you've referenced that several times, how do you feel about some of the um, kind of concepts presented fitting into existing partnerships? I know you've worked regularly with the county. There's been existing plans in place. Um, there's been interim strategies identified and long-term sort of uh, goals and vision um, outlined. How do you feel sort of some of this stuff fits within that? Because I know some of these things have come up in the past as well. So we are embarking on a systems analysis for our homelessness um, response systems within the county. I think we'll be more informed about that continuum and where shelters fit into that continuum over the coming months. Um, I do think that our homeless population, and this is true for any city, is very, you know, it's not homogeneous, people have different needs. And I think as we think about shelter programs, whether it's safe parking or a transitional encampment or an emergency indoor shelter, we need to be engaging with um, folks with li lived experience about what those needs are and building programs in a cost-effective way, hopefully to meet those various needs. And so moving forward, we're really in this urgent emergency response and providing as many shelter beds as we possibly can to meet our current needs. Moving forward, it will be incumbent upon the city and the county to think about how best to meet um, our greater population's needs in a sustainable fashion. And if I could add to that a bit, um, we also are operating under that joint action plan of the city and the county that grew out of the two by two committee, which sets forth uh, a medium term vision at least that mm -hmm. we're gonna be reporting back to the board and to the council by April 1st about plans to open a transitional shelter by July 1, utilizing the heat funds. Um, and as a reminder on the heat funds, this is the $10.6 million or heap and cash together, $10.6 million that the state gave to our county to be used countywide for emergency homeless um, use. And last Friday, um, the 22nd, was the deadline for grant proposals to come in. And so now there's going to be a, an evaluation process with that, with decisions made, I think, in March and maybe money hitting the street in April. So this is like the immediate piece we're talking about tonight, but we are, we've got some longer range looking at where can we put um, a longer term, multi-year period transitional shelter, um, either exploration of the armory is you heard earlier, or maybe other sites. So that's also what, we what we're working on. And also to this point of really having to be creative and think about different solutions. You know, there's, you know, talk about um, safe parking, possibly across the county. Um, that's come up with your counts before too, but we really are looking at what are, what are um, unique and different models we can explore, and the county's right with us in those conversations. So this is, it really is an exciting time. We've been saying that the past few reports to the council, but to have this level of partnership and focus toward a joint um, path um, really is different, and, and so I think it does fit in quite well. Okay, great. Are there other questions for staff at this time? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and transition the presentation portion to Council Member Glover, um, and then open it up for questions, and then we'll get on to uh, public comment. <coughs> uh, 
Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I, I know there's a lot of emotion around this topic, and some of us feel certain ways about different things, and we're here to talk and share those opinions, so I really appreciate everyone coming out. But if you feel like joining me in it, I would encourage us to just all take a deep breath, all together. Just. So I wanna start the presentation by letting you know about a woman that I met who has three young children, one of whom is an eight-year-old girl, and they live in their van. They live in their van because they can't afford rent in Santa Cruz. And the eight-year-old girl is facing the reality who had a conversation with me and a group of other people about how she has talents that she thinks that she should use to get a job so that she can help to support her family in paying for gas and food. Now that, to me, and I think we can all agree, is really heartbreaking, that the reality that an eight-year-old girl living in a van with her mom and her two siblings needs to think about getting a job to help with family finances. So. I take, I, I wanna just present that experience as well as the experiences I've had going down and working with and talking to the people in the camp, both when I'm down there distributing stuff and when I'm uh, meeting with them in meetings, asking them what it is that they need to survive and to exist in Santa Cruz. So with that, I'm gonna lead us into um, my multi-point plan uh, about making moves on homelessness because I think there's been some miscommunication or misunderstanding around my drive, my reason, and my uh, approach to addressing the issue of homelessness. So with that, I'll just provide some background. Thank you to the staff again for that amazing presentation. In Santa Cruz, we've gone from two completely different kind of thesis and antithesis, right? We have the Ross camp, which was really successful in the sense that it provided 50 to 60 uh, beds or things, spaces for people. It also provided hygiene, hot meals, and supplies, also a safe environment. The issue was the cost that was associated with it, though. For many of the people in the community, of it being $75,000 a month, uh, getting up as high as $90,000 a month to implement. But then it was closed with any uh, alternative plan or location where individuals could be moved or relocated. So that's what birthed the, what's now known as the Ross Camp, because people congregated somewhere. There was also the San Lorenzo uh, River Park or Park before that. Um, but the difference with the Ross Camp is that a po uh, uh, in opposition or difference to the River Street Camp, which was heavily um, monitored with lots of oversight and police protection, there is no oversight and supervision at the Ross Camp. It has very limited access to the things that they need to be able to survive. Parks and Rec has become the de facto department that's responsible for providing materials. It has, has had terrible impacts on surrounding neighborhoods and businesses with increased crime rates and feelings of not being safe. And now, because of the decisions that we're moving on and what we'll discuss tonight, is that there's the potential that that camp will be closed by the 15th of March with limited shelter. So understanding that background, it's important for us to emphasize that in the year of 2017, 55 people died in the city or the county of Santa Cruz that were experiencing homelessness, 55 people. That's a huge number of people to be dying outside in the street uh, and while they're suffering. So I want to give you a perspective as to the different points of the plan. Some of them, or all of them, I think were touched on tonight, which was great because uh, move, going into this, I didn't think we are going to get a chance to hear a report on all of those things. So thank you so much for all of those things. It incorporates the declaration of homeless emergency, the permitting of transitional encampments and safe parking areas, as well as the reopening of public facilities so that people can have access to hygiene and bathrooms. Now, first is the declaration of homeless emergency. Um, it's part of uh, advocacy strategies to advance permanent solutions uh, to uh, give us some opportunity to move forward more expeditiously. Now, from the document that talks about it that was included in our agenda packet, as well as some of the different research, it's generally intended to ease restrictions on the use of local resources. And as was pointed out by the staff, the declaration can take a variety of different forms based off of the community to meet the needs that are required for it. These are a list of cities that have enacted a state of local emergency around the issue of homelessness. So, so it's not something that's unheard of or far-fetched or something that's done that hasn't been implemented by other municipalities. 
And a place is, like uh, that last list, as close as San Jose, used the state of homeless emergency to waive requirements related to the use of public lands for the purpose of establishing emergency shelters, such as community centers, libraries, and other facilities, as well as places of worship for being able to be used as shelters. I was at a church as a guest speaker this morning talking about this with them and the possibility of using a different church space. There are other opportunities that are associated with uh, it also. It reduces bureaucratic barriers so we can move faster. It helps to potentially redirect funds so that we can offer more services or use money more effectively. It also highlights the urgent need for additional permanent housing. So this will open up the conversation of how we can move forward on developing more uh, affordable housing in Santa Cruz, which we direly need. And also it provides a quicker ability to use city-owned property to open and maintain maintain these kinds of transitional shelters. So that gets us into transitional encampments and the safe sleeping programs, which I can see by some of the signs here tonight and by some of the correspondence I've received. Uh, many of you are here to talk about the proposition of the safe parking space on Delaware. One of the things that was very common, because I received emails that were very, very similar, almost verbatim, which uh, were copied from other letters or just a group letter that came out was some concerns. The first of which they called it a half-baked idea, both the sleeping the locations as well as the transitional encampments. I just wanna stress that everything that has been suggested by myself, council members Crown and Brown are objectively data-driven to show that they have had positive impacts in addressing the issue of homelessness. Not end-all, be-all solutions, but they do provide additional tools and opportunities for municipalities to address the issues of homelessness and the suffering that's taking place of people having to live on the street. Uh, that we have the three areas that were listed by the staff and as well as looking at the issue of crime. Now, like I mentioned, there were lots of similarities in the emails that I received and there were three primary areas of concern that y'all communicated to me specifically that you were concerned about. The first was services and specifically it would prevent the, the establishment of camps and parking places would prevent the efficient and effective delivery of mental health and addiction support and services to the most in need. The second is safety, making sure that neighborhoods and families are safe or don't become less safe without a dramatic increase in law enforcement resources, which we know costs a tremendous amount of money to the city, as well as sustainability. And that was specifically around damage to the environment and further unregulated waste and disposal. So I wanna address each one of these concerns really quickly just so that we can make sure we're on the same page and so you can understand what's going on. With regards to services, in Seattle and Portland, they have shown uh, objectively that there have been people that have been able to meet their immediate shelter needs and transition out into permanent or supportive transitional housing. So there is, a pr if you can imagine 45 people in a year getting off of the street in Santa Cruz and being moved into supportive and transitional housing, that's a huge impact on our population as well as being able to provide at least 125 unduplicatable people throughout the year to have a place to sleep. And then in Portland, I wanna emphasize that they have access to AA and NA uh, services at the um, Dignity Village as well as some of the other locations that are in collaboration with police and other uh, precincts. So. Uh, really uh, uh, focus on service. The goal is for people to get into the camps, have a place, safe place to sleep, and then have the opportunity to move their way into services and transitional housing. So next is safety. Now the issue that we have with the camp over at Ross is that there's no structure to it. And that's the difference between that camp and the transitional encampments and safe parking programs that I'm suggesting is because as Susie laid out and Tina in that amazing presentation is that there are very specific guidelines and rules that must be adhered to by anyone participating in or living in the facility to be able to maximize the safety of the community. And because of the way that the system is set up, people have ownership within the community. People can cook together and share meals. People volunteer uh, as a requirement to be able to be a part of the community. So there's a sense of ownership and the ability to want to protect what you built together as a community. I think we can all, I'm sure that's why a lot of you are here right now. You wanna protect the community that you built together. And that's the same kind of thing that we wanna foster with regards to the people that are living in camps. Uh, again, here you can see the percentages of people 
feeling safe, the no increase in reported activity by police departments. And this is all objective facts, so you can see the sources down at the bottom of the presentation. Next is sustainability, uh, the concern about dumping in all kinds of places. The reason why there are issues with cars parking and then you resulting in trash and tr garbage and waste in your neighborhoods is because there is no sanctioned location for people to sleep with the ability to adequately and sustainably remove their trash and waste in important places. So if we establish a space where people are gonna sleep, then along with those locations come the ability for us to establish infrastructure around the sites that will alleviate the issues of potential dumping in neighborhoods and um, trashing natural bridges, as some of the signs say. <laughs> I also want to point some other noteworthy things really quickly. They're considerably less expensive. So uh, on one of the quotes from a model that was trying to be established here in Santa Cruz, it was like as little as $2,000 a month to be able to run an, a, camp, an, a camp area. Um, it could even, you know, let's say it costs $200,000 a year to run one of these camps. That's still significantly less than what we're paying right now to shelter a sig similar amounts of people. Um, so then we'll touch, touch on reopening public facilities, uh, especially because everybody poops. And I think uh, there's a book that we read to our kids about the reality that everyone has bodily functions and the issue of dehumanization that goes into not allowing people to use restrooms. So the proposition to open the facilities is not to make our parks unsafe, is not to make our bathrooms a totally open free for all for people to go do whatever they want with, it's to be able to make it so that your children, families and pets your, and yourself are safe so when you're walking around the city you're not having to dodge and weave through human excrement because there's no open bathrooms for people to, live, uh, to go. So uh, this is just a quote from uh, one of the staff reflecting on the camps going on, um, and this is from Seattle. Uh, quote, the people in the encampments are very proud of what they have accomplished in creating the encampment. One man said that, uh, said at the low barrier encampments that this place was the last chance for many people. And we want to be able to offer those chances for the people that are not focused on just drugs and alcohol, but are literally struggling or working homeless, which do exist in our community, that are working every day, have families, and still can't afford the cost of our rental market. So I'll close just really quickly with this quote. Uh, uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are all here because we care. Now the question is, how are we going to move through this conversation and identify the conflict with each other, but do it in a way that moves away from talking about what we don't want to see and moves into a solution-oriented conversation of what we do want to see? Where do we want to go? I, I, I know a lot of you will come and say, don't put it, uh, put, uh, open up the regulations on Delaware. I hear you, so where should we put them? And I'm going to be hopefully hearing a lot of solution-oriented statements tonight from people because I want to hear about your solutions uh, and what we can do to implement them together. Um, so I made these recommendations before I was informed by staff that they would be doing certain reports on items or providing language for stuff. So one in four are irrelevant because they were already taken care of this evening. So thank you to the staff for working diligently and making sure that those are possible. Now these are recommendations that I'm making to my colleagues and I'm sure we can discuss them uh, in depth. But specifically two and three is coming back by the 12th with a comprehensive list from the staff of publicly or city owned properties where we can potentially put encampments and safe parking programs. And then also coming back on March 12th with language for a first reading of both the potential permitting ordinances for the transitional encampments and the safe parking programs for the ordinances so that then we can start moving into the public hearing process and hearing from the community. Um, there are other uh, recommendations that I had that came through the rest of the meeting, but just in the interest of the presentation at hand and what we're talking about, I will end there. So thank you for listening. <laughs>
uh, organizations who are uh, requesting extra time that I've granted. Um, while we make the transition to getting those organizations uh, lined up, we'll go ahead and take maybe a short break. Um, but if those of you who reached out in advance could find your way towards the front, we'll start with your, uh, your presentations on behalf of the organizations you represent. Okay. Hey, can you go? Drew, can you go back? I was writing down. Oh, yeah. Sanctioned camps, people with uh, untreated and undertreated mental uh, mental illness, open drug use, public defecation, urination, and genuine concerns about the use of our public and private spaces. These present conditions, combined with the one-time funding from the state, warrant a thorough and complete response that is supported by evidence and implemented through broad collaboration. With that, I'd like to turn over to Maggie Ivey to represent v Visit Santa Cruz. Good evening, Mayor Watkins, council members, um, thank you. First, I wanna say I don't think there's anybody in the council chambers that would not prioritize the needs of a mother and children living in a van. That is not in question. I think that the presentation by the staff really highlights though one of our biggest concerns in the business community, which is zero tolerance for any encampment that's gonna be placed in our community. The business community is extremely concerned about the current impacts homelessness is having on the health of our local economy. Businesses are struggling with increased costs as a result of dealing with vandalism, public intoxication, theft, and aggressive individuals harassing employees. It's not rare for a hotel or shop manager to be told that a customer will not be returning because they have witnessed disorderly and hostile behavior playing out in our public spaces. This is a portion of our homeless community and we realize that, but they are costing this community dearly. As you are surely aware, over 40% of the city's general fund is dependent on the taxes generated by these very businesses. And in fact, 19% of the general fund is provided by your tourism industry. Support of a vibrant local economy is a quality of life, life issue for all residents. The conditions that I have pointed out are not conducive to sustaining a vibrant local economy. I'd like to introduce Casey with the Ch Santa Cruz Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, thank you, Maggie and Robert, Mayor Watkins and City Council. Thank you for the excellent presentation by your city staff and for the, what I'll call uh, the decorum that you presented tonight, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I represent the Santa Cruz Area Business Co Chamber of Commerce. We represent over 600 member companies. We, we employ over 23,000 people in the county. Those are jobs, well-paying jobs, some of them low-paying jobs. Addressing homeless is an all-in challenge. All-in, I mean it's all-in you, the business community and the people in the community at large. We must work together to find solutions. We have a shelter problem. Permanent and temporary housing is a necessary uh, need that we should look at. We need to look at wraparound services for those people that want those services. There are people in those encampments that simply don't want help. We should focus on the people that do need help. As Robert and Maggie pointed out, local sources are limited, they're finite. We have one-time funds from the state coming here. You should use them wisely, judiciously, and make sure you're, you're using it for the best benefit of the entire community. Thank uh, you. One second. Thank you. I, I'm proud of the city we, staff and I appreciate ahead. the comments. Thank you. And you can feel free if you want to submit your comments. Okay. So we have one last presentation um, and that's Brad Angel from the Grant Park Neighbors. And you'll get four minutes as well. It won't take that long. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, Council. I appreciate your 
hearing us. Uh, my name is Brad Angel, and um, I live on Colson Avenue. Uh, I'm a founding member of the uh, Grant Park Neighbors. There's a few of us here. Uh, we meet every other week, and we care about our neighborhood, and we are concerned about how the city's decisions impact us, and that is why we are here. Uh, on December 9th, uh, 2018, uh, 11 of us met at the park to discuss how to manage the impacts of the park reopening full time again. Uh, this was because after the closure of the River uh, Park Camp or the San Lorenzo Park Camp, uh, the Grant Park was extremely impacted and it was basically closed down for, for a, quite a while. And then it was open again for the weekends, et cetera. Uh, so much so that it had to be yeah, closed. Um, please do not make this mistake again. Uh, the Grant Park neighbors uh, lie in the pedestrian path between the county's, um, the county services downtown and the city's homeless services. Um, there's a direct causal link between um, your actions here and our day-to-day -day life, like, directly. Your actions impact our safety, our personal security, and the potential, from our, uh, the potential for our children, grandchildren, pets, and our own bodies to encounter, encounter real hazards to our health. <laughs> Safety and the quiet enjoyment of our neighborhood is um, of our utmost concern. I wish to thank the neighbors, especially the Parks and Rec Department, the Santa Cruz Police Department, and um, generally the city administration uh, for listening to our concerns so far and working with us. Uh, thank you. In addition, I applaud the efforts to uh, seriously coordinate with the county. I think this is great, and, uh, and I hope you guys can find a joint solution to this emergency. Thank you. So that concludes the group presentations that reached out in advance to request the additional time. I would now ask that Ernestina um, please uh, have two minutes and we'll have public comment for two minutes. And then we have Altera who will then go next and then we'll open it up to the line. Thank you. Good evening, no, good night. Uh, mayor and members of the council. I wanna start by saying um, that I hear a lot of the stereotypes with which the people who came before me are um, describing homeless people. Many of you know because I have told this story several times in these chambers. I was homeless. I have been homeless twice. And nevertheless, I am here. I am clean, I'm sober. I have never been in any use of drugs. Therefore, uh, thinking that all people who are homeless has a mental disability or are drug users is a stereotype. It's a stereotype of the people who have the blessing of having a place where they can be and probably doing the same that people in the tents are doing. Um, Ernestine, I'm, uh, sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanna make sure, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, what uh, we are talking in here about uh, having um, a place for people to live in a permanent um, way is very important because as a person who live in shelters and have to live there at six o'clock in the morning, raining or shining, didn't matter, I have to live by six o'clock in the morning. And I had to stay out of the shelter until five o'clock where I could buy, be back on there. So I had to find a place where I could eat. I had to find a place where I could eat something warm because I did not have a place to cook. And also I had to find a place to go to the bathroom because we poop. Okay, so that's very clear. So I wanna make the, the uh, point that uh, you need to take that into account because if you are gonna have to leave by six o'clock of the, uh, the morning in, in a ch from the shelter that you are planning to have, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work because I'm gonna try to prefer to stay in another place. Uh, and because I see that my time is, living, uh, is ending, so I just wanna say that for all those people who say that all people in the shelters uh, in the uh, camping are using drugs, come and visit my home. You know, as soon as I get into my, my apartment complex, you can smell marijuana everywhere. So what else they are doing in there, who knows? So, and I'm pretty, pretty sure that many of the people who are here are also doing the same. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you everyone for taking this issue of homelessness so seriously. I really appreciate your work and um, the suggestions that you've made tonight. I am hearing, however, um, a problem solution model 
and the, the main aspect of that is I'm hearing a uh, problem of the current residents across camp and our current homeless uh, population. And this is an ongoing problem, this is an ongoing issue, uh, this is kind of our new reality, we're going to have homelessness going forward. Every major city in the US has it, we have amazing economic disparity, um, maybe since the Great Depression, maybe since the French Revolution, I'm not sure. Um, but this is our new reality, so we need to meet the uh, needs of the future homeless populations of Santa Cruz. And I want us to think about that as we're going forward and how to meet the needs of our future homeless issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and start to my left, um, and you'll be given two minutes, so please. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Men and Women. Uh, I'm going. Uh, I'm Michael Sweat. Um, I live at the encampment over there. The reason why I live there is because I have uh, friends that are homeless and uh, I've been homeless ever since I moved here 23 years ago legally. I've never rented an apartment because the rent's too high. That's your number one problem. You don't have affordable housing. Um, number two is that you keep depending on uh, research from people who are going out there after the fact. These people never come and talk to us or ask us questions or talk to me. I've never seen them once down there. And I live there, I'm there every day. I know everybody there. I come here to talk for them. These people are telling you, oh yeah, we went and did this and did that. No, they didn't. They came after the fact and did this and that, which it don't count. Half the people you were talking to didn't even live there. You don't know that. But if you come and talk to somebody who can tell you what goes on, you could, what these people need. I'm gonna interrupt just for just a second. You could direct the council at this time. Okay. Thank you. What, what these people need, you can come to me. You can come to the, there's people there that will talk to you. Uh, Justin came out the other day and talked to several people and had they had ideas on what to do about um, the camp and everything. And it just, it amazes me how people can convince you so much that they know so much about people, but they never go to them. That's the problem. You never come to the homeless and ask, what do you need? What do you want? How can you help us? Because you're not trying to help us. You're just trying to do what you do with that money and push us to the side. And it's not gonna happen. We're not leaving on the 15th because Nathan versus Boise, Idaho says we don't have to. Hi folks, <clears throat> I'm Luis Garza, I live at the Tannery and I'm here on behalf of my household uh, to discuss the matter of the Ross Camp in relation to security at the Tannery. Uh, the Tannery's in serious trouble right now. Uh, crime in my neighborhood has skyrocketed since the city, county, and police have abdicated their responsibility in the protection of our neighborhood. And uh, we've had an increase in, uh, in reported crime upwards of 30%. A short list of crimes include theft, vandalism, prostitution, violence against women, a mugging. Two of my neighbors had all their tools stolen from their trucks. A guy was shooting up in broad daylight outside of the 1030 building in plain sight of where our kids uh, play and ride their bikes. Um, the worst of the matter is that our kids cannot ride their bikes on the levee path to get to school anymore. Um, it has been reported that our children have taken to riding down River Street and crossing the highway to get to school. Our children are crossing the freeway at River Street, okay? Um, because it's safer to brave traffic than it is to um, bike past the Ross Camp. Um, I say this now in front of all you folks um, so that you won't so that we won't say that you didn't know, um, and then heaven forbid that one of our kids gets hit by a car. Um, what we need, um, we need you guys to move the San, uh, just move the camp, put, put it over at San Lorenzo Park. You didn't need 200 beds to move those people there to that mud pit, it's horrible. Um, and you don't, you shouldn't need 200 beds now to move them back to the park. Um, we also need pr police protection, especially after dark. We need a car blocking ingress to our property after dark. One first alarm guy sitting in his car just checking his phone all night long is not gonna cut it, you guys know that. Um, 
we're people, we pay taxes, we're business owners, and yet for some reason we don't merit the same security as the west side, nor, uh, uh, nor the golf course, nor the downtown area, and we're completely undefended by our city, our county, and, and, and most egregiously by our police department, okay? So we've lost faith in you folks, but we're really, really asking you guys for help. Move the camp now, station some police on our site, help us out, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Cover. Um, I also live and work at the Tannery. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of myself. Um, I'm, I have trouble myself going to town on the levee, um, the, the porta potties, the uh, porta potty trucks, the um, garbage. Um, the people that are gathering make it really difficult uh, to get by on the levee. That's just me. M uh, the children at our tannery can't get by either. Uh, women are uncomfortable because they've had issues with people um, because they're so close to the levee. And the levee is public. That should be, belong to all of us and we should all feel safe walking on the levee. And I know, of course, you don't always feel safe everywhere, but this is so intense that everyone's choosing alternative routes. And it's really not fair for the kids to not have the safest possible route to go to school or to go downtown or meet their buddies uh, and much less have issues when they go by which has happened. Um, yeah, I know you're having, you're working on getting beds. Uh, uh, that's great. Could you also work on taking care of what is already there? Uh, just do, do what you have to do to take care of what's there. And, 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 cause the beds will come, but it's not gonna come like tomorrow. So you need to pay attention to the impact, the footprint that that has right there. It just, the camp needs to be made in such a way that we can still use the walkway and feel relatively safe. That's all. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Gary Ingram. I live at the tannery also. And all I can give you is my perspective because everybody seems to have studied this issue really well. Uh, the other day I was walking back from Bay Federal and as I was getting it back up onto the river walk, uh, there were three of three young teenagers who walked by me, who I knew lived there, and I said hi, and they walked in front of me, and I was walking by them, and no less than six old men catcalled them the whole way in this little four-foot narrow path. I can't imagine how they felt being treated that way on the way home. I'm sorry, I can't continue. Hi, um, I'm Carol Paul Hamus. And first I wanna acknowledge Mayor Watkins and Vice Mayor Cummins for their work on the two by two committee, which I learned a lot about from Council Member Myers the other night. I think that's the way to go. I encourage you to keep, keep doing that. And I apologize for reading the rest, I'm exhausted. Um, in November 2017, a teacher was in the middle of a lesson in his high school class on Swift Street when a mentally ill man carrying a large machete entered his classroom. The teacher got between the man and his students, backed the man out the door and called 911. The campus and three adjoining schools were locked down until the subject was eventually apprehended. That teacher was my son, and that day might have turned out very differently if he hadn't acted the way he did to stop what happened. We were told that the man had been arrested previous times for assault, including assault with a deadly weapon against a police officer, and was homeless and camping nearby with others in the park. 
You may think school lockdowns are just a way of modern life, but you need to know that a school lockdown is a frightening and traumatizing experience for students, especially young ones and their parents, and often has a lasting negative effect and makes students fearful of coming to school. There have been three other lockdowns since then at that school under similar circumstances. Within four blocks of Delaware, four blocks, there are six schools, two high schools, two preschools, a Head Start program, a special ed program, and soon Gateway, which will be a combined 1,000 K-12 students in that four block area near Delaware. Those kids deserve to be able to bike and walk to school safely and be in school safely, and we need to do everything we can to protect them. Please do everything that you can to keep our schools safe for these kids and their teachers. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, hello, council. It's been a long time since I've been here. My name is Jenny Mitchell. Uh, Jenny Mitchell Collins, to many of you who knew my husband, Marty Collins, of the Digital Media Factory, who passed away a few years ago. I'm a fourth generation Santa Cruzan, and I say that not to boast. I say that because I've seen the changes in this city. I've seen the changes from when we used to like dance around hippy dippy in front of the Cooper house and it was all nice and fun and games. Times have changed. The homeless that are here now are different. We are talking about safety issues. I live on the west side of Santa Cruz. Uh, we had our business on the west side of Santa Cruz. I am not talking tonight about tents, okay? I'm not talking about the homeless in tents. And I do have compassion. I do have compassion. I feed the homeless, I help the homeless. I'm talking about those people who have been forced to live in their cars and in their RVs. That's what I'm talking about tonight. I'm not opposed to them having a safe place to park overnight. They need a safe place to park overnight. All I'm saying is, please don't let it be Delaware. We've got long... We have, Long's, we have Long's Marine Lab, which is a sensitive environmental place. We finally got the pond, Antonelli's Pond, to the place where people feel safe walking around. We want um, a place, I think, parking. I would say for UCSC, if they have said no, go back to the table. They need to be um, accountable to being in this area, and that parking lot could have a lot of safe people. I think it should be a program where people are held accountable, and they can be, you know, I know that it works in San Diego. I know that it works in other cities. We are no different. But I, I'm not talking about those folks who are on drugs. Thank you very much. Thank you. One second, sorry. Hi, I'm Abby. Um, the staff states that they wanna close the camp due to health and safety. So all of a sudden, you care about our homeless residents. Where were you when my houseless friend Bob had just gotten out of the hospital after having a stroke, had nowhere to stay, it was raining outside, he decided to stay underneath an awning at Loudon Nelson Center where he stayed before and the police came and kicked him out. He explained he had a stroke, please let me stay here out of the rain, they would not let him. Where were you when you cared about the health and safety of our houseless friends when at City Hall there was a man, a houseless man who was so sick, he was, really sick, he didn't want to go to the hospital, and he was kicked out, we begged him to let him finally sleep, and they wouldn't let him sleep under the overhang at City Hall, he was kicked out onto the street, and the next day, he was found dead, right at the corner of City Hall. So where were you when you cared about the people, uh, all of a sudden you care about the people at the camp, and you say it's overcrowded, but you keep on putting the fence further and further in, so there's less room to have tents. Now, a point in time, of, first of all, um, on the report, low barrier housing, there's something called the four Ps, which I'm sure you've heard about, about people, possessions, and pets, and problems, people with substance abuse, and 
developmental disorders. There's navigation centers. Seattle has one, Portland has them. That is incorrect information. The point in time count, what do you mean? You just go up to, I did point in time count. You don't go up to someone and you ask them how many people are there. There's 198 tents, one to two people in each tent, three to four in the bigger tents. It's over 200 people. I don't know what the fire chief was doing. And transitional encampments, there's no, no one wants it in their neighborhood. You really think that we're gonna find one? Safe parking, what about a city lot? What's unique about Santa Cruz is the level of nimbyism, uncompassionate people here. How people get treated as homeless people. They get drinks thrown on them, they get, and, that, and then you think that they don't, that they're not upset and they won't go crazy. My name is Curtis Relafort, and I'm with the Follow Your Heart Action Network. And can I have permission to speak? You have, you, you, go ahead, we'll, we have your time on the... Okay, I, uh, I'm just coming from the heart. And the, my heart is telling me there's KKK blood up in here right now. And that energy is running strong. Anybody who sat down and wrote all them fancy letters, the fancy cards, did you have any love writing that out? Did you have any empathy writing that out when you were sitting there? These are human beings. Ask me what? Go ahead and pause it. If possible, please address the council and your comments. These are human beings that we are talking about. We wasn't put here on this earth to control nobody. We have a problem. The problem is a human having some struggling problems. We got the solutions. We wrote all them cards. You done wrote all them fancy letters. You got police. You got counselors. You got these folks and did all that research. Damn, man, you got the help. All you got to do is put it to work. That's the solution. You want another solution? Call Curtis. He'll tell you what to do. And all you people complaining about, don't park that in front of my house. Don't do this in front of my land. This ain't your land. The Indian was here first. You ought to ask permission from the Navajo, the Hopis, the nation that was here before. This is Black History Month. I'm speaking up for the people who are poor. There's poor, and then there's poor, poor. You ain't never been poor on drugs. When you go there and feel that, you will know that these people are crying out for help. They're suffering. They didn't have a mama and a dad like you doing up here. Control issues. Back it up, man. Come up here with empathy and love and the solution that this guy is talking about. Thank you, Curtis. Okay. <laughs> Good evening and thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here tonight. I'm a resident of De Anza, Santa Cruz, and I live just inside a fence from Delaware Avenue where we've recently had overnight parking, since been banned. I personally don't have a problem with it. Um, I can tell that a lot of people do because what was it, New Leaf Market, this, this meeting is well attended. When I was at New Leaf Market on Saturday, someone saw fit to go around to every car in the parking lot and put a sticker on it advertising this meeting, encouraging everyone to come out against this proposal because of all the issues. I didn't have the money or resources to make up signs to tell people to come out in support of the resolution. I did the next best thing. I walked the whole parking lot and picked up every banner that was put on every <laughs> single car. So all that time and money you spent made it into the recycling bin. That's number one. Number two, people compare, uh, complain about crime. I'm empathetic to that. I was once knifed, at, I was once held up at knife point with a knife to my neck. I've had my car stolen. My car has been broken into many times. I can't say that any of those instances, the perpetrator was a homeless person. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, but crime is crime. It's going to happen everywhere. And for us to turn our back on other <laughs> crime going on in town and saying, we gotta kick these homeless people out of here, to me, it sounds like an IMBY. As far as trash, um, I have a service animal that I walk every morning and we go out on the cliff over natural bridges. 
I'd like to see the people that everyone's complaining about that are trashing natural bridges, because I don't see anyone out there early in the morning. The parking lot is locked down at night, so people are not going in there at night. So I, I don't see it to be that big an issue. I respect people that say it is. To me, I don't see that. Um, the smell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Kelly Bloom, and I too am a resident of De Anza, Santa Cruz. Um, I lived there a relatively short time, and I do have to say that I'm a little nervous coming up here and speaking because many of my neighbors are here, and they very strongly disagree with my personal opinion. Um, that being said, I'm in favor of allowing overnight parking on a temporary basis on, De on Delaware at the end of Santa Cruz, or at the, in front of our neighborhood. I'm not very articulate today. Um, Yes, there's trash. Yes, there are some issues, but there's some mountable issues. Instead of coming and saying, no, don't let them go there, how about offering some solutions? Pump trunks that can pump out septic tanks, garbage dumpsters, volunteers to go clean up garbage, increase patrol and security. I'm willing to go pick up garbage, and I'm sure I can find other people who would be just as willing to go pick up garbage. Um, I also am empathetic to the concerns over natural bridges. I have a doctorate in natural resource land management, and so I completely understand how fragile our environment is. But again, there are ways to mitigate that that I think people aren't willing to discuss um, because they're so um, prejudiced against what they see as being someone who is less than them. Hi, my name is Jennifer. I am uh, the manager of De Anza Santa Cruz. I'm also a resident. I've worked and lived at De Anza Santa Cruz for 10 years. I've witnessed the evolution of growth in the community of Santa Cruz and the community of De Anza. I'm here today because I'm opposed to the lifting of the res restriction on Delaware for overnight parking. As the manager of De Anza, I'm responsible to ensure that my residents have a peaceful and quiet enjoyment, that they follow the rules, um, that I enforce the rules and that they follow the rules of the community. That includes individual sites for cleanliness. Um, fortunately, I have a great community. They're very proud homeowners and they respect their home sites and their neighbors. They make my job pretty easy. Also as manager and representative for the landowners, land we have worked diligently, diligently with the city, Coastal Commission, and the state to ensure that we are compliant as well as respectful to the sensitive environment. What you propose contradicts what you require from us. As a resident, it has been a few years since I have felt safe walking along Delaware Avenue. Currently, there is the pungent smell of urine and sewer. There are needles and trash left without regard. It is a health and safety issue as well as an obscenity upon the environment. Since the increase in RVs, we have installed cameras and gates. While this has significantly decreased the vehicle activity, we still suffer from noise pollution, vandalism, gas siphoning, bicycle theft, um, use of our spa or facilities for bathing and drug use. While we manage to maintain a desirable com community, your proposal to increase the RV population on Delaware sev severely undermines our efforts. While I'm sympathetic to those hardworking families that cannot afford housing, I am not sympathetic to the majority that are looking to live in our neighborhoods for free, without conscience or respect. If you allow this to happen, you will be contributing not only to the degradation of our community and Thank environment. You. And please do feel free to leave if you want your comments. Okay. Mayor, council members, staff. I'm a local physician at Palo Alto Medical Foundation in Santa Cruz. I'm also a former UCSC student who was unfortunately homeless for the better part of a year due to lack of affordable housing. This is a complex issue and I do not at all pretend to have the answers, but what I see in caring for our homeless community at the hospital is that they need real solutions such as short and long-term housing, mental health and addiction services, and that this should be a comprehensive plan that is well thought out. The average wait for an inpatient bed at Janus, which is a perinatal drug treatment, or a drug treatment, but I take care of pregnant women. For a woman who's ready to get clean, the average wait for a bed is 10 to 14 days. This Band-Aid proposal, I fear, is not the right solution. I'm particularly concerned with its location near our schools, a senior citizen community, 
as well as some of our community's most precious natural treasures. Illegal campfires could have a devastating impact on migratory monarchs. Human feces would certainly infect natural bridges, tide pools, and I foresee the real possibility of a hepatitis A outbreak, as well as the increase in crime, which has already been mentioned. What we need is real creative solutions. Councilman Glover, you appropriately asked for us to provide solutions. Um, and again, I don't pretend to have the answers, but I hope that the answers would provide our homeless community with safety and dignity. This should be done in a flat area for EMS to easily access um, uh, patients in the case of emergency, one with services available such as adequate lighting to improve visibility and safety for all homeless people, in particular women and children, a dump station for sewage, sharp containers for needles, and on-site counselors to provide resources for those that are willing and able to get treatment. We are a compassionate community, and yet we unfortunately have compassion fatigue. What, we need real solutions, but we cannot do this at the expense of our housed community <coughs> and the safety of our environment. Thank you. <coughs> Mayor, council, and everyone else, thank you. My name is Steve Denitis, and I'm a board member of the nonprofit Santa Cruz Triathlon, formerly known as the Sentinel. We are in our 37th year of running this triathlon event here in, uh, in September. Last year, we granted $75,000 back into the community, nearly $15,000 of that to the three Santa Cruz City school organizations and sports programs. Our permit states that the race morning Delaware Avenue is to be clear for the racer's safety. I see the ability for unrestricted overnight parking on Delaware Avenue to potentially cause delays to the start of the race as we would have to utilize police to move them to adhere to our permit or the towing service to tow them. If the start of the race is delayed or the racer's safety is compromised, that leads uh, towards less racers coming up for the race. That is a direct impact on the children. So. We pride ourselves in running a clean and safe race, and please allow us to continue to do so. Hi, my name is Jennifer Lanford Brown, and I'm here to talk about um, some of the things that you guys mentioned, but I think we're forgetting homeless prevention. One of the ladies said she'd been homeless twice. Um, I actually had owned my own home, own home, or lived in military housing, and came here and became homeless for seven months. Landlords like mine put people on month-to-month -month leases. We've got to remember that we have to stick to making sure, especially disabled people, people with substance use disorders, people um, who are seniors, people with children, they have vouchers. They will not get into another house or be able to have the credit to get housing. So then I'm gonna go back to the Ross camp. I go there um, three times a week. I know just about everybody camping there. If you ask them who Jennifer is, they can tell you. They know me. Um, so we forget the CDC has, we, we have harm reductionists that date back to the 80s because of AIDS. Um, Elizabeth Taylor, she made a commitment to life and she was one of the first harm reductionists because we forget about AIDS. What if we don't take care of the people? What if we don't have a commitment to life? We should, instead of just opening a safe camp or safe parking, why don't we have a camp where everybody who has a substance use disorder can go? How many people ask me a day, how can I get into Janice? How can I get help? I don't wanna be addicted to drugs anymore. I can't help them. Please help all these people. My son is 25 on the East Coast, can't come visit, why? Because there's too many drugs on the street. Those people need to be inside. Thank you. Hi, Mayor and uh, City Council. 
um, the one thing I can see, you know, by coming to these meetings, um, I, you know, this is like the second or third time that I come, and what I notice is that the, the you are very uh, compassionate, and I see the community is very compassionate about the situation, and then it's a really complex situation, and I see, you know, there's a lot of controversy, and I, how we can find the best solution. What I am here is to ask the city council is to support the, the, uh, uh, the city manager to do the, the work, and then don't keep putting more um, like delays, you know, to get the work done. Um, I know that everybody we had the best uh, uh, intention in mind, uh, but I think we have to be clear that you no, know, we can be compassionate, but um, we don't have to be so permissive. Um, you know, there is there is rules and regulations that can be put on. And I think you know, why does it, you know we, we put a, a, a stop sign because people run the stop sign. We have to enforce it so that will prevent accidents. Removing um, overnight parking on the street that they for years they work to get overnight parking. Removing it, you know, I don't think that's that's a good option. Uh, last time I came and I, I was asking to get uh, an overnight parking on my street because we're having an issue. So if we don't have a problem. I don't think we need a solution. And, and, and then right now we have an, you know, a problem with uh, people now finding uh, a deployment on the street. So the, 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 the city manager, they're doing it the best that they can. And then I, and the, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, supervisors, you know, they're working on trying to find solutions. So I was asking you know, to support each other and then we can try to solve this problem all, you know, all together. Thank you. I'm Garrett Phillip. I uh, hope I don't ramble too much. I like what the mayor is doing, by the way. I think she's doing a good job. I um, I kind of don't get the uh, emergency ordinance, the whole idea of it, because when I look at the data, as I'm sure you have for the census in 2017 and 15, 13 of homeless, uh, the percentage of unhoused homeless has always been about 75%, 80%. That's not an emergency that's like normal almost. Even I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying if you look at the county of Santa Clara, they have records go back 10 years. I mean, it's been 25% housed forever. And so I don't know if it's a, not a good thing, bad thing, but calling that an emergency is, is weird. Uh, it, it may be in your mind and, and maybe it is personally for the homeless. Um, if you look at, uh, just for perspective, I, I don't think everybody realizes uh, that Santa Cruz, the, the emergency is the percentage of homeless for such a small city. And you know, in the United States, 17 out of 10,000 people are homeless. In California, it's like double that. Uh, in Santa Cruz, it's about six or seven times that. We should have 215 homeless if we were a typical California city. Uh, we have about a thousand too many homeless. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, we need to we need to lose about a thousand homeless. I kind of think eh, that's that's, a, that's really rough to say that, but uh, there's that is the emergency, and we need to answer the question: Why? Why does Santa Cruz, this city, have six to seven hundred percent more homeless? And I don't have the answer. And uh, it would have been nice to ask those people uh, Thank you. To, to find that out. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Michael Dealey. I'm a uh, part of the neighborhood of Grant, Grant, Grant Street neighborhood. Thank you, Curtis, for mentioning this earlier. The Amamutsin tribal band are the living descendants of Mutsin and Awaswa speaking peoples who have continually occupied the greater Monterey Bay region, thriving for thousands of years and countless generations prior to European contact. So I'm, I'm glad I got to follow this gentleman here because uh, he's talking about normalizing a certain percentage of homelessness. This is a moral low, okay? Uh, now, when we talk about this land, just 200 years ago, or before European contact, I'm quoting Howard Zinn here, in the villages, and, and I'm quoting 
uh, the, the Franciscan priest who visited, uh, who saw the Iroquois. In the villages of the Iroquois, land was owned in common and worked in common. Hunting was done together and the catch was divided among the members of the village. Houses were considered common property and were shared by several families. The concept of private ownership of land and homes was foreign to the Iroquois. A French Jesuit priest who encountered the Iroquois in the 1650s wrote back to the crown, quote, no poor houses are needed among them because they are neither mendicants nor paupers. Their kindness, humanity, and courtesy not only makes them liberal with what they have, but causes them to possess hardly anything except in common. Can we be that town? Can we regain that spirit for each other? I hear you, Generation X, no. Generation Baby Boomers, no. I hear you when you voted for Trump. I hear you, but we are coming. We're a millennial generation that cares for each other, that will stand with the homeless. I know the homeowners stood against the renters this past year, but Thank the, you. I promise Thank you, you, homeless people, you. renters will okay. always stand Thank with you, you forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just gonna go ahead and pause. Uh, can I get a, a sense of how many folks still are interested in speaking to the council on this item? Raise your hands and keep them up. Okay. Hey. Um, deliberation starting at midnight. 30, yeah. Make the call. I'd like to um, reduce the time to 90 seconds, just in the interest of the council having adequate time to uh, to deliberate over the very robust conversations that we have in proposals before us. So we'll go ahead and reduce the time to 90 seconds at this point. Thank you. I'll do my best. Thank you for understanding. Okay, uh, so my name's Jeb and I'm one of the owners of the Tabby Cat Cafe that just opened up um, right around the corner here, it used to be Cafe Bene. And a few days ago, I got an email from the Downtown Association asking downtown businesses to come and weigh in on this issue. Someone, I guess, thought that the council should hear from downtown businesses as supposedly, I guess, one of the important stakeholders in this conversation. So I am here to do that, and in what follows, I will be speaking for the entire business community of Santa Cruz, so <laughs> listen. Um, so the first thing that I wanna say, and, and frankly, I. I think it's pretty disgusting how, how this fact tends to drop out of the conversation on houselessness uh, when we start thinking about this as a matter of balancing different stakeholder interests is that the people that we're talking about are our neighbors. Uh, they're not a problem in, in our community to solve. They are, they are our community. We hopefully interact with them every single day and would be wise not to forget that every single one of them is an expert in the real problem facing our community, which is one of its profound inequality and the callous indifference that this city has towards the immense suffering that this inequality creates. At the cafe, every day I see this, this misery. I see people who are starving on the streets, people afraid that they're gonna get shooed away for, like dogs if they stay put in one place for too long without paying. Uh, people battling serious drug addictions, unable to get methadone due to, un, uh, due to unexpected clinic closures, and it would be staggeringly narcissistic for a business owner to imagine themselves to somehow be the ones wronged in this situation. Uh, to even imagine that their interests and, and their problems Thank you, uh, thank you, your time is up. Thank you, and please Are on the same scale as, as those that we're, we're talking about. Okay. Next. How long do I have? Do you have 90 seconds. What? 90 seconds. Yeah. Uh, hello, council members, staff, community. I'm, my name is Christy Bittner. Um, I've been in Santa Cruz so going on almost 30 years. Um, I, I'm not an expert in the homeless situation and I wasn't able to make it to the last meeting, but I've been reading some of the stuff and, and the presentations tonight and it looks pretty exciting, the things about, okay. Um, you know, the, there are homeless that, that don't want to be there. They want to get out of it. Um, some of these pro, uh, programs and proposals sound like um, they, could, they could do that. I'm, I'm support of that. I also love that um, I know the Ross uh, camp is not the way anybody wants it, but I love that they put up bathrooms there because, you know, that's, that's it. 
I am very against the Delaware proposal as stated. It's flawed, you're rushing it, you're making some of the same mistakes. Um, in, in Mr. Glover's uh, presentation, he talked about the Ross. One of the problems was there's, it wasn't set up well. There's no monitoring. Uh, originally, it didn't have sanitation. That's what you're doing out of Delaware. Safe parking is three parts. Uh, I, I've done some surveys, uh, read some of the surveys. It's safety from police ha harassment, but it's also safety from harm from other people and safe sanitation. If you're gonna do a safe parking, do it right. Mayor, what? what? Council, Vice Mayor. Um, uh, so I really wanna speak to people who uh, uh, may be not, not knowing they're gonna vote on this. The difference, so the distinction between Ross camp encampment and the, the sort of transitional encampment is key. I think you asked the question, uh, Justin. Uh, mainly, the Ross encampment has these three layers of security, so it, it, it just successful on the basis. It can't go wrong in that regard. It's, the neighborhood is safe. But a tr transitional encampment, the hallmarks are, we didn't speak to many of the hallmarks because it's mainly the, the, the city uh, aspects that we're discussing. But in these uh, encampments, some of the guidelines are, People have to do 10 hours of volunteer service. That creates safety from the inside out. In fact, it's like a, a, a built-in downtown streets team of residents who, who live there. So you end up seeing crime go down wherever transitional encampments are located. They're much uh, more cost effective than, than uh, almost any other type of program, definitely uh, when measured against the Rust encampment. Uh, people move out of, tr uh, they're called transitional encampments because people transition to something better than, than any other shelter model, anything like that. So, uh, so I strongly advocate, I've been researching these for a very long time, uh, and I'm just trying to say when we're c considering the Ross encampment or as a transitional encampment, I think it's actually well-sided, especially when you look at Eugene. All of these places are in light industrial areas. Uh, uh, you can measure almost every aspect uh, similarly perfect for a transitional encampment at Ross. Hey. Yeah. Hi, my name is Stacy Falls and I'm a resident of the West Side. And I have been paying attention to homeless issues for a while. I think it was maybe five years ago that I stood up here with Mr. Adams and we presented our idea for a Santa Cruz Sanctuary Camp, safe camping places, sort of modeled after some of the um, camps that Susie described in her presentation, Dignity Village, some of the places in uh, Seattle, et cetera. And the reason that we were advocating for that is because we were responding to the fact that you know, p solutions based on the idea that if we're just mean enough to homeless people, they'll go away, that somehow we're gonna lose a thousand homeless people, just, that's unrealistic. I've been paying attention to homeless issues for a while. People are still here, they're not going anywhere, and just by pushing them around, we're actually making things worse. We're not giving them a chance to rebuild their lives, and what we found with these tra uh, transitional camps is that people actually have a chance to get out of homelessness, clean themselves up, and move on to bigger, better things. The, the problem with homelessness is that it exacerbates the problems with homelessness. So you have people who are afraid of engaging with the law, and so they start doing methamphetamine, methamphetamines. You have people who are afraid of other homeless people and so, you know, they start to kind of become violent and edgy themselves. And so we're not doing ourselves any favors by just continuing to ignore homeless people and hoping that they'll just go away. And in fact, because of the decision in Martin v. Boise, we're not legally allowed to do that. We have to do something effective to address people's situation. That means transitional camps and safe parking places. Hi, I'm Nancy Crusoe, and I wanted to say much of what Stacy said, so let me just add this. Um, I joined with reading about sanctuary camps, now called uh, transitional encampments, five or six years ago, and was so sold on the idea that I committed all my time to trying to find a way to help meet the needs of people who live outside in our city. And I'm excited that it's on the agenda. That's great. I want to say about the fear item. All the data that we have, and it's ample, is that these camps actually 
please neighborhoods. Neighbors do not want them to leave after they've been there for a few months. The quality of life does get better if you give people a place that they can call home. A tent is better, a tent with people you know is better than being on the street and kicked out in, uh, every night. It creates coherence, it creates a sense of community and a possibility of getting, of healing. And it also creates neighbors. And if that's what we want, good neighbors, I think these camps certainly create them. So, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Eric Harris, and I'm also with the uh, Grant Park Neighbors. Uh, Brad Angel spoke uh, on our neighborhood behalf earlier. Thank you for that opportunity. Uh, I'm here with a slightly different take, perhaps, than what I've heard a little bit this evening, and that is a take of accountability, um, not only for the homeless to try and get their own house in order, so to speak, uh, but also for you folks as elected council members uh, to represent the interest of uh, housed and unhoused citizens accordingly, as well as uh, taxpayers. Uh, we need to be accountable for the taxpayers' money and the business taxes' money in how we pursue solving these problems. Um, council Member Glover, you had pr provided these stats, and I'll be off a little bit here, but I think I saw in Seattle it was like 45 people ended up being housed out of a population of I forget whether 1,200 or 2,200, but in any case, whatever that number is, it was a very small percentage of people that were helped for the millions of dollars that were spent. And so um, I would advocate that, that there's probably not enough money being put towards those people that want to opt themselves out of their homeless situation and probably too much money spent on those that are chronically homeless and would spend years not being housed and probably have not a lot of issue with it uh, despite how they're living. So I guess I put forth to all of you as well as to everybody out here, whether you're housed or unhoused, it takes accountability to yourself and to our collective to make the situation work. And uh, we are out of, uh, there's a finite amount of both housing, cash and compassion on this issue. So thank, thank you. you. Hello, my name is Megan, and I have been a resident of this county since I was seven years old. Um, I'm actually seven months pregnant and living on the streets because there is no room in any of the shelters for me. There is no room. I'm seven months pregnant. I have been hom homeless since January 1st of 2018 because my landlord raised my rent from $2,000 a month to $2,400 a month. Overnight, I had Section 8. I lost it because no one would accept it. I managed to raise a 20-year-old who's about to graduate from Cabrillo as a, a, a member of the Honor Society. She was valid Victorian of her high school. I am not a drug addict. I've never been an alcoholic. I am poor. I am disabled because people have repeatedly victimized me and not stood up for my rights that I am entitled to because it was easier to push me off to the side. I also aged out of foster care. I don't have anyone to speak for me. This needs to be solved, and it's a mental health thing by and large. This is not okay for everybody to sit around and be like, oh, well, this is something, this is, it's ridiculous that we have people that are on the city council that are renting out ADUs in their backyard for $2,500 a month when homeless people can't make more than 800 Thank you, staff, uh, mayor, city council members. Um, your report was amazing and comprehensive and it shows just how complex this issue is. Um, I'm gonna throw out some ideas. Uh, I would suggest a town hall style meeting for just the homeless with you, keeping the rest of us out so that you can actually have time to really discern what their needs are, what the categories are. There's people that are using drugs, there's people that are not, there's people with children, there's people with pets, all those have different needs. So I think it would be faster and more efficient to meet with them in person in closed chambers. Um, I'm only hearing about short-term solutions and I'd like to see some more attention paid to long-term options, um, high-density housing in neighborhoods. 
Um, what would be the cost benefit of creating a tiny house community? What city owned land could be appropriated for this use long term? Can some of that $10 million go to building a high density apartment complex strictly to designated for homeless women, family, children, <coughs> um, to it, and who would adhere to the behavior conditions required? How much would a large apartment building cost to build? And how does that compare to spending 70 to 90,000 per month on a parking lot, tent city? Rather than open up parking in neighborhoods, city-owned property could be reworked to accommodate mm -hmm. safe parking, i.e. move city storage of work vehicles from behind uh, the train tracks down by Costco, the dump trucks, the old buses, et cetera, they could be stored somewhere else, and the safe parking place could be instituted. Thank you. Good evening, Council. I'm Cynthia Berger with Santa Cruz Tenant Association. I would like uh, to see more concrete list of places. I, I would love it if you could present that at your next meeting. I mean, actual places that could be considered. Um, you know, there's a map of city land, but I, I don't know what's on every piece of it. And uh, that would feel like there was some concrete action happening. Um, I do think that having a thousand more than someone thinks we should have probably is an emergency. And since we have such a high ratio, I think that we should be getting a lot more money from the state, because if we have the highest ratio in the state and we're the poorest county in the state next to LA, then the state should be giving you more money for this particular issue and it is an emergency. It seems really patently you know, obvious that it's an emergency if if we have the highest ratio for a city our size. So, thank you. Hi, my name is Dave Allenbaugh, and first of all, I'd like to put uh, Chairperson Donna Myers at ease. I'm not here to talk about pickleball. So anyway, um, I live in De Anza, Mobile Home Park and Delaware, so you obviously know where I'm coming from. Um, we have about 80, 85% of our people are over 60, 65. A lot of them are over 80, we have some over 90. Most of us can't hear very well, a lot of us can't see very well. We're very vulnerable to thefts, burglary, violence, whatever helps. Now, about four or five years ago, before we had a lot of security, we did have a lot of homeless problems. They go in our hot tub, they go in our swimming pool. We got a great swimming pool and a hot tub and a sauna. And we got a fitness center and you know, we got a barbecue pit, we got all that stuff there. And it won't take long to discover that we have all that stuff there. That's what I'm worried about. Now, I understand that homeless is a problem and it's a problem in this city. And it's not just your problem, it's our problem. And there's no doubt about that, it's our problem. So we gotta figure it out together, and I understand that. But I think it's extremely dangerous to maybe put a bunch of tra or RVs on Delaware, especially when we walk. And uh, Councilman you know, Glover, I don't ever remember you coming to De Anza and talking to us. I don't remember any council member coming to Delaware or coming to De Anza and talking to us and say, hey, you know what? We got a proposal, we're thinking about it. Let's talk about it. I invite any one of you or all of you to come to De Anza. I will set up a meeting at the clubhouse Thank and you. you're all invited. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, I'm Greg Banks, and I'm a uh, resident of the Ross Camp, resident of Santa Cruz. Um, I'd like to thank, I, I saw Chief was here earlier, Chief uh, Mills was here. He's the one that invited me to go there, or asked a bunch of us to go there from the beach several months ago, and I've met incredible people there, had awesome experiences, um, also had terrible infections, all sorts of stuff. Um, the people that are there, I've gotten to know a lot of them. I love every single one of them, even though they're they're ne'er do wells, perhaps. But um, they, um, each and every one of them, have stories, and a lot of them are have been chewed up and spit out by society before, and they're going to make it through this, whatever happens again. Um, keep that in mind. That uh, at, from a young age, a lot of these people had bad things. I'd like to thank. Uh, Council members Crone and Glover, working with them on some stuff and talking to um, Justin Cummings as well. Um, I'm gonna go home and have a good sleep. And my home is Ross Camp, whatever happens there. Um, I've been to 52 countries traveling and I totally feel safe there. Um, and um, cops never hassle us, I do appreciate, you know, I'll, I'll get beat up like this uh, for talking about like this, but I do appreciate the, the good things that do happen here. It's a complicated issue. Um, it's not gonna go away, but we can work with it. Thank you. Yeah. 
The issue that I want to deal with on this is... Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Please. Okay, the issue I want to deal with this on this or bring the light on this is toxic waste dumping in our area, okay? And this is, a, is something that has affected the homeless over five of the last eight years that I live here, okay? On the street, on the west side, mostly by the Safeway area. It was dumped in the Safeway parking lot into the groundwater right there. They have recently capped off one of two areas that they can do that. Okay, and they did this, and I am to witness, and my name is Gregory Lee Smith, and I'm saying that I would testify in federal court, and this is an issue I know it's coming to hand, and it's about human waste, such as liposuction waste that was held in a containment area across the street from our homeless shelter that has people there that are grown men that should not be near children, and a, and a homeless shelter for families and won't address the issue of feeding homeless people, that they just quit one day because there were too many. They advertised for them to come here, all right? And that toxic waste was very bad. They had to claim that there was a leak in the Freon at Safeway when this happened in order to explain what was going on in the area to anybody that might ask a question, okay? It was most of the people that were indoors didn't understand why the people were coming home acting like they were. Okay, uh, you said uh, meningitis kits, you can get a few ways from black mold, and you can get it from a brain injury, which you do not get rid of the blood that's on the brain, and you can, I, I, I know what I'm saying, and I just uh, need to say that. I'd like to address it with anybody that wants to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Elise Casby, and I'm a homeless advocate and activist. I have been investigating homelessness since 2009. Every single one of those years has been vital in terms of me trying to come to terms with the issue of homelessness. Who are the homeless? Why is there homelessness? No one, no one can do justice to this issue, no matter how well-meaning. Uh, by visiting a camp and suddenly becoming sympathetic. And the reason I say that is the city has a history of being tremendously duplicitous and, and cynical and unsympathetic to homeless people. Having said that, I agree with Tina. I do think this is a new day. I think we have some opportunities here. I also really resent that my time was reduced. I feel if you take this job to be a city council member, be prepared to pretty much sign away your life in, for the public good. So I just want to say, um, you, you know, cutting my time off is not right. The stakeholders in this issue are the homeless people. That's who the stakeholder is. I'm really disturbed when I see the stakeholder list top with nonprofit operators. One of the best and well-meaning nonprofit operators, the Faith Community Shelter, forced the homeless to go to a different church every single night. That's extremely hard on the homeless people. We haven't begun to even begun this dialogue with homeless people. We need to really come to terms with that. I like some of the plans up here, but we need to shelter homeless people. They are all people. Thank you all for your time tonight. My name is Caleb Baskin. I wanna to speak to the Delaware parking issue specifically. Um, what Assistant to the City Manager O'Hara said earlier about the need to match services with the population need really resonated. And I think on the safe parking issue, that is particularly important. Unfortunately, in a lot of the discussion tonight and in some of the correspondence with the community, there's been a pretty heavy conflation of the data supporting transitional encampments in the Northwest with trying to use the same data to support safe parking as a solution. Safe parking is different and it may well belong in the continuum of services that the city decides belong there. But if it does, it should be able to survive a deliberative process and choosing of those sightings. And I would be surprised if given the intellectual capacity arrayed in front of us tonight, we can't come up with a location that doesn't contain 1,100 K through 12 students, as well as ecological preserves within the four block radius around which the proposed location would be put. As much scrutiny should be given to those locations as any regular development, if not more, given the potential impact. With my remaining time, I wanted to just finish up what Mr. Prado wanted to say. What he didn't get a chance to tell you was that the reason he was here was because of those roughly 1,100 children that go to school and live in that four block area around the proposed parking location. They don't get to vote, but they're heavily impacted on whether or not that's there and it deserves appropriate deliberation, environmental review and public safety review before you open it. Thank you very much.
Mayor, council members, my name's Clayton Markle. To follow up on what the previous gentleman said, since my time's been reduced, I'd like to speak primarily to the Delaware issue. Councilman Glover, you talked about the issues, the common issues people had writing into uh, opposing specifically opening Delaware. I haven't heard those issues addressed so far in this proposal. And again, I've lived here for 45 years since I was 12 years old, grew up here on the west side, still live here. And yes, in a house. And I'm lucky to have that house. I realize that. I worked as a firefighter for 30 years. I've been in and out of homeless encampments. It's a hard life. All of you that are homeless, you're working really hard just to stay alive. I don't know how you do it. It's a really complex issue. That's been revealed. I'd love to see what, the, what else the working group comes up with. I think, Mayor, as you put it, this is an important issue. We cannot rush to judgment. You've cut my time down so you can have enough time to deliberate. I'm with the previous speaker. This is an important issue that has been brought before the community. We all deserve a chance to speak and have our say. If it's not that important, if we can't speak out loud, let's not rush to it. I look forward to hearing what you, what you guys come up with. Thank you for your time. Good evening, um, my name is Amy Liebichuk. I'm a social worker with the county. And first I'd like to say thanks for the wonderful comprehensive presentation that was presented by city staff. Um, secondly, I'm really disturbed to see the two polarizing camps that I've heard about in Santa Cruz. And honestly, this is the first time I've really started to get active this year of coming to city council meetings. I see folks that are concerned about safety in the community. And then I see folks that are really concerned about social justice and human rights issues. Um, I don't think I think we all want the same things. We want kids to feel safe. As a woman, I wanna feel safe walking around town at night. I don't, but I don't feel that way in San Francisco or any other city, maybe in foreign countries, I do feel safer, to be honest. Um, so I, what I wanna ask is that folks on the left, we have to be patient. We're not gonna see progress overnight. Um, that's gonna be hard, but I think we have to be patient. And then I ask for folks further on the right or more moderate folks, so let's try out some of these programs. There's already people parking on Delaware, acquiring hundreds of dollars of tickets. They can't pay them. Um, and they're just going through this cycle of where am I gonna park tonight? Um, so let's try these things out. If they don't work, then there's always a chance to try something new. But if we just say no, 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 then what's gonna get done? Thank you. Hi, um, first of all, I just wanted to say that I keep hearing how we are not compassionate because we have a problem with some of the things that are happening in town. And that's not true. It's just that our compassion is not unlimited. It has limits. I live on the west side, I've lived there for 25 years. We've had in the last 10 years, a lot of increased crime. I have to bolt everything down, lawn ornaments, lights on my lawn, everything. Anytime you move an encampment around, you're gonna have increased theft and increased crime, pollution, toxic waste, garbage, is all gonna come with it. So you have the Ross encampment, which has exploded, and it's disgusting looking, and I'm sure it's very difficult to live there. So now you wanna now take RVs, put them on the west side, and have the same thing happen over there, except potentially worse, because they all have places to go to the bathroom in their RVs, and I've seen them dump it. I have pictures in my wallet. Um, it's just going to cause an environmental uh, catastrophe as well as safety issues, obviously for the children with the schools and the preschools that are around there. People walk their dogs. It's a pretty place. Tourists come. It's a state park. And let's leave it nice. Let's have one side of town, at least that people can have a respite from what's going on here and figure out from, um, from, from facts, from data, what's working. Because the numbers that you stated, 63% don't you. want to be Thank you. Um, housed. <laughs> Hello, I'm Tom Powell. I live near Natural Bridges Park. 
and I'm uh, not wanting to see the parking restrictions lifted for a few reasons. Um, when I was in better health, I rode my bicycle around town a lot. One of my uh, most frequent rides was the San Lorenzo River Trail. I have, I've, it's, I called myself three or four times of people that had OD'd. And driving through there, the um, emergency response vehicles were, it was, they were out there time and time again. Our children don't need to be walking by with a body, somebody dead in an RV or laying on the side of the road. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons. And I, uh, the park itself, the, uh, last year and the year before, the fires were intentionally set in the park. I, on the, uh, two years ago, I, was, I had an outing planned with friends. I walked out of my house, smoke was roiling uh, right in my direction. Uh, all the homes over there are in the direction of the air, cur air current. Uh, the firemen that morning told me that we were very lucky if there had been uh, uh, less humidity. And yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay. You could you could feel free to leave your comments or email them for us. Okay, Thank I'm you. Deaf You're in one ear. What? You could e you could either uh, leave your comments or you're welcome to uh, to um, uh, set email them to us as well. Okay. But your time is complete for okay, tonight. I'll, I'll Thank you. Um, <clears throat> hi, Pat Malo. Um, I've been lucky enough to live in a house in Santa Cruz for my entire life, and I'm trying every day to keep it that way, just like everyone in the room, I'm sure. Um, I, I just want to thank the council and especially staff for coming back so quickly with the detailed report. I know that's a lot of work, and it's appreciated. Um, you know, I want to add something to the conversation. When I was growing up, um, you know, uh, when I was 19 or 20, you know, my dad worked full-time but temporary worker at the university and was able to live out of a pickup truck in Nicene Marks uh, Park for a year and a half until he got cancer and moved into somebody who, you know, let him live rent free. And, uh, you know, what I gained from that lesson is a lot of the time as policymakers, I think that in public we think about what can we do, and I think sometimes we need to think about what can we stop doing. And I think the first thing we can stop doing is stop criminalizing survival behavior, yeah. you know? And, and, and that shouldn't be a, a controversial partisan thing, and I think I've seen presentations in this very room maybe a year ago about how much law enforcement resources are put forward on this and how much it doesn't work. And I've also seen presentations in the county building about, you know, specifically women in jails and the county population and how almost to every single person there's a history of trauma. And we don't want to repeat that trauma. And, you know, I don't know if solutions are here in front of us right now, but I know that getting money from the state with the county is a good thing. And I think that, you know, the, some of these extra ideas are really good things we should explore. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. I live in De Anza Bubble Home Park. I've been there for 20 years. My back fence butts up to Delaware Avenue and I've seen, I've seen everything there. Um, in the last three years, I've been forced to call the police three times, two over um, meth cooking operations that the police did show up. The people were apprehended, <coughs> arrested, bailed, um, and we're back two weeks later. Um, one was a bicycle theft ring. Somebody, and these are all the motor homes that are always parked there. Same guys that I walk by and ride my bike by every day. Um, he unloads 15 bikes and I ride by on my bike and says, do, do I want to buy some bikes cheap? And I know exactly what he's got and I called the police. They arrested him, got rid of him. Countless times, um, people dumping their holding tanks right on the street. And it's not just gray water, it's the black water and, and the rest of it. Um, the most recent uh, uh, instance was uh, riding my bike with my wife and my granddaughter, and, and we're kind of an adult group, but somebody reaches uh, up through the window of his motor home and says, hey, you wanna fuck? In front of my wife 
and my granddaughter. And, you know, except for fear for getting shot or something like that, I rode on. I did, I did let the, sh the police. Thank you. Well, that was quick. Thank you. I would ask of you tonight to please look at all aspects of what is before you today. Your staff has given you some very good information and there's a large sum of money involved. I hope that you're going to look at what is sustainable. And I would ask you at this time to stop name calling. This is someone's son or someone's daughter. It is you and I one incident away. This is someone who is dealing with homelessness, not labeled as homeless. I will ask that you think about a few things. Safety for all, as I have gone down into the encampments, as I have gone out in the street as a healthcare provider, I hope that you are looking at people being the priority, keeping the people in our community safe, including those dealing with homelessness, and that you will look at our police officers and how important it is to keep them safe and in a healthy environment. And creating that environment means not just moving an encampment, but finding a long-term solution. I hope that you realize that access to care is a right, not a privilege. And that includes essential things that I am not finding as I go do my toothbrush exchange program. That includes water and a toilet, health care and a bed. A right, not a privilege. I hope that's going to be on your mind tonight because you can be the difference. Thank you. Hi, I'm Wes Weiss, Salinas resident, president of the Salinas Monterey County Homeless Union, also on this California Homeless Union as well. Um, so we're, we're branching out and getting bigger. Um, Martin versus Boise is one of those things that, that you're really gonna have to worry about. Uh, you're gonna have to open as many spaces as a thousand people will take in, in tents. And, and it's gonna have to, you're gonna have to open up more streets than only Delaware. You, you're actually gonna have to bow down to this because it's, it's like raising a kid. You know, you, you can not pay attention to him and he's gonna end up being a brat or you can scaffold this person and, and raise him up to be a child. You know, um, we really gotta look at this as homelessness issues and homelessness problems, not homeless problems, but the people, the homelessness problems. And, and that's the way that it's supposed to be approached. Supposedly that's what we're gonna do but you don't have enough space available for everybody right now. So, so you gotta count for, 20, I'm thinking you know, 400, 400 square feet in a, in a tent, you know, instead of 400, 400 acres in a mule or whatever, 40 acres, uh, you know, 20 by 20 and, and use that as, as a standard, you know. Um, <clears throat> that's still a really small area <clears throat> and it doesn't allow much privacy. But it is, it is a venue. You're gonna have to have wet camps. You, you can have dry camps. You can have zero, uh, you know, zero tolerance, but you still have to take care of these people. They have to go somewhere. If they're on the sidewalk, you don't want them on the sidewalk, well then open up a lot. <laughs> Hi everybody, um, another long night. Um, I'm Danny, uh, I grew up in Santa Cruz, in Aptos specifically, and I grew up struggling with addiction really heavily. And I'm not gonna get super into that tonight. I'm sure I'll have a chance to do that in the future. Um, but I really resonated with what the earlier person said about being one incident away from being homeless. I was like one fight away from my parents, one serious incident away from just being ostracized, you know? and. I lost, you know, there's a lot of friends I can't speak to anymore because they're still struggling with addiction that I only hear from when there's an overdose or something. There's friends of mine that live on the street. And because of all these like experiences that I've had, um, I support a few things that I'll get into quick tonight. Uh, transitional encampments as an evidence-based approach that will work um, and will address the problem that I haven't heard mentioned a lot tonight that a lot of people that are living in the Ross camp right now are not gonna be able to sleep in a shelter for reasons of trauma, for reasons of criminal record, for lots of reasons they won't be able to go into a county or city shelter program and we need to have camping options available for them. Um, I also support an extension of the eviction deadline for the Ross camp. I think March 15th, there's not gonna be those beds available even though people won't take them. Um, I really hope that can be pulled out and voted on. Um, and lastly, I look forward to a future 
uh, conversation on harm reduction because it's something very close to my heart. Thanks. And before, before you begin, I want to get a sense of uh, if there's other additional speakers. Okay. So if you could please uh, line up to my left and uh, well, you, do you want to go last? Okay. Okay. Ready? You're ready. Yeah. Hi, um, my name's Alicia Cool. I've sat here and listened to a lot this evening. Um, I'm here because I am an RV dwelling, drug free, technically homeless person. Um, I'm not scary. I'm not going to dump sewage all over Delaware. I'm urging you and supporting you to ignore fear based. Um, com comments and complaints. You've heard a lot of those tonight um, about needles and sewage. That's not a common thing. That's a minority of the homeless population, not a majority. Um, I feel like if you gave this program a shot and let us park on Delaware, you can address that small percent, make an example out of them. Um, but don't just take that off of the table because people are scared of it. It's time for some radical changes. Um, obviously, people are going to be scared, but there are, and there are children and preschools in that area. I heard a lot of that. Um, I have kids too. My kids count as well. You know, we need a safe place to sleep at night. Um, we were attacked, our RV was attacked at night by people who didn't want us in their neighborhood for no reason at all. This evening, I had somebody tell me, get in my RV and go to a different neighborhood. Um, I feel like we need to have compassion over this issue. Um, I'm also against closing the Ross camp unless low barrier options are available for every resident there. And we're having a workshop tomorrow at two there. Hi, I'm Gary Garcia. Thanks for the great work you guys did in pulling all that data together. It's really helpful. I have three things I want you to know um, or hope you'll consider. Um, First, uh, Santa Cruz is a very giving community, but we can't do it by ourselves. In many respects, uh, the, the data-driven uh, analysis about transitional camps is compelling in its microcosm. The problem is, is that, and it's been said before, we have a greater population of homeless relative to our resident community than most other communities. So that tells us that we have to work with the rest of the county and our neighborhood cities to have programs that span across multiple cities. Second point I'd like you to consider is, if we do have transitional uh, camps, there has to be something to transition to. That has to be part of the plan. And I haven't heard what happens next. And the third thing I'd like you to consider is, uh, there has to be uh, services for any transitional camp. There has to be uh, so, uh, a plan for paying for uh, sewage treatment, fresh water bring brought in, or don't do it. Don't do it badly. Doing it badly is worse than not doing it. It's better to, to have a measured uh, approach and do it right the first time. Thanks a lot. Hello, my name is Joy Carregliano, and I live in De La Cruz on up Delaware. And I, I have so much that I would like to say, but I, I feel that we've gone homeless, but we are really forgetting the people who live in the neighborhood and who have worked all their life from the time they were children themselves, have gone through burned homes, have gone through <coughs> parents in hospitals, have gone through wars. And I just want you to know that I've worked hard all my life. I've fed many, many people. I had a deli, fed the fire department, fed the police department during our disaster in the 80s. Beyond that, my husband was walking down Delaware. He fell down, he broke his nose, he has Alzheimer's. And we had three lovely ladies who stopped. If we put these mobile homes on Delaware, because we've already gotten stuck with a couple that are there all the time and they have feces and they do all these things that we've been hearing about, just a few of them. If we have these, do you really think our people are gonna be walking down and what if my husband fell down and no one was there to help him? 
we live in this community. I've lived in this community for years. I've lived in Scotts Valley. I've lived all over here for at least 45 years. My children went to school here. I paid for that. I worked hard. They worked hard. Please take into consideration our homeless people. Please take into consideration the people who've worked all their damn lives Thank and you, raised good kids. Thank you very much. Your time is now up. This is Thank so you. important. I hear you. I haven't heard it tonight. I, I thank you very much. Okay. Our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah and I, I have Asperger's, a form of autism and I've been homeless in Santa Cruz four times since 2003, but I don't use any hard drugs and I have zero criminal history. It's because I can't find supportive services to help me. I have no intentions of doing any crimes or thrashing out anybody's neighborhoods and um, I live in fear that if I ever lose my housing right now that because my income is half of what an average studio would go for or even less than a room share that um, I have no uh, future with um, housing. Um, there's no social services for me. I don't qualify for mental health services. I don't qualify for um, drug rehab. Um, and also I uh, was pregnant and I spent um, six months of my pregnancy in Santa Cruz on the streets and the only people who helped me is a Catholic mission that told me I had to sign the baby over. Um, but I didn't do that, I kept her. She's eight years old, she's top of her class in school. But what will happen if I ever lose my place? What will be her fate? Thank you. Um, Summer Rose, and I'm speaking from a personal place where I have been homeless also in this town. And, you know, safety was an issue for me, being homeless. Um, being in houses, you are not necessarily safe. I lived in houses where I wasn't safe. So the idea of safety seems to be number one for every everyone, and it does seem like there's money in this council and this city where we can have police officers, other people go down and stay at Ross Camp and be there 24 seven. There's no reason why they can't since the money is there until we find a solution if it does seem like the number one issue is safety. And that kind of seems like a simple solution. I mean, the money's there, let's just get people there now and have cops show up and just be patrolling and neighborhood watches, people in the neighborhood who wanna be there until we find a good place for people to be because it's important. I know these people can't, it's really hard to get off your feet and get on with your life if you don't have a home. It's really, really serious. That's the biggest safety issue. You have your home, you can keep your kids in your home for right now. I guess that would be you know, a solution if you don't feel safe you know, at Ross Camp or whatever. Drive your kids, figure out another solution. But you know, have, have groups of people walk your children to school with a cop. I mean, I, I don't really see that there is an issue here other than a lack of people spending the money today that we have today to address the safety issue. So that's number one. And I guess the only one, thanks. Before you speak, I just wanna confirm that you'll be the last speaker unless there's any- I have no idea. Uh, okay, so you'll be our last speaker because I'm okay. seeing nobody else. Go ahead. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. And I think that you should declare a homeless crisis. And um, we had another crisis in this town years ago. It was called an earthquake. And right across the street here at the Civic Center, that became a shelter <laughs> after the earthquake for months. There was people living in there. Why can't we do that again? You know? And as far as uh, car parking goes, Who's got the biggest parking lots in town? I would say the county does. They got the parking lots over at Emily and they got ones over there at Ocean Street. And then the boardwalks got some giant parking lots too that they don't use in the winter time. And then there's a bunch of streets over there in the Harvey West area that used to be where people could park, but they made that no overnight parking. And so those, those could be lifted also. And as long as there's uh, some accommodation for, you know, some kind of trash refuse pickup and, you know, maybe porta potties, I don't see why there'd be a problem. 
and uh, I hope that you guys can do something to really help these people because they are people. Thank you. Okay, so at this time, I'll uh, go ahead and close public comment. I want to uh, thank all of those who are still here with us this evening, who are no longer here but showed up um, or had contacted us in advance. Uh, we um, all share a commitment to addressing this, this topic, this issue, this very complex issue. Um, and I appreciate the uh, decorum and uh, ability and willingness to allow everyone to have their voice heard um, and uh, appreciate you coming out to express your, your opinions with us this evening. Um, before we return for uh, action deliberation, I'll just make a few brief comments. Um, one, of, one of which that comes to mind quite frequently for me when thinking about the complexity of balancing this type of issue is my experience working in restorative justice and restorative practices. And one of the things that we always uh, approach that uh, through a lens of, uh, of accountability, through a lens of a community, and through a lens of competency development, which is essentially looking at everybody's individual circumstances and how do we balance those. So it is truly uh, recognition of just there are very, very many, there are many aspects that are uh, considered and impacted when we're thinking about how we do our work and our uh, balancing of the very complex issues. The other that comes to mind is uh, my experience in uh, my master's program where uh, Secretary, Secretary Panetta often said, we either uh, find ourselves governing from a place of crisis or from a place of leadership. And we see a governance at this time from a place of crisis if we think about some of the things that we're experiencing um, in terms of the federal level and uh, relationship to the immigration approach. And I hope that uh, no matter what, even as we experience crisis, that we are able to uh, think of uh, solutions and come up with solutions through uh, a commitment to leading and uh, seeing aspects of uh, accountability and results along the way. That said, I um, ask that given the complexity of the topic and uh, the experience from the previous meeting, that if the council members are interested in being um, recognized that they go through myself and I will do my best to acknowledge both sides of my body um, and uh, in seeking uh, recognition of council members who wish to be sp to wish to speak on the topic um, as I also know that we want to have a real clear understanding of how to move forward and where we want to go so at this point I will open it up to uh, the council for action and deliberation is there any council member who wishes to speak at this time never mind Try to make this brief. Um, well, thank you everyone for came, who came out tonight um, and is still here at 11.30 at night. It's always hard to talk about this um, gravity of a situation um, at 11.30 at night. And so I apologize that uh, we're doing this kind of discussion right here, right now, but uh, we are gonna keep at it and uh, I, I've been here a long time and Santa Cruz has been keeping at this problem for a long time. Um, you know, we talked about data tonight and I, I do wanna reflect on some, what I perceive as some movement in the right direction. I was looking back at some of the reports we've received recently, as well as the letter we, we received um, this week from the Homeless Services Center. And between those, uh, you know, within about a six, within about a nine to 12 month period, unless I'm, misunderstanding these reports, it looks like we were able to transition about over about 400 people into either transitional housing or permanent, um, you know, supportive housing uh, in this nine to 12 months. So, so we are doing this. Um, and again, I don't know what that number compares to maybe other people who are coming, I don't, or, or aren't being, are, aren't part of the system. So one, one thing I think we need to understand is a little bit more about how people are being, um, you know, being, um, I guess, uh, how our programs are working and whether or not we can compile numbers from different programs that would be very helpful for me to understand. Is the number always at 12 or is it moving at various times of the year? Um, so it's hard to, be a, to, to make policy in progress when I'm not exactly clear how these numbers are fitting together. So I can give the staff the numbers that I used. So it could be in, incorrect, but these are numbers that I'm seeing. Um, 
In terms of the ahead, uh, in terms of the actual um, proposal tonight, I'm I'm supportive. Me, just for a second, if you could, we've we've uh, had a chance to hear from the public. At this time, it's now our opportunity for deliberation. So please, uh, please keep your voices down. Go ahead. So I'll make this quick. Um, there's a couple things I I'm a little bit confused about. So. We're talking about transitional encampments. I don't know if the River Street Camp qualifies as that. I, I think we're thinking of it more as a shelter, but I, I don't know that we're that far off in terms of uh, the facilities that we're talking about. And it may be that um, we're talking about the same thing, but the, the model has not been completely identified yet. So uh, I think we have an emergency resolution that is um, currently working. Uh, it's defining the types of things that we need for the state. It's defining the things that um, uh, are outlining the shortages in our community. And finally, um, it's uh, helped us receive some of the money from the state already. Uh, I think the safe parking program also, I don't think that we're ready to do it anywhere quite yet. I saw in the staff report two weeks ago that there was a mention of trying to do a pilot program. I think several people mentioned that today. Let's make sure we, if we do something like this, let's make sure we know how to do it. Um, let's not put it in the Delaware neighborhood. It's, it's not, I, I haven't heard anything that is, makes me wanna say yes, go and do that and open that area up. Um, there's no services there. There's distance from, it just doesn't make any sense to go to put that over in that neighborhood. Um, so I'm supportive of trying to continue to work forward. I think we have some solid plans. I'm not seeing, I'm, I'm, I'm confused by what we're talking about because I feel like we have some plans and some solid ideas and we are making some progress and we have done some demonstrations and we've done pilots. Let's keep trying to figure this out keep moving forward with some of these things, um, but I won't be supporting, uh, I'm sorry, but I won't be supporting the emergency resolution only because I feel like we have one in place and uh, I'm not ready to support um, anything over on Delaware Avenue until we really have a safe parking program and a, a nonprofit partner and some other things that we've learned from <coughs> looking at other jurisdictions. I just wanna make sure that we have those things in place before we do anything. Mr. Norris, if we could please allow us to have this conversation, I'll consider that a warning. And then at this point, we'll go ahead and have our council deliberations. We had an opportunity to hear from the community. Thank you. Okay, Council Goldberg. Thank you. Uh, yeah, really wonderful to have so many people come out and share their perspectives. It's great to uh, see the discourse in action, as well as uh, I really appreciate those of you that did provide some form of tangible solution or uh, input as to what it is that um, you'd like to see uh, as some potential solutions. I, uh, again, want to appreciate the staff for uh, being able to produce this initial language of the resolution for the declaration of the existence of a local homeless emergency. So just to move forward on the process so we can start whittling down the things that are in front of us. I'm going to make the motion that we adopt the existing language as provided by the staff for the declaration of homeless emergency uh, to be able to create a, a statement, not just about shelter, but about homelessness because of the ways that it's stipulated here in the different areas outlining the importance of uh, looking at not just the shelter issues, but also the humanitarian and human needs of people. Um, so uh, moving on to the next, in, in that motion, in, in addition to the declaration of local emergency, um, requesting the staff to return back on March 12th with a comprehensive list of all possible city-owned locations for both encampments and safe parking programs so that we can uh, begin discussing potential locations. And then also on March 20, or excuse me, to return on March 12th with language for the first reading for both a transitional encampment permitting ordinance so we can begin the community outreach process as well as a safe parking program permitting process uh, based off of the previously submitted materials. Okay, there's a motion by Council Member Glover. I'm just gonna ask, yeah, so we're, we're taking off the table the Delaware um, uh, RV parking, right? I, uh, in your motion. I, yeah, I have any, that's not included in that motion. We can discuss Delaware later. I just wanna get moving on some of these things because it's 
Okay, I'll, I'll second that because I, I don't I, I don't support necessarily parking in Delaware. So I'm just going to say that, and, and I uh, second your motion. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Crone. I just have a quick question, and I want to again thank the staff for the short turnaround in terms of the research and work. And I also, having been on the council for a couple of years, know that there's been a lot of commitment and work. Given, I think, what I see as a real consistency in terms of t intention behind the recommendations tonight, as well as some of the movement existing, do you have recommendations and to what you're seeing as already kind of unfolding in terms of our continuum of care, ongoing efforts in terms of the two by two and work with the partnerships in the county and such that would um, encompass that as well? Thank you. <laughs> um, I may think a bit as I answer. We referenced earlier, and I know it was a couple of hours ago, that there are, this conversation tonight has been about the immediate encampment, the immediate crisis, and what we can do to address it. The, the suffering, the public health, the public safety issues. Um, at the same time, we are working very diligently on other plans to deal with homelessness in our county from the midterm sheltering plan. Can we come up with an area, in fact, we have a joint city county adopted plan to try to identify um, additional shelter spaces that would come online July 1, and we'll be reporting back to you by April 1st with a report on how we're doing. We have the heat money that's out there as an opportunity. And um, in addition, we also have, and, and Susie referenced this, this eye of looking at a system-wide view of how, what homeless services are out there, an assessment, an evaluation of what's available, what is the system of care, what does that continuum look like, how does one navigate through the homeless, um, homeless services system, the entire spectrum across the county. So there are many levels of work that are kind of ongoing on a concurrent way, and they all braid together in, um, I think, in a productive way that, as I've said several times, I really do feel we're in a different space and time than we have been in the past. Um, in terms of our recommendations tonight, you know, we are trying to balance this urgency of action, which is very clearly communicated by the city council and by the community in which we share to come up with good solutions. And we're trying to balance that with also making sure we have a solid process and that um, community engagement is also a strong value of this council of staff of the community. So that's why we came up with the charter, the project charters around the transitional encampments and the public facilities. So these are things that we are in agreement are worthy of exploration. And, and this was our um, best shot, our best thought at like, this is a thoughtful way that we think we can balance all those needs for urgency and action, but also inclusive conversation um, involving a variety of people, including, you know, the topic comes up a lot around, um, including also people lived experience as well in it. So uh, what we would recommend, I mean, we've put this forward as our recommendation for action around, around the transitional encampments and the public facilities. Um, as for the the other two items here, that was really at council's discretion or whatever the council wished to do. So that's what we put forward is thinking, we think that this can harmonize with council action, what we're trying to do on the ground immediately, the midterm plans. And then a final question you had, Mayor Watkins, or an, or an aspect of it was a two by two committee. And I think a really essential part of this is that the city is not going at it alone. We have a very strong partnership in the county and um, um, Mayor Watkins and Vice Mayor Cummings, you're exemplifying that partnership. You're very committed. The two supervisors are very committed. And I think that joint planning, that's, I think, a very um, important and careful space to have those conversations. So I would want us to make, make sure we're communicating really strongly with them and that we're planning in conjunction. Because there is a sense and an acceptance from all the jurisdictions that this really is a countywide issue and we need to be thinking on that level as well. So that those are just some thoughts that come to my mind um, about you know, the, the entire system, short-term, mid-term, long-term problems or um, challenges, opportunities, funding, two by two, county. It's a lot, yeah. Thank you. And, um, I'd like to add, just based on today's discussion, because uh, I think it's important, I think we might miss an opportunity with our evaluation of transitional encampments and moving forward with ordinances around these other types of programs that we see, um, the rest the rest stops, the dust to dawn programs, tiny, tiny house villages. These are really different types of projects and programs that meet different needs in our community. And so I do think that council support of that project charter process should actually be inclusive of looking at different modalities of support for folks um, 
transitional encampments may be where we end up thinking is the best approach, but I would hate to rush that process and, and discount these other approaches as well. Thank you. And if, I'm sorry if I may make one more point. Um, just a, a point of clarification around process required and the planning director reminded me of this. Um, depending, excuse me, on the ordinance that comes back if that's council's wish, um, if it's a title 24, a zoning code change, um, per our, our rules, that would have to go to the planning commission first. So it could not be heard before you use a first reading, but it could be brought back for a discussion. So just a technicality, if there's something that interfaces with zoning, it couldn't actually come back to your first reading. It has to go through the planning commission first. <coughs> just want to double check. I thought I saw a hand on this side. I, I could have not. I would like to know what the motion was. Okay, Councilman Berglover. So was that to ask the question or to answer a question? I thought I saw a hand up over here, but it sounds like there's a question and you had your hand up anyways. If you wanna make your comments and then respond to the question, that would be appropriate. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I just wanna clarify, cause um, what I heard from you, Susie, just a second ago, was it kind of like a dichotomy of like either or transitional encampments or the other ones. In the original documentation that I submitted asking for uh, ordinance language, it included all three of the things, that the dust till dawn program, the safe parking spaces, and the transitional encampments. So I'd love to see an exploration of all of those, looking at the timelines associated with some of the things that were brought forward, which as I really appreciate the, the estimation and the time projection, but I do think that there's a concern with the earliest that any of this could happen for the parking program, if I have it correctly, is May, and then the transitional encampments is August. Uh, I think that there, I mean, and you'll be meeting with Brent and all of them to talk about implementation and all that kind of jazz, but there's language that exists from the different municipalities. And I think that's the logic that I'm getting at with the declaration of homeless emergency uh, is because what you mentioned, Tina, about the need to take it to the planning commission and then have the planning commission look at it and then come back for us to do a first reading. It's my understanding that we can circumvent certain processes if need be so that we can move forward with the first draft reading and then we can open it up and members from the planning commission can come and speak at that meeting and share their perspective as to whether they agree with the stuff. Um, I wanna clarify that with the city attorney as to if that is in fact something that is uh, able to be done underneath the declaration of homeless emergency. And then the other thing just um, on the parking is I wanted to get clarification if y'all know if the uh, Coastal Commission ever gave us a permit to actually enforce no parking in the area on Delaware or if we're just doing that on our own volition. So I want to know if you have that information and then I'll also tell you with that response and then I'll tell you the motion. The, the parking restrictions went in in 2004 mm -hmm. on Delaware Avenue and I don't know of any enforcement action but I don't know with certainty exactly what that um, approval process was so I will find out and report back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so our, our code provides that an amendment to the zoning code, which is Title 24 of the Municipal Code, um, is, is first required to be reviewed uh, for a recommendation by the Planning Commission before the Council takes action on it. Um, that being said, um, and, and by the way, just uh, going back to the motion that was adopted on February 12th, there was language that referenced similar ordinances that were uh, put in place by, I think, Eugene and Seattle. And I looked at the Seattle ordinance and it looked like it was a, a zoning uh, amendment that um, tracks pretty consistently with what the, what the motion language was. And mm -hmm. so that could be adapted to a Santa Cruz ordinance. But if it were to amend the zoning code, um, then that would have to require, uh, that would require planning commission approval. Um, the city council can adopt an interim uh, urgency ordinance without planning commission review that can be in place for a period of time. Um, I believe that requires uh, five affirmative votes, but that would be something that could be put in place while the planning commission was doing its work, if that's the direction of the council. And then to my answer, yeah, and then to answer Councilmember Matthews, 
The motion was to adopt the uh, language presented by the city staff on the declaration of homeless emergency to return on March 12th at the next meeting with a comprehensive list of all city owned locations for encampments and safe parking locations. And then to also return to that meeting with language for review of the transitional encampment permitting ordinance and the safe parking programs based off of the previously submitted materials. And if I could just follow up on that, I, I interpreted the previously submitted materials to include that uh, packet of, of Seattle uh, materials. Yeah, and then also in the transitional encampment agenda item, there was a sample ordinance language that was essentially a fusion of the Eugene and Seattle ordinances. So there was for the transitional encampment zoning conversation. And then there was also rest stops and dust till dawn programs included in the packet. And then in the parking program transitional encampment ordinance uh, agenda item, there's a list of very specific stipulations that govern trash, safety, uh, and uh, admittance into the camp as well. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Mack. Ju I just have a quick question um, for Councilmember Glover. Um, so with the uh, transitional encampment uh, process, um, the staff had sort of lined out sort of a number of, of steps, including community outreach. Mm -hmm. So if we move, so I'm just trying to understand the, the parts of the motion and how it fits sort of into the staff charter process in terms of how we, um, for example, vet any of these things back to our community because um, some of this, uh, Delaware is probably a good example of, you know, that being a location and obviously brought, brought our community out this evening. So. I'm just curious if you could clarify. I'm, I just don't, I can't quite follow where all of this kind of gets put on the ground. So are we gonna work off of this, the charter, uh, it's, uh, the charter process as was presented? Or I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how that works. Okay, Councilor McLeod. Yeah. Um, so um, to clarify with regards to the staff recommendations compared to the motions that I made just currently, um, I really appreciate the, the charter process that the staff put together. Uh, it was great to see all the different minds that are on it and I understand the process. It's the timeline that uh, worries me, especially with the admittedly lacking uh, bed space that we currently have and the population that we <coughs> need to provide sleeping space for. So my proposition is to either A, uh, come back to the next meeting with a first draft for a first reading, but after listening to what um, Attorney Condotti said, that unless we do an emergency action, that's not possible without going through the planning, planning department first? Or is there a way Commission. through this, through this uh, declaration, uh, uh, does that loosen up zoning processes? Um, the emergency declaration by itself um, provides a mechanism for um, for loosening up um, our existing regulations. Specifically, I'll just read from the applicable statute. Um, during a local emergency, uh, the governing body may promulgate orders and regulations necessary to provide for the protection of life and property, including orders or regulations uh, imposing curfew within designated boundaries where necessary to preserve the public order and safety. So it contemplates that um, this provides uh, the legal foundation within which to promulgate regulations that implement uh, emergency actions in response to the declaration. So my understanding of that personally, and maybe I'm incorrect, is that if we do adopt the declaration of homeless emergency, then there's a mechanism within it to allow us to move expeditiously in the process. Now, 
through that first reading will be a time for community members to participate. As we found out from the agenda items tonight, people are very capable of writing emails and making phone calls about how they feel about specific agenda items. And then also, we'll have to come back for a second reading of the uh, ordinance. So that's two public hearings and as much opportunity as they want to write their opinions into the governing body to decide. Um, you know that transparency and community input are incredibly important to me, but as is uh, finding fast and proven solutions to uh, the issue of homelessness. Okay, so uh, thank you for the clarification. Just to confirm, the motion is pretty much consistent as previously stated, and that was seconded by you, correct, Councilmember Cohn? Okay, uh, Councilmember Brown, Matthews, and then Vice Mayor Cummings, and then back to Councilmember. Okay, I would, um, I, I really wanna thank, I'm just gonna say it again, thanks staff for the, the <coughs> presentation, uh, the clarity, and all of the work that you've clearly put in. Um, a staff member um, for going a, a trip to Powell's books, to, <laughs> family vacation, to do that, to, to actually have those conversations. So I really, really appreciate all the work you've put into it. Um, um, I too, um, uh, I, I, I like the, um, the um, project charter idea and I appreciate all the work that went into pr um, putting those together so we have a clear understanding of what it would take to kind of to pursue um, those um, measures. And I too am though concerned about the timeline, in particular when I heard August, I mean, it, it, in, especially, I mean, one, the urgency of the, the issue, the item, um, it, it, I, I just think that's a long time to wait, um, but it also um, gets us into the next budget cycle and um, does not give us an opportunity to consider, should it be necessary, any additional resources required to operationalize um, any of these things um, if resources were needed from the city general fund in addition to the HAP and, and HEAP funding that's available. So, um, so that's a concern for me. And then I have a question because I'm really still trying to wrap my mind around um, the, the, I mean, I get the difference because I've read through the, the California, the state um, statutes related to the different kinds of emergency shelter emergency and um, a local, um, in this case, homeless emergency, um, but I'm just trying to figure out what um, might not be enabled by the the um, resolution that we have, um, and uh, if we and or if we were to expand it or kind of uh, revise it because it is really specific to it. It suggests one site, um, one managed campground. So I do think either way we would want to to pr to do some revisions of that. But I'm just trying to figure out what we can't do if we don't do the homeless emergency. That we other, that, so. The clarification between yeah, the shelter crisis I, it's and emergency. still not equation. clear to me, even with all the reading that I've done here. And my, my question is along that same line, so I ask it at the Council same time, Matthews, yeah. answer them both at once. Um, my reading of the state legislation on declaration of an emergency is, is that it is very much uh, defined in the context of a, an unexpected sudden emergency like a natural event, uh, fire, flood, earthquake, et cetera, that has a, a sharp beginning um, and has to be dealt with um, in a very immediate sense, um, as opposed to what is really an endemic crisis. And um, our staff mentioned that the existing uh, declaration of uh, shelter crisis that we have qualified the city um, for uh, funding that, that was really useful to us in terms of uh, attracting resources, but that it could st it was also developed for a specific um, point in time and it could very well stand to be um, updated in view of the discussion that we're having now. So my, my take on it was that the declaration of homeless emergency um, didn't really meet the um, uh, definitions uh, or triggers uh, defined by the state, but that we could incorporate a great deal of that into uh, a revision of the declaration of, we could call it shelter and homeless crisis. So I would just put that out as an idea and, and see if, okay. if that makes sense or. So I heard two questions. One is the difference between the emergency and the shelter crisis and two, if there's a way to further understand whether or not the emergency declaration constitutes what the state standard is, if I'm interpreting the Just question correctly. Get the best of both. And how to integrate maybe the two. Um, 
I, I guess the best way to, for me to just attempt to describe it is that the, the declaration of a homeless state of emergency, in my mind, and, and the declaration of a shelter crisis are sort of overlapping um, with regard to whether or not the circumstances uh, presented here are adequate to, to constitute an emergency. Um, I would just sort of hearken back to the discussion we had about the emergency rent freeze ordinance that the council adopted um, back in February of last year in which um, the council made emergency findings that, um, that received some negative comments about whether or not the, the rental housing market situation was, was in fact an emergency. And the way I read the law, it, it contemplates um, that determination being in, in the nature of a quasi-legislative determination for which if challenged, courts are required to give some deference to the city council's determination of what constitutes an emergency. Um, they're overlapping because uh, <coughs> the emergency declaration statute is intended first to enable the city to avail itself of emergency funding should it be available from another source. Second, to promulgate regulations that are necessary in order to uh, address the circumstances constituting the emergency. Um, the shelter crisis declaration is similar in that it um, uh, states that the provisions of any state or local regulatory statute, regulation, or ordinance pre prescribing standards of housing, health, or safety shall be suspended to the extent that strict compliance would prevent, hinder, or delay the mitigation of the effects of the shelter crisis, but then also that the city may, in place of such standards, enact municipal health and safety standards to be operated, uh, to be operative during the housing emergency consistent with ensuring minimal public health and safety. I look at the, uh, the attempt to come up with some regulations for transitional shelters as sort of consistent with the second part of that statute, that there, there's relaxed standards that aren't strictly in adherence to the building code and the uniform housing code, for instance, but that are deemed adequate by the city in an emergency to provide some minimal shelter for people who are experiencing homelessness. And then the other part of the shelter crisis declaration is the um, some protection to the city for from liability arising from uh, some I incident that occurs due to the lack of adherence to um, state or local regulatory standards. So those are the different parts. They're overlapping as is the shelter, um, the transitional shelter ordinance. Um, it's really a common, it's, it's sort of a tapestry of, of attempts to move forward with some, um, some practical solutions. And if I could add as well, um, ideas that the city attorney and I talked about to bolster the existing shelter crisis declaration is, and, and Councilmember Brown points out, it was a bit tailored for circumstances we're in in January of 18. For instance, at the bottom of page two, be it further resolved that the council directs the city manager or his designee to apply this declaration of a homeless crisis shelter to the city's proposal for a temporary managed homeless campground and interim day services a navigation center building site, and other subsequent actions to provide homeless shelter. So while we do have that clause in there which has the door open, nonetheless, we think that we could strengthen it with um, some revision to generalize the language in maybe um, having it be more open to have the flexibility depending on what our future course takes us. Moreover, the city attorney also said that we could have a clear language about particular exemptions, citing things like um, CEQA and other things as well. So just lay that out explicitly in a revision so it's much clearer if I'm characterizing that accurately. So those are the things that we had talked about informally before this meeting as ways that we think that this could be a strengthened instrument for you. Uh, Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilman Myers. I'm sorry. Okay. sorry. I think we're in a very unique situation that we haven't seen potentially in decades. Where the county has received, we declared a, uh, a shelter crisis. The county has now received $10.6 million 
and we're at the beginning of being able to utilize those funds to address the con many of the concerns that were mentioned tonight. And I think that given we haven't had an opportunity to move forward in any meaningful way to actually deal with these, I mean, we've, I've, I take that back, staff has been moving forward to come up with ways in which that we can um, utilize these funds to help end some of the suffering that's on the street. We've partnered with the county, and this is a regional pro. This is a regional problem, and I think that we need to start looking at um, issues like homelessness as a regional problem because it's not for every individual city to be addressing. It's for our counties um, to be partnering with our neighboring counties and the entire state. I mean, it, it's it's a problem that we're having all over the country. We're not alone, as we've heard tonight with um, the fact that this is something that's occurring in places like Eugene and Portland and Seattle. We know it's happening in Oakland and San Francisco. It's happening here. It's happening everywhere. And this is the first time in a very long time that we've actually been able to begin working collaboratively on addressing these issues. And um, I treat states of emergency very seriously. I don't think it's something that we should be throwing around. And I think what we should do initially is begin working with the county and begin collaborating on ideas and ways that we can utilize these funds to begin addressing homelessness. And if it turns out that we need more funding and we're able to demonstrate that we're able to use these dollars effectively, then we can move forward with a uh, declaration of a state of emergency. So I won't be supporting the declaration of a state of emergency at this time. However, um, I would um, later um, move to, um, if there's revisions that would strengthen our um, our shelter ordinance, I would move staff later at, after this motion has been taken care of to um, do that. Yeah, Councilor. I was gonna call, so we have a motion and a second, correct? I was gonna call the question unless there's other uh, I, comments. Well, we can call the question and then revisit it. And then, revisit and then it. Re <laughs> yeah. I just, it's getting so late and I, I mean, not that that matters, but. Okay. So you're call, are you calling the question? Well, I'm looking and seeing. Uh, I, if if I'll, what's before I'll, us is to vote on the entire package of the motion on the floor. Okay, so the question is, I, I mean, if the question is called, I, I believe that there's no, uh, there's no uh, additional comment. To be clear, I'm uh, calling the question. Requires um, a second. Ha, is is done by a motion, so that would be a motion to call the question, question that the council can can vote on. Okay, are you making that motion at this? Point? I'll withdraw the motion at this point. Okay, Councilmember Glover, and then did I see Councilmember Brown? And um, no. Okay. Council Great. Member. I'd like to separate my motion and have the first part be for the declaration of homeless emergency. Uh, the second, can do, I can't do, so I'll just start with the motion to the declaration of homeless emergency in Santa Cruz. Okay, so if, if I, he, Susie. I'm just gonna recommend to Bonnie to put up Council Member Glover's motion <clears throat> that was on his presentation. It might be helpful for the public to see that. <coughs> so we'll go ahead and maybe move okay. through each of the components. I think this is a little bit different potentially, but that's okay. I think I don't think it's as complicated as it, could, it as it was last time potentially. So I think we can get through it um, if it's not possible to get up. But if I'm understanding correctly, we're going to break the motion apart and vote on it as individual action, right? That's fine. I can understand the first one, but honestly, I couldn't write fast enough to get the others. So when the others come up, I would appreciate having them typed and put up on the on the screen. So, um, okay, so we'll go ahead and vote on whether or not to declare a local emerg uh, uh, I'm sorry, a declaration of a local emergency as opposed to a revision of the shelter crisis. That's the motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Crown. Okay. Can I can I ask for clarification on that? I'm, I apologize for bringing this up again. Um, the recommendation that was presented in the PowerPoint was retur to return on March 12th with a draft for first reading of the declaration. Um, just for clarification, is it to return with a resolution or to adopt the resolution that's been presented this evening? Please. So, uh, like I mentioned during the presentation, I made this before uh, I knew that y'all were coming with a draft today because you had said you didn't have it before. So. Uh, one has changed to adopting the existing language that you have, and then there's two and three in striking four. 
Okay, so we're adopting the resolution, the, the motion on the floor is to adopt the resolution this evening. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. 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 Okay, so that fails with uh, Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Glover uh, in support, and Councilmember uh, Myers, Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and, my, and myself against. Okay, um, so the let's deal with the alternative. Is that where you're the alternatives? Going? Okay, and I, I mean, I will just say I, I would be supportive of revisiting the language for the shelter uh, crisis that we already have in place, and then also um, in for, in terms of the the project char charter um, uh, outlines that have been provided by staff, which I think. Um, offer a roadmap to get us in many ways in the same direction as we wanted to go. So I'll just put that on on the floor. Um, yeah, what movie are we yeah, gonna yeah. watch? <laughs> <laughs> it's really late. We're like getting to wreck it Ralph at this point. Okay, we can do this. Okay, Council Member, uh, actually, okay, Vice Mayor Cummings, Council Member Matthews. Okay. Um, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to make a, a few statements, just given what the public had stated earlier um, and around homelessness and the state that we're living in in Santa Cruz and the fact that we have so much homeless um, in our community. And I think that it's important that everyone re remember that we are considered the fourth most expensive place to live in the world. And that's given the fact that we have a tourism economy that is unable to keep up with paying their workers the amount it costs to rent a, a place to live in this town. and. You know, I know that a, a lot of people had things to say about people who live in their cars and in their RVs, but these are also people who are working, taxpaying people in our community. Um, so I think that's really important that we remember that. And for those people who maybe don't have jobs and live out of their vehicles, there may be barriers that we're unaware of that's keeping them from working, or you know, maybe they're receiving other things like social security that allows them you know, to live off very little, and that's the only way that they're able to survive in this community. Um, I go down to the camp at least a couple times a week. Um, I've actually, I bank at Bay Federal, and, um, and I talk to people who work down there, and many of the people who work in that community do have compassion for the folks who are at the camp, and, um, Many, some people from that camp also go in and spend their money in those coffee shops and in those, those businesses because they need things too and they also spend money in our community. So I think that it's also very bad for people to you know, demonize the people who live in that camp. And having gone down there, um, a number of the people who are here tonight, they walked me through and said, hey, come on in if you wanna meet people who are in the camp and you've, if you wanna talk to them. So. Um, I don't like, you know, a lot of the language going around saying that um, that everyone down there is a criminal, and um, because I'd also point out that they deal with these the same things that we do, deal with as well. Um, there's a lot of people down there who, like, as with people in our community, feel a more secure sense of safety, and they feel a sense of community there. <laughs> there are people who are there who are who are using drugs and there are people there who may be up to no good and stealing and you know, just because they don't have homes and these things are happening there doesn't mean that there are people with homes who aren't doing the same things within our community. So you know, the types of activities that we see happening there, we also have with people who are in sheltered populations um, in our community as well. Um, with that being said, um, I know that the staff is moving forward expeditiously trying to get things on board and they're really trying to do it in a way that's very thoughtful. Um, I do have some concerns and there's a, num a lot of people in the community with concerns around uh, the closure date and just the rate at which we're able to move people into shelters. So um, at this point, I wanna make a motion to remove the closure date at the Gateway Camp and to provide signage at, please, please don't clap, please don't clap. Provide signage at the camp about alternatives including the VFW Hall, the Salvation Army, and information around the other alternatives that are gonna be coming on board. Um, and that we move to finding a site um, for a transitional camp and we continue to explore the idea of a transitional camp. Um, and just so people know, a big reason why this is happening is because um, 
there's fear not only in the community of folks who are living there, but also I've been hearing from people who live in the areas and people who live in other parts of Santa Cruz who've actually expressed that um, while the camp isn't perfect, it's something for people right now. It's, we have to remember that it's winter. We still have a lot of storms coming, and this year has been um, exceptionally wet and cold. And if people didn't have this type of um, shelter, since we're not able to provide shelter ourselves, we may actually be, we may have actually been dealing with more deaths associated to hypo people getting hypothermia. And we wouldn't know where, the, where these people are because we wouldn't have, um, they wouldn't be concentrated in one area. Um, and so I'm gonna move forward with that motion at this point in time. Second. So there, is that a substitute motion? That was gonna be my question. Okay, my question I, is also I, that. I believe there were. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have one on the floor? We have a motion on the floor. Council Member Glover's motion. motion is still on the Specific floor. Question, right? Separate, yeah. The, I believe. There's, a count, there's the second part of the original motion, which is to uh, address the additional considerations, which included the ordinance language and moving forward with that and the safe parking language, if, my, if I remember correctly, the transitional encampment ordinance language. So if and there's the a substitute motion, the then the council has to vote on whether to accept the substitute motion. Then if it is accepted, then you can vote on the substitute motion. And then if it's appropriate, you may return to the main motion and vote on that. Okay. So, uh, so is that a, a substitute motion? Yes. Okay. Uh, so your 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 motion is to consider this and to and to not consider the point, points two and three from Council Member Glover's motion regarding transitional encampments and uh, list of potential sites. I thought that by separating the two motions that um, they hadn't been those have not been considered right. yet. So you're you're recommending your your motion is to substitute the Ross encampment extending the date, which is a kind of a different issue for Council Member Glover's motion, or, you, or both? And may, may, I may I suggest that we potentially withdraw the motion for the time being. We'll go ahead and vote on the original motion, then you could revisit your second motion. We can take action separately on that. Does that feel appropriate, Council Member Matthews and then Council Member uh, Yes, I was gonna say there's about three items yeah. in that yeah. substitute yeah. motion, and also, um, I, I believe we have not dealt with the idea of um, directing a revision of the um, crisis, the, the, the yeah, um, resolution. Okay, so I was gonna make that crisis. motion yeah. after yeah. we get okay. through the rest of it. Yeah. So, so why don't we do this? We've withdrawn the motion. We'll revisit that at another time. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and move forward with the uh, council weighing in on the second part of uh, Council Member Glover's uh, motion and uh, then move on to other subsequent potential action. Did you have a I question? would like to see the language of the motion that's now on the floor. Okay. Yeah, happy to just say it again because I don't have a way to project it up here. Okay, do you want to see it again? Really? I mean, Bonnie, can't we type out the... Or if it's, really. if it's on the... I believe the it was items two and three of the recommendation that was... Uh, well, then on the PowerPoint? Let's look at items two and three. Okay, so now I can, well, no, because my internet doesn't work now, because it's down, but uh, this is outdated, like I mentioned before. This is not the same things. The first one, and we can change it, thank you, Bonnie, is uh, the uh, adoption of the language of the Declaration of Homeless Emergency. I know that didn't pass, but just for the record, so that it's in the document. Number two was for staff to come back at the March 12th meeting with a complete list of all city-owned properties with potential locations for transitional encampments and safe parking programs. And then the third one was to return by March 12th with first uh, language of the transitional encampments ordinance and the safe parking ordinance. Uh, and after talking with Attorney Kandati, invoking the expediting process but since that didn't pass, that kind of becomes a moot point, um, depending on whatever language is revised for the declaration of shelter emergency, as we can anticipate to most likely hear after this. So um, short answer is number two, come back with a list of city-owned properties for transitional encampments and parking spaces. 
Okay. So, uh, Councilmember Matthews? Yeah. And then Councilmember Brown. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to comment on that. Um, I believe this is consistent with the uh, direction, the joint resolution that was adopted by both the city and county, which called for exploration of safe parking programs. Is that correct? That was, that's already incorporated in that jointly adopted uh, action. Did that refer to transitional um, locations as well? Well, the, the joint action plan does contemplate um, a full evaluation of all alternative shelter options. So I would imagine if there's interest on behalf of the council to provide some specificity to that, um, we would already have direction to, to do that. This is consistent with our jointly adopted mm -hmm. action. And the one thing I would uh, request adding to this would be to um, um, uh, direct that that um, information be shared with um, the county encouraging um, maximum um, collaboration for pursuit of those um, uh, opportunities of, of both the Pardon? pursuit of, of the opportunity. Yeah, because what, what we've found is that our staff has already done a great deal of research on both the safe parking and um, transitional encampments and that, that uh, as part of this direction, returning with the list of possible city-owned locations, we should also share our research with the two-by-two two committee and urge their, um, their pursuit of these possibilities. So it's not clear to me that we can't um, also consider ordinance language for both transitional encampment, um, encampments and safe, par uh, safe parking programs. Strike three. So, uh, but it's, so council member Glover said that that would is moot because we are not, we um, did not um, vote, the majority did not vote for the declaring the existence of a local homeless emergency. But that was my question with a shelter emergency. I believe that we still could do those things. So I don't, I don't. If I, if I can, what my interpretation was that it couldn't happen to the level of expediency that was originally anticipated or hoped for by Councilmember Glover's original proposal that accompanied the emergency component of it, but it still could go through general processes if that was interest of the council. Is that correct? We just go through the planning department. Yeah. So, so, so rather, so the mo I'm so confused. Would to the question is whether or not we could still move forward with the direction to have this ordinance language returned to us. And uh, my understanding is yes, it would just not. It would go through our planning commission before it is able to. What correct? I what I would envision is that we would bring the ordinance back to the council on the twelfth the draft for your review. That the council could um, direct that we bring it forward as um, an urgency ordinance, and if it obtains sufficient votes, the council could put that in place on an interim basis, um, or you could um, <laughs> review it and either forward it to the planning commission for recommendation or modify it and forward a modified version to the planning commission for a recommendation. Um, neither of those actions would require as a prerequisite that you adopt the emergency resolution. I would, I would basically look at those as complementary actions, not not one requires um, the other. Uh, I would just add that um, if there is an opportunity for some of the ordinance language to fit in to a provision of the municipal code outside of the zoning ordinance, then that process of uh, the mandated process of going to the planning commission first could also be avoided. I think we need to evaluate whether or not that's a possibility and whether it fits within other sections of the code, but that may be uh, another approach that could get you to where you're trying to get to. Okay, thank you. Okay. <coughs> to us. I'm sorry, would you mind repeating your... I mean, I'm, I'm just, um, so direct staff to return on March 12th with ordinance language for a transitional encampment permitting ordinance and safe parking programs permitting ordinance um, based off of previously submitted materials with a uh, recommendation about um, process for adoption. Okay, 
process does, period. Pro yeah. The process, yeah. Does that uh, work for you, Council Member Butler? I'll accept both of the friendly amendments. Okay. Okay, so that would be a friendly amendment to modify number three um, by Council Member Brown and an additional friendly amendment by Council Member Matthews to incorporate uh, number four for clarity. Okay. Council Are we <coughs> just speaking on the motion at this point? We could speak on the motion. We could start voting on the different components. However, is it, uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, I just want to make one comment based on the uh, some of the uh, testimony that we heard that, or I think it was uh, the research that Susie was done uh, that uh, presented that uh, really transitional encampments realistically are not necessarily transitional. For some people, they are a supervised encampment that where they may live for a number of years, a couple of years, several years. So the transitional people have a, a, a concept and maybe it works out that that's a, a very temporary encampment until something more stable comes along. But in a way that's a misnomer. So I wonder if we want to just say uh, <coughs> transitional slash uh, supervised encampments or something. I, I just put that out to people as trying to be as realistic as possible about what we're talking about. Okay. You can work on that when, <laughs> when you bring that back. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, what will be valuable for ongoing discussions um, around the ordinance is the intentionality of intention. The, yeah, yeah uh, the intentionality of what we're trying to ach achieve with a transitional and enca encampment. I mean, I think that um, providing a safe place to sleep, providing a dignified and humane place to be is something that we need to have a lot of clarity around because there are other different ways to meet those objectives. Um, and those different program models require different siting con considerations, different operational considerations, different financial considerations. So I think as council member uh, Glover suggested, I do think we should consider ordinance language that kind of looks at that full spectrum of alternative shelter options and then give the council <clears throat> and planning commission or whoever other stakeholders that might be involved an opportunity to do much like what Seattle and others did, which is um, really in, um, intentional neighborhood engagement around what conditions would be considered effective in creating an, a harmonious um, kind of incompatible program within the neighborhoods that we are considering. So, I mean, that would be one, one point of caution that I would suggest you contemplate as you think about this process is um, while, and we all know, you know, council meetings are a difficult place to provide public comment, um, what alternative forms, forms of engagement would be required to ensure that we're not only doing something quickly and urgently, ur urgently, I'm getting tired, I'm sorry, but also that we'll, we will have success with. We wanna be successful. I mean, I, staff wants this, these programs to be successful too, and I think that we need to take some little, little bit of time to think about what that's gonna look like. So Susie, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're essentially outlining what was described in the charter project plan. Correct? Yeah, and, and we certainly can return to the question of urgency and timing. I mean, we we built these things in a matter of hours, the broader few days, process. but um, really having a better idea as to what that stakeholder process would look like so we can build programs that are gonna be sustainable. Okay, well, and Councilman I, I do, excuse me, but I do wanna also comment that that's my concern with these, th with this motion is to say, okay, bring, bring us back the list, bring us back the ordinance, bam, let's go do it. It needs structure, it needs thought on how it's going to be operated. Okay, so much of that for success. And um, I don't want this to sound like it's a blank check and, and all these things are gonna open up. Partly for that reason, because I think the thought behind the uh, structure and operation, accountability, et cetera, is absolutely critical to success. And also, history has shown us, you know, I can see the headline tomorrow, um, um, Camping in Santa Cruz, green light, come on down. So I'm, I'm concerned about our sending that message 
So, so yeah, I, if I could, I think there's a, mo so the, in the interest of moving our discussion along, um, there is the motion on the floor as presented here before us in terms of the various components. We voted on the first component, that failed. So now we're on, if we wanna go through them to the next component and vote on that, we can do that or make modifications if uh, accepted by the maker of the motion. And I'm open to other strategies, but in the interest of trying to get us through this in terms of outcomes for this evening, um, early morning at this point, um, where, where can we go? I think we can either vote on this and uh, decide where we wanna be or come up with a different strategy. So uh, if it pleases the mayor, just one more point, I'm sorry. I think it might be beneficial for the council to consider um, an additional direction to staff to return with additional information on how this motion fits into the project charter, yeah. where there's opportunities to hasten the process, um, how this might be a step to lead us in the direction that um, staff articulated so we can continue to kind of think about that process framework every time we return to this. So you can kind of understand how long potentially di different decisions might take and how to best engage with stakeholders and the council and the greater public along the way. Okay, so I, I appreciate the suggestion. And we still have this existing motion on the floor for deliberation. For also, I think uh, you should provide clarity on number three, because I think you amended it a little bit, and I don't recall whether this is the, the precise language. Just, I just want to make sure it's, if that. Okay. So let's go ahead and, and move down the motion. And if it doesn't necessarily, uh, if, it's, if it passes, it passes. If it doesn't pass, then we can go ahead and amend and have a different potential act, outcome. Does that work for the council? But I think you could incorporate, if it's a friendly amendment, direct staff to provide information on how to integrate this direction with the charter. And that's for the maker and the second accept that. If so, we can just. Sure. Uh, sure. So uh, I accept it. So you're accepting really to um, uh, direct five. staff to provide additional information on how the above, above mo the motion above um, can be incorporated into the project charter, charter for transitional <laughs> encampments. In and, and that would be in addition to voting on all of the above. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it just. Yeah, I just voiced that my concern with the project charter is the timeline, and I believe Councilmember Brown also mentioned that the concern was with the timeline. So I am a little concerned about the, like, does that mean that how does the how do these motions work into the timeline associated with the project charter? Because that's not the goal. The goal is to move forward quicker than the project charter because we need to see these solutions. And I'm also really confused about the con conversation of structure and strategy because there are proven systems that have proven structures that work in areas with much larger populations than we have. So I don't understand why we're getting bogged down in this pro in, in this the, the process um, instead of just being able to move with proven models that work and are data driven. Okay, so what I'm hearing is maybe that there isn't the acceptance of number five, potentially, because it's feeling not consistent with what the intentions of one or two through four is. Yeah, no. Okay, no. One, so let's go ahead, two, and, three, vote four, the, let's go ahead and vote on the motion, and we'll just take it piece by piece, and if the majority of the council is supportive, we can move forward. Does that feel appropriate? I, I just, sorry, yeah. No, go ahead. No. I, I'm just wondering if number one in there is going to be a problem because we... No, number one is already yeah. voted on. That, that one's gone. It's been voted okay. on. Yeah. So it's really two through five. Okay. So two, two through four. four. Two through four. Because do we want to vote on that all in one? Okay. So all those in favor of the uh, items number two, three, and four, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. I don't... Um, I feel that we need to have the charter personally. So I feel... Uh, uh, if, go ahead. Can we make an additional motion? So that motion passed. Motions, I'm sorry, wait, wait. This, we voted on two through four. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that those passed. Yeah. Okay, so that can passed. We, can we just get a record of the votes? Sure. Was it unanimous? No, I voted against on, on two through four because I, I feel per personally that number five is probably the better approach and it I'm, feels like it isn't really consistent for two through four sorry, for me. I lost track. I'm getting tired. <laughs> I thought five was part of it. Ugh. 
The five was removed. Mm -hmm. okay. removed. Then I'm going to be yeah. a no on this yeah, as well. Maybe, maybe we can clarify. I believe the idea was yeah. with respect to five was that it would it would work in conjunction with three. Yeah. In other words, it just provided additional information as to how number three fits in with the project charter. Right. So they're they're not necessarily different yeah. things. It's just yeah. that it, we would go ahead and ring bang the ordinance, but then we would just provide more information as to how the ordinance fits into the project charter for your information. And, and my understanding was that that was not accepted at this time. Yeah, no, just because of the timeline associated okay. with the project so charter, I don't want it to come I back. I just want to clarify the purpose, right? Yeah, okay. I just don't want it to come back. So, so, so based on the follow-up comment by Councilmember Myers, I'm there was a bit uh, of a assuming that the record will reflect two no votes, um, Mayor Watkins and Councilmember Myers, and five votes in favor. Is that correct? So I, my understanding is that we're, two more motions are about to get made. That's my sense, at least, and which would include. So number five is going to be coming to us. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's right. I would like okay. to do. Which is okay. All right. So two to four is five Thank two. You. Yes. So two to two to four was five two. Go ahead. I'd like to um, add, uh, uh, make a motion uh, with the language, acknowledging a sense of urgency. We direct staff to provide additional information on how the um, elements of this motion are incorporated in, in the, uh, in, to the project charter. I'll second that motion. Okay. Any further discussion? All those. Acknowledge uh, urgency. Acknowledging a sense of urgency. Direct staff to provide additional information on how the above motion is incorporated in the project charter. Okay. Okay. So that was a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by myself. All those in favor. Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. So that uh, passes with uh, Council. I'm, I'm not sure if I captured your vote, Council Member. Yeah, it's important. Council Member Crone, uh, Council Member Myers, Council Member Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself in support, and uh, Council Member Glover's against. Is there another additional motion? Oh, uh huh. Sure. Okay. We have. Wait. Is, is Delaware done, like not coming back? No. no, no, no. no. Okay. All right. So this motion, um, remove the closure date at the gateway camp um, and to revisit that when we have a better sense of um, how many beds are, when the additional services are, are online. Second. Oh, I'm not done. Could, 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 Bonnie, <laughs> could Bonnie write, <laughs> could we get this written out? Could she write it out as he's saying it? I can rewrite it because it's like on a page with a bunch of other notes. Um, so remove the closure date at the gateway camp and to revisit this date as services come online. Revisit the date as alternatives come online. Provide signage at the camp about alternatives including the VFW Hall, Salvation Army, and any other shelter or warming facilities. And then move to revise the, um, the shelter crisis um, statement to strengthen it, given our situation. Second. Okay, so that was a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by uh, Councilmember Glover. Um, any further discussion? Councilmember Brown. Could I just, if I could um, maybe try to wordsmith the, the shelter portion to direct staff to bring back uh, recommendations regarding revisions to the shelter emergency resolution. Recommended. Re Okay. Recommended revisions. Is that me? Is that, okay. Susie. I mean, we know what it means, but just to clarify yeah. that. So they will go, they'll come back with some recommendations to uh, please. Few um, <clears throat> points of clarification or questions. So, um, so um, with the joint action plan, that's obviously a, both a board approved and a council approved plan, and there's a tremendous number of resources that are being put into. Um, not only <clears throat> outreaching folks at the encampment around their sheltering opportunities, but building those opportunities and um, developing 
um, kind of that path to transition for folks. Um, I would recommend um, there is a two by two committee meeting this Thursday, ensuring that um, this direction is brought back to the two by two committee in case there is a need to um, modify the joint action plan as it relates to the coordinated kind of relationship between the city and the county because there is a ton of operational coordination that's around that. And then two, it would be good for staff who's working through the operations of this to have a sense of the intentionality, the overall intentionality to close with appropriate shelter options so we can continue to move towards that because um, what I'm hearing with posting signs that there's alternative shelter opportunities does not necessarily evoke people must move. <laughs> um, so I think we, we need to have a little bit more clarity around that or you can have those discussions at the two by two but I think it's important um, f f sitting from where I'm sitting, trying to develop kind of this operational plan, which quite frankly, day by day is a new task that we kind of still have marching orders to complete elements of those tasks. For instance, with the idea that we would return on the 12th with a full update as to the potential of um, providing those suitable alternatives for folks. I'll just I'll just agree that I think that is definitely something that um, came to mind for me in terms of this motion, um, knowing that also we were going to be receiving an update on the 12th and given uh, any type of uh, update that didn't necessarily result in um, meeting the intention of having um, available space so that we felt comfortable closing the can by the 15th then we can make that modification at that time. But that would also be in, in um, collaboration with the county as originally designed. So I, I share the same concern and that's why I won't support the motion as it is. Um, I, I um, respect the concern. I think one of the things that's been coming out of the camp, and um, I also um, think that we should be moving forward towards, you know, getting enough beds and spaces online so that we can close that location. And I'll say that there are, you know, there are issues with it being at that location, including um, risks to public safety. We've heard from the um, fire chief about how it's hard to get. Um, like safety services, like emergency medical services in there. There's environmental um, health concerns. And so um, I think that what we're hoping is that we do find these other alternatives that come online. And I think that the fear that's been coming through the camp and concerns within the community are around the fact that the language that's been used is geared towards only really focusing on closing the camp and not providing people with alternatives. And as a result, people are on people who are in the camp and people who are in the surrounding communities have expressed concern because what they don't wanna see happen is that the services don't come on, online, we have a firm date, and then we shut the camp down and people are kind of scattering all throughout the city and that there's um, turmoil at the camp in terms of it being shut down. There's been um, talk about uh, acts of civil disobedience and then the potential for the lawsuit around Matthews versus Boise. and so. I feel like for myself and for, and I feel like I speak for a demographic in the community, that if we have alternatives and we can say, okay, we have you know X number of beds and this is what the city and the county have committed <laughs> to and we're gonna, we're gonna now set a date and we're gonna be closing this site down. Um, I think that at that, like, at that time it's, it's better to have a firm date because otherwise, um, people are just living in this constant state of fear. And I think that in the community, it's been stirring a lot of tension as well. Okay. Thank you. So um, thank you for the clarification. So we have a motion by Council Member, Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by a Council Member Glover. Further discussion, Council Can Member? Can we separate the motion? How would you like to have that motion separated? Uh, one is remove the uh, closure date and uh, revisit the date as alternatives come online. I think that's one motion and then providing signage about alternatives and revising the shelter crisis statement. The second motion. Other one. Let's tell, is that, that works for me. So let's go ahead and vote on the first uh, motion. I also say to in, um, I'll invite staff to include any language in that signage about like the closure of the camp. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. So all those in favor of item number one, which is to remove the closure date of the camp and revisit the date as alternatives come online, please say aye. 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 
Opposed? No. No. So that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings in support. Councilmember Matthews, uh, Councilmember Myers, and, my, and myself voting against. I have a question on that action. Um, I am concerned about uh, the fact that this is a departure from our jointly adopted agreement with the county. And I'd like to get suggestions from staff on how we can send as strongly worded as possible um, indication to the county that we intend to move quickly, we intend to, to prioritize the, the projects that you're working on right now to get those additional sites online. I don't want them to think Santa Cruz is bailing on you. So, and we can go ahead. Just language on that. And just also as an FYI, we'll be meeting with the two by two this later this week, so we can go ahead and also express that. But I think that message, official message has okay. to come from the council. Sure. Okay. Do you feel com does the council feel comfortable with that? Yes. yes. Okay. So we can work on language reiterating our interest in continuing to move in concert with the county. So can I just given make a place. motion that the council would vote upon? Can we let's vote on the second one? Okay. okay. Oh, right. we, let's finish this yeah, up. This, okay, fine. so that's all fine. those in favor in, in items number two and three, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, go ahead. Um, I move that the council um, send a clear message to our county partners that we are committed to prioritizing the elements of our joint agreement and um, attempting to meet the uh, target date for the uh, camp closure. I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? Oh, Councilmember Glover. Um, I'd add that in that statement to encourage the county to identify some potential safe parking places that have been sh uh, identified by the community like the drive-in or the Toys R Us parking lot. Um, let's separate, the, I, I agree with that, but let's separate them. And that's something that we're already exploring at the two by two. I think it's already, that's it's already happening. First I heard about it, so right on. Exploring other alternatives, right? Okay, so, okay, we'll, we'll keep that separate, not accepted. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Is there a different motion at this point or do we want to call it a night? Mm. Just make, can I make one statement for the record? I'll go ahead and wait just one second. Were you prepared? Were you trying to prepare? Yeah, I was just looking really quick. Uh, we've got the resolution taken care of. We got the transitional encampments kind of taken care of. We got the oh, um, well, I mean, I guess I not now, whatever. Uh, no, I'll pass. Okay, oh. vice mayor coming. I just wanted to state for the record that, um, just the fact that I was in opposition of the closure uh, or the pulling of the signs down on Delaware because um, as someone who works in that area and um, had gone out and heard the concerns of the folks in that area, I just wanna point out that, um, that uh, one of the reasons why I was uncomfortable with that site and one of the things I expressed to a lot of people in the community was that um, when we make these kinds of decisions, we really need to make sure that we're reaching out to the community and involving them in the conversation because many of the people who approached me about that, um, some of whom are my colleagues that I've known for a very long period of time and people I've been friends with in this community mm -hmm. for over a decade, um, none of them felt like anyone had ever approached them and, and asked them whether or not this would be something that they'd be okay with. And we really need to make sure, as people have said, that we, are all working on this together, and this isn't something that the city council is gonna impose on any individual community without going to those communities and discussing this with them. So I just wanna uh, make sure that that's on the record. So just to confirm that there has been no action on uh, the Delaware uh, proposal at this point. That was brought up. Uh, there was no motion to make that uh, change, and so at this point, the council has not um, made any kind of direction to pursue that. So that for the community's sake, for clarification, that will not be moving forward. Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, make a statement kind of in response to Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, this 
process was designed to start the conversation because uh, the conversation was not happening on a community level and uh, being able to identify what was going on. It's happening on an internal level here, but we got a chance to hear from a lot of different community members tonight that came out to speak. We got a chance to hear some solutions, which they may or may not have presented to us in uh, other opportunities. And now we can continue to move forward in figuring out ways to engage the community. But I do want to caution the dedication to making sure we get every single opinion as opposed to being able to move forward and actually protect people and make it so that they are uh, taken care of. So I just wanna emphasize that there, it's not one or the other, it should be a combination of two where we're moving expeditiously, but at the same time realizing that every day that goes by while we talk about things, people are suffering and dying on the streets. Okay, so uh, thank you. We have a, sort of a different understanding of types of approaches. Uh, unless there's any further discussion, I'll go ahead and, and adjourn. Quick, quickly, quickly, Mayor, just oh, before the gavel. Really? No, we me. don't have any direction on public facilities and bathrooms. If there's consensus on behalf of the council to move forward with the project charter process, we can probably just if leave I can, it at that. If I can make a motion, I would yeah. say so. So maybe if somebody wants to move that. Okay, so uh, I move that we uh, continue with the project charter uh, process for the public facilities uh, analysis. And I'll second that motion. I'll I'm really sorry to ask this, but okay. what are the assumptions that I, I have grave reservations about that? The end result of that, um, opening up parks and bathrooms. So in terms of, yeah, so the project charter does outline a process for which we get to um, developing a transparent and consistent process for which we analyze um, potential closures. So it, you know, I think there was some intentionality about opening things immediately and having, um, limiting the, the parks director's ability to do closures. It really is about working with the Parks and Rec Commission to ensure that um, as we are making decisions that those thresholds around safety and health and the things and access um, are clear and consistent so it doesn't seem so arbitrary when, when we, when the parks, direct, parks Director closes for purposes of safety, infrastructure, et cetera. So it does lay out more of this um, strategic process for which we are engaging with the multitude of stakeholders that might be involved. Um, no, no decisions would be made right away. Yep. And it, just for clarification, it would be based on the charter language rather than, I believe there was language previously submitted. So right. it, would, it would be based on yeah. the charter process. Yeah. The key being the charter analysis and process. Yeah, okay. Does that help? Okay. Okay, any further discussion? <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. I will go ahead now and adjourn the meeting.